in Africa and how to fight climate change. And in fact, the panelists will then join the youth hub for the youth to be able to ask questions. Uh, so that's amazing. So everybody that feel like a youth or are under 30, you can join the youth hub today. And you do that very easily by just uh, checking out our webpage, the youth hub COP28 on uh, We Don't Have Time. And we will have a schedule for the following COP with fantastic speakers and youths all over the world engaging. This is great work. Well, so I, I, see, I see an elephant over there in the corner here. An elephant? Yeah, we've been talking lots about the, the oh. elephant <laughs> in the room and now we, he's actually entering the, the, the <coughs> studio here. So, wow. And the elephant is uh, wearing a suit as uh, many of the elephants in the fossil industry actually are doing, they're wearing suits. So, uh, Mr. Elephant, what is your message here? So, my message is that I'm Hello, not Ingmar. actually the elephant, uh, but we have an elephant in the room. Uh, in fact, we have many elephants in Dubai right now. Uh, they try to pretend to be climate heroes. They try to say that I'm the leader that's going to fix things. And many times, they're pretending, and they are, in fact, the most ugly action leadership instead. And uh, yesterday, I, I, I got some news. It actually happened on the first day of COP, but it takes a while until getting people's attention. And uh, what I'm talking about here is uh, we have the, you know, Brazil. Uh, they had a president, Bolsonaro. That was kind of the anti-hero to the climate movement. And uh, they have a new president uh, that have uh, stopped a lot of deforestation, done a lot of good stuff for, for, the, for the climate. Also been praised for this, been praised for this at COP in many speeches, etc. But what they are doing, many have criticized the UAE to try to get oil deals done. I mean, so far we have seen a good share of the climate meeting. But what Brazil have done is that they have done oil business at COP mm -hmm. to make an oil deal. So when other leaders are joining the fossil fuel treaty uh, or pledging to go off oil and, and pay money to, to climate funds, uh, the uh, Brazil governments, they are announcing that they're going to join OPEC at COP. They're going to join the oil, oil OPEC organization. And OPEC is not going to save us from climate change. I wrote a climate warning on this on the We Don't Have Time app uh, platform. So please go in and support that warning because we need to get some attention uh, on this, on this, uh, what's happening here. And uh, I mean, when that's, this is getting attention. I think we're going to read a lot about this because media sometimes are quite slow. Uh, so when Lula gets criticized about this, the response, the answer is this. It's not OPEC. It's just OPEC plus. Mm. That's, what, that's the <laughs> statement that came that's up. That's the excuse. <laughs> and it's not just joining OPEC like a trade organization and, and still get off oil, like a strategy to have them to get off oil or anything. No, no, no. On the same time, the Lula's government is preparing to auction aux out 603 new oil and gas blocks onshore and offshore. 603 new oil. It what is, is happening? So upset, upsetting. I mean, this is uh, beyond. It's one thing if you have an oil country doing this in, in like Saudi Arabia or something, that, but why are the good guys even worse than the bad guys? Mm. I don't understand that. So we have a work to do, and uh, this, is, this needs to be yes. addressed. Otherwise, this will, I mean, this is our future. We will not have a future with leadership like that. Mm. But not everything is doom and gloom. That's. That's because I have, happy to hear that, of course. I have another leadership that is doing the opposite. And I know this leader has gone through so much after he stated what he did yesterday at COP. And I'm talking about Gustavo Petro from Colombia. 
He is the first oil producing country that openly wants to support the non-fossil fuel treaty. And I have a quote from him. The quote from Lula da Silva was, it's not OPEC, it's just OPEC plus. The quote from Gustavo Petro, I have no doubt which position to take between fossil capital and life. We choose the side of life. Thank you so much, Ingmar, and thank you so much, Osa. We need to turn to Dubai uh, and introduce Nick Nuttall, uh, who's ready for to take over in Dubai. So take it away, Nick. Here in Dubai, and you can hear uh, this wonderful piano music uh, maybe in the background. So this is real live TV. Um, We've got two wonderful guests here, uh, Per Epson Stockners, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Leadership and Organizational Behavior at the Norwegian Business School. And he's been involved in many, many activities, yeah. including the wonderful Earth for All initiative, which uh, we've had on We Don't Have Time many, many times. And, uh, but he's also now involved in a groundbreaking project with indigenous communities in Ecuador, uh, focusing on what he calls regenerative finance. And we're also fabulously delighted to have with us uh, Berlin Paez, uh, and she is the president of the Pachamama Foundation, uh, who is also in the studio and is also part of this innovative project. Tell us a little bit of what you're trying to achieve uh, in the Amazon right now with this innovative finance yeah, project. Well, thank you, Nick. I am very, very excited to be here. Um, as you might know, the Amazon rainforest is one of the places important to, for the climate stability. And I'm basically very in love with nature, with the tropical rainforest, because I've been there working the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. So um, the things that also I have witnessed in the last years because of the fires, because of the drought in the rivers are affecting the livelihoods of indigenous peoples that are living there. I'm also part of the scientific panel of the Amazon, and we are really clear about the tipping points that are affecting right right now the Amazon region. And there is also many possibilities to approach in order to stand in um, with indigenous leaders to permanently protect the Amazon region. Um, part of the work that we do as Pachamama Foundation with the Sacred Headwaters and with Perez spent here in the studio, uh, we are definitely looking for possibilities to protect permanently the, the rainforest and to be hand by hand with indigenous people, the Achuar people in the Pastaza region in Ecuador, to see how we can um, become like a, a an indigenous-led uh, project that will be able to reach this uh, uh, alliances with people from the outside world, from the modern world, to really invest in what is possible to to protect the forest. So we have been um, starting like a project in the Lower Pastaza with these people, and um, finally, what we have found um, an, an opportunity to stop the forestation. There, there has been a, a huge forest happening after the COVID, the pandemic in that area. The balsa wood was really affecting that a, a large coverage of this forest. And the people from the community say, no, we want to be in the front lines. We don't want to do deforestation in this area, but we choose for life, for life in, in not just for humans, but also for all the species living in this place. And nowadays they have become uh, coming out with this project that Perespen will tell you more about. So yes, good news. Good news from the Pastaza lower region, from the Achuar territory. We are creating a new possibility that Perry is going to tell you more. So Pat, maybe you could talk a little bit about what is this? I mean, there are lots of kinds of finance that can, can flow into the Amazon. There's been many people trying with carbon offsets and, you know, voluntary carbon markets, many other things. What's special about what you're doing with, with uh, the foundation, Pachamama? So, the special thing is that uh, carbon offsets and carbon credits doesn't work in this area. And right now there is a road being planned coming downwards from the Andes going eastward all the way into Peru along this river. If that river is built, sorry, if the road is built, mm -hmm. then uh, of course um, this entire region will be deforested. But the way 
carbon credits work is that you have to do the deforestation first, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can try to stop it, but then the road is there. So this has it completely backwards. The, it's very difficult for the indigenous people to get funding for the indigenous ancestral stewardship practices at a community level. So the balsa crisis that Belen mentioned was that a road was built further way up in the river, but not further away that canoe could reach it. So suddenly canoes were coming down the river, logging along the river and giving some families cash in the hand while others did not get any and they didn't want to sell it. So there was conflicts internally in the communities. This idea is to provide payment for these ancestral stewardship practices, meaning that they say no to the road, they do not accept any logging of primary forest, legal or illegal, uh, and also report on it. So we have been working with four communities and with one pilot in a community called Sharamensa. They have now a team and they are doing quarterly reporting on all the changes in the forest. So if a satellite discovers that there has been a land use change or fire or flood or whatever, uh, maybe an aquaculture uh, that some of the families have made, then they have to go take photos, take a GPS and put it on the quarterly report. In this way, we put all that information on the blockchain in collaboration with the region network in the US. So there is full transparency. If you buy a Jaguar credit, then you know that this has protected a hectare of untouched or uh, 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 intact uh, rainforest Jaguar habitat. Aha. So what's, uh, just clear this up by the, we're talking about Jaguar, the, the wonderful cat, uh, uh, not yes. Jaguar, the car company. Um, <laughs> well, we may talk about them as well eventually. We'll about that later. They should buy, you know. Yeah, yeah. But um, so interesting. So in other words, you're basically giving money, which is uh, to support uh, the livelihoods of the indigenous people to be the eyes and ears for what is happening in this area, yeah? Correctly. Uh, and, and then they become the custodians even more of their own environment and they alert the outside world to any damage that's that's happening yes yeah so and the question is where does that information go when they upload it uh, from the, the satellite stuff it goes on to um blockchain database uh, in the cloud but uh, you can access this through the region foundation and the region marketplace region for regenerative finance mm -hmm. so uh, at least 60 to 80 percent of the funds that will come from the sale from the sales of jaguar credits will go to the indigenous communities so they are able to step up their teamwork their monitoring but also their health in the community and their own self-sufficiency because uh, there's been a growing population in some areas and that has uh, uh, made the reliance on bushmeat difficult. So in order to stop um, their, or not stop, but to take down their hunting, they will need some money to have their own chicken and their own fish, also because uh, the rivers are getting polluted from mining in the Andes. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of challenges, health, education and uh, protein that this uh, revenue from the Jaguar credits can go to serve. Mm -hmm. And to receive this money, they also have to make their plana de vida or their uh, management plan of the land. So uh, they will say, they will make their own rules about how they want to run their territory. So Charamensa, for instance, has 10,000 hectares, and this is the pilot. So we are issuing the better credits right now mm -hmm. on the ledger, on the blockchain ledger, and we're starting to upload this information, the combination of on the ground verification with remote sensing from the satellites. We're based on a scientific methodology that's been peer-reviewed, issued by the Ecosystem Regenerates Associates of, of Brazil, and um, based on the formula, on, you know, like, how are there Jaguar, are there a stable population, what's the health of the ecosystem, and how strong is the community's land management practices. This gives a score. So you, the better the, the jaguar habitat and the better the health of the ecosystem that supports it and the better the management practices, the higher the score. So right now we're issuing 75,000 of these beta, 
Jaguar Credits, who is a pilot, uh, on the blockchain for purchase by also corporate, maybe like Jaguar car company, as you mentioned, or a tequila company, for instance, that has a Jaguar brand. So we're in dialogue with Planos Altos, a B Corp certified tequila producer, that they will buy maybe the first batch of 10%. Cool. Um Tell us a little bit more about the, the area. I mean, do you think the indigenous people that you've talked to find this an interesting uh, concept uh, to be part of? Yeah, definitely. Indigenous peoples in Ecuador and in the, in the region, in the Amazon region, they are looking forward to have incomes to improve the life conditions, the livelihoods. And in order to do that, the way that they have been Pr uh, pr protecting the forest is one way to look for this solution. So the people in the ground are looking for have um, training in order to do the monitoring of the carbon, of the biodiversity, to also include the knowledge that they have into these methodologies to share and spread the, 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 the message to the world that the Amazon is really a bioma that is protecting the life in, in all the earth. So it's very important to have all these youth and the kids from the Sharamensa community and the Lower Pastaza engaging and to be so much in love with this project because they what they need in the territory is to improve their health conditions, the education conditions, their transportation, that in, in, in a way the government cannot um, give this to the, the community. So they are looking forward to, to bring these alliances from the outside world to really change the conditions of their lives in this moment. Mm. Because if we don't do that as a, as a government of Ecuador, if we don't do that in, in the whole region, it's very difficult that the indigenous leaders are still in these front lines defending the territory because they have been doing this for so long, for 20 years, defending, resisting from extractive industries, for, from oil industries, from mining, from illegal logging, from all the illegalities. Mm. And they are suffering, but they, they have so much to share to the world in this mm. moment that is so challenging, the climate change conditions. Tell me, just quickly, uh, because we've only got two minutes left. So if, if you're a company uh, watching this show, for example, or if you are a rich individual or a foundation, uh, whatever, and, and you, you, you're interested in, in investing in, in this uh, project, where do you go to... Do you go to the foundation Pachamama? Uh, or do you go to the region network marketplace on the web? Region network marketplace. Yeah, and that's where you find the project. Regen, R-E-G-E-N. Correct. Yeah, Regen. Okay. Regen yeah. market. Place. Exactly. And I want to stress that these are not offsets. So it's not the issue of, you know, uh, shoot 10 orangutans somewhere else and then buy five Jaguar credits. Uh, it's not this kind of balancing game where you have a net positive. This is for companies that are already taking action to become more sustainable and in addition want to support the transition to a nature positive economy. In addition, it can also provide a good um, help to the marketing. If you are relying on, let's say, the Jaguar to sell shoes or tequila or cars, then of course you should care about the Jaguar in the real world. Otherwise, you're just exploiting yeah. its very powerful and, and image. The, ja the Jaguar is, is, is the kind of um, emblematic uh, symbol here, but we're talking about huge quantities of other animals and plants. That's the point. Over. You see, the Jaguar is an umbrella species, yeah. meaning that if there's a healthy Jaguar, population, then the entire ecosystem below it is also healthy. So there are uh, deer, there are rodents, there are monkeys, because if the forest starts to, to, to break apart, the first thing to move is the jaguar. Sure. So what you need is to support the whole ecosystem, and the jaguar is a way of kind of monitoring that, quite simply by trail cameras, tracks, and also uh, scat uh, analysis. Well, look, um, thank you very much indeed uh, for being here. It sounds like a really creative project, uh, and I really hope that you get the, the kind of backing that you need to make this really, really work. Fantastic that you've come all the way here to Dubai, uh, Berlin, and uh, and I'd love to see you again, of course, Nachi Per Epson. Um, with that, we have to go back to the studio in uh, Stockholm. Uh, Katerina, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. It's now my pleasure to introduce another guest in the, in the studio here in Stockholm, Mats Pellbeck Sharp. He's head of sustainability at Ericsson, and it's wonderful to see you here, Mats. And Ingmar is also with us in this, sec in this session. Uh, so some reflections from you, starting with you, Mats, uh, from what they spoke about, uh, um, Belén Pérez and um, Per Espen, please. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here again. So, so uh, I think that... Um, 
it's super interesting the development that are now happening in in the area of of sort of protection of, of uh, wildlife and, and and forestry and so on so i think uh, from ericsson we we started already several years back with planting mangroves as more like an employee engagement project but the interesting part is that we use technology and we have used technology for many years first to secure that, that the sapling survived with the IoT solutions, so connecting the mangroves, as you say. And, and we increased the survival rate from 40 to 75 percent, uh, just by sort of measuring salinity and, and humidity and so on. And then now, the interesting part is that now that sort of we have sort of planted, there is no more space to plant. So uh, we have gone over to, to uh, watch and, and, and protect these forests. So also looking at the biodiversity and, and uh, looking at, with AI and machine learning, looking at what's, what birds are going into this forestry, because that's a very good sign of, of the rest of, of the biodiversity in the area. And, and that is uh, then because the birds eat other things and then you see by, by uh, finding the birds, then you can see what, what other types of species are there. So, so a very interesting program. And now we are moving into to providing this more as, as a service or free uh, for, for others to sort of use this technology, the AI and machine learning algorithms to find the birds. This is very cool indeed. Ima, we don't have time, it's all about engaging people. And what Bill and Pais and Perespin spoke of in this session here was empowering the indigenous people to protect their own land and also uploading the information into the cloud and, and using blockchain. So what are, what are your reflections on, on the empowerment here of uh, people using digital tools? I, 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 think, I think the best strategy is to make the people that are affected be the people that are get, get working on the get empower them to work on the solutions. But there's one thing we need in order to do that, and that's money. Uh, and I think it's very unfortunate that we have now. I mean, it's good that we finally maybe going to have a damage fund, but we should not really need to pay for the damage. Instead, we should funnel the money to work on solutions so we don't get the damage. Uh, and it's not about only about you know, facing out fossil fuel and get emission down, it's also that we need to protect nature and we need to get nature back on track. And I think we can use technology for that uh, extremely good. Uh, we have so much technology that we can apply for this. I mean, one example is that the world is heating up, so the forests are burning everywhere. Why don't we have a global UN-led fire watch for forests with satellites and emergency response and, and fix the fire before it spread? That's just one thing. And uh, if you take the agriculture today, we use so much poison to, to kill, uh, kill you know, what we don't want to grow, uh, but we kill everything else as well. So why don't we use tech to just kill the thing we don't want and have everything else to be healthy. There is technology out there to do that, but it's lack of money. Everyone is talking about we need nature-based solutions. The thing is, there is no money for it. It's on, it's on positive examples, yes, for sure, but, but it's not a business that can scale if it's not profitability to do it. So we need to have money for this. Uh, and there is a return of investment, but it will take time. So we need, we really need governments to step in and, and pay for this. And we also need companies to pay for this. Mats, do you agree? Is there a lack of money here? And then if, if there is lack of money, <coughs> how, do we, how do we fix this? I mean, governments, uh, companies? Yeah, I think there are two sides of that. W one is, of course, that, that we need to get some sort of funds going and so on. But I think for it to be completely sustainable, uh, it needs to be supporting the livelihood of the people that are living in the forest. And I don't think sort of a complete stop to, to, to cutting forest uh, would help. I, I think, I mean, with technology, it can be extremely precise in, in sort of cutting down one tree or so. And, and, and for a small population, that might be money enough. And that will not hurt because they're falling down anyway. So I think if you're very, very sort of uh, selective and uh, controlled in the way that you drive forestry, for instance, then that could be a good thing uh, still, I think, for, for the environment. So I think there is sort of room to sort of get the business going around it. And also we see with the, with the mangroves that thanks to getting the mangroves back really fast, you also get sort of the, the, the sea life, the fish, the, the, the shrimps and everything else. 
and and sort of harvesting that in in sort of also a controlled way in in a sustainable way uh, is a way to sort of get more money into the system so i think there are opportunities to 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 create a business rather than just uh, having a reliance on donations and, and sponsorships or other people paying and i think that is from my perspective the only way to get the true long-term solution is really to get some sort of business going and, and, and sort of tu tourism uh, could be another part of it. So I think creating uh, business models that work, I think, is, is the long-term solution rather than just uh, relying on donations or, or philanthropy or other funds. And that's what I mean. We, we can't have this as a good cause donation thing. We need to have it as a business model. But as long as it's, it's uh, more profitable to chop all the trees down, uh, most people will do that. So we, we need to balance it. And I think we have a good system uh, for fossil fuel. We are giving the fossil fuel industry 7 trillion US dollars. Oh, because subsidize yeah, them. Subsidize. So we can use some of those subsidies to subsidize what you were talking about instead. So that, that will become the profitable. But we can't have it as a donation. We must have it as something that are thriving, that are using the business. And, and we can do that. We, just, we need to make it profitable to do the right thing. And we need some system to make that happen. But once we have that system in place, I don't, need, I don't think we will need to subsidize it forever. And, and I think also the same tools that we are using for for uh, finding out what birds that are in the mangroves. We have also worked with, with the, the environmental uh, agency in Philippines to sort of look at, okay, is this illegal forestry? How can we measure and using technology also to protect it, uh, protect the, the rainforest and, and other parts? So I think the solutions are available. But of course, we also need legislation because legislation helps. And we've seen what happened in Brazil. I mean, regardless of, of what Lula just did with the OPEC Plus, uh, joining OPEC Plus, he has significantly reduced the logging in the Amazon since he came into office. So, Mats, from your, from your Ericsson perspective, how important is legislation and, and the backing of, of uh, governments? Uh, I think legislation is very, very important and that levels the playing field for everybody. So if you have good regulations and legislation, uh, I mean, for us, it's in, in the telecom space, but anyway, that is super important for, for leveling the playing field. Uh, I think leading companies, the few companies that care, they will always sort of be forward leaning, go ahead and drive, and they will help the legislators by demonstrating that it's possible. And then when, when the legislators feel confident that this is possible to do, then they can put the legislation in place. Uh, and, uh, and legislation takes time, so, so I, uh, and we don't have time, right? So, so really important to, to also work with the leading companies and, and give them sort of benefits of, of driving things. So, Ingmar, how can the people that are active on, on, the, on our platform push for change in this area? So, so what we are doing here is two things. One thing is that companies in the forefront, like Ericsson, uh, it's amazing what they do. Uh, and I, it's exactly working like you said. Someone needs to go first, legalization, see that it works, and they will be comfortable to regulate it. They will never regulate anything if they don't see that someone can, can do it. Uh, so that's super important. But one thing more that is important to get that regulation to happen is to get more people to know about those solutions. And what I see today is that most people know about the climate crisis. They know about the doom and gloom and everything, and they are getting depressed and they zoom out. So what we need to do is to get those solutions out and educate not just the policymaker but also the people talking to the policymakers and everyone because there's so many solutions out there we we really can do it so that is what's happening on the wheel on time platform and it's not just we saying the solutions we have created a platform where our community when they see someone doing something they can report about that they could it's tag amplified. ericsson and they could send climate love to someone doing it and not everything is, is uh, good. So what you can also do on We Don't Time platform is to send warnings to those that are maybe saying one thing and doing the opposite. But the hopeful stuff here is that most people on our platform, our community, we have a global community in over 160 countries, are creating climate love. There's a great need uh, for a space where you can share solutions instead of only share 
all the bad news. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, well, it's not morning in Dubai, but here in the <laughs> studio in Stockholm and uh, in Ingmar, of course. Uh, and this sums up this first past session uh, this morning or today. And let's hand, back, hand it back to Dubai uh, again. But before I add it back to Dubai, I'd like to introduce the next session here from Stockholm. Here at the COP28 Climate Hub, we hear a lot of discussions on climate solutions. But how do we define what a climate solution is? What types of solutions qualify as, as climate solutions? And what companies qualify as climate solutions companies? These are questions that the Exponential Roadmap Initiative wanted to answer, together with researchers at Oxford Net Zero. Both are launching uh, principles uh, to define and qualify climate solutions and climate solutions companies. So let's head over now to Dubai and the session's host, Andrea Lindblom from the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. Thank you so much, uh, Katarina, and a very warm welcome to this session here, uh, Exponential Roadmap Initiative session on defining, qualifying and scaling climate solutions. And joining me on stage here are uh, Kaya Axelson of Ex Oxford Net Zero. She's head of policy and partnerships. We have Johan Falk, CEO of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. We have Emily Feind, British Standards Institution, Net Zero Policy Manager there. And then Masamba Tioya, Project Executive of the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. A very warm welcome. Broken record. That was the title of this year's emissions gap report that the UN Environment Program uh, presented just a, a week or so ago. And this broken record, of course, refers to the temperature and emissions records that we keep setting again in 2022. But broken record, and if you look at the cover of that report, you'll recognize that broken record is a bit of a play on words as well. And it refers to how we all sound like when we keep saying again and again how we urgently need to reduce emissions, which, of course, is true. But in this session, we'll focus on climate solutions, on solutions that, when scale, will help us drive out the fossil-based solutions that are in place today, that will help us reduce the emissions. And those solutions exist today, but they have not yet scaled. And we'll talk about what makes a climate solution such a climate solution um, and what makes a company a true climate solutions company. Um, and then we'll talk about innovation, we'll talk about standards and about scaling. So very warm welcome to this and stay tuned. Now, um, Kaya, maybe you can explain from your perspective why is there a need to even define climate solutions? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us today. One of the things that I see in the policy and standards landscape is that we've left out a really big part of the picture. We haven't incentivized companies to create climate solutions. We've mostly talked to them about reducing emissions within their inventory, which is, of course, critical. But in my perspective, companies are looking to standards and policy to set their strategic direction, and the climate movement has not incentivized them to basically use the, one of the greatest levers they have at their disposal, which is to develop products to help us get to net zero. Thank you, Kaya. And that, of course, was also the prompt for you and, and Johan to team up in this paper that Katarina already mentioned and that we're launching today um, on uh, climate solutions principles, defining and qualifying climate solutions and climate solutions companies. And by the way, that's on our website, exponentialroadmap.org. Slight little plug here. Johan, from an initiative's uh, standpoint, why is there a need to define climate solutions? Well, already 2017, based on the carbon law, the recognition that we need to halve emissions every decade, the first halving is the most essential by 2030. We stated that we need to scale up climate solutions uh, in order to shift out uh, the fossil economy. So it's incredibly important to keep the pressure on phasing out fossil fuels. So that's putting 
every pressure we can on that, but we will not succeed unless we scale up the solutions much faster, which basically shift out uh, the old economy. And it goes to both companies, the existing companies that needs to transform their complete portfolio. But it's of course all the new innovative companies that will start from a wide plate and can actually start to scale up the next generation solutions. It's also important to state that these solutions shouldn't just cut carbon and protect nature, but actually fulfill human needs. That should be our absolute mission. And I think that's a, that's a pretty good um, uh, transition here to Masama Tioye, because uh, core human needs are also at the core of your work. You work on transformative innovation. How, how does this idea of defining uh, climate solutions resonate with you and what need do you see for it? Yeah. Well, thank you. Very pleased to be here and have this opportunity to interact with you in, on this very important topic. If you want to define a concept with a systemic approach, we need to start by defining the concept through its purpose first, and then what it is made of, and finally, how it operates. If you take the case of solution for climate and sustainability, and we ask the question, what is the purpose of the solution? You will realize that it's not pure decarbonization, because pure decarbonization um, as an objective is not mindful, because you can, you, can, you can, for example, cut energy for everybody and say only 10% of the people will have access to energy, and I have reduced my emission. I don't think that this is what we mean by our objective. So what we want is to have well-being provided to the many people in a healthy planet. This is the purpose. So this is why it's very important to go back to the core human needs and also have an innovation framework that is not based on product push approach, where you develop a solution and then you look for use case. Mm -hmm. You need to have a demand-driven approach where you start from the core human need, define what are the needs, and look for solution. And finally, we need to have an integrated approach. When people say we have solution, but they are yet to be deployed at scale, it means that in fact, they are not solution because a solution should be ready for upscale deployment. And how is it like that? This is because when we say solution, we mean only technology. And actually it has to be a um, combination of innovative technology, innovative policy instrument, innovative financial instrument, innovative business model, innovative cooperative approach because radical collaboration is needed, and innovative product from the culture and creative industry because sometimes you can develop a good product, but people just do not like it. So it has to be adop adopted. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, I think there's a lot that connects to, to the paper and, and points that are raised in the paper as well. But I'd now uh, like to bring up a, a graphic on the, uh, on the screen, and uh, we are not going to see that very well here, sitting here. But this uh, graphic that our audience uh, can see, um, that shows a model for governing net zero. And that um, model is developed by a colleague of Kaya's here, uh, Professor Tom Hale at the University of Oxford. It's the Conveyor belt, and we see climate solutions principles at the very left end of this conveyor belt in the early stages of ideation, of experimentation, and at the right end there, uh, further, we see as, as ideas move along the conveyor belt, we see standards and regulation. So, Emily, from a standards perspective, then, how can defining climate solutions help uh, in terms of standards and developing standards? Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, absolutely, I don't need to see the conveyor belt model. I think I have it committed to memory at this point, as many of us do at, at BSI. Um, from a standards perspective, we're really about implementation and scaling. So the comments from my, my co-panelists really reflect um, the level of consensus and ambition and innovation that the, exists in the net zero governance landscape. And the definitions that we see in the Climate Solutions paper just show that we have a framework, we know what good looks like. The next step now is to scale it. 
As a conveyor belt model sets out, we can't scale purely through advocacy alone. The role of ambitious non-state actors, voluntary initiatives and NGOs is to really drive that ambition, that thought leadership and innovation. But it's crucial that this criteria is reflected in the development of recognised international standards. International standards form a really critical part of the global governance landscape and are already set up to connect to policy and regulatory frameworks that exist all over the world. This is a system called global quality infrastructure that we actually all live and work in every day. It's the reason that we trust the food we eat, the products we buy, the quality is already assessed and managed through the existence of international standards, accreditation, conformity assessment and metrology. So the key message here is, if you are a climate solutions developer, if you aspire to be a climate solutions company, make sure that that criteria is reflected in the international standards that are going to underpin the global economy. Because that's how, as the conveyor belt model sets out, we can see that really productive ratcheting up of ambition, of innovation, of criteria to help fill those core human needs. So I do think that we've established that there is a need to define climate solutions. Now I'd, I'd be interested to know what it is that makes a climate solution. So how do you define it, Kaya? So at the core of what a climate solution needs to be is the climate science. And so the first thing we have to do is think about the emissions reductions per unit being in line with the carbon law, which is a 50% reduction at a minimum by 2030. So we're setting a high bar here. The point is to incentivize radical and strong action by businesses to mobilize businesses to innovate in line with the climate science and what we know we need to do to bring down temperatures. Another way to define a climate solution would be to say the primary use of this product is to help reduce emissions in society. So it doesn't have other uses. It is replacing high carbon or intensive processes or products. The third way to think about a climate solution is to meet a threshold of emissions low enough to be in line with net zero pathways, global net zero pathways, the IEA pathways, for example. Another thing that we think about is the safeguards we need to put around the definition of a climate solution. You can imagine companies wanting to run rampant, defining what they're doing as a climate solution. It's a very attractive claim. But of course, there are certain things that we would say are not important to be defined as climate solutions. For example, luxury products, things that are not really in line with human needs. We need to think about reducing the use of some products. Uh, for example, a luxury yacht might not be within scope. Other things that help drive up the use of fossil fuels might not be within scope. And also similarly, things that draw too much uh, on nature that could be reducing biodiversity net gain or you know, reducing biodiversity. Those would not be within the scope of a climate solution. Thanks, Kaya. You, Yuan, can you add anything there on examples? Because now we've heard what's not a climate solution. What is a climate solution? What ticks okay, the we box? Can, yeah, okay, we can, we can take an example. So we can start with steel, for example. If you can produce steel with a radically lower emissions, for example, like minus 90%, that could pass one bar but it's not sufficient of course as you said there are certain guardrails no uh, serious impact on on nature is essential and it's also how it's applied uh, in the value chain basically how it is produced but also that it's contributing to the global net zero as a product so that could be one example if you're looking at um, an electrical vehicle, could that qualify? Well, potentially in the short term, uh, but it's not sufficient just to say we have an electrical vehicle. We have to look at how we fulfill the need of mobility for all people on the planet. But it could be a component to that. So let's assume the electrical car is produced in a completely circular way with fossil free material. This is run on electrical renewable energy that is built to be shared, not parked 95% of the time, and is part of a mobility as a service. So it's combined with public transportation, but just a small vehicle in that. That should be the scenario, but it could still qualify in the first step. But I would say in five years, it has to definitely be part of that uh, complete chain. So these were two examples how you could apply it. Thanks. And I think, Masamba, you also have some thinking there on short term versus long term and how that makes a difference. For yeah, I think it's all about how do we prioritize. Uh, as it was mentioned, lifestyle is a very important component 
Um, we need first to look at solution that can uh, uh, enable change in lifestyle so that some of the things that have a high level of negative externality and that are used uh, currently, people do not want anymore to use them and would like to shift to something else. That's the first thing that needs to be done. And uh, where we do not have change of lifestyle possible, we need to find alternative product, who's a product that have high level of negative externality. And uh, at that point, it will be very important to leverage digital technology because they are very, very good in disrupting product. And if you are not able to disrupt product with high level of negative externality, then you enhance the efficiency of use. Car sharing is, for example, an example. And if you cannot do that, then you enhance the circularity. And only after all these things are explored, then you can come back to the negative externality and say, okay, I cannot change my lifestyle. I cannot disrupt the product. I cannot enhance the efficiency of use. I cannot enhance the circularity. Let me then try to reduce the level of negative externality. This is what we call emission reduction. If you see, emission reduction is the last step in this hierarchy, mm. yet everything is currently focusing on emission reduction. And that's the problem. And when you touch on, on lifestyles, I would imagine that there is a connection there to standards as well, right? Because uh, lifestyles to some extent, or, or how, how I lead my life, there's a lot of standards in that that I need to adjust to as, as a consumer. But coming from where we are now, from uh, you know this idea of ventilating some ideas around defining climate solutions to a standard, that, that seems a pretty long way along that com conveyor belt. What would the next steps need to be from from this idea to becoming a standard? Emily. Great question. So I think when we talk about taking practical steps to scaling the, the definitions of climate solutions to standards, we have to look at the standards landscape as it is. So research from the University of Oxford shows that there's actually a huge amount of convergence and alignment around the standards we're seeing in the landscape, but we are not quite there yet. And without a clear standards landscape, it's harder to scale to that policy and regulatory framework that supports businesses to become uh, climate solution providers and, and reduce their emissions. So we need to look at this from two ways. One, what standards don't exist in the first place that need to be created? An example could be a climate solution standard, where we need to leverage the thought leadership, the innovation, the criteria defined in a paper like this, and develop this into a scope for a standard. This is then developed through a consensus building process in the international standard system with global input from experts all over the world. Uh, this is something that, as you say, and Andrea, can take years, but actually we are seeing examples of much faster paced work in the standard system, such as the work of the ISO Net Zero Guidelines that was convened by BSI last year and launched at COP27 after just six months of work. When we recognize urgent market needs like climate solutions, like concepts like net zero, it is possible to convene processes that develop a clear framework for taking action right now that can be used by companies right now and can still form a basis for formal recognized international standards later. Another point that we should reflect is that there are many existing standards that may need to be revised in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement and to reflect the urgent needs of climate solutions. Uh, and that's why um, BSI has done a lot of work in the ISO system, uh, the ISO climate commitment known as the London Declaration, which is a commitment made to look at the entire landscape of international and national standards and revise those that need to be revised to bring them in line with the Paris Agreement. So there's a huge amount of work going on in the standards world, which is really exciting. Uh, and something that I'll come on to later is really just a call to action to make sure that, again, if you are a climate solutions provider, if you are an expert in this space, make sure you are engaging with the standards world because this is how we truly scale these solutions quickly and at a global level. And that call to action would probably or might might go to the companies, right? And we haven't talked about the companies yet. We've talked about the uh, the, the criteria for climate solutions and not yet the ones for, for uh, companies that would make a company a climate solution solutions company. Uh, what, what would make a company a climate solutions company, Yuan or Kaya? Yeah, we basically suggested on something we are applying as part of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative because we're actually 
implementing the principles to get concrete feedback in the front line, just, just to be clear on that, because we need absolute real feedback from companies and onboarding companies uh, being prepared to adjust, adjust these criteria, of course, but we state that at least 90% of the revenues should fall into that category and then the number of basic requirements, of course, in terms of having basic halving requirements, net zero targets and transition plans, etc. So that is basically what we are applying for companies. It's a ground rule. Yes. Just one short follow-up there. There might not be that many companies that, that qualify yet under these criteria. What do, what do they do? Well, one example could be, which we did qualify according to our existing criteria after an assessment, would be H2 Green Steel. And so it's not just that they will provide steel with 90% less carbon, but they fulfill a number of uh, additional requirements. That could be one alternative. Uh, one example, but you could also see companies which have an absolute purpose of helping others to avoid or reduce emissions, like an AI services companies specifically driving efficiency in energy, for example, driving up energy efficiency or cutting the time from decision to impact in implementation of renewable energy. That could be another example. But then that, that their absolute purpose will be uh, connected to, uh, to the climate mission. And so it helps the companies that don't take the box yet to, to transform, right? To know what they would be transforming yeah. to. So, so let's comment on that as well, because we have what we call transformative companies who basically have an unsustainable business model, which is not aligned with the 1.5 future. The first realization is that they need to realize that. And they can't just transform on their own. This is a challenge, basically. It's about the complete value chain and they're part of a value chain. So they must work together with the next you know, generation providers as well as customers to be able to achieve that. And we believe it's really important that companies can start to set targets and key performance indicators also on scaling up climate solutions. So far, we only focused on you know, science-based targets to cut emissions. So we need to be able to have indicators to actually shift the portfolio uh, before 2030 to solutions which are aligned with 1.5. So that is also really important. Now, Kaya, I find it almost unusual that researchers would be concerned with uh, defining, uh, uh, coming up with definitions for what makes a climate solutions company a climate solutions company. From what, what piqued your interest in doing that? To be honest, it's talking to companies, it's talking to entrepreneurs from the global south, it's talking to people who have innovation in their blood, who want to be building things that can be part of the greatest economic transition of our time. And it's about that wholesale change, understanding that we can't negotiate with nature and the climate, that if you want to be a part of this moment in history, you have to have a wholesale transition in your business model. And I think from a research perspective, understanding that climate and net zero is a transition that you have to make globally as a 100% transition. We have to be 100% net zero. We can't be sort of partway there. Um, that's something that we feel it must be translated into business practice. And so I'm so thrilled that we have this opportunity to see where purpose and impact meet business opportunity. And we can bring in those perspectives from developing parts of the world who want to be, who want to see the business opportunity in climate work and not just see it as a burden. And it really is an opportunity and we've failed to frame it that way in the policy and standards landscape. So this is, we see as our, our research uh, responsibility. Thank you um, so much, Kaya. And now that we've talked about uh, defining climate solutions, climate solutions companies and qualifying them, now we get to the difficult part, the scaling, right? What are your thoughts, Masamba, on, on what it takes to now, from this point where we're now, to actually scale climate solutions? If you want to scale a climate solution, we need to have an integrative approach. As I have mentioned previously, one of the main barriers to upscaling is the fact that we are focusing only on some of the dimension of innovation. We develop an innovative technology, but we do not have the right policy instruments. 
or we do not have the right financial instrument. Currently, the cost of um, countries like Namibia are able to produce very low cost clean hydrogen. But the interest rate in these countries is more than 15%. Mm -hmm. We need to come up with innovative financing in instrument. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will not be able to mobilize the potential mm -hmm. that the technology is provided. So having a holistic approach where you consider a solution as a cluster, where you will have the right uh, innovative technology, the right policy instrument, the right innovative financial instrument, cooperative approach, product from the culture and creative industry is what will make the product, the cluster, ready for upscaling. Thanks. And I, we uh, need to begin to start wrapping up the session. So I'm asking you for a slightly uh, shorter answer there, maybe in a 30 second pitch, the one thing that you or your organization can do to help scale climate solutions. Emily. 30 second pitch. If I could give one call to action for those of you watching, it would be to engage with your national standards body like BSI in the UK and our 169 counterparts about around the world and ask to join your climate standards committee. Climate solutions are developed by us and must have global input to ensure we have a just transition and, uh, to net zero and a resilient one too. We already have the infrastructure to develop these solutions and to scale them and implement them through standards. Make sure you are in the room. Thanks, Emily. Kaya, the one thing that your organization do to help scale climate solutions? My organization is interested in putting forward the research that helps expand the window of opportunity on what we know is possible. And what we know is possible is that climate solutions are at our fingertips and have the opportunity to be scaled from niche regimes into whole economy-wide adaptation and, and climate mitigation. So uh, we can do this, we will do this, and we don't have time. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sure that was appreciated, huh? We don't have time. Mm. Johan, just one That's thing. Basically Basically three things. It's no, like, just one. <laughs> I combine that. The first is, of course, practically onboarding really, really good companies and testing this practically and to giving them recognition as part of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. And then, of course, working with peers to help define the principles as we're doing today. And the third one is basically to help shaping the narrative of a race to the top, the next COP and the COP after that, that is basically not about sharing burdens only, which is essential, but it's actually about creating this race to the top between companies, countries, regions, cities to be on the top in terms of scaling climate solutions. So that's what we're really keen on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Masamba, um, and for, for joining the session on, on defining, qualifying and scaling climate solutions. And the paper that we mentioned, Climate Solutions Principles, Defining and Qualifying Climate Solutions and Climate Solutions Companies, that is online, exponentialroadmap.org slash climate dash solutions. You can find it there on our website for download. And there's also a consultation because we'd really like to hear your insights and your views on, on defining climate solutions. So make sure to scroll down right to the end of the bottom and you'll find the link to the consultation there. And that is open until the 31st of January. So we're looking very much forward to that. Um, for now, that's, that's it from this exponential roadmap session at the We Don't Have Time COP28 Climate Hub. We'll be back tomorrow. Do stay tuned for what's coming here next with Katarina. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. Yet another great session from the exponential roadmap session in, in Dubai. And let's now move on to a new topic. Today, December 3rd, is the Relief, Recovery and Peace Day at COP28. And this is what we will focus on in this next session. Gender equality, climate change, peace and security are inextricably linked. 
Nearly one billion people live in countries most vulnerable to climate change. And 40% of them are also grappling with high levels of conflict and violence, and also with low levels of women's inclusion, participation and security. However, countries that prioritize gender equality often exhibit greater resilience to climate change and other threats to peace and sustainable development. Yet in Asia and in the Pacific, uh, as we are on the halfway mark of the 2030 agenda, there's been a regression on climate action, while the progress on gender equality and peace is hindered by insufficient data. This context demands a swifter, more decisive and transformative action across climate, gender equality and peace, enabled by integrated policy frameworks and programmatic interventions. It is time to illuminate the critical interconnections between gender equality, peace and climate resilience. And we will do so by showcasing the leadership of women at the forefront of peace and resilience. So over now to my dear colleague Nick in Dubai. Katerina, yeah, thanks very much indeed. Uh, and this is a special day, a historic day, as you, as you mentioned, with these, uh, these agendas uh, coming together uh, at the, uh, the COP here in uh, Dubai. Um, I'm joined by uh, two wonderful guests, and we may be joined by a third wonderful guest, uh, 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 who is perhaps on his way. Um, I have Rufa Kukoko Guam Guiam. There we go. Peace builder and transitional justice negotiator, and founder of a women's uh, CSO from the Bangsa Autonomous Region in Muslim, perfect, in the Philippines. Um, Raise that microphone, by the way, closer to your mouth. There we go. And you've got a microphone there. When you're speaking, keep it quite close to the mouth. Yeah. Mm. And we've got uh, Agata uh, Valchuk, yeah, who's gender and climate security specialist at UN Women's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. And she is responsible for the development of programs and strategies at the intersection of women, peace and security and climate change. Um, Maybe we could come to you first. Your work in, in the Philippines uh, paints a vivid picture of women being far from passive uh, uh, victims. They're actually shaping their community's resilience to climate change and conflict. Um, can you tell us a little more about why this is so important, why it's important for governments, the development communities, the private sector, civil society to invest in women in order to deal with climate change and reduce the risk of, of conflict. Okay. First of all, assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace from where I come from, in a place which is always bothered by armed conflict, armed violence. Uh, I'd like to cite the uh, describe the context I come from. For five decades or more, uh, the region has been ravaged by uh, armed, violent armed conflict, and now, because of climate change, extreme weather events, people are reeling from the effects, the con adversarial effects of both climate change and armed conflict. And it's the women who are leading, who are leading efforts in making themselves asserting agency in uh, finding solutions to the problems they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's the women who are initiating efforts to access assistance, for example, and to find ways how to address food insecurity, which is uh, extremely felt in that region where poverty levels are quite high, higher than the national average. And they're also the first in line to come up with uh, some platforms for action in the recently uh, finished uh, regional action plan for women, peace and security, where climate change effects are uh, recognized as a threat multiplier to what they're experiencing now. Mm -hmm. And so in that uh, regard, I am doing research that goes into the intersections of gender inequality is so i believe that when a society has severe gender unequal relations 
it will make a society more vulnerable to the effects of climate change and mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you recognize the capacities of women and support them so that they won't have to uh, bear the sole burden of uh, taking care of their communities and of their families in times of disasters, then it would be a more uh, peaceful society they have. So it will create more opportunities for people to become uh, collaborative with each other rather than competitive. And so it will lead ultimately to uh, finding durable solutions to the uh, persistent problems of armed conflict and uh, preventing or mitigating the effects of uh, extreme weather events associated with climate change. Is it, is it, a, is it a, a wrong statement or a bold statement? Um, oh, we have our other guests with us. Hello, Hello. do come in. Is it is, is there a false statement or a grand statement that, that women seem to intellectually and emotionally under, cooperate much more on these challenges? Uh, the men tend to maybe be a bit different in the way that they operate. Is, is there a difference in the genders in terms of how women bring more peace and stability to a community? I, I don't want to overdo this, but I want to just understand and the public to understand. Yes. Women have a special role. You know? Yes. Uh, I think it stems from the fact that they are expected more to be nurturing or mm -hmm taking care of their children and of the wider community as well. And that's a stereotypical role that they have to play. And most women perform that role and even over and above other duties that they are uh, given. For example, in many families where the men are absent because they are either conscripted to take part in the war or have become uh, or were killed in armed violence, it's the women who both do the productive and reproductive roles at the same time, navigating through spaces where the men used to, to occupy before. But they are at the same time required to do more than that, uh, to make their families safe and to keep the whole community, uh, I mean, uh, uh, working together so that they will survive in as many of these communities I work in are quite impoverished. Mm -hmm. uh, they have no access. They are both geographically and politically distant from the centers of power in the region. And so many times assistance do not reach them. So they are the ones looking for solutions within their locality, within their families, find ways and means whatever they are in order to survive. So. This is something that we need to look at so that we can support them to upskill them or upscale their interventions at the family level okay. to, to a wider community. Got that point. I, well, I'm coming to you, Agatha, right now because, I mean, building uh, on Rufa's insights, I was going to ask you how integrating gender considerations, uh, climate action and peace building can practically enhance the work uh, of, of practitioners uh, and, and like Rufa. Uh, Thanks, Nick. Important. Yeah, let me start with a bit of a context. And yeah. that's referring back to what you said about this conversation happening on the historical day when the COP for the very first time in history features a dedicated day uh, on the interlinkages between climate change and peace. And, and to put it in a context, historically, the sectors and policies that we've relied on when dealing with issues of peace and security uh, have failed to include gender in terms of approaches and operations, have failed to respond to the particular vulnerabilities that, that Rufa has been speaking about, but also in terms of empowering the, the leadership of women within communities, have failed to include women and have been traditionally male-dominated, and that's the security sector and security policies. Now, the challenges, the peace and security challenges that climate change presents are very different security challenges. They make us reimagine security, in fact. We know that climate change um, 
exacerbates conflict. We know that delivering climate action in places experiencing violence is ever more challenging. But in Asia and the Pacific, where I work, and in many other places around the world, we are seeing impacts across the broad spectrum of human security. We are uh, seeing, uh, you know, the global food security crisis. We are seeing impacts on on health. We are seeing catastrophic impacts on people's lives and livelihoods. All the things that make us as individuals and communities redefine what peace and security mean to us. Uh, now. Historically, we've had very little alternative to the securitized approaches, and we know these are not fit for purpose for addressing what it is that we are dealing with, the existential threat that we are dealing with, with here. Now, I think the only viable alternative we've seen is that coming from women that Rufa was just what, talking about, women in communities, developing strategies and solutions that address the needs and vulnerabilities of people. Uh, the things that make us vulnerable to conflict and, and the climate crisis alike. Mm. Um, and the global women's movement that has been precisely advocating for amplifying uh, that, that leadership of women within, within communities. Mm. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's critical. I mean, it's part of this conversation on climate peace and security that we realize a big part of it is about empowering and, and including women. Now, the good news is, we do have an established policy framework that can guide us in what exactly that might mean and how exactly we can do it in a way that will make the most difference to the, the communities impacted first and most. And that is the Women, Peace and Security Agenda that started 20 years ago with civil society organizations going to the Security Council and advocating for greater participation of women in peace negotiations. But over the last 20 years, um, is evolved to a framework advocating for that participation across a spectrum of peace and security issues, including mm. climate change. Mm. Um, um, yeah, let me, I've been talking for a while. Yeah, yeah, so I might I'll, I'll Dan in a second. Yeah. Talk more yeah. About yeah. That. No, we can come back to that. Yeah. Uh, Dan, uh, great that you made it. Uh, Dan Smith, director of the um, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. It's an independent international institute de dedicated to research into conflict, armaments, arms control, and disarmament. Um, some people would say uh, runaway climate change is, is, is almost like being in the middle of a conflict uh, on a, an everyday basis. Um, where do you see this um, nexus here of gender, peace, and security? Um, it was very interesting because the deputy director of um, the deputy executive director of UN Women this morning in a side event was saying that, that there is evidence that when women are involved in these these tense situations, that they can actually reduce, uh, in a sense, or increase the the chances of some kind of landing space that, 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 that is less risky than when men are just fully involved in it. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, thanks, and sorry for being late. I no, don't worry about it. <laughs> getting my daily exercise by being lost in the, mar uh, in the maze of COP28. Um, there is, there's a great deal of evidence which shows at different levels that if, you, uh, if one excludes women from a process if, uh, to try to find peace or reconciliation or even just marginally manage a, a violent conflict, you are going to be less successful at it than if you include women in the process. I think there's two reasons for that. One is that it doesn't make sense to exclude half a society from uh, important actions like trying to bring peace. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is what you were asking about earlier, that there is something particular, it seems to me, as far as I can judge from the evidence, that women bring uh, into those situations. And that is, with exceptions on, on both genders and making a wild generalization, mm -hmm. women tend to be less invested in prestige than men. Now, there are women, of course, who are highly invested in prestige, <laughs> and there are men who are kind of selfless. But I think, on average, statistically, you find, therefore, that women bring in a more community sense, a more social sense of the enterprise that they're engaged in. It'll be less about advantage. It'll be more about solving a, a shared problem. Uh, and I think that you see this in lots of different walks of life as, as well. I think the other thing sort of worth commenting on is uh, Agatha was saying we need to reimagine security. I think that's absolutely right. I think that the Ukraine war tells us don't forget the issues which are bound up in national security. 
Uh, the food security crisis and the health crisis says don't forget the issues which are bound up in human security and climate change and the rest of the profound ecological crisis that we are facing today tell us don't ignore the issues which we capture under the heading of ecological security. So if you were to imagine a good government, a good state, what would it be doing? It would be trying to protect the population from external threats of violence, from internal inequalities, injustice, hunger, and immiseration, and from the consequences of ecological disruption. Mm -hmm. So a good security policy addresses all three areas of security mm. in, a, in a single security sphere. And I think that is the way that we need to move forward. And that's why I kind of personally celebrate uh, this is okay, this is just one day at COP, but it is bringing these different big issues mm. together in mm. one, where I think they need to be. A question maybe to everybody, and this is flipping it into a different dimension, but um, I mean, I worked uh, for UNEP, uh, the UN Environment Programme, for 13 years, and there was some work on linking uh, the uh, extraordinary creativity of women as agents of solving the climate crisis or adapting to the climate crisis, whether it be that they, they, they understood very, very quickly, for example, um, how you can have more um, eco-friendly agricultural systems, for example. They understood in parts of Africa that, that, that rainwater harvesting was a good idea, whereas the men couldn't really work this one out. And um, they also were wonderful entrepreneurs. And I mentioned this this morning, I think vaguely, uh, that in Burundi and Rwanda, you had uh, these door-to-door, -door, literally door-to-door -door women selling solar uh, uh, products so they could light up the, the houses and the children could then be, be better educated. So there seemed to be something also in the entrepreneurial qualities of women in terms of coming up with the things that solve the climate crisis and therefore hopefully also reduce conflict by reducing the threats of climate change. Is this, does this echo with your evidence as well? Uh, yes, in my region is the women who, who are very resourceful in looking for localized solutions to the problems they face, whereas their men would try to engage, you know, international donors to help them. But women are more uh, inward looking, looking at their own resources. And that's why we need to factor in, uh, in our capacity building efforts to ask or to assess what capacities women already have so that you build, you build on those capacities to enhance their skills, to, to widen their uh, abilities to help fellow women and all the rest of the community cope with challenges mm. uh, brought about by climate change events like flooding and droughts, which we experience very often in our region. Mm. So that's one of mm -hmm. the things I've okay. thought about. Nick, what I picked up on is what you started with, and that is how many years UNEP has been working on these things, how many years we've had a dedicated gender day here at the yeah. COP. Um, that's now happening uh, in the very first segment on the COP, so we are definitely seeing these issues elevated. But we've long known countless examples of how women's resilience is critical to the resilience of communities and societies at large, because the sectors that are most vulnerable are, uh, you know, overrepresented by women because of their critical roles and knowledge of communities and natural resources. And yet what we are seeing is this existential crisis of climate change and the global crisis of insecurity happening at the same time as the crisis of inequality. The world is failing women. Mm. Uh, we know that women's organizations that RUFA, that UN Women uh, work with uh, on the ground are drastically underfunded and the funding is plateauing. It's not mm. increasing nearly uh, fast enough to mm. empower that leadership. We know that the civic space for the activity of these civil society organizations is shrinking. And we know that violence against the women who defend the environment, who defend climate, is drastically on the rise. And, and we cannot afford this. I mean, you know, we are talking about the climate crisis being a security crisis. It's not something that can be resolved in a few months, in a few years. We need to act now.
and it's a systemic issue, right? That's impacting what Dan was saying, every area of human development. Mm. And we have no template on how to respond to these, these systemic issues. Can we rely on the small group of people here at the COP to solve a systemic issue like that? We, can, we cannot. And it's often yeah. the young people and the women who come to the table with the most innovative solutions. Just before joining uh, you at the studio, I was attending the launch of the Declaration on Peace, Resilience, and Recovery and Climate. And it's the young person on the panel that was speaking about young people in Yemen, bringing together all stakeholders and talking about the long-term climate perspective and not just the, the food security crisis. Being able to convene like no other, like no other group. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we, we right. have no excuse. What you've, what you've done is, what we're illuminating here in this session is just another absurdity of the world in which yeah. we live, right? I mean, how can we be uh, uh, funding, uh, subsidizing fossil fuels to the tune of one trillion uh, dollars a year? Uh, it's like uh, dinosaurs uh, subsidizing uh, incoming uh, comets. Uh, I mean, it's, it's mad. There's so many crazy things we need to fix, but this one is fundamental because it seems to be that, as you said right at the beginning, you know, this is half the population being cut out of the decision-making yeah. process about the whole future of our world. And this cannot be right, right? Especially when the evidence, as you rightly have all pointed out, indicates that women actually are agents of positive change. So, you know, uh, I mean, any thoughts on this? What, what do we need to do? We need to start getting some money to people yeah. like Rufa here and her people uh, who are working so hard. How are we going to get the financial flows that are required to address this issue? I think and also into the pockets of women, not in the pockets of the guys uh, around the corner and their bank accounts. Well, I, th I think, you know, one way to start is by thinking about the money and where it goes, and it is channeled in ways which are ridiculously siloed from each other, so that money which is there for, for peace is, not, is different from money which is there for climate, which mm. is different from the small yeah. amounts of money which are there for gender action, and, and so on. The figures that you said, by the way, I think, in my view, are an underestimate. I think there's about half a trillion dollars a year which is spent directly subsidizing the fossil fuel industry and somewhere over five trillion US dollars a year mm. is spent on indirect subsidies. And if you think about, if you think seriously about the relationship between fossil fuels, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, climate change, instability, and the risk of violent conflict, then we are investing at the moment somewhere in the region of five and a half trillion US dollars a year in conflict. You know, what, what on earth is, is that about? Now to try to unpick that, I think it's essential, first of all, I mean, women have a kind of, very often, in many different cultures, many different countries, have a kind of cultural permission to think outside the box that men have created. It's both a matter of necessity, but it's also kind of permitted. Those innovative voices can be heard very often. The young people, of course, have, I mean, in some cultures, they're kind of absolutely put down, yeah. stay in your place. But in others, and surprising ones in some ways, they are often given a voice and given a hearing. So those energies need to be galvanized. I think we have to be, I mean, I'm, I run a research institute, we think about the science of this. But what we desperately need is to have the local voices, mm. people who experience both the problem mm. in its most intense and immediate form, and have started to generate solutions, mm -hmm. some of which can be scaled up. And then we need, yes, we need local solutions, but they have to be also at city level, at provincial level, at national level. There needs to be a kind of a red thread going through this. But unfortunately, you know, we do have to change everything. But you just rightly point out we're spending uh, trillions on, 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 on conflict yeah. uh, when we should be spending trillions on peace uh, making. Uh, the numbers, by the way, on the fossil fuel subsidies from the IMF is seven trillion plus because these are the impacts of climate fueled damage, uh, uh, mainly from fossil fuels, uh, and that we're all subsidizing that damage as well. Um, so any thoughts here uh, about how do we how do we actually release the funding in some way? Where do we get it from? I mean, so let's work with what we have. And I think there is a big promise coming with that declaration yeah. that's being launched as we as we speak. And one of the areas uh, in the package of solutions is precisely uh, this uh, de-risking and increasing uh, climate finance in fragile and conflict affected contexts. Now, the, the thing about these global visions and declarations is that then uh, they then take quite some time 
to translate into action on the ground. They take time for governments to take and make them their own and for them to to make a difference to the communities, to the to the people on, on the ground. And we don't have that and we don't have that time. Uh, yeah, I think that we don't have yeah, time. Yeah, we don't have time. Have and the good news <laughs> about this dedicated day to peace is that we are finally bringing together the climate community of practice with the peace builders, and we have a, we have access to a much a broader suite of concrete policy solutions. And Women, Peace, and Security Agenda is one of them. Uh, it started as a as a global set of commitments that member states have then taken um, and uh, translated into local action plans, into national action plans that sets out very concrete measures on how to ensure that funding, for example, makes a difference to local women-led civil society, to women leaders within communities. So it's mm -hmm. very important that the two speak yeah. to each other. Mm -hmm. I'm just worried about how the, that fund, the lost and damaged fund, would be prioritized. What mm -hmm. criteria would... UN or world leaders would use for that. And I'm also afraid that uh, governments, local government leaders will hijack the management of these funds and prioritize their own concerns and interests as mm -hmm. local government leaders, mm -hmm. which has happened several times in the Philippines. We have a lot of funding partners from different uh, funding agencies but uh, a little bit just trickles down to the women who are doing the dirty job in the communities mm -hmm. of preserving life, uh, of uh, surviving mm. uh, with their heads above the water, even in severe crisis, because they are the ones looking after their children, and that's their main concern. So I'm, that's, those are just my concerns, how, how this fund will be managed so that it will be distributed fairly and justly to the, those who need it most. I think that's a very good point, uh, Rufa. And I think there's two things that, that spring to mind here. One is that they need to move quickly to operationalize mm -hmm. this loss and damage fund because it's been 30 years in the making and we mm -hmm. can't wait another 30 years to decide mm -hmm. what you're going to do with the money. Plus, in addition to that, it needs to be bigger than the pot that's yeah. now there. But it's, there's a start anyway. Uh, and, and but the other thing is, you're quite right. I think this 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 the, the straightforward message here to anybody from the governments involved in setting up and operationalizing the the loss and damage fund is they need to really think about how they get it to people like you and your communities. I mean that's absolutely clear. We've got two minutes left. I've just been given a two minute warning. So um, how do we wrap this up? Um, what does where does UN Women go from here with this uh, agenda? What 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 happens in the next? say 12 months? Are there points along the way, moments where this can be raised up as an issue far more with the I community? think this conversation, and thank you so much for giving us the platform, is part of this effort, making sure that we articulate very clearly that it's, it's precisely inequalities that make us vulnerable to the challenges that we are speaking about today. And that it's critical that the conversation around uh, climate, peace and security keeps that human element mm. and mm. the leadership of women mm. and girls uh, mm. in the center mm. to make sure that whatever uh, funding comes out of it, that whatever policy commitments come out of it, uh, make difference, the, you know, the, the most difference precisely to those who are affected first and, yeah. and most. Rufa, the yeah. last word with you. I think there should be uh, a constant monitoring or stock, stock taking of stock taking of the efforts uh, towards this concern to ensure that the funds are really distributed fairly and they're made operational on the ground and women are being given the needed support, both technical and financial, to concretize what they want to happen in their communities to survive. Well, thank you very much indeed, all of you, for being here. Uh, this is obviously not the end of the story by any means, but it's been good to, to raise this issue here on We Don't Have Time TV. And uh, Katerina, I'm uh, handing the show back to you for the next uh, segment. Uh, back to Stockholm. Well, thank you so much, Nick, and I really enjoyed this, this session. Uh, such true leadership, and including women and the power that can be unleashed if this is really done properly. This is amazing. So thank you so much. Let's now move on to a topic that's very close to this topic that we just uh, talked about.
The health risks associated with climate change cannot be overstated. Beyond drastic changes to our weather, increased risk of natural disasters and also destruction of the natural world. There is also an immediate risk to our health. This summer, smoke from forest fires in Canada impacted people's health across Canada and the US, and even in Europe. Air pollution is projected to be responsible for one in five deaths annually, and it's now the single biggest cause of premature death globally. Fossil fuels also contaminate water and land, placing those living on the front lines of production at risk. In this session, we're going to look at the scientific estimates behind these alarming figures. And we will hear from experts on what can be done to clean our air and preserve healthy env environments for future generations. Let me hand it back over to Nick, who's moderating this session. Thanks, Katerina. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I've got uh, two wonderful guests with me here, and I th I'm, I'm told that we might have somebody in on the magic of Zoom as well. Uh, if that is indeed the case. But uh, if not, uh, the two fantastic people are more than enough uh, to keep us going here uh, on this, this wonderful show on, on, well, air pollution, really, health and climate change. Uh, and this is part of our series with the uh, Fossil Fuel uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, or it's certainly fitting in very closely with what we're discussing uh, about that treaty and what we need to do to get rid of fossil fuels. Um, so, great. Um, Marina, we had you on the other day, uh, Marina Romanalo, who is Executive Director of the Lancet Countdown, uh, and you had this report that came out uh, just early. It's great to see you back. Um, air pollution. Uh, uh, what is the science telling us about air pollution and health, uh, it, with this nexus of climate change, of course, right there? Well, air pollution is a big silent killer. Air pollution is one of the main causes of death globally, and it particularly affects vulnerable populations. It affects young children. It affects their development, their um, respiratory system development. It affects the risk of cancer as they grow older. It affects the digestive system. It affects the, ment the, the, the neurological system. So it has a huge, huge burden on our bodies and our health. And a recent study that just came out suggests that the death attributable to air pollution that comes directly from the burning of fossil fuels could be as many as 5.1 million globally. Our estimate has suggested it was about 1.2, but this suggests it could be a lot higher than that. So we're looking at a big, big cause and a, a, a big um, detriment to our health. And uh, I think as we've discussed before, I mean, it's not just deaths, is it? I mean, it's actual children with asthma. Um, there was a BBC a study just in the Gulf region here from the flaring of oil and gas uh, in this region. And uh, they think perhaps 40% of the pollution here is, is actually coming from the, the flaring of the oil and gas. And they interviewed a, a gentleman whose son is chronically sick with asthma every time there's so much burning. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's causing damage, it's causing deaths, and it really needs to be something that, that's managed down. Um, what else can we say about air pollution? I mean, it also causes damage to even our ecosystems and things like that. Our, natu our nature gets mm -hmm. damaged by it too, and that's something we need to protect ourselves uh, in, in the climate change story. We need nature. Absolutely. The, the burden to our health systems, the, the decades of progress we have done in terms of reducing the risk factors to our health, extending our life expectancy, are being undermined because we're getting sick from air pollution. Mm -hmm. You mentioned young children and asthma. There's little Ella that it was the first child um, whose death certificate in the UK say that the cause of her death was air pollution, because she has severe asthma that got exacerbated by air pollution. And it's very important to make that link, that when we're looking at an increase in the cases of asthma, they often have to do with children living in very highly polluted roads. But one thing that I wanted to perhaps turn the attention to is that when we talk about climate change and air pollution, fossil fuels are the main driver of climate change and are one of the biggest single contributors to air pollution. But our inaction, is also leading to having families, particularly in the lower middle income countries, that continue to be highly dependent on the burning of dirty fuels like biomass and other sources of very highly polluting fuels inside their home. Mm -hmm. 
So it's the fossil fuels and also everything that we have done not to give access to clean renewable energies to the families that are still dependent on these toxic sources of energy, which they need to maintain their basic mm. um, lives and, and healthy lives. Mm. So it's so imperative that we do phase out fossil fuels and that we do that in a way that we're delivering access to clean renewable energies in a fair way, in a just transition, particularly to those that are today struggling with energy poverty or that still are mm -hmm. highly reliant on the burning of dirty fuels. Mm -hmm. Are there any other health aspects uh, from the, the climate emergency in which we find ourselves in? Are there any other health impacts that, that, that spring to mind? To give you a whole list of health impacts from the oh, climate yes, emergency. <laughs> um, well, look, Climate change is fundamentally a health emergency. Everything that is happening to our environment means that we're living in a level of instability of the environmental con conditions that affect us directly that we've never experienced before. And we're seeing globally an increase, and, and this kind of has become a bit obvious now. When I say it, I, people just see it and feel it every day. I don't need to be saying the numbers, mm. but we're seeing an increase in the incidence of extreme heat events, of heat waves that are leading to death, to um, increased disease. And we estimate that since the 90s, the mortality related to extreme heat exposure in people over 65 years of age has increased by 85%. Mm -hmm. And that that is more than twice the rise that we would have expected if temperatures had remained constant. So we know that this is mostly climate change driven. And we're seeing, for example, spread of infectious diseases around 30% more uh, environmental suitability for the transmission of deadly diseases like dengue that is now spreading like wildfire, particularly in South America, Southeast Asia, and undermining our disease control efforts. And we're seeing, for example, that because of the increased incidence of extreme events, because of our reduction in labor productivity, because it's just too hot to work, and because of the whole economic uh, impacts of climate change, people are not being able to produce food properly or to access the food that they need to meet their basic nutritional needs. Mm. And what that is leading to is an increase of 127 million more people today reporting that they cannot access the food they need, their food insecure, that is directly linked to the increased incidence of heat waves and of drought events. Mm. So every single one of the pillars and the determinants of health are being affected by climate change, which is a crisis driven by our persistent burning of fossil fuels, mm. a technology that we know we can replace. I remember reading, uh, in the days when I was at the UN Environment Programme, uh, a paper, I think, from the Royal Society in London, which said that in the past, the spread of infectious diseases, so the spread of existing ones we know and the emergence of new ones, was actually linked with um, things like um, people settling down on the land to become farmers. Then it moved to uh, colonialism mm -hmm. and the movement of people around the world because of colonialism, bringing stuff from one place to another. You know, it might be food products with something on or it might be animals. Uh, and then it was, and, and tourism with people now moving to that. And that now the biggest source of, of infectious diseases, whether it be old ones spreading or new ones emerging, was linked with climate change, including things like deforestation uh, uh, causing all kinds of things like, yeah, you deforest and, and you've got a perfect place for malarial mosquitoes to breed in pools of water because the forest has gone, some example. This, this is right, isn't it? This is the time we're living in. That's absolutely right. And all of those other factors are still there. Yeah. We're still seeing increased exposure because of land use change, which in many cases drives climate change as well. We're still seeing people movement and we're still having all of those risk factors. And on top of that, we're now seeing that the environment has become so much more suitable for the transmission of these diseases. Mm -hmm. So what is happening, for example, here in Europe, we're seeing that, um, well, not here in Europe, sorry, I'm used to being in the UK. You really confused me there for a second. Yeah. I thought I was in Dubai. But... No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's much so hotter hot today. It's so hot here today, than yeah. uh, it's in London. <laughs> in Europe, where I live, we're now seeing often that um, there's local transmission of diseases like dengue. And that is because the environment has become suitable for local trans transmission and because people are bringing dengue from abroad because we have people movement. And that means that we have now a permissive environment that puts us at risk of outbreaks, epidemics, and new emerging infectious diseases are starting to be linked more and more to, to climate change. 
I'm going to, uh, in a moment, uh, I realize that we actually have a video message from uh, Dr. Courtney Howard. So I'm going to bring uh, that person in. Uh, and um, that's uh, coming, I think, in a moment, isn't it? So maybe we could, uh, could we Stockholm now uh, do the broadcast uh, from Dr. Courtney Howard, please? Hi, I'm Dr. Courtney Howard, an emergency physician here in Yellowknife's Dene territory in the Canadian subarctic. This last summer, severe wildfires forced the evacuation of our 100 bed hospital, meaning that we had to transfer patients with the help of a military evacuation program down to two different provinces, which themselves were also affected by wildfires and smoke. This isn't the first time that we've had such severe wildfires. This is a part of the world that is already over two, two degrees Celsius warmer than when an eight-year-old elder was born. And our hospital serves an area that extends up to the high Arctic where it's already three degrees Celsius warmer in some cases. That's causing permafrost melt, trouble accessing traditional foods, as well as these terrible fires. In 2014, our study showed that we had a full doubling of emergency department visits for asthma over the course of two and a half months in a summer that came to be called the Summer of Smoke, or SOS for short. Our qualitative study found that people felt really trapped inside their houses for that entire time, uh, feeling like they missed their community, they missed their connection to the land, and that they missed the physical activity that they were used to having outside. People said things like, what does this mean for our kids? One thing that we also saw was that the people who prepared the most felt better. So what we can see is that taking action relieves anxiety. When there's a real threat, we need to move to actually decrease the threat. And that's one of the things that the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty allows us to do. It gives us a pathway to agency with a realistic mechanism that can really create change. The Lancet has said for years that climate change is the biggest health threat of the 21st century. The World Health Organization now says that too. Aside from severe wildfires, my colleagues across the world are now coping with huge heat waves that overwhelm emergency departments. We're seeing severe storms take out the infrastructure we need to do our work, as well as reduce our ability to access the pharmaceuticals and other supplies required because the supply chain sometimes go down. We're seeing changes in temperature and precipitation patterns mean that different mammals, different vectors, and humans are in new proximity to one another as all of these living beings move around trying to find a good habitat. And what that means is that we're at increased risk for new transmission of viruses and other pathogens into humans. So it's increasing the risk of further pandemics. The good part is that tackling climate change is the biggest health opportunity of our time. Even by decreasing fossil fuels right now, we save lives. Decreasing fossil fuel related air pollution allows us to reduce the almost one fifth of global deaths that are related to fossil fuel related air pollution. Whether we're talking about cancers or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or heart disease, these issues are all exacerbated by fossil fuel related air pollution. It also can lead to new cases of asthma in kids. Now, asthma in children is one of the main reasons they come to the emergency department. Think about what that means for kids. It means they're missing school. It means that their parents are missing work. It means that there's a burden on the healthcare system. The children are getting poked and prodded for labs and tests. It's not a good experience for anyone. So as we save the planet, we can save people at the same time through this work. And it really is a gift that the people who are putting forward the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty are giving to us all. That's why the Global Climate and Health Alliance has partnered with the treaty folks in order to help mobilize the health sector. They didn't teach us how to organize a medical school, but they did teach us to care. And so when provided with this opportunity last year, we were able to get health professionals and health organizations from around the world to join the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And the voices were raised so loudly and enthusiastically and urgently that the World Health Organization itself signed on lending its voice to the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Heading into COP28 with its very first health day, the call from the health community is clear. The treatment for the health emergency of climate change is fossil fuel phase out. And we see the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty as one of the most realistic pathways to actioning that treatment plan. 
So we would like to say thank you to the treaty folks for the energy, the love and the courage that you put into this work. We want you to know that we're there with you and we look forward to working with you to continue this call to ensure that we can have the healthy planet we need for healthy people and keep this place safe for generations now and generations yet to come. Thank you. So a big thank you there to uh, Dr. Courtney Howard from Canada vice chair of the global climate and health alliance now let's turn over to another wonderful guest that we have here uh, which is uh, uh bavreen uh, kandhari yes okay sure. climate parent at warrior mums and our kids climate and um bavreen is a concerned parent working towards clean air for over two decades spearheading several public movements in delhi uh, and india generally that bring desperate attention and call for action on clean air and environmental justice issues. She has facilitated the rise and management of social movement campaigns like hashtag my right to breathe, hashtag Delhi trees SOS, and co-founded warrior mums with mothers all over the country, all over India, joining hands to bring back clean air. Uh, so welcome to you. Thank you. Um, what is the state of the air in, 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 a, in a big city like, say, Delhi in India? What, what is going on with that air? So, um, I mean, we spoke, we? The, yeah, the, the, you know, we have uh, the doctors who've said it all. I mean, with air pollution and why it's there, the numbers, everything is there. But we are, uh, the, there is a misconception that uh, uh, we have air pollution only in this time when it's winter, but it isn't so. Mm. It's, we are almost living in the toxicity throughout the year. We had almost, uh, uh, you know, about four good day, days of air, only four good days of air the whole year. So this is uh, something that, uh, you know, we're um, uh, uh, the state, I mean, if you're talking of Delhi. And then the other uh, thing which, uh, you know, because you asked for Delhi, and I would like to uh, point out that it's not Delhi. It's pretty much everywhere. Air pollution has now, you know, the, what we've been saying and what the experts have been saying, that it's spread its wings. It's, it's uh, probably every city this year, Mumbai and Pune have been even taken over. They took, um, um, they were much more polluted. So uh, obviously this is, uh, you know, the state and this is the reason we are, uh, you know, here and uh, because of the fossil fuel treaty, we've all, uh, you know, uh, trying to stress on that it's the emissions, emissions that are causing this and this is throughout the country yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, uh, the government of India and the regional governments uh, in India, the national government, the regional governments, I mean, they, um, they're breathing the air too, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, and, and, and don't they, what kind of, it's been going on for ages, right? So it's not as if it just happened today. So what kind of thinking is going on in, in India uh, in terms of to deal with this problem? So it's not that era when they were in denial. They know this is happening, they admit it, and they are doing things, they say things, but it misses an action because you do the wrong things. Uh, when it's uh, about uh, the emissions, you're talking about, uh, uh, it's uh, curbing the sources of emission is what we need to do, and that means the fossil fuels will have to go, the emissions which are in the city like Delhi, which is more about vehicular and which is about um, the biomass, like we were talking, the indoor air cooking, you know, the uh, those kind of indoor air pollution. Those, those are the things that need to be worked out, and they have to be worked out with good systemic changes, with policy. Mm. Until our policy is not sound, and of course, uh, uh, something very important that we are missing terribly is the implementation. So strict implementation, of course, you have laws, but if they're not being implemented, then they're of no use. Mm. So this is uh, why we are doing the wrong things. We are uh, saying the wrong things and we're doing the wrong things. We, are, mm. we think smoke towers will uh, clean air. You know, there was like a huge tower that was put in Delhi. Yeah. You know, this is simply ridiculous because uh, th these gadgets are not going to clean air. These are all reactionary and they're wonderful photo ops. So the, uh, you know, politicians love uh, these kind of things and uh, they, they want to show uh, that we're cleaning air, but that's not going to uh, help anyone. And it quite uh, rightly, we, you know, it was proven this year that it's not helping. Um, just, sorry, when you told me about this before, I, I, I was really listening to, I was really quite, um, shocked, uh, bemused, uh, 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 intrigued. They, they put a, a tower up in Delhi 
right? And and they're gonna they're gonna use this to, or they're using it to clean the air. What does this tower do? So the tower, yeah, the tower has uh, these uh, you know like uh, filters, the uh, HEPA filters, and uh -huh. they, of course it can clean uh, with the experts as the IITs and all who have shown the uh, data. It can clean up to 100 meters which is okay, fine, very good. But then how do you come, you know, uh, worry about the, all the 35 million people who are living there and how it's going to happen? So now, the uh, you know, with all the research and the data and all this pushing from various, uh, you know, uh, citizens like all of ourselves, uh, it's been now, so they've asked now, the you put 40,000 towers or you don't put none, you know? Yeah. So th this is never going to be the solutions. These are distractionary uh, techniques, I would say, mm. that you put, things and you try to, you know, because the masses here are not so well educated, even the regular educated people will not have so much knowledge. But when they see that the government has put something uh, as, uh, you know, wonderful as a huge tower to clean air, then the whole, uh, uh, it's not about the city, the whole country starts talking about it. So this was getting replicated in Kolkata, in, uh, um, the, you know, Chandigarh, in various other, in NCR. So th this is the thing that you lead into a wrong direction, then everybody follows you there. You do the right thing. Everybody will follow you. I mean, so, it sounds like an awful waste of money when you could be investing that in like public sort of, money. You know, more renewable energy, for example, yeah. or you know, because in the end we have to substitute the, 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 the fossil fuels with clean energy. Clean energy it's, it's and a simple strategy. Absolutely, uh, uh, and it has to be done. Absolutely, the clean energy has to come in and has to come in fast. The fossil fuels have to go. There, there has to be an equitable phase out, and it has to be all fossil fuels. You know, there has to be, no, of course, there's air pollution, which is affecting everyone around, but there are these uh, 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 hundreds and thousands of people who are in the vicinity of the coal fields and coal mines and all who are actually mm -hmm. suffering so much more. Right. So, so we cannot even uh, deny them their right to life and right to breathe. Mm -hmm. And because we are mothers and we are talking about children, this is how, I mean, I think it should affect everybody. My children are, as much as I've been said that we've been fighting this for over uh, two decades but yeah i have twin girls and they're going to be 20 this year i don't think they will their lungs are normal they will have damaged lungs yeah. you know at some point they will suffer yeah so it's it's not fair and we uh, you know it's not uh, uh, it should not be accepted by anyone mm -hmm. actually it's funny you mentioned that because i lived in nairobi in kenya for 13 years and i had some three very young children when i was there and they were still in those days this is the early 2000s putting lead in uh, petrol in uh, Nairobi. Fortunately, the UNEP has helped uh, to phase out uh, lead in most petrol that was still using it in most parts of the world. But when we got them back to Britain, we did have some tests, and there were little traces of lead in the yeah. in the blood supply. And whereas in Britain, lead was phased out of petrol a long time ago. Yeah. What um, do you, as mums, go and see the the government uh, and yeah. say what you want, and what is their response? Yes, it's not going to work otherwise. I mean, you have to speak to them. After all, they are the ones. Like I said, the policy it has to come from them. We have to push it. We 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 are moms. We can the best we can do is the one thing we do is empowerment, because unfortunately, as uh, mothers and citizens, we 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 are you know so busy in other things. We don't know the laws ourselves. So if there are violations, like say how uh, the waste is being burned or there's vehicular emissions or a tree is being cut. What are you supposed to do? So we kind of empower them with this information. Every state has different laws. And then the second thing is, like you said, you know, pushing the policy. We meet the policymakers. We work with them. If a smoke tower, we shared a lot of data and uh, various uh, you know other um, uh, things that we can push them and understand everybody is not bad and well not you know bad meaning they are well meaning but they are being uh, guided also in the wrong directions so when you come together things work so we are so happy that the smoke tower has been has failed yeah. and uh, it's been said it's been failed but then it took three years of our lives yeah. <laughs> to Got proving you. that wrong Got and you. too much time goes by because mm. the toxicity is affecting our children every breath that they're taking every 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 second that we are speaking, I mean, their children are breathing. We are all breathing there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, difficult to understand that why we do not want to take decisions. I think there are uh, 13 lives uh, every minute that are lost because of burning fossil fuels. Yeah. Yeah. And I think three alone in India per minute. And why can't we just work? I mean, it's too many numbers. Why Why we don't want to save them? Mm. It's, I've got it. Yeah. Yeah. I've got it. Um, can we, uh, with the Lancet, I mean, obviously the Lancet is known for many people as an outstanding, you know, uh, medical journal, but um, are, there, are there health professionals in India that are a part of your work? Uh, just echoing to this, it's not just a European thing or a US-American thing. Uh, health professionals in other countries? 
We have health professionals from many different countries. We have, uh, I don't think anyone currently living in India. We have Indian professionals, but not that are currently living in India that contribute to the report. But we have Indian partners with whom we've done policy briefs, um, leaning on the data that we produce for India and that they have taken it to government. That's the ministry? Is it the ministry? To the, well, government? they're not currently in the ministry. They're from um, public health associations uh, health in India. Yeah. And public health professionals have really taken the lead in India, as you said, to put this problem, the, the, the notion that climate change is a health crisis and that space out of fossil fuels is absolutely essential for a healthy future. And they've been taking this message uh, to government. But it's not an easy road. And we know that there's a lot of interest. And that's why it's so important that we endorse the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and we make the case that we cannot have a healthy future unless we face out fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Because the challenge is there. We, we're such a big coal, uh, you know, usage uh, in our country. We have, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not easy to immediately phase out. But... Uh, mm -hmm. What you said was so right that you to work on renewable energy at a very fast pace, yeah. and that's going to be the game changer. Yeah, there needs to be a plan for the phase out, phase out of fossil fuels and a plan for the massive ramping of uh, renewable energy. I mean, that's doubling every 3.5 years now globally, so that, that's pretty good. But it doesn't have the phase out of the fossil fuel plan. We need that urgently. And the nice thing about the treaty is it actually it looks at how you would do that. And this is also important. You need to know how you're going to do it mm -hmm. so you don't dump people back in poverty because they have no energy full stop. So you've got to be careful about that. But look, this is a fascinating topic. We, we, we could go on and on and on because it, it's really exciting. But unfortunately, we have to move on to another uh, show that uh, we've got uh, coming uh, soon. Um, but I want to thank you really for the work you're doing with, with, you. with mums in, uh, in, in India. And uh, Our Kids Climate, of course, is, is a great initiative. Uh, uh, some friends of ours, in fact, Katerina, the other co-moderator, is very much involved in yes. Our Kids Climate yes. in the Nordic region, yeah. Um, I think every mom is, every mother, <laughs> and that's what we try to tell the politicians and the leaders here. Yeah. Your parents, just remember that Yes. before you take any yeah, decisions. They sometimes forget that, don't they? They yeah. forget when they come to these negotiations, they forget their mums and dads yeah. and, and, and they have their own children. What sort of future do they want for them? That's why we're here, to remind them. That's why yeah. we're shouting, showing up. You know, here at this, it's incredible. Uh, they like, they like turn into interplanetarians, don't they, when they come to negotiations, forget they're human beings as well. Yeah. But Maria, thanks so much for you being here as well. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think you do great work, uh, all of you, and uh, let's let's see how it goes. Okay. Thank you so, so much. So, uh, Katerina, um, I'm going to hand the show back to you in uh, Stockholm, if that's okay. And uh, yeah, thanks. Well, thank you so much, Berin and, and Marina. Um, just to showcase how powerful love is a f as a as a fuel for for ch for making change happen, and also to remind us constantly that why we're doing this. Uh, just an hour ago, we had uh, three small children in the studio to visit, and it's just a stark reminder of why we need to do this and why we need to step up. And just like Nick said, I am um, involved with the organization Our Kids Climate that Berveen is also very active in and uh, was part of the found founding of uh, the organization in Paris during the COP, uh, COP 21, 2015. And it's uh, many organizations that are sort of gathering together in our kids' climate, making difference. So thank you, Bavreen, for showcasing this work and also for making things happen, especially in the in, in the continent, of, well, in India. Uh, so we just have to keep on working um, and push for change. And this really showcases collective action uh, at its best, that things can happen if we gather together and use love as the biggest and most important fuel. So this concludes this session. We are now moving on to talk about climate displacement. Climate displacement is one of the biggest humanitarian crises. It's getting worse as temperatures continues to rise. We've seen many examples of this in 2020 alone, 2023 and 2020 that for that matter too, with the displacement of large swaths of inhabitants as a result of both floods, droughts and wildfires. And this is only to be to the starting point. By 2050, we're estimated to see 1.2 billion climate refugees. 
And that's more than a tenth of the global population today. A tenth. So this is really an issue that needs to be addressed today. I have the great pleasure of handing over now to the CEO of We Don't Have Time North America, Dr. Shota Chakraborty. So hello, Shota, and take it away. Thank you so much, Katerina. And we're getting into a very important topic now, and we have a great lineup of speakers joining us. So to kick things off, we are going to have a conversation first between myself and Naomi Morris. Hello, Naomi. Hi. Thank you for joining me today. You are a climate activist with Earth Volunteers. Sorry, so please. you were only 10 years old when a flash flood forced your family to flee from your home, and you lost your family, your home, all of this, and you were forced to move 130 miles to the outside of the capital of Uganda. Can you tell us your story and how it led you here to COP28? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity. Uh, greetings to whoever is watching us. Um, my name is Jimmy Morris and I'm a youth activist. Yeah, as you say, at the age of 10, I was already a climate refugee. Uh, we were forced to move due to floods, you know. Uh, due, in 2008, there was a flood flooding in our district and uh, over 400 people were displaced. So we decided to do what to leave because that was the only option. However, this has been very traumatic because I lost my dad along the way. She, he decided to disappear. At the same time, I've been raised by a single mom of three siblings. Uh, at some point, I wanted to be a news editor. Mm. That's why when you check on me, I'm always writing about stories. But now I can't do that. I had to change to focus on how I'm going to help many young people not to be in the same situation like me, you know. I had a dream, but now I'm a climate advocate. I'm trying to push for a better world. And when you look at the new re report that was published two days ago by a White House, it indicated that over 60 million people are being displaced each year. And this is why I had to come here, because these kind of conferences, they don't give young people chances to listen. The media and everyone is covering only leaders and what they say. Mm. So sometimes we on ground are the one who have to go down, share these stories. You know, what you just said really resonates because there's been so many catastrophes, whether we're talking about natural disasters or human caused disasters. In the United States, gun crime is something that we are constantly at risk of. And young people are most affected by these tragedies. Absolutely. And whether, regardless of what their hopes and dreams are, they end up having to go down an avenue that they might not have otherwise. Yeah. So you have been, because of your circumstances, almost forced into this line of work. Yeah, yeah. And you might have been something else otherwise. So how does it feel to have to almost, this is, you have no other choice. It's almost something now you feel like you have to do. Do you resent that or do you feel empowered? Mm, at some point, I used to regret why I joined this, but now I feel empowered because my voice is being heard all over. Maybe it is changing some people's voices, you know, the way they think about this climate crisis, because mm -hmm. all we need is to make sure the world really understands what is really happening. And if I had not come out, maybe the people who are following me wouldn't know what climate change means. So today I feel like, uh, yeah, it is working for me. And I don't think I'll give up because now it is like a passion. And uh, every time I wake up, I'm like, I need to do something. Today, you talked about the, the nonprofit organization, Earth Volunteer, the one I formed in 2020. We are trying to make sure we bring together young people who are at mm. school to start taking actions on ground. Our mission is to reach 1.5 million young people by 2030. You know, uh, at COP26, you had uh, the Indian Prime Minister saying, uh, we have our new net zero target is at 2070. But who is going to be there during mm -hmm. that time? These right. are the young people who are at school, so they need to be empowered. If they are to lead tomorrow, they have to start now, you know? So I feel empowered. Okay, no, that's that's... That's great that you turned your tragedy into something very meaningful yeah. and to do your part to prevent it from happening to others. So that says a lot about you. And you've met some incredible people along the way. Yeah. I know one person that you wanted to highlight was Vanessa Nakadi, Absolutely. also a fellow Ugandan climate activist. Tell us how you met her and how has she impacted your activism? Yeah, uh, meeting Vanessa, actually, we were neighbors before even, you know. In so Uganda. In Uganda. So uh, it was very hard for me actually to access her because she was already studying. But one day after completing my IT diploma, I was home trying to work as an affiliate. And I got to see news, you know, even social media was posting. There is a climate activist, very young, trying to ask the government to declare a climate emergency. And guess what? 
she was my neighbor, so like I need to reach out to her. So when I reached out to her, we organized a, a, a community cleanup in Luzilla, and guess what? That's where the impact started growing in me, and I was like, I think I need to do something. And when I shared with her my story, she was like, I think your story can actually make a difference. It took me some time for me to go to street, right. but when I started, I've never gone back. So I, I really like that she brought this to our attention as Ugandans, you know? So that just goes to show how we need to lean on each other. Absolutely. There has to be that partnership and collaboration. And so it makes us that much stronger. It motivates. Yeah. And you know, you're trying to reach all of these activists, potential activists around the world. And our broadcast reaches mm -hmm. viewers globally, millions tune in, in fact. So it's, it might be too soon in this interview to ask you, but what would you like to, before, to make sure that I don't miss it, yeah. what would you like to tell young potential activists around the world? Uh, one thing I can say is, uh, they shouldn't be, you know, I uh, feel like uh, they are being left out because most of the decisions are actually made right from where you are, you know. I've, I've been in this conference, this is my second time, and one thing I can tell you, everything is just words. Real actions are out there. So one thing I can tell these young people is to make sure you do what you are passionate about. We need more young, you know, brave activists in this fight, but you don't have to be like my friend Greta raising mm. placards. No, we need policymakers who are very young and brave. You know, your talent in technology in any way, we need you in the fight. That's the number of people we need. We need one billion activists by 20. So regardless of your expertise, absolutely, whatever you can contribute, even being an artist, even being a creative, right? Absolutely. There's a role to play. Yeah, gender, what technology, anything you can yeah. contribute to make sure we fight this climate crisis and end it once and for all, you yes, know? Yes, I hear you. Mm. So your family was displaced. Yeah. Did you get any government assistance? What happened from, in terms of aid, to help with the new transition, the new life, you know, post having to migrate? And we're, I'm asking this question because last COP, there was the conversation to start the loss and damages fund, which is long overdue because climate crises have been happening now for mm. decades, yeah. even longer, yeah. as many indigenous peoples have been telling us yeah. um, on our broadcast and here at COP. Mm. And so we're very long overdue to actually create that funds to support those who have been displaced. Yeah. What, do, what, what happened to you and your personal experience and how do you feel about this loss and damage fund? And what are you hoping to see um, is going to come from this. And this is one of the things that actually pushed me to continue demanding because when we lost our farm and the home, we were forced to evacuate. There was no any other option apart from leaving. Mm. Since then, we have never been compensated. My mom is already struggling with life. I'm also back now. I'm in adulthood life. I have to struggle. Those days we used to grow food and everything. So uh, when you talk about loss and damage, I'm one of the few people who are pushing this since day one because I believe there are so many communities, there are so many people who are going through this kind of losses every year and they need compensation because our government are still trying, you know. They cannot do everything. If you acknowledge that you created this crisis, then why don't you agree to pay? Mm. And uh, just uh, to, when we opened up this conference, they talked about loss and damage, and everyone was celebrating because of the 100 million that was raised. Right. That is very small compared <laughs> yeah. to the money they spend on, 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 like on conflicts and so on, you know? When you look at what people are losing today, that money can only go to maybe to Pakistan. But look at Nigeria, look at Malawi at the beginning of this year, over 400 people lost their lives in, in floods, you know, and this kind of crisis is still happening all over. So when you talk about this small money, you, use also, you need to also talk about how this money is going to be received so that it does, doesn't come with interest rates, you know. These communities have to access this money right cash on hand, you know. So it's a start, but you're, what I'm hearing from you is that it's really not going far enough. Ah, uh, that's too small. There is no way we can say this money is going to reach to us. Yeah. hundred? <laughs> and to some people, a hundred million sounds like a lot, but if you think about it, these are billion dollar disasters. Just the relief and recovery to fix these disasters, much less help those in, in carving out new pathways and a new life. Yeah. It doesn't go far enough. It doesn't. Yes. It doesn't. They need to, to, to stop joking with our future, you know? Yeah. Because we are droning every time. Like today we are here, but you call someone in Southern Sudan, they will tell you, we are starving. Hmm? So such crises are very hard actually to explain in public places like this, because you feel like you are mocking those people. Yeah. When you say, I have, I have, I have. It's pennies. That, it comes, it's, a, it's like. And also we need to talk about 
the cause of this crisis, you know. I know Colombia yesterday came out and joined the fight and agreed to call out, you know, the endorsement of fossil fuel non proliferation treaty, but also I was so disappointed by the king. He never called out the UK. Recently, they approved Lowe's Bank oil right. field, you know. Right. Those countries that are emitting, they have to be the one on top of phasing out all this crisis by leading by example, you know, I feel yes. bad. So all of this information isn't necessarily getting to the global audience. We're doing our part. Obviously, we're having these conversations. We're broadcasting. We have millions tuning in. Mm. But your nonprofit addresses this issue. It Absolutely. addresses the translation issue. Mm. It's looking to provide people with accessible information about climate by translating yeah. all of this information into local languages. Yeah. So how is it going? Do you think that more people, because of these translation efforts, are more aware of the climate crisis now? Mm, right now, they are still... They still need, you know, for an improvement. That's why we want to collaborate with each and everyone, even with, with we don't have time. We want to call mm. you on the table so that we can work together and spread this information all over. These young people need to be well empowered and well equipped so that they don't become fossil fuel CEOs in future, you know. Mm. So my mission is to make sure I reach out to young people wherever they are. We are starting in Uganda, but soon we'll go any other country. We'll bring them out. I've already collaborated with the United States, you know, in New Jersey, but we want to push this further so that climate education is everywhere, even in curriculum. At COP26, I was so happy they brought it, but in COP27 and COP28, I haven't had anything concerning climate education. There is nothing can move on without access to information. Yeah. Thank you. So for somebody who went through the experience that you went through, that is what you chose to focus on because that's how, criti how critically important it is being able to share uh, this information so that people can protect themselves, right? That they can secure themselves. So that says a lot. That says a lot that that's what your focus is, given what you've been through. Mm. How do you explain to people your plight? I asked you in the beginning and you shared your story, but for those who haven't experienced it, mm. and, and we're still in the United States, especially we're frustrated dealing with some of these policymakers that feel like, you know, this is a problem for other people over there. Mm. How do you bring the, how do you make it tangible? How do you make it, so that there's an urgency. How do you translate that, yeah. your emotional story, to those that might be in buttoned up suits sitting in tall office buildings that have not experienced this, but they have the, they have the power to make the decisions? Mm, it is very easy. I think I've been trying to do this through telling stories, you know? Uh, sometimes I know not everyone is on social media, but I've been trying my best to show them that uh, it's not all about we who went through crisis to be every time crying. Mm -hmm. We can also be part of the, you know, the solution by educating you guys to understand. I have talked about so many stories and these stories are actually people are starting picking mm -hmm. the idea and they love the story. The more they love them, maybe they will start to care because we cannot force you to care if you don't want. But the more I bring this to your face, you'll be like, I think I need to pay attention. What is really happening? You know, what is this? This is what I'm trying to show, you know? The more stories we bring out, the more people will start giving it attention. And what is it about these stories that you think are resonating? resonating. Is it, it's the shared humanity ultimately, mm -hmm. and it is, it is being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Mm. But for those who might be hearing this for the first time, mm. what, what do you want people to know and understand about what it, me what it means to have the, un nobody wants this title, but to have the title of climate refugee? Mm, yeah, it is sometimes a shaming, you know, when you enter some schools and you tell young people that, you know, I'm a climate refugee, they'll be like, oh my God, how, you know? Yeah. But uh, it's also good to show that uh, regardless of who I am and what I have gone through, I'm doing something. I'm standing in front of you. I'm trying to show you this. It is up to you to understand my story and feel the empathy and maybe mm. start doing something because regardless, it will also come to you. You know, it's not going to stop. We saw what was happening when wildfire happened in Canada. New York was also polluted, right. you know. So right. it is coming. You may not see it, but one day it will be there with you. So I try my best to feel, you know, to feel like I'm not a victim. Yeah. But I'm a victim. Wow. This is very powerful. We're all connected. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. And you having been through what you've been through, having turned it into something that is really solution oriented is very, very commendable. Yeah. And you still come across as positive and hopeful. 
Is that an accurate? Is that accurate to say about you? Do you think yeah. we're going to be able to solve this? Yeah, we are going to be able to solve this because I'm working with young people who are very brave, you know? Yeah. You know, when you check uh, Uganda today has so many initiatives that are doing a lot in gender, you know, in children and youth. Like, there are so many upcoming initiatives and innovation that are coming up. For me, that's what gives me positivity and uh, hope that we are moving, at least we are progressing, we are on the right path. So you always find me happy. <laughs> yes, you always it seems find me like happy. It. Because th I'm working with young people. When I go to plant trees on, at schools, young people are always super excited. What else do I need? I don't need any happiness from any leader because they are here just fooling us, twisting the speeches, <laughs> and move out. So that's why I haven't even entered any se session. Here at COP28. Mm -hmm. So what was the point of coming then? My point was to come and lobby. Yeah. for my organization. Mm. Because all in all, that money, once it is approved, it has to go to these people yeah. in the community. So I have to make sure I lobby for them the information they need. So I'm looking for all the information. I'm gathering books and everything and funding for my organization. Make sure we take back the information. <laughs> That's all we need. The resources, the information, the, the human resources, capital, the human capital, the knowledge. Absolutely. Okay, so in the last few moments we have you, mm -hmm. before you go back to the world that is COP28, this bubble that we're in in Dubai here mm -hmm. in the United Arab Emirates, yeah. um, can I ask you, what are you, what, what is the hope and the takeaway from the next couple days, weeks? Mm, I'll be so happy to see if they frontline some few issues. The first one is still on climate mobility. You know, I'm a migrant. And I, I'm sure there are so many migrants out here who are not heard. So if they bring that topic, mm. I want to see it somewhere, at least added on agenda, where they talk about it. The second thing is the countries that have made their names in exploitation and extraction of oil, they should come out and endorse the fossil fuel non purification treaty. We need to phase our fossil fuel right now, not 2030 and 2050. Our partner for the, the broadcast. transition is to start now, if we are to win this transition, mm. it has to start now when people are still actually alive. Mm. We don't know what might happen. People are dying. You know? This is evident everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Naomi, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. As we continue on talking about the refugee crisis that impacts of climate are bringing on increasingly around the world, I'm thrilled to have an expert panel joining us. Our three experts have very different backgrounds, but are going to contribute their perspectives to this conversation. First, we have Sherry Goodman. She is the board chair for the Center of Climate for Climate and Security. Welcome, Sherry. Happy to be here. We have Amali Tower, the founder and executive director of Climate Refugees. Welcome, Amali. Happy to be here, thank you. And Kuno Abdi, Country Director of Mercy Corps. Welcome, Kuno. Thank you. Okay, let me start with you, Sherry. So, you are a climate and security expert. You are the United States' first ever Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for the Environment. And you are very well known for creating this term threat multiplier so that the defense uh, the, the Department of Defense in the United States would be able to talk about climate and how impacts of climate are making other risks, security risks, that much worse. So tell us, from your vantage point, how is climate change intensifying co conflicts around the world and creating new threats around the world? Okay, thank you very much, Shed, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to broaden the concept of threat multiplier well beyond what militaries do because it's a broader security concept and we're here speaking today uh, on the day at the cop that's about with a major declaration on climate relief peace and recovery and i think that's very important because 
we're talking about the risks we see from climate, which I have characterized as a threat multiplier, amplifying other risks, uh, whether it's of terrorism or great power competition. But we also have to deeply understand this in human security terms at the local level. And that's why I think that we need to understand fragility, vulnerability, the factors that lead to increasing displacement of uh, vulnerable populations because of inadequate food and water. So those are the physical threat multipliers of climate change mm -hmm. from drought, heat, uh, increasing sea level rise, extreme storms, then leading to the food, water insecurity that then is leading further to displacement and migration of people at a greater rate than any time since World War II. Okay, thank you for setting up that context because this is a humanitarian crisis. It's a security crisis. And if we, depending on how we frame it, we get various attention from various organizations and, and funding. And ultimately, that is what we need. We heard from Naomi just now, we need to be able to build this loss and damages fund up because we know that increased displacement is on its way. How do you feel about that, Amali? And given you have spent your career really interviewing people who've been displaced by climate change, tell us a little bit more about what is needed by people, especially in terms of resources. Yes, sure, that's a great question. Thanks for having me. Um, what I would say is um, why we're seeing such an increased uh, number of d displaced people, as Sherry said, more than we've ever had uh, in history. And let's, let's be mindful, every year the number goes up right. by several million. And today, three times as many people are displaced, uh, at least internally, by climate change than conflict. This is happening because we have sort of missed the chances we had to, uh, to help people adapt in place. So we do need to sort of recognize that the international community did commit to avert, minimize, and address loss and damage. And if we don't address the human rights losses and the development setbacks that climate change poses to marginalized uh, and vulnerable populations who are at risk, then climate change is almost like an oppressive situation that one must flee. And what one is finding is untenable situations, whether, whether that's from rural to urban migration in their own countries. If you're a frontline country that this is happening to, mm. how exactly do you actually support the growing number of displaced people in your country when this is affecting institutions and systems and food security, right. uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the Horn of Africa today, 56 million people are impacted by drought, but there's also concurrent flooding. You know, multi-millions of people have been displaced. And it's the countries with lived experience with this that are actually leading with solutions by cooperating regionally, and that includes across borders. Right, good point. Well, Amali just brought up the Horn of Africa, and so you've had 18 years of experience working in the dryland ecosystem in the Horn of Africa. So what have you seen during those years? Can we give some uh, tangible examples based on what we know is happening. We hear kind of the big impacts, but how, what have you seen on the ground and how is climate change amplifying the situation? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think um, we have, um, we've talked about it already, the, the displacement, uh, the, the multiplier effect of the climate crisis, uh, the displacement in Horn of Africa, Mali mentioned already 56 million people displaced across Horn of Africa and the threat of the, to these populations. Over the years, I think, there are several things that are happening sometimes concurrently and sometimes um, in different places, but of course, all of them contribute to the, to the climate crisis. Uh, Horn of Africa is synonymous with the drought. These droughts were five to 10 years uh, apart. Now it's every other two yeah. years. Yeah. And, and the, the frequency of this drought is, 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 is increasing. We're just coming out of a drought and uh, when we're just coming out of the drought, the flash floods and the floods that come out with good rains are also displacing populations. Mm -hmm. Where I come from now, my uh, hometown in Garissa, in northern Kenya, is, is half of the town is underwater. Uh, water partly from upstream and of course from the, from the rains. These are displacing populations. From a humanitarian crisis of hunger, malnutrition and displacement, and people looking for better pastures and water, to a crisis where people are underwater, croplands are underwater, mm -hmm. Uh, schools are submerged, homes are destroyed, infrastructure is destroyed, the roads are, are, are washed away, and we talk about entire populations that do not have access to basic food, not because they don't even have money, but it's because the roads are impossible. Right, 
Right. Wow. So, I mean, it sounds like from this that there's plenty of water, but we know that's not the case. Yep. And we know that there is conflict that comes from a lack of access to water. What is, the, what is it that worries you about this, Sherry? You've done uh, significant work in this part of the world as well, in Africa, and looking at how this lack of access to water or generally impacts of climate are resulting in increased violence and increased security issues, increased potential um, funnels to terrorist groups. So if you could please talk a little bit about what concerns you regarding this. Well, it takes its toll on democratic governance. Um, particularly, um, it undermines the ability, the legitimacy uh, of democ democratic governance when they can't provide the basics of food, water, and shelter for their people. And that creates avenues for malign actors, mm -hmm. terrorist groups, to sort of work their way in and take advantage of vulnerable populations who don't see other alternatives. So it's important to understand how these, how climate risks are undermining the legitimacy mm -hmm. of the state. Uh, and that becomes critically important. And that's why, again, the, the focus today at the COP on climate peace and recovery, the tools, some of them are in climate finance, a variety of tools. Some of them are in under, having better early warning systems, having better data, and then developing very tailored local strategies for building resilience and peace in, that are specific to the context. I mean, what works in northern Kenya, where your region is, is suffering from severe floods, is not the same as what's going to work in a vulnerable Pacific Island nation, right? So it has to be very specific. Uh, e even, you know, vulnerable communities all around the world, even in developed countries, a lot of coastal communities uh, are extremely at risk. Um, and we see displacement, um, particularly even in the United States, we see coastal communities from Louisiana to Alaska already moving. Um, and you could even say that the disruption in, um, in the politics of the United States is fueled by the growing challenges of having to manage these complex set of risks in addition to other risks. So if we work on climate, we can solve some of these polarization issues that are plaguing the United States and just generally democracies around the world. So, so many reasons to really be focused on this. This number is really distressing, that 1.2 billion people could be forcibly displaced from their homes by 2050. That's, that's a seventh of the world's population, eighth of the world's population, and so, Yet still, despite that prediction, the UN Refugee Convention does not give protected status to climate refugees. Amali, talk to us about this and your frustrations around this. What does this mean that uh, climate refugees aren't getting the same protections as other refugees? Yes, um, well, as, as Sherry just did too, let, let, me, let me just pull back a little bit and reframe this. Um, first of all, we, we don't really know. Um, we, we do have a lot of projections and we, we'd actually put I, in my opinion, maybe a little bit too much emphasis on, on, on these numbers of projections. And that has some consequences. One of uh, we're not paying enough attention then to the protections and instead projections versus protections mm -hmm. If viewers can think of it that way. The second thing is um, it tends to entice a, a far more border security narrative than it does global cooperation. Um, and so I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of big numbers that are really about um, you know, projections that are based on modeling and, and various scenarios. So with that said, I would say um, we don't need to reach these huge numbers to, to think about this as an alarming issue that requires our attention now. Um, isn't one, isn't 10, isn't 1,000, isn't 10,000 or a million people who are unduly displaced, although they've made no contribution to global warming and the climate crisis, isn't that enough suffering for us to be concerned? You know, that's, that's the kind of uh, thinking that I think leads to solutions. The fact is though, that you're absolutely right, we do have a, a protection gap, but I will say that we've come a long way. Um, two things that I wanna say that are positive. One, UNHCR has provided uh, legal guidance um, that does stipulate how the existing refugee convention, which applies to people who are fleeing across borders, um, persecution or conflict, um, and there are about two contexts in which we can see how the convention can apply to people who are also displaced by climate change. Because 
the truth of the matter is most people are, are fleeing a complex web of how, cli how, of how climate change is actually intersecting with all these drivers, which includes conflict. Mm. The second thing is the UN human rights community. Um, we have a UN special rapporteur after decades of advocating from the global south on this point, uh, the UN special rapporteur on human rights in the context of climate change, who did have a report out this year calling for full legal protections for people displaced across borders from climate change and including adopting an optional protocol to the 1951 Refugee Convention, mm -hmm. which I think is exactly a step in the right direction. The last thing I want to say is, um, as I alluded to earlier, many of the frontline countries that are at, already dealing with the worst of this crisis are already leading with solutions, which includes border, border cooperation at the regional level. You see this in the Horn of Africa. You see this through the regional instruments um, uh, in refugee law, in the Cartagena Declaration, in the African uh, Convention definition. And um, I think the Global North could take a lot of leadership from these experiences. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sure. clarifying all of it. Because this is relatively new in terms of discourse in the climate community even. It shouldn't be, like you're saying. We, New Talk Alaska was a community that had to get up and pretty much move inland in the United States, and that was years ago at this point. Yes. So this has been going on for such yeah. some time. Yeah. So by no means is this new, but this is why we're highlighting this topic, because it really it needs to be part of the COP28 discourse. Right. And it is to the extent that we're talking about loss and damages, and we heard uh, Naomi earlier saying that he's disappointed at the at the number that is being put forward because it's pennies to the dollar in terms of what these refugees will need, ha do need and will need. And $100 million for this um, loss and damages fund is not a lot. And so I'd love to hear your opinion, Kunal, on how what you think about the fund. Is it going to go very far? Sash, what do we do to actually derive benefit from something like this? Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, first is to appreciate that uh, this has been pushed for the last 30 years or, or more, three decades or more, to have this fund. The, the, law, the loss and damage fund, I think, is something welcome. That's, that's the uh, point number one. The, the point number two is, is it enough? Of course, not enough. And, and, and number, the third point is, uh, the challenges with the fund itself, one is it doesn't fund climate justice. The, 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 the countries that are bearing the highest a brand of the climate um, uh, climate effect, climate change effect, are the fragile countries, countries that do not have enough and are, of course, having their own problems. W what is happening is this money is not only enough, but of course there is no also framework with which it can be attached to. We are emitting the least greenhouse uh, gases to the to the environment. The countries that are emitting the highest are not necessarily contributing enough to combat the effect of climate change. Mm. So climate justice element is, is, is missing. And finally, I think it will take time before these funds can be accessible to, for implementation for several reasons. One, the framework is not in place. Uh, the compliance mechanisms for um, agencies to access and implement these funds, especially with uh, now um, sitting with the World Bank is, is still absent. So it takes, I mean, quite some time for these funds to be accessible. And, and of course, finally, you mentioned uh, the, the, how, how fun the funds are not enough. So the commitment must be uh, following genuine contributions. So Mexico Tech and Mexico are just uh, leaders globally uh, to increase uh, not only the commitment, but also transform the promises into genuine uh, contributions uh, to fight climate, um, climate change effects. Okay. I would love Amali's thoughts on that. This is what's being talked about now at COB. What are you thinking in terms of the direction that this is going to go? Yeah, it's um, it's quite complicated because while it's a win, you know, given that it took 30 years uh, for, a, for for loss and damage to even be adopted, right? Uh, and that happened last year. And so in one year, we've had this operationalized through uh, the transitional committee that met for for five meetings, which is even more than than intended. And then that proved and showed how contentious and difficult progress is on this issue. I completely agree with Kuno that, you know, uh, we're, we're missing the climate justice element. Mm. The fact is the convention stipulates that global, you know, developed countries were supposed to A, help developing countries uh, provide the, global, the adaptation finance. That hasn't happened. And that 
was my earlier point about why we are seeing such increased displacement. The second issue is we have this uh, principle of common but differentiated responsibilities in respective capacities um, that is not part of the human rights-based approach that the loss and damage uh, fund and its mechanisms needs to really ensure and have in place. So this really speaks to what it takes to make progress. There are a lot of concessions that have to be made. And I don't think that we should, um, you know, be completely only happy about the fact that there's a fund if it doesn't necessarily, A, have this obligation that countries who have polluted need to provide the financing. They need to provide it in time and scale for the people who are at risk of displacement and are increasingly displaced. And thirdly, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily ensure a human rights-based approach. And so when you have the fund uh, sitting at the World Bank, you know, who doesn't really have a history of doing this kind of uh, funding, mm. um, it's, it, it, it does give me a little bit of pause. So I, I, I totally agree. We, we need to do more to now push for these climate justice elements to be a part of the loss and damage. Uh, to be included as part of the fund, to be, to be intrinsic to the exactly. funds as they're disseminated. And we can still do that through the board processes sure. and the mechanisms, but, um, but, but I, you can see how difficult that point yeah. is, right? Yeah. And that's something we should all be able to agree on, you know, but, but unfortunately we don't. We're seeing it increasingly happen happening in the United States government. We see that justice is very much part of the implementation of um, the Justice 40, is very much part of the Inflation Reduction Act's implementation as part of the Biden administration. And I'm curious, Sherry, what your thoughts are about generally financing for these types of covering, recovering from these kinds of tragedies. I know you worked with Newtok, Alaska, and the community that was moved there. And I remember it was costing like $100 million or something just to move a small community of 400 people um, more nine in, miles up river. Yeah, nine. So talk to us about financing in terms of how do we actually get the climate refugees the funds that they need and deserve? How are we going to afford it? Well, I think we have to broaden the conversation. And first, we have to understand that we're already paying the costs. Um, you know, we're paying the costs in hundred billion dollars. You know, we have multiple billion dollar climate risk climate extreme weather events every year, just in the United States and many more around the world. So those costs are already being borne either um, by governments, by the people themselves who are either temporarily or permanently displaced. So if we could, um, you know, and, the, and increasingly the military is even responding to what we call humanitarian assistance and, and disaster relief events. There's a cost to that deployment too. So if we understand that we're already paying for this as a society and then try to move the cost into the right preventive bucket. Now that is always much easier said than done. Um, you know, I think we have been only modest, modestly successful in general in the development space in doing the preventive work as opposed to the post-conflict reconstruction work. It's always harder to get the, the dollars in advance of the conflict or the event or the, so, but there is a move towards doing more disaster risk reduction as opposed to just paying for response on the other end. I think we also have to broaden the concept of climate finance in addition to the loss and damage fund, there's reform of multilateral uh, finan international financial institutions uh, so that the lending practices are changed and that it enables a greater flow of funds to the right people for the right projects. Um, and then I think we're going to have to really think hard that there are going to be parts, uh, you know, areas of communities that cannot as easily support um, life as we have known it in the past. And um, that has to, I mean, that's going to be difficult, but you know, we also know from history, back through world history, that, um, you know, migration is actually an adaptation strategy. So not all migration is bad, right? And we have to sort of think about that in the context of, um, you know, the United States is, is a country of migrants. I mean, my parents are immigrants and many, uh, and many are immigrants. And so, and for sometimes for good and sometimes for challenging reasons. Um, but we have to sort of be an innate, where it's purposeful, uh, it, we have to be an enabler of that. Um, and I think that's particularly going to be true in fragile 
coastal regions around the world, parts of the U.S., but parts of small islands, nations, uh, and those are going to be some of the most difficult to address. Um, but I think we need to be clear-eyed about it and, and think more holistically. Yes, no, very well put. We have to think about, we know that migrations are going to be happening. We know that most people stay as close to their original uh, location as possible, but increasingly they're crossing borders. So, Amali, how do you think about the, a host country receiving a population outside of its, its actual uh, sovereign nation? So, what do we think about in terms of where people are moving and then how they are being received? Well, um, most migration across borders are going to happen to uh, to a neighboring country. And because this is impacting the global south disproportionately, that also means then the countries who are feeling the worst and the most brunt of the climate crisis are also then playing host to climate displaced populations across borders. Um, so again, that's, that, that shows you not only is there is that a double sort of unfairness, and don't forget also that the Global South already hosts about 86% of the refugees right. all around the world, right? We are um, at about 114 million forcibly displaced people in the world. Of that, only about 36 million people are actually refugees. Mm. So then think about the difference in that number. And, you know, they're internally displaced, again, in climate co countries that are frontline of the climate crisis, um, and, and they're asylum seekers, or, and, and climate's interwoven in all of these sort of buckets of how we categorize people. But you don't see global South countries belly aching to the same extent as you do in the global North, mm -hmm. who are not sharing that responsibility. In fact, they're actually pushing people back. I, I point to the Mediterranean, I point, point to the U.S. southern border. Um, you know, you, you, we all know what these policies look like. Um, in, in June, you had the worst Mediterranean boat tragedy to date. Mm. Over 56,000 people, I think it is, have, have died in the Mediterranean since crossings began. And if you look at the populations that were on that boat, um, I'll, I'll point to Pakistan being one example. And we all know that Pakistan had devastating floods last year, where a third of that country was underwater. Uh, Nigeria also around the same time. A lot of these same populations, I would encourage people to look at who are the populations on these boats and what are the conditions ongoing in these countries and what role does climate play? So that's what this looks like. Um, you're seeing a lot of mixed sort of movements, and you're seeing the Global South not only be bearing the brunt of the crisis, but also playing host to increasing numbers of forcibly displaced populations. So the Global North needs to step up, not just with climate finance and, and a human rights-based approach to loss and damage, but also find regional uh, cooperation um, for people that's coming to its borders as well. If I could just offer sure. one, uh, one example of a potentially hopeful example is that Vanuatu and Australia have just made an arrangement where uh, if the, pop the population of Vanuatu will have ability to relocate to Australia. Now, is that a perfect solution? No. But is it better than um, closed borders? Is it reflecting uh, a recognition of um, the need to accommodate a population whose um, you know, that, that may lose parts of their uh, atoll and their land to sea level rise and loss of fresh water in the future. So I think um, we are going to have to have more arrangements like that in the future. Uh, and we're beginning to see some of those kind of combinations emerge, which I think is a somewhat hopeful sign in a very challenging situation. Sure, sure. And it is, I mean, it is challenging, right? Because we're asking people to leave what they they know their culture, their values, that there's such an attachment to the land and where you're born and where you're raised and all of that. And as somebody who's been working in Africa and has seen it firsthand, what, tell us from the community's perspectives, how they are, how, how do they deal with it truly? How do they deal with it and how do they find peace um, following such an uprooting event in their lives? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a, not a very easy question to answer. Definitely um, with, uh, with the displacements and of course, uh, the, uh, what we're dealing with in uh, the drylands ecosystem, especially in Kenya and, um, and uh, Somalia, of course, 
80% of the land is, is, is dry land ecosystem and uh, the main traditional practice is pastoralism. Uh, they have strong cultural attachment to this land. And uh, um, uh, Sherry already mentioned that uh, movement and migration is not necessarily bad. Uh, mobility is the core anchor of pastoralism as a tradition. Mm. Uh, unless they move freely, they cannot survive. So it, it depends on the, uh, the, the, the rainfall and, and, uh, and the patterns. And uh, there is disruption of this movement, either by flooding or by severe droughts or uh, by administrative uh, boundaries that are not necessarily favorable to movement. So there are so many layers to, to it. And uh, we increasingly seeing uh, pastoralists uh, displaced to urban centers and they cannot cope. They have no skills, they cannot fit. Uh, the, good, the, good, the good news is that over the years, for the last 15 years, uh, especially in Kenya and, and the region, Moscow has been working with these communities improving their resilience, coping mechanisms, and, and, and working on the rangelands, rehabilitating the rangelands, and integrating with the government um, efforts to institutionalize, understand, and better cope. And, and that is what we're doing. However, what we're doing is not necessarily enough. We need more investments, more money. And, 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 and this is what uh, Amali said. Um, the, ad the adaptation fund itself is only 1% funded. Uh, we're talking about in, in the 10 fragile states, um, most fragile uh, climate vulnerable states. We're talking about 283 million, uh, according to a Mexico research very recently received, uh, released. So this is like, it's, it's, it's peanuts. And, and uh, it's, it's affecting communities um, and we need, we need more investments. And, and I mean, the time is of essence. There is no time. Yeah, we don't have time. Exactly, we don't have time. Sherry, but please. Let, I mean, let's also broaden the, co the, the concept of where the investment can come from. Even when governments are falling short, um, there is, and you see it here at COP, massive investment from the private sector. And we need that, we need that for the energy transition. You know, just today is an announcement by 40 countries of tripling um, nuclear, civilian nuclear energy by 2050. Many of that, much of that is going to happen actually in the African continent um, because there's, there's new advanced technologies that allow for small modular and micro reactors more safely to be deployed that will meet the needs of local communities and can power local communities. And I see that happening around the world. A lot of that investment is going to come from the private sector. Sure. And so we need to be able to, you know, aggregate all the opportunities here and, uh, that will help us yes. uh, in the long run. And we are, look, we are very forward thinking. We're looking at the opportunities, we're seeing what's working and we're sharing that so we can actually learn lessons across sectors, across the public-private divide. Amali, I'm gonna come to you for the final word as we wrap this incredible conversation. Thank you all for contributing your expertise to this. Amali. Well, let me just um, maybe, maybe say that, let, let's really look at the heart of what people are going through. Um, we, you know, climate refugees released a report um, from visiting 10 locations in Kenya, a middle to low income country. Kenya is integral to exactly what Sherry just said. Kenya also hosts two of the largest refugee camps in the world. If Kenya is seeing development setbacks and massive human rights losses because of the climate crisis, how do you expect such a incredible partner and important country to the stabilization of Africa. You know, th this, is, this is where this is all going in the wrong direction. Um, a pastoralist um, farmer told me, we, we cannot recover from the cascading effects of climate change. And we have to re recognize that just as we all are going through an economic crisis post the pandemic, right? Uh, Ukraine and the fuel crisis, all of these things have cascading effects is how I took that statement. You know, um, I met children who have who were going to school and we were achieving that sustainable development goal who have now had to forego school because they have to go and fetch water that is increasingly drying in Kenya. And these water holes are getting deeper and deeper and even capsizing on people, you know, and actually burying them alive. That's the kind of losses you're seeing. Uh, in terms of climate change. So, you know, all this investment's great, but I really would love for people to recognize it's a crisis. So it can't, we can't wait six months and a year. This is not loss and damage that's happening in the future. 
This is loss and damage that has been happening for many years already. Very powerful. And actually, that is the most poignant point to end this segment on. This is a crisis. We're in a climate crisis. We're in a climate refugee crisis. We have been for some time, and we must address it urgently. So again, thank you to the panelists for the work that you do and contributing your expertise to this critical topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Shweta. What a great panel. Such an important topic to, to, to really dig deeper into. Uh, this uh, is now concluding this session, and we're going to move into the next session about Planet Pledge. Uh, can marketeers be part uh, of the solution to the climate crisis? We've seen a number of businesses and industries who have found innovative and also groundbreaking new solutions to help cut emissions, reduce pollution, reuse otherwise wasted resources, and push our planet a bit closer to net zero. But when it comes to communicating climate solutions, selling the story of the climate crisis, and reaching the right audiences, what can we learn from the industry that does it best? The mar marketers. We know that we have the solutions, so could it be the case that solving the climate crisis is simply a marketing problem? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today with leaders and marketing aficionados from three large businesses in an open panel. So I'm now handing it back to uh, the CEO of We Don't Have Time, North America, Shuta Chakraborty, who will be moderating this session from Dubai. Thank you, Katerina, for setting the stage for this conversation. On stage with me here in Dubai at COP28 is Rupin Desai, CMO and venture partner for Unaterra. Welcome, Rupin. Thank you. And joining me on Zoom is Priyash Sarma, head of corporate affairs and sustainability at Unilever. Welcome, Priya. Hi, and everyone, and thanks. Great to see you. And then we Thank have you. Stefan, CEO of World Federation of Advertisers. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. So let's get right into it, because this is a conversation that is long overdue. And we actually met right in person at Can Lion, which is really known for marketing. And I've never considered going to an event like Can because why would climate people be there? But we were. And I'm sure we'll be there again. And increasingly, climate is part of this conversation. So it goes to show that this industry is really recognizing that it has a massive role to play. Nobody gets that better than you. So let's start actually talking about why marketing today is potentially incompatible with the sustainable future. So clearly, because there's been no climate and sustainability people at the, in these conversations, now there are. But what's been going on? Why is that the case? I mean. If, look, we're, we're at COP, right? And 70,000 of us. So obviously the future of the planet is very important to us. And then when we look at numbers like it's going to take us 2073 to reach sustainable development goals, or 132 years for gender equity, or 90% of the world's plastic not being uh, re recycled, sustainability is the biggest challenge of our time. Mm. So every business, no matter small, big, every business needs to take responsibility for it. And I think it's a moment of reflection for us as marketeers because the language of growth has actually translated into profit at the cost of people and the planet. So marketing has created concepts like consumerism, upsizing, fast fashion, planned obsolence, and therefore, as it stands today, marketing isn't compatible with a sustainable world, but we do need to change. Hmm. So, Stefan, let me come to you to, for your thoughts on what Rupin just said. Um, what is what are the pledges and initiatives to, that are really going to bring us the marketing industry to really make some serious commitments to uh, a more sustainable future? So, actually, the, the Planet Pledge is um, 
is a commitment signed by 38 of the world's largest brand owners. Um, collectively, they represent uh, approximately 70 billion US dollars of ad spend uh, annually, which is which is very considerable. And we've just announced in the run up to to COP last week, seven additional signatories of major brands, including Nestle, Vodafone, um, HP, and, and a few more. Um, now. Why is Planet Pledge actually so important uh, for marketers to be addressing uh, the uh, climate emergency? Two reasons, really. One is um, it is the CMO, the chief marketing officers, that is actually becoming the climate champion in the company. So essentially, this is about marketers embracing the climate transition, the climate emergency as an opportunity to be um, uh, driving um, growth, more sustainable growth um, in their companies. So this is not about parking the climate challenge as a sort of uh, corporate social responsibility program. This is about changing the company's strategy and embracing the future. And the future is a very different future to uh, what we've seen so far. So far. And um, Rupin just alluded to that. The second um, um, reason why, why the plan pledge is, is so important for marketers to embrace uh, the, um, the the climate emergency. It's it's all about acceleration. Um, um, even the largest brand owners don't have the time nor the resources to all figure it out by themselves. And so the plan page is actually creating um, um, common assets, uh, whether that's for training, whether that's for um, um, ethical guidance on the use of environmental claims. It also creates platforms to uh, share learnings, the good and the bad and the ugly in order again to be accelerating uh, the, the pace of change. Now, maybe just a word um, uh, about, about what, what those commitments entail. So when, when a company signs up to plan pledge, what is it committing to? One is it, it commits to a race to zero. So it commits to a public accountable commitment for the entire company to be climate neutral by 2050. That's, that's the conditio sine qua non. And that creates a very solid foundation for making sure that those who sign up to, to plan pledge are truly committed to, to change. It also entails a commitment that the brand owner invites, encourages all their supply chain partners to do the same. So basically leveraging the unique position of brand owners in the value chain to make sure that we, we scale this effort uh, quickly. The second commitment is, is a commitment that addresses the knowledge gap. It's a commitment about training. We've, we've, um, we've found that there's still a significant knowledge gap in terms of what marketers know and should be knowing with respect to the climate emergency and sustainability in general. The third commitment is about uh, a commitment to share learnings. Again, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because no one has really figured it out, or a few may have, but you can't say that there's a large scale of companies that have figured out how to normalize more sustainable consumer behavior. And this is about making sure that we get inspiration and learnings across sectors to be shared so that we are faster at, at, at driving that change. And finally, as marketers, I encourage to embrace um, uh, sustainability and embrace the climate agenda as a way to stand out in competition. We want to make sure they do that in a manner that is ethical and responsible. And so we've created the first global guidelines um, in order to avoid greenwashing. Uh, and those guidelines are shared across the entire global market community. Thank you, Stefan. I'm gonna come to Priya next. Priya, uh, from what Stefan just said, I'd love to hear your thoughts. How do you feel about circularity as part of these pledges? So how can brands play a role in driving more sustainable and circular behavior? This is very much part of the initiatives that are that Stefan was talking about. So. Talk to us a little bit about how that can be actually achieved by the brands. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me here. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Rupin. So uh, I'm, I'm really, I think one of the places that I'm going to be talking from is my uh, position as chair of the Circular Packaging Association uh, in the region. Um, now, if, if you'll allow me, I'm just going to take a few seconds to highlight where are we today and where is it that we really want to get to, right? Um, where we are today essentially is a consumptive economy and um, it's really what we call a linear model where we, are, we take, make and dispose 
data. Uh, essentially, what it means is we are treating very limited resources as if they are in, available in abundance. Uh, we extract them from the environment, from the planet, uh, make the products that we want, which are then quickly disposed of. Um, and the place that we really want to come to is a circular economy model, which by its very nature tends to be very restorative and regenerative because the concept of waste does not exist out there. Yeah? It's the way a circular economy works is one individual or industry's waste then becomes a resource for someone else. And that essentially means products, components, services, materials, along with all of the byproducts, essentially circulate at the highest value and for the longest period of time within this ecosystem. And a, the current linear model, which I talked about, is primarily about extraction taking, is designed to reward primarily just one party, which is the company that is putting the goods out there. A circular model, on the other, other hand, is a very systemic approach to economic development, and please note I'm talking about sustained economic development that is designed to benefit all parties. It's about benefiting businesses, societies, and the environment. Yeah, And like I said, at its heart lies continued economic development, because what we're really talking about is the gradual decoupling of growth from the consumption of very finite resources that we have. We know we have finite resources. Um, and we're not really talking about less, we are talking about using what we have in a much, much better way. Yeah, And this is really about, therefore, redesigning materials, products, using certain products as services. Yeah, There are certain things, for instance, I have a printer in my house. I hardly use it. Do I really need to buy it at, at a product, as a product, or can I just hire it from a particular company, which will actually bring into play new business models? So what essentially is required is a fundamental really change in attitudes and behaviors across industry, society. It's about really a lifestyle change for individuals. It's a mindset change for industry where we have to start looking at everything in a very new, new way and a very different way. And this is where brands and marketing really have a very kind of a dual or a triple role to play. The first really is if we look at packaging, packaging waste, which is a lot of the pollution that Rupin was alluding to at the start, is what we really see out uh, you know, in the oceans, rivers, in the environment. This is where we have to start with what we call designing for circularity. This is what companies then have to start with, where they uh, have to rethink the process of creating a product from the beginning, focused on sustainability with a respect for the environment. That has to be the starting point. Um, and then the second place uh, where brands and marketing really have a very large to play, uh, role to play is with regards to uh, you know, using the power of the brands and the reach and the scale of the brands to start educating consumers and start incentivizing them. And this is a big role that we know that brands, corporates have to play in store, with, in collaboration with retailers. And it's just something that we are really focused on doing. So thanks. So there was a lot to unpack from that, and I'm going to come back to you with some probing questions. I'm going to move back to Rupin, who's here on stage with me in Dubai, and ask you, putting you on the spot first, because you're here in person, and uh, it, that's, so it's easier for me to do. But this question is going to come to the other panelists as well, so please pay attention to Rupin's response to this. How do we deal with the accusation of greenwashing? And now, in addition to greenwashing, um, how do we deal with the accusation of green hushing, which at we don't have time, we say is equally as bad, not communicating uh, the transition to clean energy and the journey that a particular company and brand is on is, is almost just as bad because then it suggests that nothing is really underway and it's not inspiring the sector as a whole to think about the transition. And so where, how do you address these accusations of green hushing as well as green hushing? I think we, we need to acknowledge that these accusations come because there are quite a few bad plays, more than good mm -hmm. plays, and therefore are essential in keeping the pressure on all of us and the responsibility on all of us. But at the same time, I think as companies, we need to move away from seeking perfection rather than talking mm -hmm. about progress. I mean, 100% transparency, even when you fail, 
even when you had a, had a mistake, even when you made a commitment for a particular year and are not going to meet it, is probably being appreciated far better than not talking about it, mm. hiding behind it, uh, hushing about it. So I think, I think increasingly the world is moving to appreciating transparency and some form of action. As imperfect uh, as it may be, rather than no action or no, no words. Well, that's authentic, right? Yes. The point is, is that we're not perfect. There's no point in shaming anyone because we're all, the writing is on the wall and we see some sectors transitioning faster than others, yes. right? Food and agriculture has historically been talked about. Transportation is the largest emitter of carbon and so it has a massive focus. We see that in the United States absolutely as part of uh, President Biden's initiative to transition to clean energy and to really electrify transportation. So. There are certain sectors that have already started the process, and we don't have to shame those that are following suit, maybe a little bit slower. But now that the knowledge is out there, we need to accelerate. We need to move things along. So I'm going to turn back to my panelists here via Zoom. Um, Stefan, let me come to you. How do you think about this? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to say that's, that's precisely where we think marketers need to play. We want marketers to embrace the climate transition and, uh, and the opportunities that it creates to stand out with novel products and services. That's what it's exactly all about. Uh, and therefore, when we hear about um, uh, green hushing or green washing, we're concerned um, because they're, they're realities. You know, the green washing uh, accusation is, is, is real. Um, the commission <clears throat> ran a survey last year that established that more than half of the environmental claims were actually not substantiated. So that, that's an issue you know, because longer term, we can't have that type of level of, um, of, of greenwashing if we want to build trust and confidence with consumers, if we want marketers to be able to um, compete on environmental claims. And so um, you may be surprised to hear that, but we're actually very much applauding um, regulators, and in particular the European Commission that is actually setting, um, I think, a very imp important precedent in actually creating a legal framework that establishes strong principles that demands uh, substantiation of environmental claims in order to be building that trust uh, among consumers. Otherwise, it's not going to work. No. On the other hand, we feel that this um, um, rate framework needs to get the balance right. You know, It's very, very important that we have principles that apply to the entire, entire market. You don't get rogue traders to get away with, with claims that, that are actually not substantiated. On the other hand, you want to make sure that you're actually still offering the opportunity for those companies that are more innovative to be actually going out there and outcompete their competitors. No? And so you need to be making sure that the regulatory framework doesn't become overly restrictive and in the end treats everyone equal and actually encourages companies to green hush. No? Um, and that is, that is a real risk. You know, according to a survey that we ran last year among marketers, roughly um, a, a third of, of companies say that they're hesitating to actually um, go public with claims for precisely that reason. You know? And so we are in this, we're in this moment um, that is actually um, a very important moment for the industry to, uh, in terms of helping regulators get that balance right. We're very, working very closely with the European Commission. We're, by the way, very encouraged by what has been established so far um, um, at the EU level. We think it's, it sets a very good precedent. And we, on the basis of that, we want marketers to be actually, as you say, to be embracing the challenge, except that at times they may not be perfect and, and recognize that, correct it. But in the end, it is competition, creativity, uh, innovation, communication that is going to be helping us change consumer behavior. And that's where really where marketers have a role to play in the climate transition that we urgently need and that we're encouraging. That's very much what we're focused on. Excellent, Stefan. No, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that data, too, because we're, it's, it, it, we can use that survey results to really guide how marketers are going to be approaching this transition and really understand what various stakeholders are looking for. So thank you for sharing that. I'm, Priya, I'm going to come to you. Um, the former CEO of Unilever is here at COP28, and we saw him yesterday, in fact. And historically, your company is um, doing pretty well in terms of perception of companies. So talk to us about, maybe you're not suffering from this problem as much as some of the other companies are, but how do you think about green, how does Unilever think about greenwashing and green hushing and what can, what can other companies learn from your historical learnings? 
Yeah, I was, um, I was quite, uh, yeah, I know Paul Pullman is out there and I was in a round table where he, uh, you know, he provided the keynote. So I was really happy to speak, uh, to actually speak with him and see him. Um, so with regards to Unilever, I think, and especially with regards to things like greenwashing and greenhushing, I think there are two or three aspects. One is, one, one of the things that tends to happen is when people don't know enough, so they either you know, they might end up leaving out pieces of information, uh, which then, uh, you know, set them up for being accused of greenwashing. So I think one of the key things out here is that companies and, you know, especially if you're going to have marketers be at the forefront of driving consumer change, educating consumers, I think they have to be as educated uh, about uh, sustainability and about the conversations that they need to drive. So I think that is one thing. Uh, with things like green hushing, I think what you also then need for companies to do is, of course, like Rupin mentioned, there has to be elements of transparency. We tend to learn not just from success, but also from failures. I think they are such an important learning. And this is one of the things that Unilever, I think, has been pretty transparent about, especially with regards to the uh, sustainable living plan, which was introduced when Paul, Paul Pullman joined as CEO. And we were quite clear that we had set very ambitious targets for ourselves. Uh, you know, it wasn't as if we were going to achieve all of them, but we were going to try and drive ourselves and be as ambitious as we could. And uh, uh, in our CTP or climate transition act uh, plan, we did completely outlined where we had landed our successes and where we felt we needed to do a lot more. Um, and I think the other thing besides the transparency is, of course, having very robust from frameworks. So it's important that as organizations, you should have an end plan. So, you know, there are a lot of companies that are committing to net zero by 2050, but it's so important that you also have the short, medium, and long-term targets or goals to showcase how is it that you're going to get there. And then over a period of time, keep outlining where you sit with regards to each of them. So I think if you actively pursue such a strat strategy and are communicating openly, are collaborating with your industry, I think then you are on the path to success. Fantastic, thank you for that Priya. And so we see these companies here present at COP, right? So there's a, a private sector is heavily represented here. Increasingly every year, we're seeing more of a private sector presence. What about the marketing presence of these different various companies? How do you feel about the marketers being here? And uh, should that improve in number? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I have met more marketeers here than any other previous cops. So that is obviously a great, great. sign. Yes. Okay. Uh, Stefan is on his way here as well. Okay. Again, showing the industry's commitment to it. Uh, should the numbers increase? Absolutely. If marketeers have to be a part of the solution, if marketeers have to find new languages of value, new languages of storytelling, new ways to convincing their own companies and consumers, you've got to be at the place where both challenges and solutions are being discussed. Right. And so there's opportunity here for marketers to really learn and to take back to their respective companies and to use a language that is perhaps more consistent. That And that, as a scientist, I will tell you, is key. That's the science of communication to really drive behavioral change. So what is the opportunity then for marketers? Look, we, the, I mean, I'm a big optimist, okay? And I'm a big believer in marketing. And I think the, the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity lies in moving away from the growth language, which is profit at the cost of people and planet. So products, services, communication, uh, influence, humor, magic, which mm -hmm. are all the, the strengths of marketing at the service of business models that drive prosperity for people, prosperity for planet, prosperity for all stakeholders, a language that is regenerative, mm -hmm. a language of growth that is humanized, and moves away from the Milton Friedman doctrine, which is let's create profit for the shareholder at the cost of everyone else. And therein lies both a challenge and our opportunity. So you're saying that there's an opportunity to be profitable without being greedy, without completely exploiting the planet. Oh, that is essential. You see, none of the companies we market for are NGOs or for profits. 
Therefore, finding a mechanism where prosperity is extended, but not at the cost of prosperity for the company, prosperity is extended to all stakeholders, including the shareholder, lies our biggest, biggest opportunity. Well, that might have been a mic drop moment, but I'll come back to you for an additional mic drop before we close out this session. Let me come back to you, Stefan, and then uh, Priya as well, to get your thoughts on your thoughts and your hopes for the outcomes of COP28. Stefan, it sounds like you're coming. Priya, you have a contingent here, of course, from your company. So uh, let me start with you, Stefan. What are you hoping as a marketer to hear as an outcome from COP28? So it's, it's going to be my third uh, climate summit. And, um, and, and I've always been struck, um, whether it's in Glasgow, Sharm El Sheikh, and hopefully now in Dubai, about how much um, goodwill there is, actually how much appetite there is from different stakeholders in the climate, um, um, in the climate um, uh, community to be actually hearing from marketers and to be engaging with marketers. And, um, and I've always been incredibly inspired by, by, by people I've come across that aren't necessarily part of our lives, not of our bubbles, you know, and, and, and that's really what, what COPs are all about. If there was one, one hope I have for, for COP here in Dubai, it is, it is, it is for, um, it is for governments um, to understand what we're discussing in this panel here, which is to you know how important it is to offer opportunities for marketers to 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 drive um, consumer behavior change in the manner that actually uh, enables marketers to to use what they're best at, you know, which is creativity, communication, innovation and win in the marketplace. If we can leverage that, um, if we can leverage that energy, that creativity, I think we can be a huge contribution to, um, to, um, to, to, to the climate debate. Now, we've, we've, as I mentioned earlier, we've, um, we've been polling our, um, our chief marketing officers all around the world to understand where they are on this journey. You know? And the reality today is, is that roughly half of the CMOs that have responded to our survey, over 900 CMOs from all around the world, half of are telling us that they are um, making the initial steps in the transformation um, of marketing. But 15%, one in six are saying that they're already well advanced. And all our obsession and focus and determination is to be tipping this very, very fast. And for this, we need actually a framework that actually encourages it. And we talked you know, um, a minute ago about the importance of creating a legal framework that actually encourages marketers to compete on environmental claims, um, avoiding greenwashing, of course, but actually inviting marketers to compete on environmental claims for them to be promoting the innovation in terms of products and services that are going to be enabling consumers to be making the changes they want to be making in their lives. And so our hope um, um, in, to, uh, in, in Dubai is, is to be getting governments to understand our opportunity that working with marketers, leveraging um, the marketer creativity um, and innovation is actually an opportunity for all of us to move faster. <clears throat> Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for your thoughts on that. We're looking forward to seeing if, if, what the outcomes of COP28 are, especially for the marketing community. I am going to just come to Priya for what you have one minute, and this will be your, the closing statement of your hopes for COP28. Please, Priya. Uh, thanks. So I'm, you know, I'm going to jump off what Stefan and Stefan. I'm so happy to say, uh, you know, to see the WFA really behind it because I know once you get be uh, you guys got behind get behind something, I know there's going to be a real uh, push. Um, I think, um, you know, for me, what I'm, what, what I was really excited to hear yesterday in the roundtable that I uh, attended was about the narrative that we need to change, right? So one of the things I mentioned is, of course, in order for marketers to get behind this, they have to understand the story. What is it that we want to educate and tell our consumers? How do we actually get them to uh, make those choices and move the needle? But I think it's equally important today when you talk to consumers, they're very confused. You know, they don't understand their role. They think it's such a big problem that they have to uh, try and address. And what is their role? As one individual, what are they trying to do? It's a narrative that they're hearing of gloom and doom. So I think the big role that marketing really has to play is how do you shift that narrative, make it one of hope, of the future, of opti optimism, which is where Rupin, I think, really started from. And I think that's really the big bucket where marketing can play and help move the needle. 
Priya, awesome. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Final 30 seconds to Rupin. What is your hope for coming out of COP28? Look, my hope is to be a great dad. I have two young girls and I want to use every superpower, including marketing, including communication that I'm good at to be able to give them a world that is far better than the one they seem to be inheriting right now. Okay, well, let's make that happen. Thank you so much to this expert panel of marketers for sharing their thoughts. And with that, back over to you, Sweden. Well, thank you so much, Shutta. Um, I'd like just to add also the perspective of, the, of social media and the influencers. In Sweden, we had a had this debate now for a while on, on what we call green influencers, that people are afraid of becoming green influencers because if they're not 100% perfect, they don't want to portray anything on social media because they're afraid of being accused of greenwashing. And of course, this has to stop. We need to be able to push uh, and, and showcase the stuff that we're doing that is good and that is working. So this is a way of, of looking at, at the marketing as another perspective in social media. And of course, this affects young people, and this is also a segue to the next session that we will talk about uh, the future voices. And now it's time for our Youth Empowerment Hub, which is going to be hosted again, once again but by, by my colleague, Wasa Sambe. And I think you need to sit here, Wasa, so let's swap places and I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, great work again, as always, uh, Katarina, on this. And uh, yes, uh, today I have uh, had the great privilege in the Youth Hub to have a lot of amazing youths and actually I think you can actually see the youth hub here behind me. We have people from India, Kenya, uh, Somalia um, and Bangladesh and uh, yes pretty much from everywhere, Thailand as well. So um, these uh, youth voices are strong voices who have their chance to get their voices heard in the youth hub but we will also hear from them a little bit later and in fact I will also hear now from two uh, really powerful voices, actually, both right now in Dubai. Uh, my first guest uh, today is Rohan Pandit, who is the executive director of Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action, which is a SF Bay Area based non profit and it's dedicated to empowering high schools and college students to combat climate change immediately. How? Well, through impactful educations and policy initiatives. Welcome, Rowan, to, uh, to this uh, talk. I'm really happy that you're here with me. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Rowan, can you just uh, firstly uh, explain a little bit uh, w uh, what's, behind your, what's behind your drive and your passion to, do, uh, to be involved in the Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think for me, you know, before this this job, I had previously worked for uh, a California state senator and I, I got a, a better understanding of sort of the climate policy landscape specific to California. Um, what I really realized is that we need to build more political will and, 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 and shepherd a lot more youth into climate careers. Right. Um, because these are these are youth that we need to to be thinking about uh, climate solutions um, if we have any chance at combating climate change in the future. So that was really my motivation into getting into this line of work. Um, and and we, need, we need all hands on deck, right? So I think motivating as many youth as possible to get involved now uh, will allow them to be better equipped to be the leaders that they need to be for, for the future. Boys, can you explain for me the whole initiative? That's amazing, Rowan. Uh, and I really, you know, uh, we chatted before, and I, I, I'm really intrigued about the work that you're doing, obviously, with the right. impactful education that, you, that you're doing throughout your area. So can you tell, tell us a little bit about the methods that you, that you are using? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, one reason our organization has been able to have some level of success in the climate movement, because it's really organized or it's really hard to organize youth. Right. As many people know, um, I think we create a model that really engages youth 
that actually that, that care already about climate change, and we provide them exposure and opportunities to turn that change into uh, that passion into real systemic change. Um, and a, I think a big part of that is is truly teaching them how things work in the real world, right? Like we want to bring them early on into understanding how does the legislative process work. How does uh, how do the systems of government work? How does public policy work? And not just even at the macro level, uh, at the federal level, or even at the state level in California, but even at the micro level locally, where uh, uh, you can really make a dent in their local communities, right? Um, to talk a little bit more about our approach, um, it's, it's unique in the sense that we have specific action teams, right? According to uh, our, our each hometown, uh, or uh, uh, their specific interests, if it's transit policy, if it's energy, energy policy or whatnot, in these action teams, when they get onboarded to our organization, they learn about the subject matter, uh, they really get in the weeds of climate policy and actually do things like read and analyze uh, uh, their, their hometown's climate action plan and, and, and search for better solutions. Um, but what I really think sets us apart and, and why we're able to sort of sustain this momentum is because they actually learn about the specific issues and how to be effective advocates, how to uh, give a, a powerful public comment at their city council from other youth, from their peers themselves, right? Um, and youth motivate youth, and, and they provide mentorship to each other. In addition, um, each action team has typically an adult leader in the room who uh, is, is a staunch community advocate or policy expert to help guide the youth uh, uh, and, and, and kind of expose them to other uh, opportunities that they could get a, a better understanding of the political landscape to champion a, an initiative and to help us stay on top of solutions. So they, they learn about the issues in the action team. And then uh, in these specific action teams, we actually connect our youth to key stakeholders in their community. And that may be uh, uh, mayors, city council members, elected officials, nonprofit leaders, climate tech industry leaders. So they're learning, you know, about the issues from every different sector, right? And, and that in turn learns to, they, they, they learn to sharpen their voice, uh, they, they learn to build confidence in advocating for climate solutions and what they believe in. And it sounds simple, right? But when you have 25 to 50 youth that show up to a city council meeting, everybody perks up, right? All, 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 the, uh, all the elected officials perk up and they pay attention. And they even come back to our youth to ask for their perspective on, on climate issues. So that's, that's sort of how our system works and how we're able to make a change. Well, that's that's really amazing. I also want to just uh, check with you because you do, do say that youth attracts youth. Like, so when you have those youth le leaders that you mentioned, like, how do you how right. do you get them on board? Like, how are they recruited? Yeah, well, this is fantastic. Uh, you know, a lot of them are already very motivated, so they're looking for organizations. And uh, yeah, for, for reference, in, in California, we had just passed this year a climate literacy bill that uh, will require climate education to be introduced into all K through 12 uh, 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 grades and subject areas. And that's the first time, that's the second state in the country that does it. So the youth who are interested in climate change, they're not learning about it in their schools. So that's why they're looking for organizations like us. Otherwise though, I would highly recommend um, in, at the high school level and at the middle school level even, a lot of the schools have environmental clubs where youth can join and we're able to you know, we, I, I'll go during lunch uh, hour and, and speak to those groups and try to recruit youth there. Um, we, we take advantage of Google advertisements and whatnot to try and reach out and, and word of mouth, right? Once you uh, have a couple of really motivated youth um, at, at, in their specific cities and high schools and they're, they're staunch community advocates, you know, they, they inform and let other youth know who are interested in climate and they, we, we bring them on board as a result. That's, that's amazing. And, and actually, in fact, I'm also very thrilled to welcome uh, our second panelist to this dialogue. And that is Barzana Farouk Jamu, who is a climate activist from Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, co-founder of Cat Pencil, which is actually an organization for teaching unprivileged children in her area who have to move to the city because of climate disaster. But she's also the youth advocate for UNICEF Bangladesh. Well, Welcome so much, Farsana, to, to this panel. Thank you so much. Uh, Farsana, you are also uh, right now currently in Dubai, I think. So could you uh, just share a little bit your, your story uh, as well? Like how, how, how come that you are engaged in the climate movement? So I started my climate uh, activism journey with Fridays for Future. Fridays for Future is a global movement uh, currently working in more than 120 countries. And each country has their own chapter which works independently. So this is a decentralized movement. One thing we all have common is the idea of climate 
change and how we wanna uh, work around it. And uh, for that, we actually work around changing the narrative of uh, climate being a future problem rather than a present problem for many of us. So I am mainly working with Fridays for Future MAPA, which is most affected people and areas. So uh, this is a like, combination of more than 30 countries who are really affected, but not only those countries. We mainly think about people and community rather than countries uh, because in every country there are most marginalized people because of climate change and um, Fridays for Future wants to bring everyone here and uh, one of our main goal is to work on intersectionality and uh, so we work with different movement which because uh, for fridays for future and for me personally i think climate change is not just one problem in silos it's the amplifier of many problems and that's why we are saying that climate change is a problem currently uh, like one of the biggest problem of the world because it amplifies all other problems so uh, i joined fridays for future as an activist and with them i started working and and like um, meeting different people online, coming like together, having meeting, not knowing how to push uh, inside of the negotiation, but also outside to make more people come to the street. Because we have seen that uh, with Fridays for Future, there was a huge strike all around the world and this is a way to show that youth want to be part of this and we are not uh, some people who will just shout at the road but also uh, we will be the person who go inside the negotiation room talk to um, law like negotiators talk to the party delegates to know uh, let them know what we want and how we want it so currently um with like three years of my journey with fridays for future as international level i'm working more on how we bring um and different topic, but especially fossil fuel phase out in the text because uh, from country like mine, I'm from Bangladesh, uh, which is one of the most vulnerable country and one of the least responsible for it. We emit 0.3% of global emissions. So if uh, my country decide, okay, we will shut down everything, it will not change. That's why we need to talk more about fossil fuel phase out and that's what I'm like pushing for right now. Well, that, that yeah. is really, really inspiring to hear. And, and thank you, of course, for sharing those, sharing those inspiring words. I, I also want to, to touch on the fact um, that about your work where, where you're actually teaching on privileged children uh, in, in your area that basically then have had to move into the city because of climate disasters. Um, you have obviously seen a lot. Uh, can you maybe share a little bit with us um, the climate disasters that you, um, that you have seen and, and these children, what, 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 what are, you know, when, the, when, when you meet them for the first time, what, what is their, what are their thoughts? Yeah, so um, I, I started like volunteerism in 2018 with some of my friends and our uh, first idea was going to slums and uh, give students like students as in like children who can't go to school but then there is some organization who started uh, informal school for them and I, we wanted to talk to them and uh, know more about them and suddenly we realized that our area also have similar uh, kind of children but uh, they uh, are not getting the opportunity to go school, to school so we started a informal school and um, what happened is like suddenly there are some children who wants to join and um, like even though it it was informal we were like playing and doing uh, some stuff together, not in a very formal setting. But then again, uh, a children like coming in middle, 
is a surprise to us so we asked why didn't you join us earlier and the response was uh, my family recently shifted to this slum so we wanted to talk to their parents uh, so uh, from one to two to like many and many of these people have this one story common that they had to move and they doesn't say it's because of climate change but when you ask why did you change they're like we have no food and why, uh, when you ask why don't you have food you are farmer you were supposed to be like farmers or fishermen but uh, you are the people who grows food for the whole nation why don't you have food and then they're like because there is salinity in the water and uh, we can't drink that water uh, there uh, no crops is like growing the fish we used to cultivate is no longer there so then we realize oh that's how it's connected to climate change and uh, when we talk to children they actually don't uh, like in my country they actually uh, really don't understand uh, what's going on but there is a trauma which you can like realize if you start talking to them that they l hate like stuck in water uh, they hate um, not having food and then you will find some very inspiring children this is also like um, many picture in internet if you see that they are actually drawing their own books after a flood so they are trying to get their resource this is their treasure their resource their book and in a flood it just washed away so now they're drying it so that they have a hope to go back to school but the school is um, in our country we have one of the best uh, like early warning system we have one of the best uh, uh, like centers where people can go and take shelter uh, so this is actually schools where people take shelter so students no longer can go to school and if it is like for one month and two months they are like not connected to education anymore and i have met a lot of children who have these same feelings of we wanted to learn but we can't go to school anymore and this is the thing actually drives me to come and work uh, more into climate like change and how to change the perspective how to change the situation for those children that is amazing thank you so so much for sharing sharing this with us uh, and giving us an insight on on what what you um of of your work uh rowan i'll just quickly jump back to you and say i know that you're working with policy in incentives like can you just share a little bit about some of the impacts that you have done Absolutely. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that um, California just passed uh, uh, the climate literacy bill. So we've been working towards that for the last two, three years. Um, that's something we really cherish and believe in because that's going to create systemic impact. Having climate education in the public school system gives our youth the, uh, the ability to sort of visualize the solutions needed, the urgency of the crisis, to become stewards of the planet young. Um, so that's something our youth take it personal too, and they, they care about that. Um, in addition, a, a lot of our action teams have gotten you know, a, a numerous amount of things done toward, you know, I, I can think of some examples at the local level. They helped pass in the city of San Jose, uh, aggressive climate action plans and reach codes. Um, we helped create institutional bodies for climate action and advisory at the county level to ensure that there's always some level of guidance uh, from the public on climate action uh, in the county. We've helped pass over 40 state bills that are extremely important to California. That creates a ripple effect. And that's essential California too, as the fifth largest economy in the world. And what happens in California can, really trickle out to the rest of the world. So those, that's just a few of, of some of the things that we've worked on. Yes, well, that, that is amazing to hear. If you get to say uh, one, uh, one sentence on how you get people to engage, if I'm a youth and I really want to engage, what do you think, both of you, that, that one, one should do? Rowan first, and then Farsana late to close. I, I would say, um, I, it, it, basic, like because you are young, a lot of young people think because they are young that they cannot take action now. You can take action now, and in fact, it, it is more important and more impactful for you to take action now as a youth because that is your competitive advantage. It's gonna. This is our generation that's gonna deal with the the dire consequences of climate change, and and people want to work with youth, right? Because they understand that. So use that, use that, and 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 
As a result, get a seat at the table, right? And find local community organizations in your community that are doing this work. Um, get involved in climate policy, uh, uh, your local government or your, your state government and, and see where the impact can be made. Thank you so much, Rowan. Farsana, do you have a last sentence? Just one, we just have one sentence. What, what do you want to send? Uh, just want to echo Rohan and say that youth is not a homogeneous group. So whatever you do is, is and can be part of youth uh, climate action. So uh, believe in yourself, find who is working and what your role can be in the youth movement. Well, thank you very, very, very much, both of you, both Rowan and Farsana, for sharing these impactful stories with us. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm going to invite Katarina back. Thank you so much, both of you. Well, thank you, Osa and Rona Fasana. That was really, we really felt the energy here in the studio of your, your commitment to this work. It's, it's really, really, truly amazing. So we're going to stay with the youth for a few more minutes. Uh, and we're going to listen to some powerful voices from around the world that have been sent into us. And the voices are showcasing what the youth of today might or will, depending on how we act, look like in the climate changed world of tomorrow. This is Transmission Attempt 81. My name is Sam. And I'm speaking to you from the year 2015. Now, climate change has accelerated, and the impact is felt daily. Rising sea levels, scorching heat waves, raging wildfires, hurricanes and droughts displacing millions. No one is safe. No one is unaffected. Everyone suffers. But this is not a distant scenario. Because all of this is actually happening right now. now. The choices world leaders make today will determine the kind of world we will live in tomorrow. The future is now. Cut. Nice. Do you think they'll listen to this? Yeah, I look like an old man. In my city, I have seen so many climate migrants. In the south of Bangladesh, more and more people are currently underwater, and our ground are full of saline water. I'm building Nature's Fury when pushing to its limit. I could go on and on, but we don't have time. The time is running out. The choice world leaders make today will determine the kind of world we will live tomorrow. The future is now.
the choices world leaders make today will determine the kind of world we live in tomorrow. The future is now. So I'm absolutely delighted to have some guests here with me at COP28. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Rebecca Collier. She's Executive Director of Renew 2030, uh, along with Luisa Sierra at ICM. And we'll find out what ICM stands for in a couple of seconds. So um, really fantastic to have you here at COP28. Um, Rebecca, Renew 2030, I understand, is a new and innovative collaborative uh, initiative of regional climate foundations helping to support partners around the world to scale wind and solar five times that's the target yeah by 2030 or between here and 2030 you have a particular focus on building multi-stakeholder action to support renewables tell us about rn 2030 uh, and its vision and what you're hoping to achieve here at the cop 28 Thanks, Nick. It's absolutely wonderful to be here with We Don't Have Time. So Renew 2030, we are supporting groups on the ground through regional climate foundations like Luisa's to look at the key barriers to renewables, things like the inequitable finance to renewables, things like policy, things like supporting the just transition for workers. Um, and we do that as a set of peers. So we are regional climate foundations that have been working together on these things for more than 10 years. Mm. And we've learned how to get things done through supporting civil society groups like think tanks, NGOs, communications experts and others. And we believe in a fast transition. We mm -hmm. believe in a that the electricity sector has to go first because it electrifies everything else. And we also mm. believe in a fair transition. So at COP28 today, what we're hoping for is this big pledge that governments are going to mm -hmm. make to times three renewables by 2030. And that's really consistent with the Renew 2030 vision. Mm -hmm. So I, what I want all the We Don't time Have Time viewers to think about is how significant it is that mm -hmm. global leaders have come together with a pledge to three times renewables. It's mm -hmm. the big news coming out of COP20, uh, exactly. COP today. And you're actually saying five times for your initiative, and that's even better, right? Uh, so maybe the tripling is, 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 is the kind of floor. You're actually raising it above and beyond the floor. That's right, because wind and solar are just two technologies within mm. the broad definition of res. And we believe that wind and solar have got this critical key role to play. Mm. Maybe uh, bioenergy is going to play a role, hydropower mm -hmm. is going to play a role, but mm -hmm. wind and solar, they're the tech that communities can get behind, mm -hmm. can scale quickly, that have had this momentum on cost mm. reduction. So they're the exciting ones as far yeah. as we're concerned. And uh, I'm going to turn to Louisa in two seconds, but just tell me, um, I mean, I think most ordinary people out there watching it think sort of, well, it's very easy. You just put the solar panel on the roof or whatever, or put the wind turbine up and then it starts generating electricity. But th there are actually some complexities to this, yeah? And there are barriers. So just highlight a, a handful. Uh, we were yeah. talking together as we were preparing about mm. grids. Yeah. And grids, I mean, 10, sometimes 15 years to get the critical infrastructure needed yeah. to support wind and solar. So if we lean in, and we have consultative processes with communities involved, mm -hmm. we can responsibly shorten those lead times. And that's some of the things that can accelerate renewables. Yeah. And what about fossil fuel subsidies? Do they distort, uh, or maybe they do not create a level playing field? Maybe put it that way. That's exactly right. Finance isn't going where it needs to go. Mm. Some of the um, richer countries in the world have got behind renewables and they're really running at cost competitive mm. levels but where there are subsidies in place for fossil fuels mm. and where governments and other stakeholders haven't really unlocked mm. the finance mm. for renewables, they can really significantly hold back the progress we'd expect yeah. to see. Yeah. So, Luisa, hi. Um, you're the Director of Energy at uh, Iniciativa Climatica de Mexico, yeah? Exactly. Is that okay from a, from a bad Brit trying to... <laughs> That's a perfect Brit. Okay, you're a hero, thank <laughs> you. Can you tell us about what Renew 2030 means for you as you were on the ground in Mexico? Uh, what types of work are you supporting through Renew 2030? And 
and what do you think will be the major points to look out for after this this COP28? That's like a marathon question, but yeah, <laughs> just yeah, generally yes. pick up on that. Um, yeah. Well, Renew 2030, it will enable us to um, to do what we already knew it was needed. And as Rebecca was mentioning, we need a transition that it's fast. We need a transition um, that will enable uh, the people at the center, mm -hmm. right? An equitable transition. So Renew 2030 um, will enable us to uh, strengthen the ecosystem of civil societies organizations in Mexico mm -hmm. through... Um, uh, through acting like um, towards advocacy efforts, for example, to strengthen and defend the regulatory framework that we currently have, mm -hmm. or for example, to trigger renewable energy projects into communities, mm -hmm. because um, the just energy transition, it's about that, not only like bigger scale, but mm -hmm. also smaller scale. Mm -hmm. And in Renew 2030 also will uh, allow us to um, support subnational governments mm -hmm. to uh, advance towards an uh, energy transition uh, mm -hmm. itself. And with this project, we will be able to um, support or to advance or contribute that mm -hmm. towards Mexico achieving its most recent NDC. Last year, they updated okay. the NDC towards mm -hmm. a 35 percent reduction, mm -hmm. but also um, to achieve a 40 gigas of renewable energy. So that's mm -hmm. more than triple times of what we have right now. 40 gigawatts. 40 right, gigawatts. That's really something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, give us a, a quick uh, example. Is there one project that's uh, maybe already started or is coming uh, through Renew 2030 in Mexico? Is there a place? Yes, can... for example, when, when we are talking about, uh, as I was saying, uh, about just energy transition, mm. we have a really good example that we call Ejido Solares. And Ejido Solares is a specific uh, land tenure that we have in Mexico, an agrarian land tenure. But what we are doing is changing the governance of the renewable energy projects. So uh, it can incorporate just a perspective and a gender perspective. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is deploying uh, distributed generation uh, systems into the communities, mm -hmm. but when the ownership is within and remains mm -hmm. in the community, so the benefits go directly to the people and for the people. Right. So uh, this is a, a project that we are already doing in the northern region of Mexico um, in, with a state uh, that it's called Sonora. And the good thing about it, it, it can be scaled up. So with the Renew project, we will be able to replicate this not only uh, nationwide in Mexico, but so, uh, somewhere else in other geographies. And uh, stories like this mm. uh, will be um, shared uh, among the, the regional foundations that okay. are working in Renew. So, so it's not just renewable energy benefits uh, and, and economic benefits. There are also large social benefits from this. And therefore, you're meeting the sustainable development goals as well as helping to achieve the Paris Agreement for Mexico. Are there other countries in the world that you're working in? Absolutely. We've got Brazil. We've got the Africa Climate Foundation, European right. Climate Foundation, Energy Foundation China, the Tara Climate Foundation right. in Southeast Asia. We're all peers and we work also with the Energy Foundation in the mm. US. It's an amazingly dynamic group of individuals mm. who are passionate about making this happen. I think it's uh, incredible work that you're doing and I, I like the focus on the, the community level. I think that's very powerful and because uh, then people can see that these technologies are not going to rob them of a future. They're going to actually make enrich their future uh, rather than being a, a challenge. And I think this is the, the story that we need to tell around the world, that this, uh, for ordinary people, a transition to a low carbon economy is actually their best bet for a, a, a really prosperous future and a chance for their children too, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're coming to the end here. Um, any other final points you want to make? What do you, where are you going from here uh, after this interview? Where are you going in the COP? What are you going to do here? briefly uh, we have a regional pavilion mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we will have uh, many events with other regional foundations some of them are within renew so we will having some events uh, regarding uh, of the challenges that uh, in each region we are having but yeah. also the opportunities to deploy and to advance into a just energy transition okay okay oh, i think with that thank you so much indeed for being with us at cop 28 and we wish you all kinds of luck with uh, with what you're doing it sounds great thank you thank you
extent of any real decision making on climate action. Over these years, I've seen my home country transform from a well-functioning democratic country into an over-polarized and populated one. Crops of farmers are on a yearly basis destroyed by lack of rainfall, seasonal droughts, and intensified storms. Meanwhile, migration to the Netherlands and European countries have intensified as people from other continents are on a search for livelihood due to changing climates in their home countries. As a result, uh, we are yet responsible for another humanitarian crisis on the European border due to poor migration management. Simultaneously, all these mouths have to be fed. But from what resources? I can go on for hours, but we don't have time. The strange thing is, these things are happening in your life. In your own Time is running out. The choices world leaders make today will determine the kind of future we have tomorrow. The future is now. My name is Agustin Ocaña, and I'm transmitting from Ecuador in the year 2050. A country born by the lack of decision making. Over the years, I have seen my hometown, my country, my land transform. I can't believe we lost cacao as our national plant. Now it's just growing in labs. We cannot harvest it anymore. The floods and the plagues make it impossible for us. The jungle, the Amazon, is covered by acid rain and Galapagos is drowning every year due to the sea level rising. I could go on for hours, but we don't have time. The strange thing is that these things are happening right now, in your time, in 2023, in your backyard. Time is running out. The choices world leaders make today will affect the world we live tomorrow. The future is now. speaking to you from what you all know as Sweden in the year 2050. It is a country burdened by the lack of any real decision making. Over the years I've seen my country transform. In my hometown Mokfjord I've seen landslide after landslide hit caused by the heavy rain. And yet I am not the one who suffers most. I come from a great place of privilege. I come from a part of the world that is not affected by nature's fury like other parts of the world are. I could go on for hours, but we don't have time. The strange thing is, these things are happening in your time, in your own time, in 2023, in your backyard. Time is running out. The choices world leaders make today will determine the kind of world we will live in tomorrow. The future is now.
Yesterday, we sat down with Andrew Revkin, writer and author, as well as Bill Moma, who were sharing more about their involvement in the Climate Emergency Feedback Loops film. This session is a follow-up on that. Uh, this time, we're going to take a more general perspective on negative feedback loops and what they can teach us on the urgency of reducing emissions. The film will be posted on our website and on Twitter, well, X, profile when the panel starts. Uh, that will be pretty much right now. So with me to talk about this amazing project, we have two people. Bonnie Walsh, Senior Producer for Climate Emergency Feedback Loops, that is the film. And Kerry Emanuel, an atmospheric and climate scientist from, from MIT, who was a professor for 44 years until retirement in 2022. She is still actively working on climate research, however, and is incredibly knowledgeable about countries that have decarbonized their energy systems. And uh, uh, so let's say Bonnie Walsh is with us here. Uh, I can see. Uh, let's see if we have Carrie too joining us. And also we'll be joined by Samuel Okello from the Youth Hub. He is the Youth Hub leader for um, our own Youth Hub. And he will join at the end of this panel to uh, pose some questions to the two panelists here. Terrific. All right. So let's move on to talk to you, to, to have some questions for you. Bonnie, I'd like to start with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what motivated you to make this film, please? Uh, yes, thanks so much for having me. Um, so the, the series, which is called Climate Emergency Feedback Loop, is um, a series of sh five sh films. And we were actually approached by producer Barry Hershey, um, came to the director, Susan Gray, and myself and said he'd been hearing a lot about um, climate feedback loops from friends and colleagues. But when he um, when he surveyed a lot of people in his sort of social circle, a lot of people had never heard of them. So he'd been reading about them, but a lot of people he talked to didn't know about them. And so he really wanted to make some kind of film to educate people about these dangerous ambulances warming cycles that are to tipping points in the climate. And so um, we just said that the best way to reach the audience would be to make five short films that would be free and accessible on the website, which is um, climatefeedbackloops.com or feedbackloopsclimate.com, both of them work. Um, and then we ended up in a one film for public television in the United States out of the five short films and sold the broadcast version around the world. So it really came from Barry Hershey, and we just sort of carried out his vision for the films. Thank you very much, Bonnie. You're breaking up a little bit, but we'll, we'll try to, to, to follow you uh, completely. That's why I thought you were finished, and I intervened with a question. Uh, could you, uh, for those of that haven't seen the film yet, the full film, can you give us a brief synopsis of its story and, and, um, and themes, please? Sure. So the theme, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm bringing up, um, the theme is about climate feedback loops, which are vicious cycles in the environment where warming leads to more warming. So the first film is an introduction film, which explains what climate feedback loops are. And the next four films focus on a specific area, forests, permafrost, the atmosphere, and the poles. And in each film, we give examples of feedback loops happen in each of these areas and explain the science behind them. So it's really uh, a science film, a series of science films explaining in great, you know, with great clarity, we hope, with a lot of graphics, um, how these mechanisms are working. Thank you, Bonnie. Is, and what sort of reactions have you received from the film, well, the films so far? Um, very, very positive reactions. We've We've been many, many film festivals, won many um, awards and have gotten into festivals around the world. Um, we had great, uh, we had almost 90-something uh, you know, percent of public television channels carrying program that, that has aired many times in the United States. We've been able to sell it countries around the world. We've also done a lot of outreach with the films. Um, the five short films were launched in January 2020 one with a virtual event, Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg and a couple of scientists from the from the project. And then since we've had events at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, we were able to present the films to the British Parliament, meeting COP26 
26 in Glasgow. Uh, Prince, now King Charles, invited us to screen it at that event for his Terra Carta Strategic Markets Initiative. We have been able to um, reach out to many, many school districts and schools in the United States to encourage them to use the films in classrooms. So we're really um, excited that it's being they're being shown to the next generation. Uh, we've shown them in conferences, climate conferences around the world. So they've had an incredible relationship, and we really feel like we're we're getting the word out about the topic, which is very gratifying. I can imagine, really, the wonderful work. So turning to you now, Carrie, um, as a climate scientist for many years, uh, what was your initial reaction to seeing the, f the, fertile, f the final, the first versions, uh, the f sorry, the final versions of this film, or should we say films? Well, I was uh, quite happy to see some of the things that we've been concerned about for many decades getting such a good airing as that. And it's it's so important to make people familiar with, with the scientific background and what the risks really are of climate change. I think the film does a great job of that. And Carrie, given your expertise in, in decarbonizing nations, what steps in your mind do, do global authorities have to take to really counteract the climate feedback loops? Well, we talk in terms of two major things that have to happen, and it's not a question of either or. We, at this point in history, we're, we're forced to do both. One is simply adaptation. Uh, there's a certain amount of climate change that's already happened. There's a certain amount that's going to happen, even if we take uh, really uh, strong measures. And adaptation isn't simple. We have to know what it is we're adapting to. Is it just a question of sea level rise? Or is it going to be... Uh, more fires, more storms. It depends on where you are. So adaptation is is local, but it has to be supported at national, state levels, and so forth. And then the other thing is to try everything we know how to do to mitigate the climate change, which means mostly reducing emissions of the greenhouse gases. Mm. Carrie, in, in terms of mitigation and adaptation, well, that could be different. Uh, different countries be doing the most, but which countries do you think have pushed this action the farthest? Mitigation and adaptation. Well, it's a mixture. On the mitigation side, I, I would cite some countries like Sweden and France, although uh, the mitigation they did wasn't uh, initially to to uh, um, deal with climate change. It was to deal with energy security. And that is, they both countries almost entirely decarbonized their production of electricity, and they did it in about 12 years. They did it with combinations of nuclear and hydropower. I'm a big proponent of nuclear energy and very happy to see that it's finally being pushed a little bit at this COP28 uh, because um, we know from history, uh, the history of countries like Sweden and France, that we can do it in a short time. And so I've been out there uh, trying to counter a lot of the disinformation that circulates about this energy source and, and to promote it as something we really need to do to rapidly reduce emissions. Do you think we'll be able to get this in place in time? I think that depends upon us, and it depends upon the viewers of this program and everyone else, because the, the main thing that's lacking is the popular support for this, and that, and I understand that, it's because of a lot of uh, misinformation that's circulating around about this power source. The fact of the matter is we've done it before. It's We've done the experiment. We can decarbonize fast with this source. And that should be done alongside the growth of renewables, which is very gratifying. But we can't do everything with renewables because of the storage problem. So um, people really need to understand what it is that we can do. And we ought to be optimistic as long as we can get some momentum among uh, populations to do this. I think it can be done. But, you know, it's we know that it can be done in 10 years, but of course we're living in a different environment today. It will take longer now than it did in the 70s and 80s. Well, thank you for your input here. And if we would have had a person focusing entirely on renewables, they might have a different point of view on this on this topic. But of course, uh, uh, it's it's very interesting and valid to hear what you, your point of view here. Uh, what advice would you be would you give to the average individual on what they can do in the face of these negative feedback loops? Well, 
I get that question a lot, and it's very tempting to give them the answer they want, which is to change the way they live. A lot of them want to hear that, to replace their light bulbs, to use less energy. Uh, but in reality, a lot of the problem has to do with what we hope will be growth in energy consumption in the third world. I say hope because it's key to alleviating poverty. Energy poverty is is almost a guarantee for poverty, poverty. We can't, I don't think we should try to curtail the growth of uh, nations like India and some of the uh, African countries and other countries around the world. So what we do by way of conservation is great, but it isn't gonna solve the problem. And so I think the, the number one thing you can do is to study a little bit what it takes to mitigate and then get your representatives, if you are fortunate enough to live in a democracy, uh, to push for some of these changes in the way we um, generate energy and transmit it. I think that's the most important thing to do. So if I, if I interpret you correctly, is it's used to your power as a citizen in, in democracies. And would that, could that also involve sitting in the street from your perspective? Well, I, I don't think that, I think that's sort of stepping outside what I consider my expertise. Um, I think what's effective depends very much on the culture you're in. That may work very well in some places and it may backfire in others. But uh, yeah, political action on the part of communities, not just individuals, is what really matters here. I couldn't agree more. Collective action has is, is proven its point at, and, and, and proven its effic efficiency many, many times, of course, in, 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 in moving society ahead. Um, so a question for both of you. Um, getting the message across is, of course, just half the battle, uh, which is certainly what the film aims to do. What can we do as a society, uh, all parts of society, to ensure that this sentiment is echoed really far and wide, that people understand the concept and act. Uh, businesses, politicians, we talked about civil society a bit. From both of you, please, uh, let's turn back to Bonnie first. Yeah, I mean, I think what Carrie's been saying is, is right. People need to really get their governments to take action. I think the only way it's gonna happen is at a very top level like that. I mean, I think, it's it's great that people can make individual changes, but I don't think change can really happen until it's at a higher level of corporations and governments. So I think getting lobbying your government to make choices is is what we can do if we can do it where we live. Thank you, Bonnie. Of course, this is what we're trying to achieve at the We Don't Have Time platform to, to engage people and, and push uh, for change, policymaker change and also business business leader change, of course. It's all about leadership from my point of view. Um, so yeah. um, getting back to you, Carrie, uh, what is your point of like pushing different parts of society to ensure that this sentiment is really echoed? Well, I turn to historical examples of where collective action has actually worked. Mm. And in my generation, in my country, the United States, I think about the Vietnam War, um, when we started to figure out that that was a mistake and that we shouldn't have been there, uh, it was finally the younger generations that caused change. They basically insisted through collective action uh, that the adults, <laughs> The, the people in power listen to them. And finally, the adults said, well, you know, there are children, there are future, we've got to do something. Whether that would work today, you know, I'm, I'm not qualified to say, but I would certainly think that's how it would work. Uh, it's, it's the youth that are really going to make the difference. Thank you. On that note, let's see if we have Samuel Okello with us already. We're a little bit ahead of time, ahead of schedule. See if we can get uh, Samuel Okello on, on in the panel here, because I know he has prepared some questions uh, from, collected uh, questions from the Youth Hub. Let's see if I can get an okay. Yes, 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 terrific, I can see you. Wonderful to have you with us, Samuel. Um, so uh, I know you have questions, so go ahead and address them, please. Wonderful to have you on board. I'm not sure. We, we can't hear you, Samuel. So if it's on your side, if you can unmute, otherwise it might be 
somewhere else along the line, but if you check your equipment, please. To make sure you're not muted. Very much now. Yes, now it's working. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so I have the following questions from the YouTube. The first question is, what is the most prioritized action that that we need to do if needed to priori if needed if needed to prioritize both business and individuals? I, I'll repeat it. What is the most prioritized action that we need to do if we needed to prioritize both business and individuals? Thank you very much, Samuel. Carrie, would you like to take that, please? And yeah, if I understand the uh, correct uh, the uh, question, it's what? How do we prioritize action between individuals and businesses? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, uh, I I think we absolutely need both, right? I don't think we can do without one. Um, I, you know, businesses, in the end, right? Businesses do are in positions, at least in some countries, to exert political pressure. I would say that's true in most countries, but people are too. And uh, so I don't make a strong distinction between the two, but I would echo something I said earlier that it's, it's really going to be uh, people in younger generations who stand to gain most from action and lose most from inaction that are going to make the difference in this whole evolution. Thank you, Carrie. Would you like to add, Bonnie? Yeah, um, I have. I have the. Oh, let's see. If, let's see, Samuel. If, if Carrie, Bonnie would like to to add an answer to, please. Um, no, I'll, I'm deferring to Kerry on this one. He's he's more knowledgeable about it than I am. So I'll I'll go with what Kerry said. Okay, terrific. So back to you, Samuel. Okay. The next question is: Who can take the responsibility to prevent negative feedback loops? I think that go, that one goes to you again, uh, Kerry, as a scientist. Well, yes, actually, um, just to be, be a little bit of a scientist here, it's the positive feedbacks that we're worried about. So positive in this case doesn't mean uh, an ethical judgment or a value judgment. It means whether the feedback acts to accentuate or not accentuate the original direction in which, in this case, the climate change. So positive feedbacks are ones that accelerate the change. and. Um, uh, one of the things that we absolutely have to do, and this may sound a bit self-serving, but it isn't, I'm retired now, uh, so it, it isn't in my case, and that is to really try to put more effort into understanding these feedbacks. Um, one of the concerns, and this comes across in the film, is from studying geological data, which shows that there have been kind of runaway feedbacks in the uh, history of the Earth's climate. And uh, because we don't understand those, A, we're nervous about them, as we should be, and B, we can't rule them out or, or necessarily predict them. So uh, we've got to do that at the very least. But we also have to look at this problem as one of risk. And when you look at it as risk, you don't do things like some economists do, is take the most probable outcome and figure out how expensive it is. You look at the whole range of possible outcomes and there necessarily has to be weight put on the more catastrophic outcomes because those are the things that will really cost us and we really want to avoid. So we have to look at this problem differently and not uh, try, try to focus so much on what the most probable outcome is when there's enough uncertainty in this problem that we really have to prepare for the more serious risks and not just look at the middle of the road estimates. Okay, bye. Thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, back to you again, Sabio. Okay. Another question is, in promoting climate education and awareness, how can we empower future generations to become active stewards of the environment and catalyst for, for positive change? Thank you, Samuel. Um, as a communicator, I'd like to turn this question to um, to Bonnie. How can we activate the youth? I know you're doing it already by by airing the th the films in the schools. Um, so, what kind of response, and how can we further this this activation? Yeah, I I do think using these films in classrooms is really one of the best things we can do because we're teaching 
the youth of today to care and be stewards of the environment. I, I actually got an email recently from a, a teacher who had attended a keynote speech I'd given to the Kansas uh, Science Teachers Association conference here in the US. And she said she had shown the films in her science class and there was a one of her students had been a, a climate denier. And after he saw the, the, the films and went through the curriculum, which we also have on our website, um, he actually changed his mind. So I feel like we have to change hearts and minds by giving them the science, by teaching them what's actually going on. It's, it shouldn't be an emotional, uh, political conversation. It should be the facts. And the nice thing about the films is they just lay out the facts. They lay out the science of what's going on in an, in a way that can be just taught and it, hopefully accepted as, as fact instead of um, some kind of political view. So I think education is the key. I think people have to be educated. And as Carrie said, it's all up to the next generation. And if they're learning these things in, in the classrooms, then I think that's that's our, our best hope, at least for, for that generation of, of youth. So we're 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 continuing to promote them to be used all over the world. And they are subtitled, I want to add in, I think we're up to about 30 languages now. The wow. films are captioned on the website, feedbacklooopsclimate.com. You can use up to 30 captions. So children all over the world can use the films. They should be shared, they should be passed on, they should be used in conferences and gatherings and community groups and everywhere. So they're quite accessible and, and usable. Wonderful. So many languages. That's terrific news for our youth hub because we do have youth from all over the world in our youth mm -hmm. hub connected to, to the work at, at the COP. And of course, all the youth will be able to access the films uh, because we have posted them now on our site. So that's terrific. Um, we also know that when youth, we gave the example of this a young person that was a climate denier, that was uh, you know informed and, and understood the uh, the true implic implications of, of climate change. And we know that youth, of course, are the best ambassadors to convince their parents. So I would I would be guessing, and I think I'm probably right, that when this person came home and talked to his or her parents about his new findings and really understanding the impact of climate change the parents will probably listen more to him or her than to um, politicians or other leaders uh, saying that this is nothing to worry about. So this is really impactful indeed. So uh, back to you, Samuel, do you have any more questions? Because we do have a few more minutes. Yeah, I have uh, around two, two, two more questions. Excellent, perfect. Okay, and uh, the next question goes as the follow, goes as follows. Since many delegates have come to COP to discuss climate change issues, what can you expect this COP to be different from the earliest ones? Hmm. Good question. Let's, let's turn to Carrie. Um, in the light of having more youth in place, will this COP be different, do you think? I That's think how I understood be. the question. Yeah, yes, I, I, I'm optimistic about that. I think it will be because of greater participation by youth. This is what we really need. I think uh, COP28 has already accomplished something in realizing that you know, we have to, to put all the chips on the table when it comes to clean energy. We can't just exclude one source because uh, people, for one reason or other, don't like it. We, it's too important. Uh, to to not have all the chips on the table and cop has already accomplished it by by putting some of the chips back on the table here but the youth part of it is is the most important and let me let me add to some something bonnie said i think it's, it's terribly important so i'd like to kind of re-emphasize it that um the youth will be most effective in persuading their parents generation that we need to do something if they can base their arguments on factual information rather than just opinions. So it's so important to, to watch the sorts of films like this one that we're talking about here today, uh, to get real honest information in the classroom and elsewhere, and not through necessarily social media, which is great at, at, um, at circulating opinions, but not so great at uh, expounding on facts. So it's very important that arguments be factually based. 
Thank you, Carrie. Bonnie, would you like to add your reflections here? Um, yeah, no, I just agree that that's that's why we made these films and that's why we made them as science films so that we can get the facts across without without the noise of um, the, the different um, political angles and um, people who have other agendas. So, yeah, I just echo what Carrie said. It's important to just get the facts across, get the science and teach it to kids so they have that information and and can can inform their parents and talk and themselves and start changing things. Thank you, Bonnie. Over to you again, Samuel, please. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question goes as follows. What are the tangible changes that can be implemented to, to ensure a more resilient and climate-friendly future for the next generation? Could you repeat that question, please? Sorry. Could you what re tangible repeat changes it? Can, what tangible changes can be implemented to ensure a more resilient and a climate-friendly future for the next generation? Hmm. Thank you very much. So, Kerry, this one is for you. Well, I'll go back to the uh, the idea that we simply have to figure out how to accelerate the transition to clean energy. It's not happening fast enough. That's a, every energy expert and others I talk to say that, we have got to bring everything to bear on this. Uh, and that means really, as I said before, uh, reconsidering nuclear power, which this COP is doing, much to my gratification, I'm glad to see that. We have to step it up and um, we can't let, you know, our, our legitimate know. concerns, local concerns get in the way of that. Thank you, Larry. And on that note, local concerns, we just had a statement out from from the head of COP that uh, he said that facing out the fossil fuels will take, it back, take us back to the caves. So what is your response as a scientist to that kind of statement from the head of a COP? Um, nonsense. I'm sorry to put it so bluntly. Of course, it won't send us back. And by the way, we will run out of fossil fuels. So it's a question of getting ahead of the curve on this. Um, fossil fuels kill eight to nine million people a year through particulates. And um, we should phase them out even if we didn't have climate change. They are a wonderful boon to civilization, but their time is over. Indeed. Just like uh, the, the time of horses is a, a big means of transportation, which helped civilization at the time, that came to an end. So get over it. Fossil fuels, the age of fossil fuels will end if for no other reason that we will run out of close to them. Well, the sooner the better we stop them, right? So I hear in my ear from the studio uh, producer here that uh, you have one more question and we actually have time for that. So, so, so hand it over, please, Samuel, uh, your final question. Thank you very much. My final question is as follows. If you had the ability to instill one eco-conscious habit in every person overnight, what will it what will it be and why? Did you catch that, Carrie? Because I think that's what no, I'm afraid uh, maybe you could repeat it or yeah, someone a could repeat it. There's a break up here. So uh, yeah. take it slowly. Um, Samuel, I think we'll get it. Okay. <clears throat> if you had the ability to instill one eco-conscious habit in every person overnight, what will it be and why? Eco-conscious habit. Which one would that be to prioritize? I think that's uh, you, well, Karen. Yes, okay. I'm, I'm thinking about it. It's yep. a very interesting question. Um, I'm a little bit worried about the temptation, and I suffer this too, to think that we're going to solve this problem entirely by changing our individual habits, except that we might change our attitude uh, toward one of collective action. And I come back to that. It's going to be collective action that changes things. Uh, I'm not coming out at all against conservation or eco-friendly habits. I think that's wonderful and we should try to instill them, but it isn't going to solve the problem by itself. And what we're lacking, I think now, not entirely lacking because COP28 is happening after all, is collective action. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Would you like to add, do you, do you uh, agree with, with uh, what Carrie just said? Collective act, action would be the most anchor-friendly mm -hmm. habit? 
Yeah, I mean, I, d I don't think it should come down to individuals actions because I don't think that's where the problem is. If an individual could change one habit, it should be, and I don't know if it's considered a habit, but they should educate themselves. They should care enough to talk to other people about what's happening in the climate and make it a priority in terms of how they <clears throat> how they're thinking about the world, how how they'll vote when they are able to vote, how they talk to adults who can vote. I feel like it's it's a matter of educating oneself and really caring about the problem. Well, thank you. You are indeed doing this with these fantastic films that you could watch from uh, from different platforms, but of course, from the We Don't Have Time platform, you can access the films. Thank you so much for joining us, Samuel, Carrie, and Bonnie, and continue to work for collective action and to hinder these these feedback loops to to be even become even worse. Thank you. And this concludes this session. We're going to move on. So we're now coming to the end of date three. So let's take a moment to reflect uh, with a special guest uh, on what's been discussed today and indeed what's been happening at COP itself. To do that, we're going to hand it over to our Dubai hub and my wonderful co-host, Nick. Thanks, Katerina. Thanks very much indeed. And great job in Stockholm today. Uh, we've got some super guests here uh, lined up for the final session. Um, I have the privilege of hosting uh, Steiner here in our Dubai studio. Achim has served as administrator of the UN Development Program since 2017. And before joining the UNDP, he was the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program for 10 years. And he's also been a director at the Oxford Martin School. And he has served as the director general of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and the secretary general of the World Commission on Dams. He brings over 30 years of diverse experience from international development. Great pleasure to have you. You hear Ahem. Uh, with him, two other fabulous guests as well. Now, this is where I'm going to be really challenged with my uh, pronunciation of the Fijian language. Uh, Alumat, Alumata Talai Sekinarai. Yeah. Not bad? Okay, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Phew. Uh, she is president of the I Took a Women, and Alm Almita is from Fiji uh, and is currently serving as an ocean. Voices Fellow at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, not far from where I went to university. I went to St. Andrews, which is just up the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, her focus is on developing guidelines to integrate traditional knowledge to ocean science for ocean management practices. She's also part of the early career ocean professionals at the Pacific Community Center for Ocean Science and president of an indigenous youth group in Fiji, which we just mentioned, um, women in conservation as well. Yeah, super. Rose, Rose is from Uganda. Rose Kobusinga, is that okay as well? Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I, this is going far too well. Um, <laughs> migration ambassador for the IOMAU migration. That's the international, international organization for migration, okay. Rose is a dedicated uh, migration, environment, and climate change ambassador from Uganda, as mentioned, and is at the forefront of leading climate action and rallying young people, policymakers, and diverse stakeholders to address the intersection of climate change and human mobility. Thank you very much indeed. Let's, let's go to Rose and uh, Alamita first. Let's start with you. Um, what is the message that you want to carry to this COP here, this COP28 in Dubai? What, what are you saying that you want from world leaders who have been meeting here in governments? Maybe, Alamita, you can start first. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's okay. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, um, I come from uh, from Fiji, a part of a small island developing states in the Pacific. And for us, um, climate change is not a, an issue. It's a threat to our livelihoods, to our um, economy as well. And in this, um, I look up to the leaders here uh, on their collaboration, on their innovation, and also their international cooperation for making this um, initiative in wherever they are doing their negotiations to bring a change because this is what we do face back at home. Um, and we lose a lot of lives back at home. Um, we look up to them and the action for that is now Mm -hmm. and for them to take their leadership into this to, in order to save our lives back mm -hmm. at home. So thank you. Is there a specific uh, request or, or something you'd really like to see happen here? Yes. Um, from, from what we've seen is that we've um, adopted the loss and damage. That was one of the mm -hmm. things that we look at. Mm -hmm. And in this, for our small island developing states, we really have a lot of loss and damage when it comes to climate change. We're also trying to face out fossil fuels for us in the transition to um, energy transition. So that is also one of right. the things that we are looking at um, at the moment. So okay. Rose, what, what's your top ask? Uh, well, I think mine is mostly practical action. That's why I can say, because we can have all these, you know, good documents and negotiations, but if there is no action at the local level, then there's no action, there's no impact. So we can always prepare for COP, then in December, we go for holiday. January, we start preparing co for COP29, and we keep on the documents just like that. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see leaders commit to practical action. An example could be from U the Uganda delegation and parties, or you know, together with, say, UNDP, mm -hmm. they decide we are starting a new project in Kasese where we have 1,600 1, people that were displaced by floods in 2020 who are still in a camp, have not been resettled, no livelihood support, no support at all, because there's no any international recognition of climate migrants or people that have been displaced by the climate crisis to be supported and protected. So I want to see those practical action happen at the local level, led by the local communities. And uh, the other main key message I have for the developed world, the developed world where there is, we know we welcome the loss and damage commitments, but we don't see a timeline attached to them. When will they be delivered? Because we realize that the losses and damages go up to 400 billion per year. So the money that is being committed, even though we see, I see it as progress, it's not enough. It's not even 1% of what is needed. Mm. So we need to see an actual promise not just commitment, but promise turning into real action with a timeline on when that will be delivered. Maybe by the next COP will come with, you know, telling positive stories and success stories. Yes, we, we can't wait another 30 years for them to sort out the organizational side. Not at all, because the losses and damages, even non-economic losses, are mm. continuing to happen. Mm. Mm. Let me go over to you. Uh, I mean, there are many, many youth activists here, and, and also We Don't Have Time is running a, a very special um, youth hub, which is a kind of also like a parallel broadcast with youth around the world debating all these topics, and at certain moments they come onto the live show here uh, every day. Um, I mean, so much passion, so much energy, so much creativity, and, and yet uh, Many of the things they dream for are, are, are not happening. What, what is your message to the to the young people? What would you ask them? Well, first I would begin by saying my hope is that this COP will not make young people who have invested their time, their energy, their emotions into not only preparing for the COP, but mobilizing support in their communities, in their countries at home, to go home and feel they've wasted their time. I think every COP has to stand that test. We may not get the breakthroughs that we are always striving for, but we cannot go backwards. We cannot let excuses continue to stop the world from acting. And I think every cop, in a sense, is a litmus test. Are people hiding behind excuses in order to avoid acting with ambition? And that, I think, is the second key term. We know that science is telling us we have almost run out of time. Some scientists say we have run out of time for the 1.5 degrees. I would like us to still challenge this sense because I think we can increase ambition. And one piece of good news is 
that if you look at the last few years, for example, in the deployment of renewable clean energy, we actually see a remarkably exponential curve. Mm. We can go faster, we can go even faster, mm. and we can go faster together. Mm. And that's what will always be at the center of these COPs. Can we do it together? Mm. Or do we fall apart over our differences, over our abilities to act? And I think mm. young people are a constant reminder at the COP, but also all over the world, mm. that this is literally a generational responsibility. Mm. Mm. I mean, there was something the other day, has China now hit 50% renewable energy, something like that? And there was one report saying that they thought that China's emissions now might start peak going down, uh, had peaked and were going to go down in 2024. I mean, that seemed remarkable. And the solar, there was some report the other day with solar that it had doubled in capacity in the last 18 months. I mean, these are extraordinarily positive developments, as you rightly say. And it's important that we celebrate those. You know, in our world today, if country X does something good, country Y cannot speak to that because somehow it seems to detract from other issues. Mm. Big mistake. We need to recognize one another's efforts. For example, the debates about climate finance that go on in the COPs are often, unfortunately, framed in such a way that it seems to the general public that only one side is asked to pay for something, the mm. other side is not. The harsh truth is developing countries are paying multiples of what developed countries are contributing to the global development partnership mm -hmm. on transitions to clean energy, on adaptation. But we always pretend that it is one who is giving up a lot mm -hmm. and another one who is getting a lot. Mm -hmm. This is not the reality. And so you mentioned China just now. China has done remarkable things in terms mm -hmm. of introducing clean energy, moving to electric mobility. But so has Kenya, which now produces over 90% of its electricity with renewables. And so has Uruguay, and so has Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. But so has Denmark in the last few years. And I think what we can take away from just the last five years, or even the last two to three years, is that when the International Energy Agency mm. now predicts that oil and gas will peak before 2030, that would have been an unimaginable statement just five years ago. That's how quickly the curve is gathering mm. momentum. Mm. And let's also acknowledge clean energy sources are today competitive virtually in every country across the world in producing electricity. Mm. But they will not be allowed to succeed if we continue to spend seven trillion yes. dollars in subsidies mm. that make fossil fuels cheaper. Mm. So let's get to work. Mm. We change that. We don't even have to phase down or phase out fossil fuel anymore. They'll just go because mm. it's cheaper to produce energy, electricity, mobility with other sources. No, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I had to pinch myself the other day to realize that I had completely missed in my entire career on climate change that there was not text in the agreements uh, on fossil fuels. There's text on emissions, but there's not on fossil fuels. And of course, this is now a, a big issue here at the COP, is it not? That, that, that so many, I think it's 100 countries right now would like to see language that says a phase out of fossil fuels, not the phase down of coal that we got in, in Glasgow at COP26, uh, which I can remember some people were very angry that there wasn't a phase out there. I remember the Swiss uh, environment minister really uh, very, very cross, uh, and some other countries too. So now we've got this, this, this push on the phase out. Is that something, I know the Secretary General spoken to it, uh, Antonio Guterres, is this a general system-wide view of, of, of the UN that that we need this vision from this COP. There is an end somewhere in the future to fossil fuels. Look, the Secretary General speaks for himself and as head uh -huh. of the United Nations, I think he has articulated unequivocally his view of what the future of fossil fuels is in our mm -hmm. energy mix and in our economies. I think the question that we ultimately are trying to grapple with at these COPs is how quickly can we decarbonize? Mm. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to eliminate carbon emissions. Mm. Now, there are some who still believe that carbon capture and storage or some other miraculous technology may extend the life of fossil fuels. I have yet to see evidence that is compelling of that. Therefore, mm. I think my sense is to continue to bank on the economic distortions that are preventing clean energy sources from becoming the backbone of our energy economy of the 21st century mm. and of our energy security, by the way. Mm. So I think there is clearly a focus on fossil fuels. The question is, you can approach the essentially phasing down, phasing out of fossil fuels from different entry points. You can dictate it, you can legislate it, you can incentivize it, 
mm. or you can create a market in which nobody will invest anymore in the next coal mine mm. or build the next diesel powered generating facility. When I think of the small island developing states, mm. it's a travesty that the international community has not been able to come forward and essentially help SID, small island developing states, to transition towards clean energy. Mm. In the Caribbean, an average consumer of electricity pays roughly 400% more for a kilowatt hour of electricity mm -hmm. because it's generated by imported diesel generators. Mm. We can do better than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alamita, Rose, um, you're just hearing what Akin was saying. Um, what are some of your thoughts about what he was saying or some of your additional thoughts about what you want to see from this, uh, this conference? I mean, I think for me, if we don't solve the main root cause of climate change, mm -hmm. which is the fossil fuel emissions and the emissions from agriculture and other sectors, but mainly from the energy sector, we can have billions and billions of loss and damage fund and adaptation fund, but it will never be enough. We will continue needing more and then to a point because adaptation has limits. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do more work on mitigation, and for most, for most of us from the developing world and from the small island states, I think beyond 1.5 is a death sentence, is suicidal. Because right now in most of our, like in Uganda, in Kenya, we've already surpassed 1.5 locally. Mm. That is what people need to remember. Mm. So, and calling for keeping it below 1.5, if it was possible to keep it below 1.5, and 1.5 should not be the, the goal. You know, the goal should have been no any increment, any change in the global mm. temperatures. Mm. But now we found ourselves here and we know we can do something about it. I don't believe that there's nothing we can do because that kind of also demotivates people from action. Even if we knew we are at 1.2 or 1.1 because different reports are saying different things, we know that, you know, the action on mitigation will help, will further help from because if we don't do something now, we we'll end up shooting four, right? Mm -hmm. But if we do, even if people think that we've already surpassed, you know, the uh, the points, I think we still need that action. And in terms of investment in renew renewable energy, I'm from Uganda. We have more than eight hours of sunshine a day. That is a resource. Look at this where we are right now. This is a resource that is untapped. And when we are calling out for a phase out of fossil fuels, we need to back that up with massive investment in renewable energy. Because in Uganda, 19%, we have 19% connect, connectivity to the grid, mm -hmm. only 19%. Mm -hmm. But we have a resource that is untapped, which is solar. But of course, we need to be careful because there are sovereignty issues. We can't continue relying on, let's say, China, and, uh, who are producing most of the solar-related technologies. We need also capacity for African countries to be able to produce our own energy. But also, there's the solar panel and battery waste problem that could come up. So we need to have that capacity as African countries, and we need that investment. So my urge to everyone who is on the calls, like I am, on calling out fossil fuel companies, we need to back it up with the investment in green jobs, in green skills, in renewable energy. And because we have a long way, we still need to industrialize, but the industrialization shouldn't be, we shouldn't repeat the same mistakes that developed countries mm. did. I would love to see a model country relying on renewable energy where all countries can come to, to learn from there. Good and, point. And Very. young people are yeah. taking this leadership. It's just the Finance does not reach young people, does not reach the people at the front line and at the forefront of action. Lumita, yeah. Just to add on to what she has mentioned, like for us, what we've been doing is just committing, trying to limit our emissions, even though we are the most vulnerable one when it comes to climate change impacts. So we, we've been having um, projects, energy, so renewable energy projects back at home. The only thing that we have is capacity building and training in terms of these solar energy projects that comes in into our communities. Because for us, this action takes place in our local communities and indigenous people. And for them to actually know what these projects are about, to aware them on how these projects commit to climate change. And for our leaders here to also recognize our local communities and indigenous people 
people back at home because they are actually the ones that are facing these vulnerable uh, changes to climate mm -hmm. change. So, yeah. Did, let me ask you a supplementary question there. Did any benefits uh, in terms of action on climate change, renewable energy investments, did anything flow from when you were the host of COP17, was it? Which was held in Bonn, of course. But when, when Fiji was the presidency there, did you notice a difference that came yes. from that? I do no notice a lot of difference in regards to that, uh, from how we transition from uh, um, um, just transition into en uh, renewable energy. Um, and we've also launched the blue shipping line here that was re-emphasized uh, by our PM on the work that we are doing back at home on green shipping um, industry, um, doing our green shipping for our maritime um, industry. So okay. yes, I do. Okay, that's just interesting to, to, to think about. What does, it, what, do, what does it mean if you host a COP? Yeah. Um, I know we're pressing ahead on time. We've only got 10 minutes left, but um, let me just come to you on this loss and damage fund again that Alamita mentioned uh, as well, and I'm sure, you, Rose, you, you know all about it, yeah. Took 30 years, COP27 signs it off, which to me, I was in shock when that happened because I never thought it would happen. I thought some rich of the countries would never say that we'll do this, you know, because they were worried it was an open, open checkbook to the future. But they did. Now we've got some modest money, but we do have some money in it. So that's good. But now the debate, of course, is how is it going to be spent? Where is it going to be spent? Who's, which agency is going to manage it? And all this sort of stuff, which could be a long haul. Uh, we need to shorten that distance, don't we, between the decision and the money and it actually getting spent. Um, are you pleased this happened? Do you think it's a good step forward? But is there more to be done? Look, I think we all can be pleased with the fact that it took less than a year from the decision in Sharm el Sheikh mm. to call for the establishment of this fund to act actually having been adopted um, as a unanimous decision. So let's also celebrate moments when the COP actually provides precisely that platform that the world needs in order to come together despite hesitations mm -hmm. and doubts and so on. Mm. But let me also comment in terms of something Rose said earlier on, and it goes a little bit back to the fossil fuel Mm. companies and economies. You can have a loss and damage fund, you can have all these other funds and things that are being mm -hmm. put forward, but let's also call out those who continue to, in a sense, divest from this transition. I mean, just in the last few months, we have seen the great announcements of Shell, BP, on the one hand, um, essentially retreating from some of their commitments that they had made two, three years ago. We have seen Exxon uh, make statements about the future of fossil fuels that are surprising to many. And I think we have to be careful because we may have a remarkably quick set of commitments, close to $700 million by today, to the loss and damage fund. But I have two concerns. One is, is that money genuinely additional money or are we actually seeing that money being taken out of an adaptation fund or out of one of the global funds mm -hmm and now allocated to this, because then the net benefit of that would at least be significantly diminished. And secondly, how do we invest at the global level, uh, for instance, all the windfall profits that have now happened? I mean, it is ironic that a few thousand shareholders seem to matter more in a company's long-term strategy, even at this moment in time, in the fossil fuel sector, than 8 billion people mm. as stakeholders. Mm. So I think we also need to call this out and we need to really ask the question, have you got an excuse for retreating from a commitment you have made? Mm -hmm. Because if all this money that is currently being generated by the fossil fuel sector on the back of wars that have driven energy prices up and then are reinvested in exploring more oil, gas and coal, mm -hmm. then I don't think this is acceptable, mm -hmm. nor is it what the Secretary General has said responsible in terms of a company's responsibility to society. Mm. Mm. Very good points indeed. Uh, unfortunately, we are now, I'm being told, because people keep holding fingers up at me. Uh, I don't know why they're doing that, but it could be for other reasons. But I think they're trying to tell me the time. I think we are really, we've got one more minute and we need to wrap up here. Can I just say, it's been, a, I mean, we could have gone on for another 30 minutes, right? There are so many topics here to cover. and. Uh, as eloquent as usual, Achim, very, very interesting thoughts there. But Rose and Alamita, 
you as well really contributed to this. So I want to thank you for being here and uh, I wish we had another 30 minutes, oh, but we don't. We'll be, back. <laughs> we'll be back. Yes, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, okay, so uh, we have to leave you now from Dubai and go to uh, our wonderful studios in Stockholm. So it's over to you, Katerina. Well, thank you very much, Nick. For sure, you will be back. Uh, it's nice having this ping pong back and forth with you. We, we, we miss hanging out with the team in Dubai, but you're doing a great job. So I'm here in the studio with Ingmar Rensorg, the founder and CEO of We Don't Have Time, and also Samba, who's project leader of the Youth Hub that we are very happy to have with us this year. So let's start with you, Osa. What reflections do you have from the youth at the Youth Hub? Well, it's truly been a, a really great day again uh, in the Youth Hub. Today we have had about, uh, well, uh, well uh, probably about 30 to 50 youth all over the day from all parts of the world, in fact. And we've listened to, we began this morning to listen to um, a startup, Colin Mayani, who is in Kenya. And he was inspiring youth to act. And how, uh, if you're sitting on an, uh, with an idea, how, how do you, how should you act? And his word was, don't just sit on the idea. You need to bring it to the front and actually share it with your neighbor. And I thought that was really, really good. And he also spoke about the he also spoke about the importance of mentorship to actually if you don't have a network then ask for help maybe it won't give you something new but it will be someone to hold your hand and I also thought that was really really lovely and very well put and uh, we've also uh, had some of our youth hub leaders so every day in the hub we have a different youth hub leaders from all over the world and today we have had Samuel Okelo and Dixon Mutai from Kenya who's who's helped and also been in the broadcast. He was great. He was really, really good. And in fact, uh, we also had the brilliant opportunity to have Rufa Gakogo Guam, I think her pronunciation mm -hmm. was. She was also a panelist here in the main broadcast, but this, she then took the opportunity to, to have an exclusive Q&A with our youth. And that was actually amazing. And she spoke about uh, her work in Asia uh, and on gender. And she actually uh, concluded and said that she shouldn't be stopped uh, because she is sometimes, she gets a lot of hate and a lot of bad voices, but she did say that I should not be stopped to promote a gender fair world as that is what will be needed for a more peaceful world. Word. And I thought that was beautiful. That's really word on that one, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Osa. And I can imagine for, for her to be part of this, this Youth Hub session, to be able to talk directly to the youth must be really, really important also for her, not just for the youth. No, this is completely true, and, and she was thrilled to join, and obviously the youth were really thrilled to have her there as well. So the dialogue is crucial, and that is why this platform exists. That's why we're doing it this year, so that the youth voices are heard, and also that, that they have a chance to actually speak to world leaders and researchers from all over the world. And we are continuously doing this throughout COP, so if you're interested to join, mm -hmm. just please uh, go to uh, COP28, we don't have time, you Hub, and there we will have an interesting program facilitated just exclusively for youths. Um, so it's just to register and then you get a link and you might just end up in our broadcast. Who knows? Who knows? Excellent. Thank you so much. Great work, Osa. So, Ema, what are your reflections on this third day at the COP? Um, if this very, um, I would say it's like a football game where you have two very clear sides. Mm. Um, the leaders wanted to to win for us all, and the leaders that wants to win for themselves. Mm. Different teams, huh? And not even their children, but themselves. Because it's old leaders, they don't have many years left on this planet, and they only care about power and money. Uh, and if, if uh, it wouldn't be that the stakes are incredibly high, you could kind of watch this on distance and applaud when you see something good and shout out when you see something bad. But I mean, we don't have time for hundreds of cops. We, we need to move for, forward. The clock is ticking. Indeed. Uh, so in one way, I see a lot of, I feel a lot of hope that the elephant in the room is finally out. Oil is at the core of discussion, not just talked about this in the negotiations. It's what people are talking about. And I would like, to, as I normally do, I would like to give out some love and some warnings. The heart is there and the triangle um, is there. 
And um, the love I would like to start with is to Sunak, Prime Minister of UK. He has been heavily criticized mm -hmm. uh, because he is supporting phase out of fossil fuel. And here's the thing, and this is concerning me a lot. Uh, people are starting to call him out as a hypocrite because he's doing the right thing. But, but and the reason why they call him out a hypocrite is that just a couple of months ago, he was approving hundreds of new oil and coal and gas licenses. Yes. But here's the thing. The reason why we need uh, legislation internationally is that we need to agree that everyone needs to face out fossil fuel. We can't just do it in one country. We need to do it everywhere. So it's not hypocrites. To, to do the wrong thing and to try to get everyone to do the right thing. It's actually good action, it's, but it's bad leadership. Mm. Because if you're a good leader, you're living by doing it you yourself. You shouldn't have auctioned out the right. And you try to pursue the others to do the same. But it's, it's not Sunak that is the problem here. The problem, however, I, 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 this, I started this COP meeting, I, I kind of was positive. Uh, surprised about the hosting country in the chair uh, because he stepped up and seemed to be willing to do an independent role as a chair. Uh, and he made this uh, loss and damage fund happen the first day. That's his story. That's yeah. uh, but what he said, what came out in media that he has said quite recently are worrying me very, very much. He's saying that Facing out fossil fuel uh, doesn't need to happen according to science. Mm. It's one way of saying that we can't face out fossil fuel because we don't want to do it because we will lose money. Fine. But the science is clear. There is no future for continued burning of fossil fuel. It's a matter of if we're doing it fast or slow, but we must face out fossil fuel. And that is what the UN General Secretary are stating very, very clearly. Uh, and I will read a quote from the UN Secretary. The 1.5 degree limit is not, pos is not only possible if we ultimately stop burning all fossil fuels, not reduce, not abate, phase out, with a clear time frame aligned with 1.5 degrees. It's science. You can have different opinions, but you can't change science and fact. We can negotiate, nego negotiate with other countries, but we can't negotiate with natural science. Indeed, That's Ingmar. absurd. Mm. But I will, although, and end a, with a end very a, positive note. End on a positive news. Yes. Piece of news uh, piece. So I take with me this. Go ahead. Because I have a very, very big love mm. to give. And this is exciting news. Um, and what's exciting, if you watch this show yesterday, we were so glad. We had eight countries supporting facing out fossil fuel. And there were two more counters added yesterday. Colombia was one of them. Today, we're 100, 100 countries supporting phase out of fossil fuel. And not just saying it randomly at an event. They're doing it in the negotiations. They're fighting for it. It's a majority of the countries on the planet are pro phasing out fossil fuel. Fuel. It's historic. And as we all know, we need 200 countries to agree that will not happen. But before COP28, there were eight countries. Now it's 100 and counting. It's the most incredible news ever. And what I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see this COP maybe as Copenhagen. The big failure before we will have the COP with a big success. That was Paris Agreement the year after Copenhagen. But maybe it's happening now, maybe it's never happening, I don't know, but let's not wait and see, let's act, and everyone can join this call, and fossil. You can do it on wecandoit.tech slash fossil, and you can 
speak outspoken about it yourself and you can act. Uh, and if you're a leader, you don't need to dig up more oil like UK are doing. You can actually do it anyway to show leadership. Uh, so that's a credible good. If we see other things going on uh, in app, you could read a lot of warnings and, uh, uh, and love, good and bad action. And one warning we talked about this morning was uh, Lula da Silva, president of Brazil. Uh, he used the COP meeting to announce that they are joining OPEC the first day. Uh, and the day after COP is over, Brazil will have an auction where they will release 600 new oil and gas projects the day after COP. I'm not at COP, but I heard by my colleagues that were there that Lula yesterday had this speech in a room full of world leaders where he cried. He had tears talking about how bad it is that the world is going to be destroyed and where he is feeling that he is doing the right thing. Is he crying over his own bad failed leadership or is it just playing theater or is it kind of don't understand it? I don't understand this. I don't understand how you can be seen as a climate leader in the world and auction 600 new oil license the day after COP. That's not a climate war, love. That's a climate warning. So if you agree on that, you can go to We Don't Have Time and you can do that. But it's also happening more things. Um, and um, we don't have it here somewhere. But anyway, European Union and US, they are also joining a coalition with, I think, over 100 countries to triple renewables and double up energy efficiency. So it's a lot of positive things happening there. But where is this going to end? Is it going to be Copenhagen or is it going to be Paris or something else? I don't know. The only thing I know is that we need to keep pushing it. And I think we can do that. Let's do it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ingmar. Thank you also, of course. There, there is the we in this. We need to be keep pushing it. And you can help do that on the platform. Tomorrow's focus is finance, trade, gender equality and accountability. And we'll be enjoying another exponential roadmap session on how companies can transform their portfolios towards a greener future. This is important. We're also going to keep talking about the elephant in the room. The elephant is here. Um, we're going to talk about fossil fuels, of course, which is the elephant, and specifically how we can collectively finance a fossil fuel phase out. There will also be a session on how to enact our collect collective urgency as regional solutions that can help each nation, city and individual find the pathway to sustainability that best suits them. But don't go anywhere just yet. Uh, we'll be restreaming the third Business Sweden broadcast and Youth for Planet broadcast from our hub and several other pre-recorded interviews from Dubai. So we hope that you have enjoyed this third day of our broadcasting live from Stockholm and Dubai, and we're looking forward to hosting you tomorrow as well. Take care. Good morning, Lars. I'm so thrilled you were able to join me. I am here with Lars Stankfist, CTO of Volvo Group, a long-standing partner with We Don't Have Time. So, welcome to COP. I know you've been here for a few days and you've got a, a full day ahead. 
So we're thrilled to have a conversation with you. Tell us, what is Volvo doing to reach net zero by 2050? Well, for us, then it's very clear that the Paris Agreement then means that by 2050 we need to have a transport system that is truly fossil free. For us, then Volvo Group, trucks, buses, construction machines, our customers are normally using our machines equipment 10 years. So for us, 2050 turns into 2040. Excellent. So for us, it's 100% fossil free from 2040. And that is what we are doing then, meaning that we are developing solutions, providing to our customers so that they can operate fossil free downstream uh, at the latest 2040. But we are also taking care of the upstream flow. So for us, it's also very important to talk about we have to have a zero manufacturing footprint by 2040 as well. That is what we are delivering on. And so that's an incredible ambition, but Volvo is part of a value chain. So you need support in, from your partners across the value chain. So what actions do you need from others to help you reach those ambitions? If I'm looking downstream to start with, uh, towards our customers, it's very clear that this is not an automotive transformation. It is not just about the vehicles as such. It's very much about infrastructure. Uh, if we are talking about battery electric vehicles, if we are talking about fuel cell electric vehicles, it's a lot around infrastructure as well. It must be possible to charge your battery electric vehicles. It must be possible to refuel your hydrogen powered vehicles. If we are looking upstream, it's a lot about the supply chain. We are very happy here in, at the COP uh, to uh, have our partners with us here. Yesterday we announced a new partnership together with Norsk Hydro in the area of uh, uh, near zero aluminium. So we need to work together with partners both downstream and upstream. And we are all about partnerships. You've been a partner of ours, and we have supported and amplified all of the uh, transition that Volvo has been making to net zero future. And so there's so many innovative solutions that your company is putting forward. Talk to us about the, why it's not just about one solution, though. Uh, we can have one technology solution for decarbonizing heavy transport. Explain why that is. Heavy transport and commercial vehicles requires more than one solution. There is simply not just one silver bullet. We need to have a menu of technologies that we are offering to our customers. Uh, we did a rather thorough analysis some six, seven years ago, and we came to the conclusion that we can definitely not rely only on the combustion engine <coughs> running on renewable fuels, simply because there will not be enough renewable fuels allocated to our industry. So the majority of the vehicles 2040 will be electric. And we believe that it will be a mix between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles uh, based on hydrogen solutions then. But we are also true believers in that there will be a role for combustion engines also in the long run in our industry. But then of course running on renewable fuels and recently, during last years, we see a lot of possibilities to burn green hydrogen into combustion engines as well. So, leading the technology team, I can say it's more exciting than ever, with more technologies than ever in parallel. Okay, that's fantastic. And so hydrogen, is, you brought up, you've mentioned now, and will be a key player in, in uh, the energy for these electric cars. So talk to us about how hydrogen technology is developing. What is the infrastructure that you're going to need so that these battery electric vehicles really come into fruition? It will be very important that we have an infrastructure with refueling stations then, at least to start with along the highways, the big corridors across uh, Europe, across North America and other regions in the world. Uh, I'm less worried when it comes to the infrastructure for hydrogen than for uh, charging of batteries, um, uh, because the range of the vehicles running on hydrogen, they have longer range and they will be uh, predominantly used in long haul operations, meaning that they will normally transport goods along these big corridors. But we are definitely depending on, uh, dependent on partners setting up this infrastructure. And so what are you hoping to come out of COP in this regard? Because we covered COP every year now, and hydrogen was missing from the conversation. It doesn't make it to the plenary sessions. We bring, it, we bring um, advocates and experts on the topic through our broadcast. What are you hoping to see come out on hydrogen from this COP in particular? Well, for me, it's very important and more and more people realize that hydrogen is definitely a vital part of the decarbonization. 
Uh, there is a lot of talk about energy efficiency, that battery electric vehicles are outperforming hydrogen powered vehicles. But to be honest, it all boils down to the availability of the green energy. And in some areas, uh, we simply don't have the transmission capacity, the grid, in order to cater for the charging infrastructure. But in many of those countries, we have a history of pipelines, so there it will be easier to uh, distribute hydrogen than green electricity. And in the end, for our customers, it will be a choice when it comes to total cost of ownership and total cost of transportation, meaning that the cost for the green energy at the point where our customers want to use it will decide what technology they will use. Sure. So thank you for sharing this because the point of sharing all of this is to inspire others that also need to accelerate their transition to, to clean energy. And what is your advice for those that are struggling, the challenges that they're reaching, additional car companies in this sector? How, how can Volvo share its journey in a way that inspires others that also need to move in this direction? We need, we need to urgently transition. We took a decision a few years ago to really go for it. Uh, so this is really the strategy of the company. Uh, we have been early out, and that's what I'm saying to everyone. Don't sit and wait. You have to take action. Don't wait for all the answers, because the answers are not there. There will be questions that we need to, that we need to come up with the answers together going forward. So get started, is yeah. my advice. <laughs> and do you think we will succeed? Yes, I'm a true optimist. And, you know, uh, not all, definitely not all, but a lot of this will be... It's solved by new technologies, technology achievements. And, uh, you know, I'm leading a team of, it's amazing, 15,000 engineers. Wow. Uh, and uh, I tell them that we are just in the business of making impossible possible. So what was impossible a few years ago is possible today. What's impossible today will be possible in a few years. Is it possible? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, final words from you. We know that transportation is the leading uh, uh, emissions contributor, carbon emissions contributor. So if we can make an impact in this sector, we're really making a huge impact generally on the planet warming. So is there a reason that you have chosen this particular sector to, to prioritize your time and your career? Well, I've been into this industry for a little bit more than 30 years, and I must say it has never been as exciting as today. Uh, we have a clear purpose in our industry today. It's much easier to attract talents because we are part of the solution. We are part of the future. So that's a word we can say to our audience tuning in. Future engineers, this is the sector to get involved in because the, the transition is actually a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity to contribute to a clean energy future with your talents. So thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing Volvo's journey and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Fantastic. Thank you for having me on the show. Of course. I'm thrilled to be here at COP28, hosted by the United Arab Emirates, and with me is Lucy Almond in our studio. She is the Coalition Chair for Nature for Climate. Lucy, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you, thanks very much for having me. So, for those that are tuning in, there's probably very few that are unfamiliar with Nature for Climate, but please tell our audience a little bit about your organization. What brings you here? What are you hoping to achieve with your presence? Yeah, thank you. So, Nature for Climate is a, it's a coalition of 22 of the world's largest environmental organizations, some of the UN agencies, and some private sector coalitions. And so um, we've been working together since 2017 to basically promote the role of nature as a climate solution, to kind of mainstream the idea that you won't get to net zero without also getting to nature positive at the same time. Mm. So bring in the kind of two sides of the biodiversity and nature crisis together. So give us some concrete examples. We're big fans of nature-based solutions. Of course, we shared a pavilion our audience will remember at COP27 last year in Sharm el-Sheikh. And we, are, we really love sharing success stories uh, to inspire others to think through successful projects that can be brought to light, you know, ideas from those that are working on nature-based solutions around the world. Tell us some projects that you're excited about that you'd like to showcase that could also be scaled potentially or that others can pick up and you know, take off with in their local communities. Yeah. 
So there, are, I mean, there are three sort of main categories of what we call nature-based solutions for climate, um, and there are thousands of examples mm. of them all over the world. Um, some of them primarily are around kind of protecting tropical forests. Some of the actions are really about restoring some of the ecosystems that have been lost. And then the others are around kind of effectively managing our productive mm. lands. So that can be farmlands or that can be timber, timber forestry type things. So some really cool projects as a good example for in, in Indonesia of a mangrove restoration. Mm. So a lot of the Indonesian mangroves have been lost, been cut down basically for, for the local communities um, to, to you know, make space for fishing, for example. But actually, if you restore those mangroves, you can do a lot more. You, you, you bring back the fish supplies so they've got a fishing livelihood, but you also can do ecotourism. So people, so there's projects where people have come along and made kind of really, really cool ecotourist places as well. So you get multiple revenue streams. And then the main protect, the main thing about the mangroves is they can really protect the landscapes from storms and sea level rise. And obviously then you get the carbon CO2 storage as well. Mangroves are really having a moment. They're like the super tree. <laughs> CNN Films just launched Blue Carbon. We were covering some of that. And so restoration around mangroves to really think about how to protect oceans as well. So it's not even just land. Nature-based is also oceans. So please. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a lot of the work that we've done over the last seven or eight years has been really land-based. Mm -hmm. So we've done, you know, we've spent most of our time thinking about forests, reforestation, agroforestry mm. projects, but it's really great at this COP to see mangroves coming forward. I mean, a lot of our colleagues in the environmental movement have been mm -hmm. talking about mangroves as the unsung heroes right. of climate. And so I believe the, the, the focus on mangroves that the COP presidency has brought has really kind of brought that to everyone's attention, which is great. Yeah, sure. So that was specifically a question on solutions, but actually you also have an additional superpower, which is creating coalitions of actors in this space. And that's not easy to do. As a collaborator ourselves, we are always looking to see how to amplify impact by building partnerships. Talk, talk a little bit about this. What are some of the challenges you've faced in building coalitions and those that are looking to also really rely on partnerships to amplify their efforts, what can they learn from you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's I I can't lie; it's not been easy. <laughs> I can't we know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I think what happened was we used, in some ways, we used communications as a bit of a Trojan horse. Mm. So it was very clear that the environmental movement wasn't really getting the message across, particularly to the climate movement, about the importance of nature. And so by getting the big environmental organizations to collaborate on communications was actually just quite, an, not an easy first step, but they could all see the value in everyone speaking the same message from the same hymn sheet. So we spent two or three years really building trust within that community around communications. And then that subsequently led to further deeper collaboration on things like science, engaging with the finance sector, advocacy, and things like that. So, um, you know, what what's really been good interesting for me is to see how the coalition has grown and brought in very different types of sectors. There's, a, there's an obvious group of big environmental mm. NGOs who would work together because they share the same values, but we're starting to see the private sector take more interest right. in wanting to come in, and also smaller, different groups. And then this year, we're particularly proud of our Nature Positive de Delegation, which has brought in a group of indigenous peoples and mm. youth groups to be part of the broader delegation. Yeah, that's fantastic. And everybody speaking the same voice, that's the game changer. If you have different actors actually saying the same things but reaching their audiences in a way that resonates with those audiences, now we can actually see science make its way to implementation, right? Because science isn't the language, it's no. storytelling. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's a matter very close to my heart because the initial message we had with Nature for Climate, mm. we, we had so much science, which was telling us exactly how important nature was for the climate crisis, but everybody was communicating it in very complicated different ways. Right. And so we spent a couple of years building out the message, basically, that nature is a third of the climate solution right. and less currently attracting less than 3% of the funding. And that message was simple and mm. it stuck and everyone's been using it over and over again. And that really, I think, has helped build this nature positive movement. Yeah, and so you're here, and it's a it's a it's a strong presence at COP. The message is very much resonating through the proceedings. So tell us what you're hoping will come out of COP for the nature positive movement. Yeah. 
So I think the most important thing for us now is really about turning the commitments into action on the ground. So at COP26 in Glasgow, we really felt that that was the sort of first nature COP where all the pledges were made by governments and the private sector. And it's been two years since then. And so our efforts really now have been, how do you take the, those pledges and turn them into implementation on the ground? So we've had a, a campaign in the run-up to COP around the need to um, integrate nature into the global stock take. Mm. So this is really quite technical, detailed yeah. policy type work about how country by country people can take their international their, their national climate plans and integrate nature-based solutions within them and therefore that nature is truly representative within the global stock take so that's what we've been campaigning for really in the last few months and it's just been a few days into COP but what are you seeing so far so I've been I mean, I haven't had a chance to see a lot because <laughs> I've been mainly running around trying to find the pavilions. <laughs> For those of you not here, you're not missing anything in terms of getting around. <laughs> so um, I think what we've seen is some, we've seen some very strong implementation announcements, actually. So yesterday, the particularly on the forest and nature side, they announced what's called the country pass packages. Mm. So there was um, some, some really kind of strong financial commitments for countries like the Congo, for Ghana, where they've, they've taken the pledge from Glasgow, mm. the Glasgow uh, Leaders Declaration, and actually gone into a lot more detail about what those, what those plans will look like and how those countries can move forward to protect their own natural resources. Wonderful. So we're hoping for many more announcements like that as we continue on in the, this two-week very critical uh, conversation around how nature can play a role in the bigger picture of overcoming this climate crisis that we're in, but we know we can solve. Do you think so? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm, um, we, I saw everybody last year wearing those t-shirts, yeah. stubborn, stubborn optimist. Stubborn optimist. Stubborn optimist. Stubborn optimist. Yes. So I think I'm a realist, um, but I think we're there. I think just in terms of the amount of announcements, the amount of people here, I know mm. that's a double-edged sword. Yeah. People, a lot of people are sort of talking about the number of people that come to COP. But if you don't have the people come into COP, you don't have the momentum and you don't have the pressure on the governments and the private sector to change. And I see so much more focus of attention on nature and climate, obviously, that gives me some hope. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to be here, to have the conversation with us. And please, all continue fighting the good fight, Lucy. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here with Ebba Grithberg, the head of sustainability at Spotify, and we are proud partners with Spotify, and it's such a pleasure to welcome you to COP28, to our We Don't Have Time studio, and have this conversation about what is Spotify thinking about at COP28? What is it uh, that you want to see in regards to climate action and sustainability as a unique company in media that has a presence at this major global convening on all things climate? So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I mean, at Spotify, what we look at uh, when it comes to sustainability is really two parts. Mm. Both the first part is our own impact. So how do we make sure that we don't have a negative impact on the world? And for us being a streaming company, I mean, we don't have a huge, comp a huge impact. We're not the fossil fuel companies. We don't manufacture things. But of course, I mean, we do have a physical impact somewhere in the world, mm. right? Uh, and we are a growing c company and that impact grows as we grow. So for us, it's super important to make sure that we, we're, not the, we're not part of the problem. So that's why we set our kind of net zero target by 2030, including all, all of our scopes. Um, so that's, a, I mean, it's not a super easy target. Mm. We're not 100% sure how to reach it, but we're working against it. But what I really see as the big kind of potential for us, and we really, really can make a difference, is in how we use the platform. Mm. Uh, I mean, we have 574 million users or something like that globally. Uh, and imagine what we can do with that platform. So that's the kind of the second part of our work, is really kind of leveraging our platform mm. and our reach to raise awareness and uh, inspire to climate action. And that is, of course, also what we're here to kind of explore opportunities and possibilities for collaboration and inspiration in those areas. Yeah, it's very cool. And this is why we love partnering with additional media companies, because we're able to amplify our own impact. And if all of these companies are really using that reach to communicate messages around accelerating solutions to climate, now we're talking about real behavioral change. And we're reaching listeners directly. And that's what Spotify is so known for and so excellent at. 
And so you would think, yes, you're right. You don't have a heavy footprint compared to many of the sectors that are here. But that being said, everyone is looking to improve. And what I appreciate about what you also said is that it's a challenge. We're being honest, right? We're, everyone is on a journey. We're moving to a transition to clean energy. And there's going to be barriers that come up that need to be overcome. So we need to share how we're overcoming it. So talk to us a little bit about what Spotify is doing to be more environmentally friendly within the company across its value chain. Yeah. And I mean, the, the way we think about it is that it's a really kind of an integration issue. We have to work, I mean, across our operations. And of course, I mean, the first step in that was kind of looking at what does our impact look like. Uh, and for uh, being a streaming company, that was not super easy. It's not that many companies that had done that before. So it's really about like defining that methodology, looking at where are our hotspots and how do we address them. Mm -hmm. uh, and for us, that's a lot about kind of the, the whole streaming, of course, uh, end use and also the kind of the cloud usage in that. So for us, it's about kind of activating all the incredible talent that we have in the company mm -hmm. when it comes to I mean mainly engineering uh, so how do we how do we activate that engineering competence uh, in the kind of fight for actually reducing our emissions so that's everything for more efficient cloud usage um, really kind of breaking down that it's also a great opportunity because it's also a um, cost benefit so that goes hand in hand uh, but it's also about looking at all of this kind of leverage what can we what can we play it and I think a really good example of that is what we recently launched the dark mode Mm. So you can listen at Spotify. Most people listen on, on their phones, of course. You can listen on a computer, but you can also listen on a TV. Mm. Uh, and looking at a TV, you would have Spotify always on, mm. uh, which is actually consumes a lot of energy compared to any other device. Mm. So our teams looked at it. So what can we do instead? And how can we take down kind of this source of emissions? And came, came up with the dark mode. So you can mm. actually choose to have a dark mode on your TV, which makes a lot of difference and up to 64% or something like that in, in emissions. That's Brilliant. That's a great example. Or and it's electricity usage. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. and that, that's just thinking about seeing an issue yep. and just thinking through. And you have engineer. It's a company full of talent and engineers. And uh, we're talking about the actual, the actual company itself. I'm curious. The what you represent, what your product does, is music, of course. So bigger picture. What can the music industry do? And you, as a player in the music industry, to also encourage those that are tuning in, using Spotify, um, enjoying music. What can, how can the music industry be leveraged more to also contribute to uh, more sustainable practices? Yes. So you mean you're talking about like behavior change and how we can activate our users? Yeah. And of, of for us, that's a lot about kind of, I mean, as I said, using our platform, really using that reach. Mm. Uh, and we have the benefit of having, of course, both music on the platform, but also podcasts. Mm. So we have a lot of different kind of types of content that we can use. So it's about both about curating that content. I mean, there's amazing content on the platform already. So making sure that our listeners can find that. And that's why we have a climate hub that we activate uh, throughout the year uh, for listeners to find credible, good mm. climate content. Um, but if, it's also about curi I mean, cr creating content that is good. And when, when I first started at Spotify, my kind of initial um, feeling or reaction was, okay, we need to bring like science to the platform. You know, we need to have like science podcast, uh, which is great. I mean, I love science, uh, but a lot of people don't actively search for climate content, and don't actively search mm -hmm. for that type of kind of um, listening experience. So what are kind of what we're exploring now and the, the kind of the big challenge but also the great opportunity is how do we find how do we kind of reach the people who are not looking for this content so how do we infuse climate into other types of content Brilliant. that are that you you don't really kind of know that you're listening to climate content it's like getting kids to eat their vegetables exactly exactly <laughs> you mix it into something right. else right right i mean you make like a pancake batter and you <laughs> mix it like spinach into it and you have hulk pancakes exactly so that's what we're trying to do uh and i think a great example of that that is what we did for earth day earlier mm -hmm. this year and we know that true crime is one of the biggest kind of uh, podcast categories with a great listening span and there's many people who have that in their feeds mm. so what we wanted to do was discover how can we make climate content in their feeds so they don't have to actively choose for it so we made like a special series of earth crimes so crimes related to to the earth and to um from everything from like bp horizon conspiracies and and climate activists um so having people kind of you know falling into it and right. hopefully that makes people feel, think, and act. So this is really interesting because we we are only producing climate content and our users really care about this topic. And so it's interesting to see when you have more, uh, when you have a more s general spectrum of of content, yes. how to, wh what people are tuning into and what they're listening to. And 
we know from we know that mass media still only it's only in the single digits that's actually pushing out climate and sustainability mm -hmm. related content. We have to change that. So have you seen progress? Is what you're doing, what you just described, is that successful? And are you seeing the numbers tick up? Are you seeing improvement in those caring about this type of content? I mean, we do see uh, people care a lot, and especially like among the younger generations, when you look at Gen Z and, and even younger people than that, uh, people do care a lot about it. People want to to know about it, but it's still, I think, the barrier for actually kind of consuming content mm. is really, really high. So the content has to be, I mean, of course, as attractive or even more attractive than other content for you to actually take that time and mm. listen to it. Uh, so I think that's that's the main kind of challenge and opportunity. How do you make really, really good climate yeah. content? It's not that people are not interested and people don't want to learn or or consume it but it, how do you make it worth their while to spend like a, like an hour of a podcast listening yes uh, yes that? well that's a lot of food for thought thank you for sharing that you definitely have me thinking i know our audience has really enjoyed hearing from you and your reflections in the last minute on what you hope to see come out of cop 28 so i love that spotify is here it's really important for media to have a presence at these conversations because we need to be able to take the outcomes of COP and really get it out to the world, make it relevant for those tuning in. What are you hoping as an outcome that you also hope that the audience, global audience takes away? Yeah, I mean, what I really hope for, from COP and from companies participating in COP is really like around looking at this like opportunity side as well. Mm. I mean, we all need to focus on the problem, of course. We need to we need to reach net zero, all of us. But also, we don't we we need to kind of remember the positive side of it because we have so much opportunity in this problem, and there's so many companies who can leverage what they already do mm. and leverage their business model for for good. So I really hope that that's also more apparent and that that kind of continues to develop. Well, thank you, Eva. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and enjoy the rest of your cup. Thank you so much. You too. I now have the pleasure of interviewing Sandra Frank, who is co-founder of Avid, and you're also a marketing director of Avid. And Avid is a fantastic company that has built two eight-story wooden construction buildings in Sweden, and you're really focusing on wood as a construction material, right? So um, since you've been, you've been advocating in replanting trees, also, of course, growing our building materials to uh, create a circular and more sustainable construction um, building industry. Um, because our building industry is letting out a lot of lot of monoclonic gases um, and we need to uh, we need to fix this and we need to change the narrative and we have to look at the building materials that are not concrete of course uh, and steel and we also need to spread the knowledge on how we can sequester and, and, and harness carbon in the construction building in the building the building the houses so Sandra um, tell us about Albert um, and, and uh, who are you and what do you do Thank you, Katrina. Um, we are developers. We are also advisors and kind of kickstarters to other com companies. So we're helping out because now there is a lot of construction companies and developing countries, uh, companies that want to learn how to build out a wood. So we're actually starting to to be being a, more of an advising company than than actually, but also developing, but only in wood. So what is what Ava does relating to the, well, the climate conference that's going on now? Um, so it's to us, we need to spread the knowledge around the globe and we need to take equal responsibility in all countries. It's easy for us up here in Sweden to say that we need to use our forests and replant them and uh, buying carbon dioxide in the forest and then in our future cities. But we also need to spread that knowledge and influence other, com uh, other countries because uh, many years ago a lot of uh, countries took down their forests and they haven't replanted. So it's not just about the building but it's also about the taking care of what's coming up. We need to make sure that we replant of course. Um, how does it help the climate transition to build in wood more precisely? Mm -hmm. um, we have two sides kind of. Uh, it, it's so important what kind of materials that we're using and what kind of materials that we're bringing up from, from our planet or we're taking, using. And some of those materials will never grow back again, such as steel, concrete, glass. And um, 
it might look in the first wave that we shouldn't <laughs> use our forest to get out of. But if we look at uh, how we're building today, we can't continue like that because steel and concrete is one of our most productive industries that there is. And uh, we need to grow our building materials just as we grow our food. And if we do that, actually the houses that we built in here outside Stockholm, uh, it contains about 2,000 cubic meters of timber. And it took the Swedish forest about one minute to grow. So every minute, every 24 hours, every day of the year, the Swedish forest produced enough building materials for one eight-story apartment building like that. It's actually mind-boggling to, to hear that those statistics. Mm -hmm. So, Sandra, um, there is critique that you might worry that you might you need forests and wood for for so many other uh, aspects of, of society than just for for building. So, how do we how do we fit everything in, and what is the priority? Mm -hmm. I think why there is such a good idea to use it in buildings is because we need to store the carbon as well as we need to use the forest for, for many good reasons. But storing the carbon is one, one, and I just think it's a brilliant idea to store it in our future cities. So um, uh, that's, that I would say would be the main, main thing. Why not using it for fuel or for a building? But of course we need the forest for, for many things, and that's why we need to replant as well, globally. Absolutely, because if we, we've used it for fire, the carbon, the biogen carbon, it goes straight yeah. up again. And, and, and when we put it in a building, it's, 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 it's there for hopefully hundreds of years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there's always been talk about the fire and the building houses and wood, but that's really you know, not, a, not a topic anymore, is it? Not really here in Sweden, because we're getting used to these types of buildings and we talk so much about it. But going to other countries where they maybe not have seen a high-rise or a mid-rise wooden building, or the first thing you think of is fire. So, but it is these, these um, panels that we're using to build a higher building, they're very thick. <laughs> So, and a fire needs oxygen to burn. So you need to, you know, you need to split it up to, 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 use, to get it to fully uh, burn. But today, however, it's, it's totally fire safe. And in Sweden, we have these, um, the regulations. There is very strict regulations in, in the building industry, of course, and especially due to fires. But up until 1994, we had specific materialized uh, regulations and it said that we cannot build in wood because of the fire but from 1994 when we joined EU um, that changed and it says this is specifically for fire just prove that it doesn't burn and this has been proven yeah so it's, it's really a no-brainer these days too mm -hmm. as long as you do it right it's it's not more more uh, have fire hazardous than in concrete Excellent. Um, do you have any good examples? I mean, apart from your own uh, examples, you might want to tell us more about those, of course, of, of building fairly high buildings in wood. Yeah, there is um, there is the beautiful uh, cultural house up in the north of Sweden, and uh, it's a cultural house. It's a, a library. Um, a place for the whole city of Skellefteå to come, but it's also a hotel, so it's, I think it's eight, tw 28 stories high, and it, it's a hotel, so you can, you can live there. That's a brilliant example, and it's very beautiful, because they've combined so many different techniques in wood building. But also, as I said in the beginning, we, we kind of uh, also work as advisors and kickstarters, and um, there is now, where we kickstarted as the company Volchem. Now they have, they have built uh, four houses, or are building the last ones on, uh, just in the city center of Stockholm. It's 11 to 13 buildings. It's called the Cedar Houses, Sierra Tusa. And uh, those are 
beautiful. And they're also built on an overdecking of, an, of a highway. So, and that, they, it could be done like that because of the light weight of the wooden, because wood weighs about one fourth of, uh, of, of concrete. You can also imagine if you if you want to deck over a highway with all the noise pollution, mm -hmm. wood is probably better absorbing noise and, and, and than, than concrete and other building materials. Yeah. Well, this is so fascinating, and uh, your work will be continuing, uh, of course, and uh, as you kickstart other uh, other projects in, in other countries, and uh, we look forward to seeing more houses built in wood, so we can sequester the carbon. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. We are here in beautiful Dubai for COP28, and with me is Calixto, Calisto, I said that correctly, Suarez, our WACO's representative. But please just pronounce that so I make sure that the audience hears it correctly. Calixto Suarez, de la tribu, from Aruacos tribe. Amazing. And you are translating for him today, so please introduce yourself. I am Octavio Rollo, I am the translator. Well, thank person. you for being here, both of you. My question to you, sir, is what is your work in this territory on Sierra Neva? Why is it so critical? Why is it so important? Why is? Why, the work that he's doing in the territory of Sierra Neva, why, why is he doing it? Why is it so important? A ver, la Sierra Nevada es como el símbolo de micromundo desde la cosmovisión arhuacas, entonces de, de ahí hacemos muchas cosas porque sabemos que desde ese punto tiene una correlación de conexión de diferentes puntos continentales. Sierra Nevada es el heart of the earth, es a es a special point in the world, and they are working in in spiritual ways to to save the earth. Tell us a little bit about your tribe as well. Bueno, a nivel en Colombia, pues vive 115 comunidades indígenas. En la Sierra Nevada existen cuatro pueblos indígenas. In Colombia there are 115 tribes, mm. indigenous tribes. But in Sierra Nevada there is four. There are four tribes. Entonces, Kogi Guiguarguacos y Guiguancuamos y ¿Qué es lo que hacemos? Uh, habitamos um, 50.000 habitantes, pueblos donde hago parte. There are 50,000 people in the Sierra Nevada. Mm. Uh -huh. eh, siempre vivimos con el pensamiento, con una correlación al cuidado a la naturaleza. ¿no? The cosmovision, they always are living in relation with the earth. Why is it so important to protect the land and culture? What is happening that that needs to happen, that protection? Porque desde la creación, desde la cosmovisión indígenas, todas las culturas indígenas tiene una relación de la creación, o sea, donde están las verdades. No hay otros inventos ni nada, sino la verdad y la paz y la armonía y la unión. Por eso es importante el territorio de los de los pueblos indígenas. Because they are living there from the beginning of the earth the history and they represent the unity, the harmony, the sustainability. So it's important to respect all the tribes indigenous. So what are the specific things that are being done by your tribe to protect this this part of the country? ¿Cuáles son las cosas específicas que estáis haciendo para proteger la tierra? <coughs> son, sí, son dos puntos fundamentales. Para mí es importante cualquier cultura que sea, cualquier humano que sea de, de las tierras, que, es, que viva en paz consigo mismos y también en un, que sepa que la tierra, somos parte de la tierra. En one side, uh, he's saying that for he is important to be in harmony with yourself to be in harmony with the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, 
La segunda es que muchas de las personas desde nuestras mentes pensamos que la tierra es de nosotros. Nosotros no somos, la tierra no es de nosotros, sino nosotros como ser humano somos de la tierra. Eso es lo que hay que pensar. Yeah. So they, they say that a lot of people is, is saying or is thinking that the earth belongs to them. Mm. It's my, my earth, my, my right. part of the earth. So they, they say the contrary. They think that we belong to the earth. It's the opposite way. Ah, uh, I see. Tell you us about the <coughs> law of origin also and why you are sharing this law of origin with the global audience. The law? The law of origin? Origin? Yeah. El origen es los cuatro elementos de la naturaleza, que es la tierra, el aire, el agua y el, y el fuego. The origin is the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air. Sí, eso es lo que tratamos, que ellos también estén armonizados. And they are doing rituals, shamanic rituals, to make harmony between each element. Porque es de todo el mundo, no es de una sola persona. Because it's for all the planet Earth. But they are doing rituals for everyone. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank we, you, thank we you. We need this. <laughs> so, why is it important for you to be here at COP28? ¿Por qué es importante para ti estar aquí en la COP28? <laughs> para mí es importante porque nos llama, la Tierra nos llama. La tierra se está manifestando a través del cambio climático, si eso nos llama. Y esa unión de diferentes culturas, diferentes pensamientos frente a la tierra, nos estamos uniendo. Por eso es importante. So they listen the call. Mm. The, the planet Earth is calling mm. the people and they listen the call. So uh, he's here because uh, he's, he thinks that we need to be united to, to in this, in this, to combat the, the climate change, you know. And this is a great place to communicate. We are reaching an audience of millions around the world that might be hearing your story for the first time. What is it that you would like to communicate to those that are watching you right now to say, you know, here's how you can help, here's what you can do to help my people, my tribe, my country, and the planet? Cada ser humano del planeta, en, de cualquier forma o condiciones que se encuentres a nivel físico, mental o enfermos, pero siempre valórese por sí mismos. Yeah. Each human being, whatever is their condition, has to have value, has to value their self inside. Pensar que yo soy muy importante para la tierra. Eso es muy importante. Everyone has to think that we are really important for the planet Earth. No hay que pensar que sobro de la tierra o algo excluido ni nada, sino soy importante, soy algo de la tierra. Y ese pensamiento transforma a muchos y alimenta la, el alma de todas las que, que habitas. We have to think that we are part of it. We are not, we have mm -hmm. not to think that we are not part of the planet or we are not part of, we are not involved. Everyone is involved. And if you think that, this, this kind of thought is transformative. Mm. Eso es lo que le puedo decir. This is my message. Yeah. Well, thank you. Last question. What are you hoping to see come out of this COP? 100,000 people are here. There's all these countries represented. Indigenous peoples are here as well. What do you hope to see happen? Muchos niños alegres, muchas mujeres alegres y el humanos alegres. Yeah. Happiness. <laughs> happiness for the people, happiness for the, the woman, happiness for the kids. Can we just take him to everything? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> gracias. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Muy bien. Gracias.
It's gonna take all of us to heal this world. It's gonna take all of us. Day three at COP28, and today we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Our youth reporters are gonna give us a tour of the Blue Zone, as well as check out some of the country's pavilions. We'll also be answering some of your questions from Slido, which, by the way, thank you very much for sending them in. People are mainly asking about what countries are gonna do to get the planet back to 1.5 by 2030. We'll also be checking in on the winners of the Polar Race for Good and take a ride on the Creative Velo. Let's check out the Blue Zone. So today we sent in our youth reporters to the Blue Zone to check out some of the pavilions, including Ethiopia, Singapore and the Congo. My name is uh, Adefres Wurku. Uh, I am the chair for the Green Legacy Technical Committee of Ethiopia. So today we are at COP and uh, would love to know what Ethiopian Green Legacy is doing to reduce the emissions and also to bring the temperature to 1.5 degrees because I'm seeing some exciting work here you can elaborate more. Yeah, thank you very much for that very timely and important question. As we all know that Ethiopia is one of the countries which is very much affected by the changing climate. But our threat is not only climate change, but also uh, natural resource degradation, loss of ecosystem services. So to address these socio-economic and environmental challenges, Ethiopia has been doing several nature-based uh, uh, intervention, one of which is the Green Legacy Initiative, actually. The Green Legacy Initiative at its center, it is a people program and which is owned by all citizens of Ethiopia because the Green Legacy Initiative is, you know, an initiative, a flagship program that has given an opportunity to all citizens, all walks of life, uh, where farmers own it, pastoral community own it, so that it is a program that has been implemented from rural to urban area to address some, you know, uh, these uh, uh, challenges of the day, one of which is climate change natural resource de degradation, loss of biodiversity, so on and so forth. So before Ethiopia, before inter into implementing the Green Legacy Initiative and also other uh, uh, interventions, so economic development programs, we had this uh, NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, which is a very ambitious one, like Ethiopia. Though our contribution to the changing climate is very insignificant, I mean, not only for Ethiopia, for many developing countries, particularly in Africa, who suffer a lot because of climate change, has pledged to minimize or to reduce emission by 68% by 2030. So Ethiopia's you, uh, NDC is very much aligned with 1.5 degrees centigrade emission reduction. So. I mean, we, we, we don't see it simply after, you know, enacting that, that policy or that strategy. Then we entered into an intervention. So Green Legacy Initiative is started in 2019 to plant 20 billion seedlings. And uh, in tw up to 2026, 20, we wanted to plant about 50 billion seedlings. This is going to be the largest, uh, you know, tree planting campaign, actually, if we are going to finish it by 2016. So within this Green Legacy Initiative, we wanted to mitigate, contribute to climate change mitigation. We wanted to also strengthen social ecological resilience of our people. But also we wanted to other countries to join us so that Ethiopia has been, you know, sharing, actually not very big, but we, we have been trying to share some germplasm, some seedlings with our neighboring countries. Now many countries have been joining Ethiopia. In fact, we wanted the Green Legacy Initiative to be a pan-African program, actually. This is, you know, 
at its center, it says that later is too late, actually. When, when we discuss about climate change, we say that later is too late. Yeah, my critical message for the youth is that take over the world. You are now the responsible generation to lead and to act timely so that you will, your future will be the best one. So that lead, I mean, the youth need to really lead us. They need to intervene timely so that they will have you know, a better future. That is my, my, my message for the youth. It takes all of us. Always time for a quick coffee stop. So what is the question of the day? Everyone's been asking a bit more about what loss and damages are. Let's find out. Now, for those of you who don't know about the loss and damage funds, we need to understand that it was, it's something that has been in the coming for years now, 30 long years. And so this is a truly historical moment. $400 billion will go a long way. Now, the fund was created to cater to vulnerable nations across the globe. And the reason for this is that the most hard hit by the climate crisis are, in fact, the vulnerable uh, nations because they do not contribute to the gas emissions to the climate crisis as much as the bigger nations. So we saw c contributions coming from the bigger, larger economies like the United States of America. We had contributions from the UAE and also Germany, Japan, and um, uh, Europe as well, and the UK, the United Kingdom. So so all of this money, we're, look, we're so glad to have it, and we're looking forward to seeing change in the coming years. Well, well, that's a good question. In fact, it does. Like I said, it set a positive start to COP28. It set a really, really positive start. You know, having the agreement fin finalized, having the agreement operationalized, it's, the fund has, it's, it has put a positive step to everything. It's tying it all together. And we're hopeful that in the coming days, we're going to see more ambitious decisions. We're going to see stronger steps taken towards achieving the Paris Agreement. Singapore has also been one of the leading countries in climate mitigation, let's hear what they have to say. Okay, I'm here with Christine at the Singapore Pavilion and Christine, can you tell us more about yourself, please? Sure. Thanks, Tenny. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. So wonderful to be interviewed by you here at COP28. So I'm a, I'm a social entrepreneur, philanthropist, and climate investor based in Singapore. I've been invited by the Singapore delegation to attend COP. Uh, it's my first time, so I'm really excited. Uh, some of the work I do um, is focused on supporting vulnerable women uh, across Asia and Africa. I organize uh, expeditionary travel for all female teams around the world as a way to raise awareness and funds for women impacted by climate change and also women impacted by violence and abuse. Um, I also have several uh, board uh, roles uh, focused on sustainable investing, climate investing, gender lens investing, so trying to move as much capital as possible towards um, solutions solutions that could uh, benefit women in particular, but also um, uh, the more vulnerable communities that are most impacted by climate change. Okay, I've also heard about uh, you, the NGO that you have, yes. Her Planet, is that correct? Planet. Can you tell us more about it, please? Yes, so I have two NGOs. One is called Women on a Mission, and the other one, as you said, is Her Planet Earth. Both use expeditionary travel as a way to raise awareness and funds for vulnerable women, as I said, but Her Planet Earth focuses specifically on women impacted by climate change because uh, I discovered through my research um, that women were disproportionately affected not just by violence and abuse, economic crisis, but also by climate change. And unfortunately, in our part of the world where I reside in Asia and also parts, many parts of Africa, women are at the forefront of climate change because we hold the majority of the agricultural roles with what is uh, happening in terms of the feminization of agriculture as men go to the cities to look for work. Women and children are left often tending to the crops responsible for collecting food and water um, and are at the forefront of what's happening with climate change. They're really feeling the brunt of it. And so I realized that we need to support them in different ways, not just about raising awareness, but also raising capital and funds and helping them strengthen their livelihoods to make them more resilient to what's happening with the climate. 
that's truly incredible. But I had expeditions. I had I've, I've, I've read that you take these women through Antarctica to so many incredible places. Can you tell us more about Yes, that? I've been very fortunate over the last 12 years to lead about almost cl close to 200 women of all mixed nationalities, ages and backgrounds uh, from 22 years old to 61 years old. Uh, we do this as a way to not only take women who have the privilege to do that out of their comfort zone as a transformational experience because there's no better way to become an advocate for women and especially for the environment than to immerse yourself in these experiences in remote places. So I've been doing this, taking women to, as you said, to Antarctica, to the Arctic. We've been to Greenland. We've crossed deserts in Iran. Uh, we've crossed the Danakil Depression, the hottest desert on Earth in Ethiopia, um, across mountains in the Himalayas in Europe. And all this as a way to, to push ourselves and to rally our communities to stand up and pay attention to why are these groups of women doing this. We're doing this not just to raise, uh, put a spotlight on these issues that are so important, supporting vulnerable women in emerging markets, but especially to raise funds. And we do this through um, rallying our communities to make donations, we organize events, we bring, we give talks, we work with polar explorers, scientists, uh, we organize film screenings as a way to bring the community together and then raise more funds to support these meaningful causes. More recently, I, I took 17 women across the Namib Desert, the oldest desert in the world in Namibia. Um, and so that was a really beautiful expedition. Uh, we raised a lot of money for women impacted by violence uh, for that specific trek. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, I do this all regularly. It's uh, it's really an empowering exercise as well, not just for me, but for my teammates. Uh, earlier this year, I got the chance to work with scientists from the Earth Observatory of Singapore. So this was uh, not one of my expeditions, but I was there just to support uh, the group of scientists. We had filmmakers from, um, from Sydney as well. Um, so the scientists came to Antarctica to do some, um, some tests on the Antarctic ice sheet to measure the rate of melt and the effects, of course, of what this would have uh, on Asia in particular. Um, so the Earth Observatory is uh, the leading one of the leading uh, scientific groups uh, out, of, out of Asia, out of Singapore in particular. And uh, our professor who was leading the trip, uh, Professor Benjamin Harjan, is one of the leading uh, sea level rise specialists as well around the world. So, um, you know, there's a lot more awareness that needs to be um, done and, uh, about climate change. A lot of people think that what's happening in the Arctic, in both Antarctica and uh, in the polar uh, ice caps in general, don't impact them. But in fact, we are completely connected. The whole uh, system of oceans and climate are interconnected linked and unfortunately a, a lot of uh, countries with coastal cities will be impacted four out of five people actually who will be impacted by sea level rise reside in Asia and Southeast Asia in particular. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to raise the alarm and, and raise the awareness um, because we need to, to let people know that this is happening and it impacts every single one of us around the world. Thank you so much for that. And how would you how would you rate the importance of investment in innovation for climate change? So there's a lot of work that can, get, can be done, not just in the philanthropic space, but also in the investment side, because a lot of the solutions that are going to help us tackle climate change require capital to scale and develop. So a lot of the work that we need to do is uh, looking at capital and how that can help scale up solutions for climate change. So as part of my role as a board member, I'm on uh, two uh, VC uh, funds as a board member. We have funds in Australia, Singapore, and Africa, and these funds are dedicated to support young entrepreneurs to, who are working on, on innovative technologies and solutions that can really put a dent on emissions across many industries. Uh, so this is really important because we can't just look at philanthropy. Uh, that's really important too, but we need to move capital in, in an urgent manner. And COP today is also about that. There's a lot of conferences at the moment looking at gender lens investing, climate investing. How can we move more capital? We had an announcement a couple of days ago about uh, the damage and loss fund. Uh, I think they've committed $300 million, but that's still not enough. We're gonna have to, to, to raise much more money. We need trillions of dollars over the next 10 years to really uh, support vulnerable countries. So, so everybody has to step up to the plate. The urgency is really here. So I've been invited by Singapore government. Uh, we are partners uh, here. So we have a delegation of, uh, of different uh, parties, nonprofits, government, business uh, community. And we're really here to, to deepen the, the bonds of collaboration. That's really what we're here for. Everybody has different roles. Uh, it's a privilege to be invited as part of the delegation, of course. Um, but we are here really to continue uh, those relationships with our different stakeholders in our different roles. Because, of course, Singapore is playing a leadership role in the space. It's, it's wonderful to see that. Uh, this is the second time that we have a pavilion at COP. Uh, the, the first pavilion that Singapore had was, at, uh, was in Egypt last year. 
Uh, and so I'm sure we're going to continue that trend uh, because we are definitely playing a leadership role in the region, trying to move capital, you know, play host to ASEAN nations as well. Um, you know, po increasing collaboration in food tech space, for example. We have uh, we, Singapore has recently become a food tech capital uh, through the pandemic. As I worked on some of these initiatives through cultivated meat as well. Uh, Singapore became the first country in the world to give regulatory approval for the sale of such uh, meat, so meat made from cells in a bioreactor, to address some of the the, the security issues that we have around food um, supply in, in our part of the world. Um, so yeah, so lots to do and, and Singapore is really stepping up to the plate as well and hosting many events in this space. Thank you very, very much. It's been lovely meeting you. It certainly takes all of us and I'd like to share a little message to the youth. You are our future, you are our hope. Uh, I have four children myself and so what I'm doing today is also for their future. Uh, just believe in the power that you have to come up with innovative solutions and ideas that are going to impact our planet, impact our world for the better. I believe in you and all our generation really does believe in you. You are capable to solve the, the big problems of our world with our support. Trending news of COP28 in Germany today. The commitments made by the United Arab Emirates and Germany to the loss and damages funds are currently receiving a lot of attention in the German media. In particular, the media debate is focused on the question of whether and if so how China could react to the pledge. German Development Minister Svenja Schulze was quoted by Redaktionsnetzwerk Deutschland saying that she is calling for China and other emerging economies to participate following the example of the United Arab Emirates. Further media attention is focused on the upcoming visit of German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Dubai. Critical voices are pointing to the lack of substance in his climate policy measures. An article in Die Zeit criticizes the fact that German climate policy under Scholz has shrunk to an industrial policy issue, which he claims to answer with state subsidies, when at the same time the German public is well aware that climate protection will justifiably come at a cost for everyone. Another topic of the reporting is the long-prepared establishment of an exclusive climate club. It is seen as one of the main projects that Scholz introduces to the conference. Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung criticizes the lack of substantive objectives and the incomplete preparation of the project. Today, I sat in an interesting plenary, particularly focusing on elevating youth and underrepresented voices. Uh, in, it was most interesting on the impact of climate on education. While one child has the opportunity to attend school, another child is denied the opportunity to attend school. So let's hear what they have to say. I bet all they do is fight about, I think we should do this, no, I think we should do that. No, I actually think we should do this. If a bed cigarette no Stop fighting for once and let's focus on the important stuff. Well, no offense, but you guys only have a few years left to live. And meanwhile, I'm 11. I have my whole life to live and I want to live it. I do this. Se você então lembrando, você tem que cuidar das crianças. Andá lá e cuida da hora. O ano é nisto. E na hora que o cabo na nisto. O ano é 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 nisto. O
Assalamu alaikum. Your Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, children, youth, and educators. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the World Climate Action Summit, presidency event of COP28 focused on youth and education. The latent force of climate action and the first of its kind. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Maryam El Mansouri, and I am the general manager of a UAE based company called Rebound Plastics with a global impact when it comes to the recycling plastic space. And it's my honor to be your moderator for this event. As we just witnessed in the opening video, climate change is impacting children and youth in unprecedented ways. And you can hear the frustration, sense of urgency, and hope in their voices. And they're calling on you, leaders of the world, for bold and inclusive action. With the voices of youth still fresh in our minds, I would like to introduce one of the incredible 100 COP28 international youth climate delegates who are amongst us today. May I ask some of them with us here to raise their hands? Okay. And now I would like to give the stage to Ferdinand Valmond from the Commonwealth of Dominica to share how climate change has affected his life. Thank you. Distinguished heads of state, esteemed delegates of the COP28 and fellow youth, Mabrika, the greetings of my native language. My name is Ferdinand Valmond from the Commonwealth of Dominica, a COP28 international youth climate delegate, land of 365 rivers, and home to the last surviving pre colonial tribe in the West Indies, the Kalinago people, and a country that it's on its path to becoming the world's first climate resilient country. This speech was drafted together with indigenous youth from around the world. As both a climate and indigenous youth activist, I too have and continue to be affected by the impacts of climate change. And I recognize the voice of youth as the touch bearers of the future. As a result, from the age of 15, I pushed myself to be the change that I wish to see. After experiencing the catastrophic effects of two major tropical cyclones which devastated my country, my parents, who were farmers, and thousands of others in my community and country by extension, faced the harsh reality and continue to live by it. Our livelihoods are under immense threat, and I made it my goal to educate myself and others on the crisis that we are facing. Most children, young people, and adults still do not have the education they need to understand this challenge. We need immediate intervention if we are to survive. Curious to find out how the Congo has been impacted by climate change? One youth activist shares his message. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. My name is Guillaume Kalonji. I'm a climate activist from Democratic Republic of Congo. I founder and coordinator of Congolese Action for Nature. And I'm so excited to see what will happening from this uh, COP28. Uh, I'm so excited to tell you now what's happening in Congo right now. So there is two big problems. First of all, Congolese people are victims of climate change, but they don't know that it is about the climate change. Secondly, uh, they are facing an injustice, a climate injustice and a social injustice. They don't pollute a lot, like uh, emitting uh, CO2, but they are suffering a lot from the climate change. And uh, another problem is about the just transition and protecting the Congolese forest. About the, the just transition, 
our our doctor our our children are working in the mining seat uh, some people below 18 below 15 are now in the mining seats in the central part of congo instead of being at school and uh, about the forest we as climate activists when we are fighting against deforestation we are starting to be a target of those who are doing deforestation that is a bit uh, about what's happening in congo and then we have uh, 27 million people suffering from um, food insecurity right now that is thanks to the climate change which is disturbing uh, seasons in our country biodiversity in general in congo is in danger we, we know that congo have uh, uh, some specific animals uh, which we can't find outside Congo. We know that Congo have the second biggest forest. We know also that Congo have a lot of stock of water in Africa. But the problem is that those uh, biodiversity, those uh, resources are impacted impacted by the climate change why uh, i have been in the capital state of congo uh, for 20 years and since uh, 2017 i'm now in the eastern part the eastern part is the only one place in congo where it is very cold you know in the central in the central part is very hot but in the eastern part it's very cold before to come at COP, I have been with someone who uh, traveled from the capital state to the eastern part since 2000, uh, uh, 2004. And then this year he told me in the eastern part it's not, it's not cold like in the past. That means the temperature has changed a lot. In the eastern part it started to become uh, hot also so we know that naturally animals can survive in 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 a territory when the temperature is uh, good for them since the temperature is changing it's now difficult to see some animals like when you are in the city it's difficult to see birds it's difficult to see some insects that is one of big problems since we know that uh, between human space and uh, all other species of animals, we have also another problem when we, we are losing forests uh, by re replacing it by oil, um, by oil palm, monkeys need to eat fruits. Monkeys don't eat uh, the fruit of oil palm. Uh, in the Congoan forests and in other Congolese forests, people out from outside Congo are coming to cut natural forests and start planting oil palm. That's one of the uh, biggest cause of uh, the loss of monkeys. The lack of food, then they are just uh, start dying because they don't know another place to go. My message to the world now is that there is no uh, the fight against climate change without Congo. First, because the just transition which will be dis discussed in this COP, it's impossible without Congolese minerals. Secondly, it's impossible to fight against climate change without, uh, without Congo because we have the second biggest forest in the planet. So it's like a must. And I beg you to include local communities of Congo in the table of negotiation. They have some stories to share and those stories can lead you to a right decision 
and see how to protect Congolese resources, Congolese forests, and to succeed in the fight against climate change. It's going to take all of us. And that's a wrap on day three of COP28. Hope you enjoyed the tour of the Blue Zone. And by the way, make sure to send in your questions on Slido. It's going to help shape our show. It's going to take all of us, and we don't have time. It's going to take all of us. Welcome to this seminar on uh, bridging the gap between the latest science, the climate negotiations, and the solutions with a focus on positive tipping points. My name is uh, Linda Berinius, and I work as uh, head of development at the Global Challenges Foundation, who works with raising awareness of global catastrophic risks and to strengthen global governance to handle those risks. And uh, I would like to start off this uh, seminar by uh, some comments and introduction from uh, Dr. Joanne Rockström. Welcome up, Joanne. You can stand here. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Linda. Good morning, everyone. So this is a really important session, and let me just put a bit of a, of a framing around this. So tomorrow at 4.30, we'll be releasing the seventh edition of the 10 New Insights in Climate Science. This is across the entire science community that we try to map out the 10 most important advancements in science over the past one year. This is handed over ceremoniously to all the climate negotiators. This is like what you need to know to be an effective uh, negotiator. So Matthias, you'll get a, get a version of this as well tomorrow afternoon. The number one um, insight here is, is actually a very challenging one, which is that we are very likely heading towards overshoot, meaning that the pathway to a direct safe landing in 1.5 is essentially shut. We have burned too much of the carbon budget to be able to go directly to 1.5 from the 1.2 where we are today. We will very likely pass to 1.5 sometime between 2030 and 2035, and at best have a 30, 40 year overshoot of up to 0 0.3, so touching 1.8, before landing back at 1.5 by the end of this century. Now, why has this such a strong relevance for a session on, on, on positive and negative tipping points? Well, it's the following that all the IPCC scenarios that take us to that safe landing by the end of this century, after a period overshoot, have two major assumptions in the climate models. Assumption number one, that the living biosphere, nature, will remain intact. That you'll have all the carbon sinks on land and in ocean functioning as today. 56% of emissions absorbed in the living biosphere. So we have to take care of nature, not only phase out fossil fuels, to have any chance of holding that return to 1.5. The second assumptions in all the models is no surprise. There are no tipping points that will occur during that overshoot period. Do we have scientific evidence for that? The answer is no, we do not. We actually do not know what will happen during overshoot. We know that it's likely that we cross tipping points in a number of systems, and David Bohr will certainly map out a few of those from the work in the Earth Commission, already at 1.5. But we don't know exactly how much stress can the Earth system take beyond 1.5 without irreversibly crossing tipping points that would self-reinforce warming. So this is why it's a big gamble we're facing. So of course, message at COP28 must be, let's get on with fossil fuel phase out, because that's the step one, because we need nature and holding off tipping points as well to have a safe landing by the end of this century. So that, dear friends, will be coming out tomorrow, but of course, this session is focusing in on the negatives and the positive tipping points, because the ultimate conclusion is that nothing less than social tipping points are therefore needed to have a safe landing, because with the time of incremental change is past. There's no such way as a linear path to success. It is actually exponential. So good luck with the, the session here today. Thank you very much. Thank 
you, Joanne, for this uh, important introduction. And uh, I would now like to welcome Dr. David Obora on stage from the Earth Commission. Uh, he's also a director of Cordio East Africa and newly elected chair of IPBES. It's like the IPCC for the planet, or, or the nature, IPCC for the nature. Uh, who will tell us about the groundbreaking research from the Earth Commission. So uh, welcome on stage, uh, Dr. David Obora. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here for this session um, for the Earth Commission. Um, and it's great to have Johan's introduction uh, to the research that we've been undertaking and the importance of that research for, for this process. Now, one of the important parts of what the Earth Commission has been doing is that we're part of this broader Global Commons Alliance, and with a focus on business uh, and actors, um, one of the things we really want to communicate is this issue of, while we're doing a lot of science around showing the, the negative tipping points and the risks ahead, we really need to help show actors what they can do to avoid those tipping points and have action. So one of the key partners in the Global Commons Alliance is the Science-Based Targets Network, which is developing um, science-based targets for cities and companies uh, to be able to implement. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that towards the end of this presentation. Now, these Earth system boundaries, um, we have a very strong understanding now of planetary limits. Um, I think the work on planetary boundaries has really developed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years while, while they've been in the literature. And what the Earth Commission has been doing is to really try and show the social side of this as well, that it's not just about safe boundaries, it's about just boundaries as well. So we know we're deep into the Anthropocene, we know we're approaching these tipping points, and these tipping points are occurring because of emissions, because of pollution, because of excess consumption and things like that. And so we're really trying to understand how do we address these in a just way, um, because uh, the, a lot of the drivers are coming from overconsumption, and there are large parts of the planet who, are, who still don't have enough. And how do we try and balance the system in order to have a, a system that can support us all? We've looked at uh, Earth system boundaries across these five major elements uh, of the planetary system, so climate, biosphere, water, nutrients, and air pollution. And one of the key things we decided quite early on is that rather than having separate indicators for safety and for just limits, we decided to really look at using the same, uh, the same variables, um, the same metrics, so we can really point to where we are in the system and what we need to do to get back. So this is a very complex diagram. This comes from the, the signature paper that we put out, uh, I think it was in, in May this year, um, to really indicate across these various Earth system uh, components, or these planetary boundaries, uh, the current state of the planet, and that's shown by, by the little uh, the dot of the Earth uh, on each of those. You can see we're divided, climate is up at one o'clock, and then two biosphere boundaries, intact nature um, and managed nature over to the right. I won't go through all of these because, because there's a lot on this slide, but just to indicate uh, what Johan just mentioned, where we are on the climate boundary. So there you can see in red, we've identified, the Earth Commission has confirmed what the IPCC had identified before, that one and a half degrees warming is really the safe uh, limit for warming, and that's coming very soon. We're approaching that within the next few years. But in looking at the justice side of what we do, we realized that uh, there are large parts of the global population that are impacted already, um, just past one degree of warming, and we identified 1.2 as being a just boundary, which we have already crossed. There's already very unequal impacts of climate change that are impacting many different countries, small island states around the world. And that's where we show that the, the safe boundary is red and the just boundary is blue, and they don't Overlain. They, they don't um, align with each other. Some of the other boundaries on nature, for example, we found that the safe and just boundaries, the way we identified them and the way we felt we could quantify them, are in the same place. Um, for intact nature, um, we need a certain amount of intact nature across all of the land and in the ocean. We just quantified on land in the first phase. And that's at about 50 to 60 percent of the plant of the Earth's surface needs to be under under intact nature, it doesn't have to be completely pristine, but 
the activities that are happening in those spaces mustn't be damaging the natural system so it's not functioning uh, well. Uh, and that helps with carbon sequestration, the sinks that are critically important. In terms of the managed nature, these are the parts of the planet where we have impacted uh, nature so much that you no longer recognize the natural system as being in full function. So in, in farmland, in urban areas, obviously. Um, IPBES has done a lot of work in this area as well. And the metric that we chose to look at there, uh, and, we, and we, we went through this for a couple of years, is to look at a square kilometer. If you have enough high function nature per square kilometer of land surface, people can access the benefits from that nature. They can be supported by the rainfall that, that it uh, encourages, by the pollination, by the habitats that are there for species that really uh, give us benefits. Um, and we have crossed that boundary as well uh, for, I think, since they're two thirds of the um, impacted parts of the planet have less than 25% nature per square kilometer. The importance there, and the coming to, to what we want to reach out to people with, is that at a square kilometer scale, people can act. You can protect the nature in the area that you live in. You can restore it. You can rebuild it. And that means that agency comes down to local levels, to communities, to landowners, to towns and cities and municipalities to do something about that. Just one last slide on the bigger picture, on the Earth system tipping points, and that's you know, these are, these are planetary systems, and if we're exceeding so many of those in the previous slide, um, there are consequences at a planetary scale. And these are the Earth system tipping points Johan just mentioned that we don't know past one and a half degrees. How soon will some of these really tip into a significantly negative phase? The big red dots, so the cryosphere, the ice sheets in the north and the south, we know that those are melting quicker and their melt increases in speed with every uh, little piece of warming and the consequences on future warming and on sea level rise are very severe. Low latitude coral reefs, that's the system I work in. I'm a coral reef scientist based in Kenya. Those are declining rapidly all around the world and between one and a half and two degrees warming, we really don't quite know uh, how much more quickly they're going to decline during that period and if there's a tipping point of no return past one and a half that's, that coral reefs will decline. And then as we go to future uh, levels of warming, others of these earth systems, the smaller red dots, will come closer to, to their tipping points as well. The risks here are, of course, when you pass a negative tipping point on a planetary scale, is there any scope of return? Um, and at the moment, for many of these, the science says there isn't. For some of them, there's a lot of uncertainty. But the important thing now is what does that mean for actors? So it's not just about governments, it's about people acting where they live. And one of the things we did was to map out across the planet all of these global tipping points, Earth system elements, you can look at their local manifestations, and some of them are, are really essentially locally determined ones that we aggregate to global scales. And you can map out across the planet, you know, is one or two, three, up to seven of these um, Earth system boundaries transgressed. And so, of course, where in, orange, in the orange colors, you can see where five or more of these boundaries are transgressed down to the blue where just one is transgressed. And so that means that in those places, you could actually do something about those, those tipping elements in those places. And this gives you decision-making power in, in those jurisdictions to determine what you can do. Um, so the key thing there is then thinking about, okay, we have, we've been looking at the declines. There's a lot of doom and gloom in, in that messaging. How do we look at the positive actions that can be undertaken? How do we return within safe and just boundaries? This slide initially had the title as how do we live within safe boundaries, but we're already transgressing those boundaries in so many areas that we really need to communicate that we have to return within them at this point uh, to understand what to do. The diagram here just shows one of those pies in the earlier figure um, with the state, the current state being outside of the safe and the just boundaries. And we've, we need a just transformation. We hear a lot about transitions, the just transition in technologies, in businesses, in various energy sector and food sector. But when you look at all these together, it's not just transitions that we need. We, read, we need real transformation. Uh, and what does that mean? A number of things. We need to ensure sufficient access uh, to resources for all around the planet, especially to those who still don't have enough. 
Uh, this does require redistribution uh, and uh, transformation to make it occur, and it needs to go across multiple scales. Um, and the key thing is then it, we need to take it beyond just countries being called to act, but also actors on the ground, businesses, cities, we've identified in the Earth Commission as being two of the primary actors globally that actually control large, they have a high degree of agency in, in pushing for change. So, what does transformative change mean? And I'm going to pull a little bit to the IPBES framing now because, and the Partly I'm doing this because with the Earth Commission, we are an independent group of scientists. There's, there's a, large, uh, a large group of organizations that are invested in the Global Commons Alliance and what the Earth Commission is doing. It best is a governmental process, and so there's, there's, a, there's a, a dialogue between these two things that needs to happen. One is much more nimble and can move very quickly, can really move with the latest science and what's moving forward and how we communicate it. The other is really held to govern, government processes and needs to acknowledge what the, what the countries have learned, become comfortable with, and can mandate for moving forward. In the IPBES Global Assessment in 2019, we produced this very complex figure. Um, I'm not going to go through everything that's in the figure. Um, and what we're doing now is really coming, as the Earth Commission is doing, coming to try and understand how do we make this tangible to actors on the ground, and that's these two assessments. You can see through the tables here, the transformative change assessment and the nexus assessment, and interlinkages between multiple sectors. These are very much actor-focused. The key thing in the figure there is the actors on the left, and you have multiple actors working together. There's no single sector that can solve this on its own, or no single set of actors. We need to work across many different people, across the rainbow of different uh, agencies and responsibilities. We're trying to shift the drivers, all the drivers of going past these tipping points are human. There's all of our uh, sectors, um, agriculture, mining, transportation, and so on. Uh, food systems, what are they doing? They're, they're imposing direct drivers on nature of decline, but it's behind those, it's the indirect drivers, so demographics, values, and so on, uh, our social systems, that are really driving uh, all of these changes and pressures on nature. And the key thing about transformational change is that leverage point. If you have a lever, where is the fulcrum? Where is that balance point between the actors, what you can do, and the things that you're trying to change. And there's a whole range of things under levers that we can try and address. I want to focus on positive tipping points now as we come to the conclusion of this session, is um, how can we look at the various levers that the global assessments identified, so things around the, the visions and values, what are our visions for the future? Um, can we have a positive visions that really express values of, of integration and change and plurality? The various institutions and governance processes that we have, um, technology and the role of technology, uh, particularly in, in business sectors and in production sectors and how we move forward. And then the various incentives, uh, sort of enforcement, how do we really make sure we're moving in the right directions? But how do actors actually change a situation of one in the top of this figure on the left so the blue ball can't cross over to the to the other uh, well because of the hump in the middle. How do you change the shape of that landscape, the shape of that system, so that you can enable a transformation? And it depends on more and more actors coming together to, uh, to work together. And this is work that we'll be focusing on in the second phase of the Earth Commission coming up. Um, one of the groups is very interested in really diving down into these uh, positive tipping points and understanding how to leverage those. How does that connect with government? So this is a figure from the, from the IPCC AR6 report uh, that uh, informs this process now. We're here moving into the future with climate resilient development pathways, the message being that there are bifurcations coming up in the future where we can go into more positive or more negative directions for future outcomes. But the key thing there is that all of those branch points are about people. It's about people's decisions and what they choose to do, how they choose to act, with whom. Um, there's, there's no magic about this. It's all hard work um, in terms of identifying uh, what we want to do. And so we have this big picture understanding about these climate resilient development pathways. How do we really dive down into the detail of enabling positive tipping points, enabling actors to move forward and make those decisions from one day to the next, to one year to the next, to pushing the, the graph in a, in a positive direction rather than a negative one. And there are all those levers on the right that I mentioned already. 
and making them a bit more uh, tangible for businesses. So some of the things that are coming up, so I mentioned we're working on that in the Earth Commission phase two. IPBES is working on this through a couple of assessments that are coming out in December next year. And then there's existing guidance already out there that businesses can use. So Science-Based Targets Network in the Global Commons Alliance is putting out guidance. And then the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures also is putting out guidance now to at least get to disclosure on impacts and, and positive change that companies can do as we move forward into, into action and implementation. So I'll end with that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation on the groundbreaking research that you are doing and also breaking down so that businesses and um, uh, societies can use this research in a very concrete way. I would now like to welcome up uh, Matthias Frimri, our uh, Swedish chief negotiator, and Dr. Arana Bagosh, founder, CEO of Council Environment and Water, top ranked among Asia's leading uh, policy research institutions. So welcome both on, uh, on stage. And you have one. So um, I wonder, what are your reflections uh, on the research from the Earth Commission? Uh, Matthias, would you like to, to start? Well, I think my uh, good, good morning. Uh, great to be here. I think for my first reflection is that you know we, we should have this presentation at start of every COP for all the negotiators, sort of to get us into you know what we're actually discussing, uh, a useful reminder of what we're here to do. Um, but also more on on the, maybe on the positive side. I mean, uh, for, for me at least, I think this speaks to very much the approach that we take from the Swedish government side on what to climate diplomacy more generally, where we are sort of these three elements that we're using on policy finance finance and innovative technology. And by bringing these three elements together, uh, hopefully sort of encouraging countries to be move quicker along uh, the route of uh, sort of towards climate neutrality. I mean, and as you were saying on the sort of the incentives that we're putting in place in terms of uh, creating the right kind of conditions for countries to move forward. And here for us, I mean, that is uh, the direct link also here to um, what we're doing here at the COPS, sort of setting some kind of global regulatory framework. We have the Paris Agreement, of course, being the ultimate example of that kind of regulatory framework. But of course, for, the, for every year that we meet, how we're trying to develop those kind of frameworks to be more granular in terms of what countries can do in their national frameworks sort of to set the kind, right kind of, of uh, direction. And again, creating those kind of incentives to make sure that we're not sort of pulling over those tipping points, the negative tipping points, but rather focusing on the positive tipping points and how we can use like all the dy dy dynamism and energy here in like in the Swedish Pavilion by all the Swedish business actors to contribute to that positive uh, examples of what we can do to ensure that we uh, are embracing the opportunities in climate action. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this uh, very wise comments. So you can start every present. <laughs> you will have a lot to do then. <laughs> That's perfect. We can be more ambassadors. Uh, Dr. Gosh, would you like to share your reflections as well, please? Thank you, Linda, and good morning, everyone. And thank you, David, for that uh, terrific presentation. You captured a lot in just 10 minutes. Um, climate negotiations drawn on and on for two weeks. We've got to get cracking. I had uh, my very first reaction uh, comes from your safe and just framework. It, uh, and I'm glad that you've been able to bring the, the, the safe and just into one kind of framework. But my reaction is that... Uh, while we want our approaches and our, uh, whether it's negotiations of policy or action to be driven by the science, what you are already showing is that maybe the science also needs to come together with existing wisdom of the communities. Many of the boundaries that are being breached does not require necessarily, right, a a global framework to understand them because they already are linked to received wisdom on the ground for communities. Let's take uh, your breaching of the uh, managed nature, basically the land that we cultivate. 
um, surface runoff, groundwater. Mm. These are basically, this is what human beings have been doing for 10,000 years, right? And there is a received wisdom in what is the appropriate use of land and minerals and resources for our food systems, to take that as one example. And we know how our subsidies, how our um, distorted pricing structures, et cetera, are driving us towards a very different form of productive and consumptive behavior, even though the cultivators on the ground know that it's something else. So bridging this, the, the science, the global science framework, with the wisdom that already exists is, I think, absolutely critical. The other reaction I had was to your point about this is, the need, this is a need for a transformative change. And I completely agree with you. Net zero, I've been arguing for a long time, is not an energy transition, it's an economic transformation. But what you're suggesting is that it's not even enough to have an economic transformation. We need a social transformation. And the biggest social transformation we're not having is an understanding that this is a collective responsibility. And I am looking for those tipping points out of COP28 and beyond, where we recognize that this global redistribution that you've called for is not a north to south transfer or something like that that has to be negotiated. It is actually part of our collective framework. I mean, if, if we were all members of one family and we had a bunch of food at the table, we would ensure that everyone got a fair share of that food. You know, and we continue to have a global approach towards the science and then a north-south approach towards the redistribution. We've not figured that tipping point yet, and that's critical. Um, and my last thing here is really about the, the, uh, the positive tipping points or the, the, the levers that you're trying to refer to. And I think we'll, we'll come to that a little bit in the conversation. It, what is the model or what are the models of collaboration that actually enable a tip over, right? Um, rather than just the usual. And that means we've got to rethink how we think about incentives for innovation, how we think about incentives for return on investment, how do we think about incentives on, on, on behavior. So my last point here, is what I did not see, maybe it's there, or maybe I missed it, an explicit focus on sustainable consumption, not just sustainable production processes and methods. Um, uh, the analysis we put out just two days ago, which is that the richest 10% in developing countries have a lower footprint than the average of developed countries. So there's a serious problem if you're trying to drive climate action only from a supply side approach without putting uh, sustainable consumption and behavioral change as a specific pillar of climate action and with staying within the broader boundaries that you referred to. Thank you. And um, I wonder, would you like in 30 seconds comments on, on uh, this by the, um, how the, I was going to ask how the, how we could strengthen the science policy interface, but I'm thinking that maybe here we should integrate the wisdom uh, interface as well. Do you have a short comment on that before I move on to uh, Matthias again, that I know who will have to leave us soon? Yes, well, I think, um, so improving or integrating the science policy interface, of course, we're wondering about that in, in many different spheres now, and now, I'm, now that I'm the chair of IPBES, I have a, a, a much more formal role in trying to work that out. I think because of the complexity of all the things that we have to deal with, I don't think it makes sense to, to combine everything into one science policy interface. What we need to understand is the interlinkages. And so we have really very clear about climate and biodiversity processes, for example, and how we need to come together to address those. And that takes a certain nimbleness. And then there's the science and the local knowledge as well, and really embedding things locally is the other part of that. Uh, so we need to move much more rapidly in, in our changing our architecture to enable that. Thank you. And uh, one last question before closing this panel, and we will invite a new panel up, is to you, Matthias. I wonder, it has been discussions here on uh, like the need for scaling and positive tipping points and the transformation. What can policymakers do to more effectively foster positive tipping points? 
Well, I mean, I think that comes back to these sort of the positive in incentives that we were, uh, that also David outlined uh, previously. And, and again, for us, if we look from the negotiations perspective, I mean, what we're trying to do is create the kind of, you know, get decisions basically from the COP, which guides parties, countries, into what they, c or what we can be doing uh, to sort of develop our national policy framework. Uh, just to sort of to mention a couple of examples which we hope to be coming out from COP28, and of course we have the global stock take to start with, you know, setting a, a, a framework for what we hope to see in the next round of NDCs, I mean, as, as one element, you know, all economy-wide, all gases, you know, uh, an increase in terms of emission reductions. Secondly, we have uh, the, the whole concept of fossil fuel phase out. You know, could we could we actually address that in decisions coming out from the COP, which in turn will create hopefully positive incentives again for countries to uh, set those kind of national policy regulatory frameworks in terms of their own national phase out of fossil fuels. And also what we have the, the so-called mitigation work program, which is another element of, of, the, of COP28, where again, I mean, we started this at COP26, where we, I mean, the whole intention is to bring parties together to in terms of various types of mitigation responses, you know, sharing, you know, throughout sectors, you know, in transportation, kind of examples being shared at the global level can then sort of triple down or dripple down into uh, national policy making. So collectively, I think, also push, push this carriage over the hill until it starts rolling. But For us, with all of the business actors, uh, reach that hill and sort of go down the hill and make it a smooth sailing. I mean, it's going to be a tough ride for many of us, but, you know, in the end, we're seeing that this is, you know, there are, there are possibilities in the transition, and, and those are the ones we need. Part of uh, this session, and uh, Lena executive vice versa and if we have with us maybe she will still be a bit late uh, she is arriving and uh, we will now continue the discussion on positive tipping points uh, and I gosh so please uh, Arnaba you can uh, if you want to you can stay here with thank you again uh, came on uh, David outlined an outstanding but we were discussing as we closed off the, the cart over the edge of the hill, so this starts rolling with its own. Uh, the phrase tipping points, positive or negative, um, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? already tipping, already. In a negative way. In a negative so, way, so unfortunately. So positive? Sorry. Is there a positive? Uh, uh, okay. Protected areas and so on. All right. I so love to hear about folk you know when we are progressing. It's also on scaling innovation, because we need to not just have those new solutions and pilot them, they need to be scaled. And in order for that to be scaled, it's also the demand side. Uh, over to you. If I connect to the word of positive, or tipping points initially about something positive, because I connect the word positive tipping points to opportunities, and that's what we companies usually run for. So this is, an act on climate action, we do it because we believe it's business and talking about positive tipping points, we can perhaps have others also see. And the thing that comes into your mind is where you work on, right, and where you're, where you're coming from. We work on climate finance. Of course, I think about the positive tipping points of finance and how that investment um, is starting to accelerate globally, those climate finance flows. We've doubled you to accelerate. So when I think about tipping points, I really think about system dynamics where you see, you know, this leads to this, this leads to that, and it loops and it continues to grow. So I think that's our... At my organization, CEW, we like to use a phrase that shifts sustainability from the margin to the mainstream. For us, that tipping point is when most obvious thing, even if it has not achieved scale, it is that sort of mental shift that Yes, that's what we should be doing. I see, uh, and I wanted to frame this in terms of what is it that we can do in exploring or in terms of uh, the change. So let me start with you, then. You, uh, Skanska technologies are developing, especially in very, where does collaboration fit in, um, in terms of engaging with other actors? 
to... Partnerships on innovation is crucial. So, so to understand the built environment, about half of actually from the energy needed to operate buildings that we build during their lifetime. So that means for us, of course, to partner up with those that are uh, producing uh, and manufacturing, how we can impact the design of a building to make it highly energy efficient. However, it is possible today to go even further when it comes to concept. We call it the powerhouse. And that we call it that because thermal and solar solutions, highly efficient capabilities of also energy storage and also sharing with other buildings or for that part with these kinds of concepts and then proving them over and over again. Because we've been doing this in Norway. I did powerhouse in, in a region like Norway and we proved our point. We've been doing several. And for us now, how to scale that even further into other markets, into other regions. I'm going to come back to how you're planning to take it from Norway to the rest of the world. That, you know, Volvo has a very strong brand in India. Not for your cars, your car. How do we take, you know, you're making vehicles. Lee. Well, I mean, you have to be very clear. I'm representing Volvo cars, so therefore Volvo buses, they also deserve uh, recognition, but that's not me. You have to be very clear here. But <laughs> that, I think that's a very important point. We, as a car company, what you say, it's a usage from cars. Well, of course, we need to go electric. That's what, why we are saying going full electric by 2030 globally. Targets right now to reduce emissions from production, going far in steel, aluminum, etc., to reduce all these emissions. So, so far, we have said by 2030, the average car emissions from it, but it requires so much more when it comes to materials, and we can connect that to many of these positive tipping points. But to answer your question, well, of course, this is not enough if we product play a part in the future of mobility. Not every individual or We need to play a big part in the whole ecosystem. We need to individual car. In some cases, they should not have it. Mm -hmm. And we need to ensure that we pre uh, prepare the products we are building. We do good, produce them as sustainably as possible, but also so make them fit for the future. Different that being the target of what is, whenever you want to reach net zero, what would be the tipping point for electric? So from an individual company perspective, we are past that tipping point. To me, this was not the given five years ago, but we see this definitely makes sense from a business perspective. It's this super important from a sustainability perspective. And we have taken this leap. Also said the materials, that's a challenge to yes. me. So what we are trying to do right now for us in other areas, we are dependent on the aluminum and steel value chains yes. to tell about what we need. Because usually we don't do that. Usually we talk about the car when it's done. We yeah. collaborate with suppliers when we want to buy. We need very, very many tons of these new technologies that are to produce these times. We can buy them from you, and we will put the money where our mouth is. So that's why we're doing right now. It comes in because it's not just what you do within an individual company. It's the, both the supply as well as big sticking point. Oh, a tiny sticking point is finance. Not because we don't have the ideas and the solutions, the stuff that we've collapsed. Tip over. I mean, how do we take small examples of pilots here, blended finance there, some de-risking? Some... Yeah, um, there's a few layers to that. I think we are seeing it in you know, some more mature technology. So with the large-scale renewable energy, I think you've already hit that tipping point and that financial tipping point in a lot of places. So, and, and the way it worked was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was catalytic capital going into um, innovative investment vehicles or innovative financial products. And over time, as the technology costs came down, the, um, the, the questions about performance were resolved. Then you saw that um, more and more investment came in. And now it's essentially mainstream institutional investment, um, very little public capital going in on large scale renewable energy. But so what we need to do is actually is create that cycle in other technologies and other business models um, across the spectrum. And so you know, we, for example, we um, run a few incubators for climate finance solutions. We're starting, you know, starting the process on some of, uh, say, on nature-based solutions or maybe more in distributed renewable energy. And um, we've worked with bus companies, for example, to help them uh, develop financial products so that they uh, they lease the batteries and sell the buses, so that you uh, you kind of divorce the cost, the upfront cost of the bus from the higher cost of the battery and it helps to get things rolling. I think then that's sort of the, the beginning of 
of this cycle of the, let's say, of the system dynamics and getting that rolling. But actually, if you're going to really scale up the, cap the catalytic capital, we need much more on the system side of things. And that's where a lot of the work we've been doing is more around international financial architecture reform, multilateral development banks. How do they do their work better so that they are um, offering more risk-sharing instruments. They are changing their business models in ways that better mobilize private capital and use their scarce resources in a much more um, targeted manner. So that's, I think, when you think about how do we scale up these big blended finance vehicles, mm -hmm. it's really about, well, where, where are the bigger, biggest sources of public capital and how do you use those more effectively? So that's, I think, the flip side of, of promoting some of the innovation and trying to see, okay, where is the innovation coming that maybe in 15 years will be fully at scale? Um, if I may follow up, Bella, um, there was an image that uh, David showed in his presentation of about 10 people with a lever, and then there's a fulcrum, and then the other end, you know, this classic thing about leverage. My question to you from the tipping point of institutional capital is, are those 10 people research institutions coming up with ideas and that fulcrum being, say, the World Bank Group? Or is the 10, the World Bank Group and other regional development banks, et cetera, all providing that leverage for the rest of the $100 trillion of uh, institutional capital that sits in the world? What's, which one is the tipping point we need to be working well, on? Right now, I think it's the former, right? I think it's a lot of us research institutions <laughs> kind of coming together, trying to really bring t ideas together and bring the people together to actually make those ideas move. I think the ideal situation is when you have everybody pulling on that lever together, and that's really what collaboration is. And I think we will get there. I think there's a lot of positive momentum towards that. I think it's, gonna, it's a huge theme of this COP. It was a huge theme of last cop, I think we will, we will get there. David, let me come back to you. You've been, you, you gave us the view of the just and uh, safe framework. Uh, now you've heard on technology and business, on, on catalytic finance. But let me bring nature back into this conversation. Right? Um, you mentioned very clearly that, you know, just like IPCC, IPBES, which you are now chairing, is also an sort of intergovernmental process. My question to you is, what would be the tipping point to have nature embedded into climate conversations uh, through an intergovernmental process? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's partly why I'm here. Uh, one of my interests is to make sure that, that that happens and also that the nature pavilion is not at the farthest end of one of the leaves you know, of, of the blue zone. It needs to be right in, in, in the core, in the middle. Um, I, think it's a, I think we're very close to that tipping point. I think there's a very strong realization is growing uh, rapidly. Uh, as Johan pointed out at the beginning, you know, we don't get, to, uh, we don't get back to 1.5 without nature. Um, so, and I think the climate community is realizing that, but also realizing that to implement that, you can't just implement it from the climate community. You need to implement from the biodiversity and the users and all the sectors that are interested also have stakes in biodiversity too. So I think understanding that complexity of interactions uh, is coming and the, the sooner the better. Uh, and that's certainly one of the things that, so between IPBES and IPCC, we had a workshop report in 2021 mm -hmm. that came about. And interestingly, at the same time during the pandemic, there was a pandemics report where we had a much realizing that our institutional processes can't yet deal with this integration. So, so we put in place this very fast track, non-formal workshop process. So it's not an assessment. It's, it doesn't, the, the results don't carry the same weight as the full assessments, uh, but it's a first step and maybe we can take that another step in the coming years. So, Lena, if I can come back to you on this, because a lot of companies in the pursuit of net zero are looking at the, the carbon side of the equation. Is there, are you exploring how you can bring some of those other, you know, boundaries that we seem to be breaching into the approach you're taking? You know, where does nature-based solution fit in, not just for, it's often thought of for adaptation and resilience, but so where would nature-based solutions fit in for your mitigation approaches in, in the technologies you're developing? To be honest, 
the built environment is to a very high degree also about urbanization and there it's needed also to how to integrate nature as a part yeah. for example as urban forestry or urban farming right. those methodologies are right now you can see them are being tried out i would say it's very much driven by city uh, mm -hmm. from a city perspective. Mm -hmm. And I do see a lot of different cities around the world that are quite visionary. They are also quite innovative and really trying out what kind of uh, methodologies that they should use in order to bring nature into the built environment. So are also we doing. And to acknowledge them, there are different aspects. One is how would you make urban farming work uh, yeah. in, in an urban environment? We tried high up on roofs, not so good, but it's, it's really hard hard, uh, to, too much wind, too, too harsh sun, etc. It, it's tough. We tried it in the midst of Prague, just uh, making an area for urban farming. We never thought it would work. We, we thought in the midst of a city, people coming in and what will happen? Still up and running. It's amazing because that's also about human behavior, human trust. And that also gives us some ideas. How could we actually make a, you know, a vibrant city where urban farming and nature would be actually part of it? it to what content? Also, just to acknowledge, nature and nature-based solutions are so important when it comes to the aspects of resiliency. There are both technical solutions as well as nature solutions needed. Yet again, we need also to make sure that we are safeguarding the, the, the societies, the people, the, the people that are within and in between the buildings. And due to extreme weather events, we need to also invite in both the technical solutions and the nature-based solutions to make that happen, that we can withstand and be more resilient when it comes to heat waves, floodings, and other aspects of extreme weather. So yeah, nature really important. How to measure it? That's the next perspective. I think that's why there's such a great focus on carbon, because we know how to measure it. We do not know to that degree how to measure the impact. We, we are working together with others. We've been doing from a Nordic perspective, as, as a kind of a, a standard for industry on how to be measure on biodiversity and nature. Mm. But I would say that's the next enabling point to be better following up a measure. This is a, I was just going to come Can back I follow to you, up on David, that because <laughs> this will, uh, I mean, if I may just extend what Lena is saying and back to you, your framework makes a lot of sense when David Obura gives a very clear presentation. I step outside and I just catch somebody and say, name 17 sustainable development goals. I think many of us will struggle to say it, right? And the same problem, there's, that's a framework as is yours. Whereas 1.5 is something, you know, that's all you need to remember. You might not know how to get there, but you need to remember. So how do we find so, those metrics? So what really makes it tangible, in fact, I had this discussion find, looking for the pavilion this morning <laughs> with a colleague from the World Bank as well. So for the managed nature, so agricultural, urban areas mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. is we came up with a boundary was that 25% of every square kilometer, so even within a city, if you have one quarter of each square kilometer, so that's at neighborhood scales, under, with trees, in urban parks, in urban farming, uh, with, with green solutions to temperature for managing water flow, uh, you know, things like that, you, you can provide benefits to people. And that's really easy to measure, because everybody can walk around and look in their space, you know, my square kilometer of neighborhood, is there one quarter of this that is, that is a natural area? Mm -hmm. So that's easy to measure. And the other thing you need to look at is what does it provide? Does it provide shade? Does it reduce the heating in that neighborhood by one degree or one and a half degrees? And so that we don't have all the metrics yet, but the, the broad parameters, I think we're getting there and we can say that. And we can always improve the detailed metrics. But if we have that area and show that that's really useful and very beneficial to people, then we'll get that value change and people will adopt that and move forward with that. I'll give you a personal example. My home in, in Delhi is just 900 meters from um, an area which used to be a stone quarry. You know, and you'd dig out the stones and it would be used in the construction industry. And then when that quarry ran out, it was gonna, that area would have had more buildings coming up. Instead, uh, it, the, the place was left as it is, native species were planted, and my daughter is 11 years old, this thing began, began 12 years ago. So literally during the lifetime of my daughter, We've now got a 2,000-acre urban forest that some studies suggest accounts for 7% of the national capital region's oxygen. 
know, that's all I need to know, you know, that this is, this is the point you're making, you know, and, it's, and sometimes it is top-down urban design and sometimes just let it be. Um, let me, yes, of course. Let me just fill in because I, I very li much like this discussion. From our perspective, well, uh, I believe nature is where climate was five years ago or so for companies. Sort of right now, we know it's important. We're trying to learn as much as possible. How can we act in line with what nature asks from us? I think I see a risk right now that too many companies run too fast in terms of doing these fantastic claims right. without understanding what it means. Right. So we need to do the groundwork. Mm. How can we really reduce our negative impact and act? And even though I fully agree with what you say, I also think it's important for us to understand our full scope one to three effect yes. on nature as well. From a car, of course, the car in itself, the production of the car is one thing, but our problem is, of course, the production of the car and the material going in. And therefore, how can we be accurate and specific in what is the negative impact of the production of the materials going into the car? And then coming back to how can we measure that? So standardization of these measures, fully agree with that. But I think we, we are in a challenge that many of us need to run fast on and then go into sort of fantastic claims if we want to do something story-wise. Jonas, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I wanted to use that as the sort of last segment of our conversation. I think the biggest sort of positive tipping point that we should all be aspiring for is trust. Not just trust in climate negotiations, uh, but trust in, you know, do I believe what a business is saying is true? Do I believe what a business is saying it has done has genuinely been done? You know, do I believe that the money is genuinely flowing? Do I believe that the tree that I was told was planted actually still survives? My question back to the two companies represented here is, and I served on the UN Secretary General's high-level expert group on net zero for corporations last year, and we, in our recommendations, we clearly put out that not only do you have to have near-term targets, but your actions have to be independently verified. How do we get to a tipping point of trustable verifiers of what it is that you're doing? The, the entire world needs it. It's not just one consulting firm here or there will do it. How do we get there? Was that to me? <laughs> I, would, I would say it's so important for us as, as companies, we can do a lot, of course. We can come up with a lot of innovations and solutions. We also work together with different NGOs or, or business organizations in order to come together to set our standards. But that comes to a point where regulations or clarification is needed, not just at the national level, but mm. foremost, business is international, and these issues mm. are equally international. National. So it also needs to be international standards. So I'm looking for, as well, bodies like uh, um, International Chamber of Commerce, uh, ICCC, are doing great work on, on that. And also seeing how, at a larger level, EU or US and, and others are, are coming together, but they tend to set their a bit different standards. Okay. And it would be important to ca have it more overarching. Or at so, least harmonized yes, or so interoperable. Maybe, maybe turning then to the UN. <laughs> <laughs> Jonas, do you have a different approach towards getting there? I, I agree with the standardization point. I think that's a key thing here as well. Um, from our end, I, I believe... Sorry, I'm trying. I'm sorry, I thought so much. Of the, can you repeat the question? Because I, I thought so much about the last topic. So I actually dropped the first one. It's, Please help me. It's really who monitors the monitors, you know? Oh, yes, how yes, do, sorry. How do we get of course, enough of course. Um, critical mass of trusted exactly. verifiers for what it is that you're doing? Well, as I talked about, our challenge is in scope three. How can we credibly claim that we reduce something? I also see, I'm coming from a car maker. Car makers are not really famous for being the most sustainable companies in the world. So therefore, I'm very eager that we are not saying something that we cannot substantiate. Right. And due to that, we are getting into a point where we more or less treat sustainability claims like we do with any sort of legislation. We need certification on the claims we are to do. And if we are to do that in the value chain, more or less, sort of how can I prove that the emissions produced in our 
tier three supplier, 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 mm -hmm. is what they claim. Mm -hmm and prove that with certificates. That's an enormous challenge from us, but that's more or less what we're trying to set up to be able to deliver on. We don't have all these answers yet, but that's more or less what we prepare for. The back side of it is sort of, I, my role is called head of climate action. Mm. I'm internally joking, I'm becoming head of climate admin because this yes. is a so huge task yes. that we're trying to prepare for Indeed. that will at the same time limit us from acting on what we need to do. So we need to play both sides here. Of course we need to have credibility in what we do, but we also need to do it sort of in a standardized way so we don't sort of overdo something just because the worry of getting it somewhat wrong, because then we know we will fail anyway. And this is, yeah, this is a challenge I don't have an answer I'll for. I'll give you a better job title, Head of Climate Architecture. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, propose that to my manager. <laughs> Bella, uh, um, again, from, from sort of catalytic finance point of view, is there, you know, what, what is the tipping point for trust, you know, that large institutional capital begins to trust that developing countries and emerging markets are reasonably okay to put their, to trust their money with? It's a, it's a huge issue in the way that in, in, international institutional capital largely does not go to developing economies. And I think, um, you know, in terms of the trust of that, it's data. It's data on performance. Actually, this is why we do pilots and proofs of concept and initial investments and blended finances actually to set up a track record so that future investment can flow. That track record and that, um, that disclosure of that track record is largely missing in the international community. And most of that data is considered confidential business information. Exactly. And so you don't get the positive externalities of innovation. And so you know, one of the things that has been um, been called for this year is the publication of the Multilateral Development Bank GEMS database, mm -hmm. which is a database that some people have seen, most people have not seen, mm -hmm. that is purported to actually t um, show the performance of investments in developing economies that the multilateral development banks have made. Um, it's still not published. Everybody's waiting. I think there there is a commitment to do it, but um, the data, from what I've heard, is good but not great, and so I think there will also need to be a lot of work to make sure that the that all of the data that's coming out of these proofs of concepts, innovations, et cetera, is actually available so that you can build trust on that. Um, just a few weeks ago, I hosted a finance roundtable in Delhi, and uh, one of the financial institutions said, um, and this was a closed room conversation, they said, we've made 350 investments and we've had one non-performing asset. I said, you know, you should be the world's best banker. You know, you're, you're, this should be a headline on the Financial Times page, not a closed room conversation, because these are the stories that don't get out there, that investing in climate, investing in climate in developing countries gives you a return on investment that keeps you in business without creating non-performing assets. We maybe have two, three minutes to take a question from, one or two questions from the floor, if anyone has one. Otherwise, I have one last one for David. <laughs> yes, please. And if you could introduce yourself, maybe if you could use this microphone. Thank you very much. Short, please. Very short. Actually, um, it's about the monitoring. The aspect of ensuring that the data gathered really reflects the actual activity, that the verifier can be confident in it. Uh, I came in a bit late, but I realized that was the tone of the conversation, how we could confirm the integrity of the data being exactly. gathered, and for the verifier to also authenticate it yes. or the transfer. So is there any, let me say, um, a standard that had been rolled out over the years since the whole idea of monitoring verification had come to, is there any standard that had been set up that may be close to acceptance or close to the sure. integrity we are all looking sure. up for? Maybe again, if the, if Lena or Jonas, you want to respond because there's this 
nature related financial disclosures climate related financial disclosures etc all various standards out there yeah. Which one would you go with? I think it's so important to have a third party verified. So our climate target, we have it verified by science-based target. Uh, when it comes to our projects, so, so when we are doing infrastructure projects or when we're developing building, we are uh, searching for different kinds of also verification by certification. So that means uh, in, in our line of business, there for buildings, you have LEED and BRIAM, mm -hmm. very large uh, organizations that are also doing third party verification of the performance and also envision when it comes to infrastructure. And Skanska has been collaborating a lot with the, our industry in order to be part of developing these standards. Because we do think it's so important that they are relevant, they're credible, and you are able to actually measure and follow up the performance and result. Because then you, are, you, then you can also make it a value to customers, mm -hmm. as well as to finance. As for us, we have 100% of our f external funding is now actually uh, either sustainability linked or green. Okay. And we would never have achieved that level if we would not have all of these kinds of different external verification of the work and performance. Jonas? I agree with this point. Standardization is very key in many areas. What we are doing, because we also recognize this won't be in place in time for us to act as fast as we want. So we're also building the internal capability to more or less call anything out. Sort of, we don't believe you, so please prove us wrong. Yes. And that is actually something that has changed internally recently that I think more big companies, especially because they have the capability of doing it, treat it like finance. Sort of, when someone gives you a quota, have the internal capability of breaking it down down into the details, look at it and say, do you believe in it? And when it comes to our manufacturing, sort of how, how are the emissions of steel yes. uh, sort of created? You can break it down into the process steps. And if someone gives you an idea or an, a quota, that doesn't make sense. Call them up. Please give us proof of tier three certification because that doesn't make sense. Excellent. You cannot do that. And I think that's key. So you also need to do your homework internally. And that's what we are doing here at COP, sort of trying to call out standardization on top of, of course, a call for uh, phase out of fossil fuels and all the other key areas. So standardization is critical. We have one minute left. So, David, I have a question back to you because you gave us the broader nature framing. Yesterday, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, announce something called the Green Credit Initiative. And this whole point is it shouldn't be just about carbon. It should be about the incentives we can create for afforestation, for land restoring la degraded land, water systems, etc. Would, would something like that, I'm, I'm not saying you have to comment just on that statement, but you know, when you look at the ways in which we can create those positive incentives for the larger nature-based investments mm. that are needed, uh, is that a way to go? Um, yeah, so, so that's a very complicated question. And I, so there is going to be a talk, I think, tomorrow, and we had this at the Africa Climate Week with an Africa group, uh -huh. in which uh, an expert from Uganda, and she's on the global advisory group for biodiversity credits, pointing out how good biodiversity credits are when they're implemented right on the ground, mm -hmm. benefiting people who, who live there with the nature that needs mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. restored and looked mm -hmm. after and so on. So there's a lot of positive potential. In all of this, it's about how you implement it, the standards and so on. And what I was thinking, listening to all this discussion, mm. it's about the values, having common values and having shared visions for the trust uh, and for the standards to be set up so we can, we can work around the same thing. Collaborative technology, catalytic finance, behavioral change, but the tipping point for trust. I want you to put your hands together to thank um, Bella Tonkonaji, uh, Jonas Otterheim, Lena Hook and David Obura before I hand it over to Linda for your closing remarks. Thank you so much. And thank Should we go down? Yeah. You can, yes. <laughs> and thank you, Aranaba, for a wonderful um, moderation here. And, um, the panel for uh, very insightful interventions. And uh, what I take with me is that viable solutions exist. And to reach the positive tipping points, we need support by well-designed and well-targeted policies and regulations. We need reforms of the financial
financial in, uh, architecture. We need leadership and we need trust to enable the rapid implementation on a global scale in a fair and equitable way. Uh, thank you again to all our eminent speakers today and to you who are here with us today and to you who follow this session online. And uh, let's go out and uh, push these viable solutions over the hilltop so the carriage can start rolling by itself. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone who's here. Welcome until Detta event. That's my very poor Swedish. Thank you, everyone who is here today, and you found your way to the beautiful Swedish pavilion. I'm very happy to welcome you to an interesting discussion with corporate leaders on the issue of navigating the climate challenge, sustainable leadership in action. We have four wonderful speakers. Uh, my name is Cecil Hafferkamp. I work for an organization called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We're working with the United Nations and with governments and private sector partners uh, to help achieve the SDGs, including those related to climate. And I'm very happy to have a discussion today with you uh, on the role of leadership and specifically the leadership of corporate leaders. Uh, for the past uh, 36 hours, we had the arrival of many heads of state, many heads of government. These are government leaders, and government certainly has to lead. But it's important that we think of leadership in broader terms. Everybody has a role to play, and we especially need corporate leaders to uh, exercise their leadership uh, in these important times as well. Um, Maybe just to frame the discussion a little bit, the, the challenges we're facing are quite substantial. Uh, we're not talking about step-by-step um, step, uh, improving certain indicators of development or even climate. We're talking about economy-wide transformations. We're talking about the most fundamental transition for societies and uh, economies uh, probably ever since the industrialization. And obviously, the challenge of transformation requires transformative leadership. This is what you hear often. But aside from what you can read in textbooks and in smart uh, opinion pieces, uh, doing this practically is very challenging. And so today, we have an opportunity to hear from four uh, leaders in the corporate space who can share their experience, their views on leadership, what kind of leadership, and what is to be learned from their experience and from all our experience in this field. So uh, with that, I would like to welcome you, uh, all of you. Um, we have as a first speaker, Jonas Gustafsson, who will set the stage for us with uh, an introduction uh, into the issue of sustainable leadership. And then after that, we'll go into a discussion with other speakers as well. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I will try to be short and, and uh, make sure that I invite my colleagues on stage this great panel. But a few words about leadership. Uh, um, and uh, someone said once that change is uh, never easy, but it's always possible. And uh, I've been working in industry over the last close to 30 years in really great global companies like ABB, uh, Bombardier, Sandvik, and now. I'm heading up AFRI with 19,000 or close to 20,000 engineers all over the world. Um, so for sure we have also some great slides. So I 
When I look back on those years, I want to ref there are three things I would like to talk about because, first of all, I do see change happening right now. So I'm, like you, one will say, uh, in genuinely positive to a lot of things. So change has started and we see the industrial green transformation really picking up. Just in the last five, seven years, tremendous amount of changes in industrial verticals. But the second one, there needs to be, a, at least our view, there needs to be a system view. Because if each industrial vertical is transforming, if you don't look at it as a system, together with polit political agendas like uh, permissions or legislation, we will not uh, get the full effect. It's like when you try to optimize a manufacturing line. If you don't think of the system, you will not get the output because you will end up in bottlenecks in the manufacturing line. And then I think the third thing for each leader is to think both short and long term. Yes, we need to deliver quarterly reports, but at the same time, a lot of decisions we're taking today will impact the future, and that goes for polit political as well. So they want to be reelected, but they have to take brave decisions now that impacts the future. And I think me growing up in Sweden, I think Sweden have a tremendous position. Because we have done these changes over the years. If you go back hundreds of years, we did develop the hydro plant structure, nuclear later on, creating a fantastic platform for energy. We also have, based on our culture with democracy or free education, created more you know, global advanced technology company than man, in many countries. So with our position today, with a fantastic um, I would say back-end structured with access to clean energy, high technology, a good structured country, we could actually be a winner in the industrial transformation. So I really believe that there is a lot of positive change going on. But at the same time, as we see right now, a lot of these changes are happening in each sector. So for sure, my colleagues will talk about we see implementation of green steel or we, we see the transformation to clean energy where we also play a role, how biomaterial also Im impact. So, but the first one, what I really believe is that we see change, but it's not enough. So the second one then, again, and this is really the system view, sorry, this is really the system view. And I think step by step we are getting to that. And of course, if we are not making sure that we get the access to clean energy to go hand in hand with the production of green steel, we will never make it. So I think more than ever before, leaders need to find a way to work together. Um, we talked about it, the fact that even competitors need to get closer to find a common agenda. We need to have uh, the private sector, the industrial sector, having a very strong agenda with the political landscape because we will never make it just by operating the silos. And for the last years, for the last 20, 30 years, you know, we have gone through a lot of changes in the industrial climate, but not as big as, uh, and as transformative as now. And this is where I think we need to think of it as a system. So a lot of the decisions, we need to think ahead of the game. And I just have to quote my favorite ice hockey player of all kind, Wayne Gretzky. He always said, I never skate to where the puck is. I always skate to where the puck will be. And as leaders, we need to think, where will the puck be played? Because we think just here and now, it will not be enough. So we need to be a bit more like, um, like uh, Wayne Gretzky. Um, and then the third one, just to reflect, it, this is long and short term thinking. And I think as a leader uh, and as a political elected, you tend probably to make a lot of decisions that impact you here and now. But some of the decisions we need to do now is brave. Uh, it could even be challenging. Maybe you need to leave a very fruitful business sector at A3, which was a few years ago we decided to leave all the coal, coal, coal power plant projects all, all over the world. We had a lot of people that knew that from heart. But we said this is not a business for us, so we left that. So decisions need to be made that could impact your bottom line short term. It could impact people. We need to care about that, but it's, necessity, it's a necessity for achieving our, our goals moving ahead. So these are the three things for me, from my 
you know, looking from a manufacturing industrial point of view in Sweden. We see change in the sectors. We need to think and work in a system, and we need to be able to balance short and long-term thinking. And we need to play as Wayne Gretzky, and again, change is never easy, but always possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, wonderful for setting the stage. Uh, please stay there. And I ask our other three panelists to join us. That's uh, Johan Söderström, I hope I say this correctly, <laughs> Annika Ramskjöld, and Lena Höck. Thank you for joining. Please a uh, welcome applause again to all of them. It's a bit crammed on the little stage, but thank you. Uh, thanks for Jonas to set up the discussion. And it's remarkable for someone like me who works mostly with governments. The headlines are exactly the same in the public sector, but the way you outline them is from a corporate sector. And it's really encouraging to see that there is not a major difference in the recognition of how big that challenge is, but that it's not a problem, it's also an opportunity, and it really depends on how we manage the transition. So wonderful. So maybe with that, uh, if I could maybe ask uh, Lena and Johan to specifically maybe respond and to speak to the issue of what does sustainable leadership mean today? And maybe, of course, we're at COP, so specifically with regard to the role of the corporate sector addressing the climate challenge. Maybe you start first. Thank you, and thank you for a really inspiring introduction as well, Jonas. I would say, for many years, sustainability was, and sustainability leaders was this passionate person mm -hmm. that was, you know, advocating quite visionary different things. Today, it's much more integrated in business models. And that means also that you need to be able to set the structure, the governance, the resources, the mandates. Because all of a sudden, sustainability and sustainability leadership is actually about leadership just like anywhere else when it comes to how to make things happen. Within Skanska, we have about 800 people working within the sustainability functions and sustainability roles. The reason why we have that is due to the fact that they are very much integrated into our production and our projects. And having thousands of projects, of course, we do need to have that knowledge and that leadership out on sites, you know, with boots on the ground, ground, making sure taking care of the sustainability risks as well as the opportunities. Thank you so much. And I think maybe for the benefit of those following on video, they might not see the screen behind. You have both the names and the titles of our speakers here. Uh, as you heard, Lena is speaking from Skanska, uh, where you are in, a, in, a, in an important role. Um, yes, if I can, Johan. Yeah, um, for, for you touch energy, uh, sustainability is key, because in our purpose, we have sustainable energy future for all. But that is also giving us the homework to really be transparent, to do our homework when it comes to scope three, to learn and benchmark with colleagues like Annika from Vattenfall and, and Lena from Skanska and Jonas uh, from AFRI and others. Mm -hmm. uh, partnerships is the new normal as well, um, because sustainability is going to be there as a prerequisite for continued success. And we really, uh, we really want to partner a lot in the whole value chain, and we want to partner with the best. So the system piece you talked about, Jonas, super important. Uh, we need to provide um, 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 economic, social, and environmental value every day, but we also need to manage the short-term piece and the long-term piece. I, I echo what Jonas said there as well. But it's about people as well. It's about diversity. It's about listening in to everyone. It, and it's about uh, utilizing also the young generation. We look upon bringing on a lot of people right now since electricity is the, is the um, backbone of the energy transition. So we really want to have more young people coming in with sustainability in the DNA and really listening in to them and giving them more power. Excellent. Um, if, if I, before going to the next one, just pick up one element, and I think uh, you refer to it as well, uh, that... Uh, 
the, the, the challenges that you're facing, in a way you're all facing the same question. Now, of course, there's one element in the private sector that you don't have on the public sector, at least in public, and that's competition. Competition is an important aspect of the market. But also the need, and I think you refer to it in this context of long-term, thinking long-term, that there is need to make painful decisions maybe in the short term. Uh, which you need to be able to afford. So maybe if against that background I could ask, are there any specific, you as leaders interfacing with public sector, do you feel there's areas where you need more from the public sector? Uh, more in terms of, so, so maybe that's an ideal way to go d over to our next sure. speaker. Yeah, we, we take it. <laughs> right, because leadership means not only leading your own company, but also leading vis-a-vis -vis the other players and the public sector. So uh, not to restrict you, but if you can maybe speak a little bit about what that challenge is for you and what leadership in the context of climate crisis means and difficult decisions? Very many questions at the same time. <laughs> but let's, let's maybe start with uh, sort of what we can expect from the public sector. And I think here it is absolutely crucial now when we have all these public procurement and other things, if we want to bring the breakthrough technologies into the market, we absolutely need to get some, some of the public procurement really truly demanding those pieces. So I think that's a very important piece from, from, from the public sector. And then you talked about the, the competition uh, piece here. I think it is, uh, that, that's also partly what lays behind uh, if you want to have public procurement, you need to secure that there are enough suppliers that can actually supply mm. the things that you need. And then that brings me back to another. It feels like I'm starting from the wrong angle. I would actually like to start just introducing, because for Vattenfall, being an energy company, uh, I think it's so important that we do not only look at our own activities, because we're going to electrify the, the entire industry and transport sector, mm -hmm. and that means that we cannot look at things in isolation, but then we need to start to understand where can our fossil-free electricity make a change, mm -hmm. uh, and that means that we need to start at what, what will be required for us to build the new fossil-free electricity. Mm -hmm. Then we know we will need lots of fossil free steel, lots of fossil free cement. We need to build the infrastructure. We need the permitting processes. Mm. Also, permitting is a piece that mm. is, is very key in all of that. Uh, and at the same time, we are not buying the materials directly. We go via suppliers like Hitachi and, and others, and, and Skanska help us to do the construction work. So it's very much about what you talked about. It's an ecosystem. We need everything from the original original materials, via the components, via the constructors, into building the things, then we can secure that we deliver the fossil free electricity that then goes back into uh, producing the steel or aluminum or whatever you need into your components, uh, the, the cement that you will use when you are constructing for us. So it all fits together, meaning that we can definitely not work in isolation anymore. Yes. So I think in one way I would say uh, the, the sustainable leaders can become a bit schizophrenic because you need to talk to everyone. But that's why it's so important that you focus on the things that really make the change and you need to get the right people on, on board to make it happen. Excellent. Thank you, Annika. And you did very well. I'm sorry I started you off at another end, but you came around beautifully. And, and you also linked up with what Lena said at the beginning. Uh, just giving nice speeches, passionate speeches, is not going to do it. Uh, it's a leadership style that needs to... The whole system, in a way, is... It needs work, right? And it, it is a lot of kind of f f following through from the vision all the way down. Jonas, if I can come back to you and maybe your own experience. Uh, so if leadership in the age of climate crisis is not just more partnerships, more collaboration, more, more, but it's, it's fundamentally different in a way because it's a crisis or because it's it's, from an economic point of view, it's important to be ahead of the field and to, to, to seize the opportunities that present themselves, or is it both? <clears throat> Probably both, but when I look on our company, then being an engineering company, and we have roughly 20,000 engineers um, uh, active in energy all over the world, doing power plants um, and you know, biomaterials. So one area, of course, that this change 
is a huge opportunity for us because we basically deliver 20 million engineering hours per year wow. all over the world. So for sure, when we work together with many of our clients like Hitachi or Vattenfall or Skanska to helping supporting them in their design or in, in actually implementing their plans, for us to stay ahead of the technology, meaning that we need to be able to attract and retain competence that are slightly different than in the past. Mm. So this fight for competence, fight for talents is for us clear. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that we can bring on the most um, you know, skilled engineers that can together with our thinking create new project that helps our clients to transform? Um, then I also think that there is also, if you look on a people-driven company like us, there is actually a bit of a pressure from inside the company. A lot of these new generation coming to us, they put pressure on us mm -hmm. in a different way than you never before. I remember when I joined ABB in the mid-90s, I was so happy just to join ABB, but now people ask us, tell me, tell me, why should I start to work at your company. I have three other companies. So I think this of being true to what we do, how we act, having a big impact on climate is something new for leaders mm -hmm. because if you're not true to our employees, they will choose another employer. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, is quite clear and a bit new. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Th that certainly sounds challenging. I, 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 hope, I hope no young management students are put off by this and are saying maybe government is a nicer field to work, but I, maybe we can <laughs> say it's, it should be as hard in government. These are the same challenges, right? It, it's often said or compared that this, what we're facing is a marathon, and you seem to indicate that this is not a quick thing, this is a marathon. How do you kind of sustain and maintain kind of the commitment and the trust that you internally and externally? So maybe, Lena, if I could go back to you from your experience, uh, even in terms of your own experience of uh, how do you sustain internally motivation, uh, sometimes it's people are reporting kind of a change fatigue, often the way it expresses in our very unfortunate ways, and again, that's something public sector is the same. We do strategic retreats and we do these kind of things, and there is sometimes the point where our own staff tell us that this is getting too much. Uh, but maybe, maybe you have <laughs> lessons from your own experience about that challenge, internal support, people to buy in, even through the difficult times uh, to come out somewhere else together. Well, anyone working with sustainability is actually working with change management. And that means that you constantly have to identify problems or stuff that ought to be better done. And then you also have to deal with that together with other people, how you think that change should be. And you also need to be able to listen and be humble about that they also have a point too. So how to encourage that perspective to us. I think it's really important to state that we do not do sustainability just for the sake of sustainability. We do it through Skanska's actually business and focusing on what matters the most from what we can impact. As for us, the construction of infrastructure, the transformation when it comes to fossil free uh, electricity and energy, much more efficient resource management and handling of resources. All of that is very inspiring as such, but still, like you acknowledge, it is also tough to drive change. To me, I think it's important that you are acknowledging that you are working with change management because that makes a shift. It's okay to feel a bit fatigue a day, and you may share with some colleagues, and they may say, well, you know, that's how you're actually driving change. You're on the right track, potentially. But also how to listen in to partners. So, so to us, for example, the proof lies in the pudding. So, so let me take a great example that we, do, that we just from the other week. In our industry, there's a lot of heavy machinery, you know, excavators, trucks, etc. Usually, they are needing diesel, so fossil fuel. It's a tremendous shift going from diesel to fossil free. It could either be biofuels, then you need to really get the customer on board because they need to be part of paying mm -hmm. parts of it, or it could be electrifying. So we've been doing this electrifying. We have this great fossil free construction site south of uh, Stockholm. It's called the Meatpacking District. And one of our uh, leaders, the, the Sustainability and Innovation Director in US, he went there in March seeing this 
electric excavator and seeing that it had quite the force. It's from Volvo. And what he did then was less than a half year later, setting it up, the same kind of machine, an electric excavator, in the LA metro uh, project that we are, mm -hmm. that we're doing. And what happens then is when the head of our US business comes out to the project visiting it, and he was a bit hesitant. He thought that, well, it's sustainable, it's electric, may, may it be weak. And he came back to me and said, Lena, it's a beast. Mm -hmm. And that was positive, because he, he thought that it had just the same kind of capacity, but also adding um, on less vibration means a better work environment, less air pollution means good both for the workers on site and those citizens on, uh, around, and, and less noise, and of course, less carbon. Wow. So all of that, the proof lies in the pudding, and that, I think, when you see those examples, when you see it happen, when you can actually connect with your business and you can show a proof point like that. That is amazing. And that also energizes, I guess, both me and several else to keep it up. Here is Volvo. Lost your fist. You were a fan from Lena. Thank you, Lena, for that great example. Uh, if I could come back to kind of more on the political side, and, and maybe Jonas, you referred to it as well. Now, we live in a time of multiple crises. Uh, governments are looking at all kinds of other evolving scenarios. Uh, in, in a way, again, this, do you feel, in order for you as corporate leaders to play this role on your side of the transition, uh, where do you feel, in general, or what are the mechanisms for engagement with the political sphere? in terms of, you know, for example, what people like us are doing, we look at NDCs, we look at what kind of different policy measures different countries have taken. You have the whole spectrum. You have countries that are more top-down, that are frankly putting money, they subsidize the kind of practices that they want to see. Surprisingly, since last year, the US, very clear, there's real money for real things and it gives, it removes a lot of the uncertainty in the markets. Now, within Europe, Sweden is probably known for also being more subscribing to this uh, top-down in a positive way to engineer the future you want to see. Other countries are more market-oriented. But more in general, if you could share, do you see there's key areas that you see emerging where you feel the dialogue between companies and the political sphere needs to uh, increase? needs to help sustaining the political kind of support that you need and also maybe the kind of market mechanisms that you need in order for you to make these decisions, as, as you said, getting off fossil fuels. Yeah, I will actually, I will also leave it to my friend Johan here, but for sure we see a difference. I mean, yeah. on, on our side, just an example, there's a reason why we see now more really, really, really interesting products in US for us than yes. in a long time. So there is something in that. I mean, we, we as a company, we have not been that big in North America and US, but just over the last six months, we are involved in more products than ever that I would, would I put into the green, green industrial transformation. And for sure, it's driven from the whole political agenda. And I think we, we need to think very carefully because when you look on technology, it's for sure that we need to, as I said in the beginning, in Sweden, we have a pole position in many aspects, but we need to make sure that we, we are playing offensive, as you say, Johan, mm -hmm. that we go for making goals, that we are not becoming too defensive because it's, it's going fast now. So that's my view. Okay. Th thank you, and, and um, I'm privileged working in Touchy Energy. We see that um, electricity will grow by factor four to 2050, and um, electricity transmission with more than factor three. So right now we are in a steep uh, mm -hmm. uptick, and we need to collaborate in the whole value chain with, with people like Vattenfall and, and Lena, Lena in Skanska and Anna Ifri. Uh, but we also see big differences between countries. We do a lot in US where, where financing is in place. But in Europe, for instance, we see countries like Germany and, and Holland where the state 
state is really giving the public tendering a new face. So recently we received an order of 13 billion euro uh, for high voltage direct current projects, enabling us to plan ahead together with our partner Petrofac and reutilize mm -hmm. good people, scale up, do the investments in people and assets, and doing the best for the, for the climate. And then back to Annika's comment about competitors. Our competitors also got the share. Mm -hmm. So still the competition was allowed, but we are not competing to save the planet. We are there together to save the planet. So I think personally that also Sweden has a home lesson to do there. We are a world leader, humble world leader in high voltage di the direct current, but we do less in Sweden than anywhere else in the world. So we need some help from the states, and then the private sector is fantastic. I want to high five everyone here <laughs> representing the high, uh, including Volvo as well, who got mentioned and Skanska and Vattenfall is not the private sector, but you're different as a DSO, as a distribution. You're very innovative. You're part of a lot of, you know, new uh, uh, projects in order to enable it in the forefront. So we learn a lot. We are humble. Thank you. You want to add to this? No, I, I just wanted to buy, build on that. I, I think we have a few cases also at AFRI where due to the public procurement or different rules in different countries, we could miss up on some great opportunities where other countries like Holland, for example, are getting much more ahead because yeah. of, uh, you know, pro problems. Excellent. I, I have to say, I wish in the political sphere um, governments were watching each other with the same interest that you're watching your competitors and a positive dynamic that can come from that. We hope to see also with governments. We're all here at COP. You came here for COP, not just because you can meet others, but because uh, you want to be part of a broader joint endeavor. If, if I could ask you, and starting maybe with Annika, about your expectations of COP, uh, as you all, whether you're new to COP or not, it's quite overwhelming, the agenda that usually and a normal, at a normal COP, we would still have negotiations on the agenda now. Uh, they have solved that very quickly. Uh, but what are the agenda items, what are the issues where you have expectations, personal, but primarily from your corporate perspectives where you feel, you know, is it around adaptation? Is it around implementation? Is it around maybe opportunities for you to see an entry point to support, say, countries in Africa and partnerships in Africa or in other regions? So just broadly speaking, your expectations for here at COP, and then maybe we can go th through the whole panel with the same question. Well, I, th I think a lot of the expectations are, of course, now that we move towards implementation, as you say. Mm. It's time. We cannot talk anymore. We see so clearly, and also from the stock take, it's so clear that we have to speed things up. So, so at least what I'm expecting is that uh, a lot of us that have been able to build fossil-free value chains or have different type of collaborations, be it with suppliers or, or throughout the, the value chain, also public uh, private private uh, partnerships, etc., that we can inspire others to speed up and see that it is absolutely possible. So the time to say it's too far away, the premium is too high, we, we need to wait, that time is gone. So, so the big hope is, first of all, that we go very much more into implementation. Uh, secondly, of course, also in general, that we now go towards phasing out fossil fuels, not only phasing down, and now we then, to do that, really build an uh, enormous amount of, of fossil fuels, uh, fossil free, <laughs> or renewables rather. And I, I think in Vattenfall we are quadrupling our wind capacity and doubling the grid capacity in order to enable this. And of course that means that we will need a lot of this steel, so therefore we want the fossil free steel to come on quickly. And I have to, I have to raise, I'm, I'm really happy now that uh, we announced yesterday a collaboration with SSAB. So I mean, we've been part of producing the fossil-free steel through hybrid. Now we are also an off-taker of that steel, so we can deploy that whenever we build a, a grid tower or it's for the transformers or, or any other piece that we need for, to get this infrastructure in place. But uh, that it is not something that we buy directly. So what we do is we secure the fossil-free steel that can then be handed over to our sub-suppliers. So really building the, the ecosystem that you talked about in the beginning. It's not enough just to look at your own activities anymore. So that type of understanding 
and actions happening is what I want to see even more of. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So maybe, uh, Johan, you want to be next? Yeah, I, I, I can echo very much of what Annika said. I think uh, we will do it anyway uh, without COP, but COP is a manifest, it's an opportunity to deepen partnerships already existing and, and also building new partnerships and getting the momentum and learning. We are very humble since we are part of the electricity transition and it's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And we need to do it in a great way. We need to inspire people and, and, and be very humble here. But we, we, we will speed up. Thank you. But just briefly, Johan, expectations for COP? What do you hope to have learned, done, met, heard? I already learned. I was in the Norwegian um, um, panel uh, listening, just taking notes. Yeah. So we are going around taking a lot of notes. And then we are pretty big in the UAE and in the Middle East as well. So we have a lot of activities here and, and uh, across the world. So uh, we, we are connecting globally. But I'm very happy with um, Swedish participation here with a lot of established companies and a lot of startups and, uh, and other organizations really with global appetite to do, do, to do the right thing Excellent. from a sustainability perspective. So we are part of a lot of these partnerships as well in the private sector and we will continue. Excellent. Thank you. Lynn. So my, my thoughts about COP is how important it is that all of us come together across different industries, nations, as well as policymakers, academia and NGOs, to raise the perspectives and knowledge, as well as to increase the partnerships on the solutions, because that is what actually matters and what counts, the actions that we can take. We can't do that without common goals, common direction, and also that we trust that this is the transformation now to be done, and that's why industry and corporations are so important because the solutions and the innovation comes from corporations and we need to scale them and, may, and do that a bit faster than we have done before and that we need to have an agreement on. Excellent, thank you so much. Back to you, Jonas. Yeah, no, for, from our point of view, I think uh, the COP, I think as a leader, we talked about leadership, I think just to be here, uh, as you once said, you interact with uh, the Nordic uh, clients and we are strengthening the cooperation and building uh, these ecosystems. So I think to be here is also to take the leadership role mm. as an uh, industrial industry leader. So I think for us at AFRI, being in this transformation, I'm looking at Linda now who's leading a global organization in energy. We have, hundred, we have products in 100 countries and we are very active in building the electrification in Africa. So for sure, the COP arena for us it's also to interact with a lot of countries' clients where we can use the Nordic high-end technology to avoid the same mistakes as we did, building out the fossil fuel, and you can go directly on the most advanced solutions in the, in the developing countries. That's one role that we think, and that's why we have to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much to our panel. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you. I, I think if you can stay close, maybe we have one time for a photo so that you have uh, something, to, a souvenir. I think if we had corporate leaders of your caliber in all countries and all places, then I think we are well positioned. Thank you so much. We'll take a quick photo and then I think it's over to a press conference. Thank you. Nu i ett, i ett imponerande internationellt hav av ledare på olika nivåer, både i näringsliv och i, i politik. 
Ebba Bors och jag tänkte säga några ord om vad vi gör här i grund och botten. Och jag hade tänkt säga att jag har precis hållit det svenska nationella anförandet. Nu kommer jag säga att jag kommer alldeles strax hålla det svenska nationella anförandet. Det skapar också viss bråska eftersom de tidtabellerna inte alltid riktigt är som de, som de borde vara. Och då kommer jag att understryka att vi befinner oss i ett kritiskt skede om alla världens länder ska lyckas ställa om i rätt tid. Det är bråttom, urgency som vi säger på engelska. Vi måste ställa om från fossilt till fossilfritt. G20-länderna som står för 80 procent av världens samlade utsläpp måste öka takten, ta ledningen för att nå målen i enlighet med Parisavtalet. Det här är bråttom just nu, det är vårt ena budskap. Det är också att det är bra att oljeländer, likt värdlandet UAE, är med i det globala klimatarbetet. Det förtjänar de ingen kritik för, tvärtom. Men uppgiften är likväl att fasa ut fossila bränslen, inte att bara minska användningen av fossila bränslen. Jag kommer också peka på de stora möjligheter som omställningen innebär, inte minst för ett land som Sverige. Omställning ska alltså inte ses bara som en börda, någonting vi gör kortsiktigt här och nu för att vi tvingas, utan som en långsiktig möjlighet med helt andra konsekvenser. Ekonomiska, kommersiella, internationella möjligheter, konkurrenskraft. Och vi har visat under lång tid i Sverige att det här är möjligt. Sedan 1991 har våra utsläpp minskat med mer än en tredjedel. Samtidigt har vår tillväxt, eh, vår ekonomi har fördubblats på den tiden. Många länder i fattiga delar av världen vet inte om att det här är möjligt. De ser bara bördan, de ser inte alla möjligheter. Jag träffade Världsbankens chef här nu på morgonen i bilateralen. Någon sak han underströkte var ju vikten av att allt vi gör också måste vara möjligt för fattiga delar av världen att ta efter. Inte göra det som är dyrast och som bara ett fåtal länder kan göra, utan det som många länder kan se som ett föredöme i världen. Det handlar ju för vår del om några fundamentala saker. Vi ställde om vårt energisystem med start vid oljekrisen, enkelt uttryckt. Och nu är det nästan helt till 98 procent ett fossilfritt elsystem, nästan helt fossilfri värmeproduktion. Medan andra är kvar både i kol och olja och i fossil gas. Det är en helt avgörande förutsättning. Som Ebba brukar säga, har man ingen energipolitik så har man ingen klimatpolitik. Det börjar och slutar med energiproduktionen, men det räcker inte. Det andra handlar om att sätta pris på utsläpp. Vi var ju tidiga även med detta. Redan 1991 så sjösatte vi vår första och höga beskattning av koldioxidutsläpp. Och att skapa ett marknadstryck för förändring fungerar i en marknadsekonomi. Och nu gör hela EU i praktiken precis samma sak. Det är en monumental förändring eh, av vägen framåt. Och det tredje vi har bidragit med det är innovativa företag som är snabba på att reagera på marknadstrycket. Vill man vara konkurrenskraftig när andra ställer om så måste man själv klara av det. Alternativet är inte att fortsätta som tidigare. Alternativet är att antingen har du en fossilfri produkt eller har du ingen produkt alls på marknaden. Det här förstår företagen i en extremt hög hastighet just nu. De som inte ställer om kommer helt enkelt inte klara konkurrensen. Här är vi också föregångare. Men det finns ingen skäl att tro att vi är unika. Resten av världen ställer också om. Det finns inget utrymme att luta sig på gamla framgångar. Det betyder också att vi tycker att svenska företag och svensk exportindustri nu är en allt viktigare del av vårt lands miljö- och klimatrörelse. Speglar våra höga ambitioner utomlands. Många är också, som ni vet, representerade här. Sammantaget har det här gjort att Sverige nu har Europas lägsta utsläpp per capita tillsammans med Portugal. Mitt medskick till andra ledare under olika möten, bilateraler och andra, under de här två dagarna har varit detta. Att klimatomställningen är absolut nödvändig. Tro ingenting annat. Försinka inte. Men också att den ger nya ekonomiska möjligheter. Tro inget annat där heller. Och det är därför jag är så otroligt övertygad om att allianser med andra föregångsländer är kärnan i vårt arbete, även utanför EU. Igår så lanserade jag tillsammans med Indiens premiärminister Modi förutsättning, fortsättningen för ett partnerskap som vi har där vi samarbetar om den tunga industrin. Stål, cement, den sorten saker för att nå nettutsläpp 2050. 
De gör saker som är mycket snarlika det vi gör här i Sverige. Att staten och kapitalet samarbetar för att bli föregångare i sådana industriprocesser också är användbara utomlands. Det är det första. Det andra som jag tror Ebba kommer gå in på ännu mer det är att kärnkraften för första gången någonsin har fått en framträdande roll på en COP-konferens. Från att ha varit nästan lite bandlyst till att bli en absolut nödvändig del av klimatomställningen. Det här är ingen liten förändring. Vi var med på den gemensamma kärnkraftsdeklarationen tillsammans med Frankrike, Sydkorea, USA, Polen, Finland och ett stort antal andra. Och budskapet, inte minst från John Kerry, USAs klimatsändebud, det var ju att kärnkraften är en absolut nödvändig del av lösningen tillsammans med förnybart. Och du uttalade målet för det här samarbetet är att vi ska trippla eller tredubbla den globala kärnkraften fram till 2050. En mycket ambitiös mål och för första gången. Det betyder också för svensk del att om vi ska kunna fördubbla elproduktionen för att klara elektrifieringen till 2045 så måste också vi storsatsa en gång till på kärnkraft. Vi var ledande för några decennier sedan och nu ska vi vara bland dem som leder den utvecklingen en gång till. Allra sist, det vore bra om vi kunde få samsyn i Sverige, inte bara internationellt utan i Sverige, att kärnkraften är en bärande del av den fossilfria energin. Massor av vattenkraft, massor av förnybart och massor av kärnkraft. De kompletterar varandra väl och det är en del av vårt internationella klimatarbete. Det skulle stärka Sveriges röst internationellt när vi visar att omställningen är möjlig. Där är vi inte än, men jag är rätt säker på att dit är vi på väg även i Sverige. Och med de orden, Ebba. Och med den realistiska optimismen tar jag med mig, tack statsministern, och djupa då lite granna i den här deklarationen som vi precis var med och lanserade, och till de som tittar där hemma också. Det här är då alltså en deklaration för att tredubbla kärnkraftskapaciteten globalt från 2020 till 2050. Och det är som vi har sagt många gånger, svåra problem, det löser man bäst tillsammans. Att nå våra klimatmål i tid. Det är verkligen sannoliken ett, ett riktigt stort problem. En applåd för Ebba där. Ja, det är tack. Du fick ingen där så, så här spontant. Jag vill undersöka det statsministern sa här. Vi har alltså, det är ungefär 20 länder som är med i den här deklarationen, det här åtagandet. Men Sverige har alltså ingått i kärngruppen utav länder kring detta tillsammans med då USA, Sydkorea, Storbritannien, Förenade Arabemiraten och även då Frankrike så har Sverige varit avgörande för att få på plats den här deklarationen. Och att kärnkraften för första gången är en så het fråga på COP det visar att allt fler har insett ett absolut eh, fundamentala roll för att nå Parisavtalets mål. Sverige kommer ju med ett väldigt tydligt eh, budskap om brotts att vi måste öka tempot i vårt klimatarbete. Ska vi göra det på ett realistiskt sätt där vi också kan ha eh, folket med oss där vi kan ha the, the, the public opinion, att vi har eh, verkligen en trovärdighet och att människor kan känna att det här är en omställning man kan tro på då är kärnkraften en avgörande eh, del. Fossilfri baskraft är en avgörande del också för att vi ska kunna ansluta mer intermittent förnybar energi och där fortsätter ju Sverige var mycket offensiv. Vi kommer att vara det nu framåt på tisdag också i initiativet för att där trippla användandet av förnybar kraftproduktion. Men för att vi ska kunna göra det så behöver vi ha baskraften för att takta tillsammans. Jag tror också att det som gör att Sverige kan vara så framgångsrik under de här veckorna och i arbetet som har lett fram till COP28, det är ju att vi är ett föregångsland som visar att det går att vända klimatångest till klimathopp. Det går att kombinera högt uppsatta klimatmål med en stark ekonomisk tillväxt och ett starkt, en stark välfärd. Och det vet vi är avgörande för att vi ska få fler länder att våga göra den här resan som statsministern utvecklade alldeles nyss. 
Vårt budskap är alltså att det är fullt möjligt att klara omställningen. Det är fullt möjligt att öka takten på den resa som vi har satt ut på. Det går att vända Mission Impossible till Mission Possible. Det är det svenska budskapet. Och mycket tack vare, tack vare våra svenska eh, företag som går i bräschen för detta. Internationella organisationer som International Energy Agency, IEA, International At- Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA och IPCC har samtliga tagit fram analyser och scenarier som stödjer kärnkraftens betydelse i den här mixen. Och på tisdag så medverkar jag också vid lanseringen av IEAs IAEAs uttalande om kärnkraftens avgörande roll i omställningen tillsammans med 50 andra länder. Ni kan ju bara föreställa er en situation där Sverige inte skulle haft den här offensiva rollen som vi nu bedrivit det senaste året, inte minst under det svenska EU-ordförandeskapet, eh, vad vår situation hade varit under förhandlingarna nu eh, om vi inte hade haft den här linjen. Det är vår bestämda uppfattning att det är genom internationellt samarbete som vi har möjligheten att också påskynda uppbyggnaden på hemmaplan av kärnkraft. Och det förklarar också våra insatser inom den europeiska unionen och formerandet av kärnkraftsalliansen där för att förbättra förutsättningarna. I somras så undertecknade vi också ett samarbete med USA om bilateralt avtal med då energiforskning i fokus. Och nu senast här i oktober så undertecknade ju statsministern tillsammans med premiärminister Sunak eh, samarbete mellan Sverige och eh, Storbritannien kring framväxande kärnkraftsteknik. Eh, signerade ett partnerskap om ett ännu närmare samarbete, däribland SMR. Några korta ord då om de fyra komponenter som... Dagens deklaration innebär. Det innebär att vi nu är ett antal avgörande länder globalt som åtar oss att ett arbetar för att främja ett globalt ambitiöst mål om då tredubblad kärnkraftskapacitet. Två, att vi tar, eh, sä- ja, men säkerställa att vi har ansvarsfullt sätt att hantera kärnkraftsbränsle, eh, kärnbränsle, kärnavfall och att vi har en långsiktig plan för det gemensamt. Den tredje delen handlar såklart om att stödja utvecklingen och kärnkraft och den fjärde handlar om pengarna. Att mobilisera investeringar i ny kärnkraft. Och om man bara blickar lite snabbt på det vi har gjort hittills det här gångna året så i, vi har vi kommit ganska långt i att möta de här åtagandena i deklarationen. Vi har lanserat två steg i ny kärnkraft för Sverige. Den första röstade också riksdagen om i onsdags eh, som handlar om att slopa antalet, förbudet på antalet reaktorer och antalet platser. Ny kärnkraft i Sverige, ett andra steg, handlar bland annat då om utredning att se över tillståndsprövningen för att få upp tempo till den, djupare in till alla komponenter i den. Och därtill så har vi då eh, redan beslutat om kreditgarantier kring kärnkraft i höst. Vi har också presenterat en färdplan för ny kärnkraft där vi också ska titta på och föreslå riskdelnings- och finansieringsmodeller. Så att det, 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 det händer otroligt mycket på det här området och mycket av detta tankar också såklart in i energiforskningspropositionen som vi presenterar senare i höst. Bara en personlig reflektion från min sida på den eventet som vi var på här i, i morse. Det, det är någonting speciellt att ändå vara en del av den enorma rörelse för att få in fossilfri baskraft. Att höra då Special Envoy Kerry och president Macron, eh, samtliga talare som plussade andra länder, nämnde Sverige. Eh, och nämnde vårt arbete i att vara en trovärdig partner för offensiv grön omställning men som skapar framtidstro som är realistisk fartökning i omställningen. Omställningen, en omställning som människor kan tro på eh, och där kärnkraften nu helt uppenbart i och med COP28 tycks vara en fundamental del. Där tänker jag att det stannar. Tack Ebba. Då är det öppet hus eller på att säga. Eh, Susanne styr. Ja, då börjar, öppnar vi upp för frågor. Vi börjar med Dagens Nyheter. <laughs> ja, tack. Eh, jag har eh, två frågor. Eh, den ena eh, rör att Guterres uppmanar går rika länder att eh, gå ännu snabbare framåt och försöka nå netto noll 2040. Kommer Sverige ställa sig bakom eh, en sån förändring i klimatmålen? Och sen undrar jag, kommer Sverige bidra till den nya fonden som etableras här när det gäller skador och förluster? 
Mm. Så kan jag bara, bara fylla på. Alltså årstalen, nu är det 2045, ja, 2050 använder en del, 2040, vi har inga nya planer på att ändra, ändra årtalen här. Jag tycker han har en poäng i att rika länder i största allmänhet som har bättre förutsättningar ska gå före. Men jag tar också verkligen med mig, gå före på ett sätt som är exporterbart till resten av världen. Mm. Jag tror inte det går inte nog att understryka detta. Vi brukar säga att det är bra att USA är tillbaka i klimatarbetet. Europa är det bokstavligt talat. Att få Indien, att få Kina, att få Afrika, att få Sydamerika. Att göra saker och ting som i deras ekonomi är realistiska. Det är den riktigt stora saken att göra. Och då ska man lägga till en sak också. Som vi också hade diskussioner om igår. Att, att begränsa utsläppen, minska utsläppen, bli av med det fossila. Det är ena delen. En del fattiga länder, framförallt de som ligger i längst i fronten av att drabbas av, av, av klimatkonsekvenserna de vill också ha anpassningsåtgärder otroligt viktigt att vinna trovärdighet hos dem med anpassningsåtgärder om sånt som redan har inträffat. Så där tycker jag maningen att för att det är våra länder att också med klimatbestånd, vilket Sverige deltar i är en viktig sak. Och det blir också en övergång till, till nya fonden. Bra att loss and damage är på plats. Vi ska se hur vi ska fördela våra pengar inom ramen för olika former av klimatstöd internationellt. Har du mer att säga om detta? Men det går ju bara att understryka att Sverige är ju idag ett av de, de, de mest offensiva givarna vad gäller just klimatbestånd och nu gör vi en total översyn utav hur vi kan göra vårt bistånd än mer effektivt. Vi har ju inte någon ambition om att göra klimatbeståndet mindre effektivt. Så, så mycket kan jag gå händelserna i förväg och, och berätta. Men detaljerna kring exakt utformning av den här fonden är ju heller inte, är ju heller inte klart. Så att vi kommer att återkomma kring exakt vad som blir Sveriges roll i den framåt. Så inga konkreta siffror under det här klimatmötet om bidrag till fonden? Jag är inte för dagen i alla fall. Sen får vi se. Vi håller på med en analys av hur vi använder. Vi är ju en mycket stor bidragsgivare till den andra klimatfonden. Då får vi ska fördela våra medel får vi se. Svenska Dagbladet. Ja, två frågor angående dagens event. För det första försöker jag bara förstå vilken typ av avtal eller åtagande är det här så formellt sett då? Och vad betyder det vad Sverige har? Har vi också skrivit på att vi ska bygga tre gånger mer kärkraft? För det om jag har räknat ut är 20 000 megawatt mera reaktorer i så fall. Ebba svåta drömmar. Mm. Men kan, kan du berätta vad det är planen efter 2035 i så fall och hur bindande det här är? Det måste riksdagen godkänna det. Men hur ska man förstå avtalet? Mm. Nej, men, li, lite krast. Det här är inte ett bindande avtal. Men det är ju någonting när, när ledare av den här typen för den här uppsättningen länder ställer sig på scen tillsammans med hela världens ögon riktade mot sig och gör den här typen av åtagande. Det är klart att det får effekter. Och jag är övertygad om att det också kommer få effekter för var investeringar går, var, vilka investeringsbeslut som företagen tar och det i sig kommer ju också att låsa inriktningen framåt. Men det här är inte ett bindande avtal men det är ett, det är ett gentleman's agreement som är på, på, ganska, på ganska hög nivå får man se. Men jag tänkte statsministern nämner 2500 megawatt som ska vara på plats till 2035. Det är en väldigt liten del om Sverige skulle faktiskt trippla kärnkraften hos oss också. Kan ni säga någonting om var ni tror att vi är efter 2040 fram mot 2050. Det här är väldigt tydligt den här deklarationen att vi ska bidra till att trippla det globalt och Sverige kommer göra sin del. Vi har ju idag ett, ett fossilfritt, eh, fossilfri elproduktion i, i Sverige eh, och nu ska vi dubbla det energisystemet eh, men vi låser oss inte vid att, att själva trippla det för att tala klarspråk utan vi bidrar, vi har nu gjort ett åtagande där vi gemensamt ska se till att trippla det eh, globalt och Sverige kommer att göra sin del. Med med den massiva reformagendan som jag tidigare också repeterade de stora grundbulkarna av tidigare så tror vi att efter 2035 så kommer det hända väldigt mycket med både fler konventionella reaktorer men också SMR:er. Hur många de blir och hur stor andel av produktionen de kommer stå för, det återstår att se. Jag ser gärna att Sverige fortsätter att vara en nettoexportör av fossilfri kraftproduktion till andra länder, men inte på bekostnad av effektbrist vid topplasttimmar och fullkomligt avgörande investeringar i många delar av landet. Men det är som du brukar säga också att ju mer vi i de kommande decennierna ökar den basproduktionen med i praktiken kärnkraft desto mer utrymme finns det också för mer av förnyelsebart eller förnybart. Så att jag tror att det faktum att vi idag har ett nästan helt fossilfritt elsystem 
Det är inget löfte i sig att vi ska klara av en fördubbling som krävs för rektifieringen. Där har vi ju läxan kvar att göra. Och det är därför jag tycker att vår trovärdighet ökar dramatiskt med våra vunna erfarenheter tidigare om kärnkraft att nu göra om den resan en gång till. Och det tycker jag bara antyder vilken ambitionsnivå vi kommer kunna ha i den. Sen är det ingen slump när jag, jag har rest det senaste året. Sydkorea, eller jag har haft inkommande besök också. Mycket Frankrike, mycket Sydkorea, mycket Storbritannien, mycket Finland. Det här är ju länder som har mycket höga ambitioner både som tillverkare och som användare av kärnkraft. Så med de orden avslutar vi den här presskonferensen. Tack för idag. Bra. Hello and a very warm welcome to this session at the Pioneer the Possible Pavilion, the Business Sweden Pavilion at COP28. My name is Robert Watt and I will be your moderator for a fascinating session on how to implement near zero emissions technologies for a climate neutral society. I'm going to introduce um, this session by recalling a couple of things that the Swedish Prime Minister has just said as he spoke to uh, Swedish media. Um, he said two things that I think are really important and help us set the scene for this event. The first is, he said that there will be no markets in the future without fossil-free products, that companies that aren't producing those products will not be able to make the sales. And the second thing he talked about is he mentioned the fact that this is a sort of transition that needs to take place all over the world, where Sweden can show the way, but where there are partnerships with other countries, and in particular the newly announced Sweden-India Industry Transition Partnership, that can help to spread these technologies around the world to make sure that we all reach net zero. But how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to start off with a presentation uh, by Alastair Graham, uh, who is Senior Associate at the Energies, Energy Transitions Commission. And Alastair is going to give us the latest analysis um, about what is needed and what the state of decarbonisation is for many of the hard-to-abate sectors in the world, steel, cement, aluminium, and so on. So I'll hand over to Alastair, who will be joining us online with a presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Alistair Graham. I am the Head of Industry Decarbonisation for the Energy Transitions Commission. It's a pleasure to join uh, Rob and the panel uh, today to discuss how to implement near zero emissions technologies for a climate neutral society. At the Energy Transitions Commission, we've been working on this topic for uh, something in the order of seven years. And we're very pleased to see a kind of a transition from what I refer to as the talk, the talk shop to the workshop. Um, and we see a lot of activity around industrial scale pilots, particularly in the Nordics and particularly in Sweden. Um, at the same time, the Breakthrough Agenda 2023 report makes it very clear that whilst uh, the transition towards clean energy and sustainable solutions is accelerating, there is still a big gap between where we are and where we need to be in terms of deploying near zero emissions capable technologies at true commercial scale. So before Rob and the panel dig into this topic, um, I thought I'd offer some, uh, some some thoughts and some thinking based on our most recent uh, work. And to do that, I'll offer up a handful of slides and I'll just take you through some of those. The first is that Achieving climate neutral society will not be possible without addressing the harder to abate sectors. That is those uh, sectors which are typically emissions intensive and have very uh, steep challenges around the techno economics of decarbonizing them and indeed their position in international uh, traded markets, which creates kind of locational and regional problems to the, to the, uh, to the issues. In parallel, progress 
in some of the easier to abate sectors, such as light duty road transport, means that we may actually see uh, an increase in the emissions from the hard to abate sectors proportionally in the years ahead. And so pressure and focus on those will inevitably rise. Um, Obviously, this, this week we will see the UNFCCC's uh, global stock take, and in parallel, there has been one undertaken for the cor for the corporates uh, by the world by, by we mean business, um, and that's going to highlight some of the, the the urgency and the need to address the heavy industry and heavy duty transport emissions problem. Um, the good news is that reaching climate neutral heavy industry and transport is indeed techno and economic technically and economically possible. Um, but crucially, these pathways will depend upon the ability to deploy near-zero emissions technologies in the coming years in order to uh, align with the trajectory that keep us on the Paris Agreement trajectory towards 2050. The Mission Possible Partnership, of which the Energy Transitions Commission has has done a lot of the work on on the on the sectoral uh, sectorally focused pieces, um, has laid out for 2030 what that looks like in, in real economy milestones. And if we just look at three examples, so for cement, you're looking at 30 plus uh, low emissions full 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 scale commercial plants by 2030. In steel, it's 70, producing something in the order of 170 million tonnes of near zero primary or ore based steel. And for trucking, you're looking at 7 million trucks uh, with uh, large volumes of uh, both depot charging and also high speed public charging to support their, uh, to support their use. So big numbers, um, but we are starting to see a, a, a series of, of decisions approaching uh, final investment decision across all of those sectors. Um, but what we will say is that the pipeline is still far short of what is needed to align with those 1.5 degree trajectories. Um, if we look uh, at the yellow um, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the charts here, that shows the final investment decisions that have been reached in each of the sectors. And you will see that particularly for steel, for cement, uh, and for uh, trucking, the actual numbers are very, very uh, small um, relative to the scale of the challenge. What could be done about that? Because time really is of the essence, uh, both in terms of uh, deploying these technologies, which, which are uh, typically very large assets and require very long lead times for, for their uh, construction and eventual um, deployment. But if you, if you look at the conventional lead times, some of these are extending beyond five years. So there are things that, that can be done to, to shorten that. One is front-loading some of the pre-feasibility studies. One is uh, front-loading a lot of the um, front-end engineering design work. But there are limits to what you can do there. And the main one uh, is, of course, plan uh, is the kind of bureaucratic dimension, which, of course, is planning and permitting for such facilities. So there's a lot there's work to be done there. But even if you were to do that kind of to the maximal uh, extent possible, you are still looking at several years in which to make a decision and then have an asset built and deployed in, in commercial scale. So the question then arises, what is what is holding back the final investment decisions in these sectors? Um, and, um, um, what we see is a first wave of first of a kind technologies reaching FID, typically because of a combination of enabling conditions that are quite localized, targeted uh, policy support, and support from the demand side from the buyers to pay a premium for some of the production or the service that that uh, technology offers. However, these localized uh, conditions are not sufficient um, to, to work kind of at a true international scales, which is what the, the earlier charts were kind of uh, suggesting is going to be needed. Um, and it's going to require a big change in the enabling environment at scale. And that's going to require joint industrial policies. It's going to require enabling infrastructure, particularly for around, around clean energy. It's going to require access to raw materials. And it's going to require the ability to attract and retain the right talent. Um, and of course, pulling all that together, you really are looking at reshaping entire value chains uh, and supply chains production. So the final thing we'll, we'll, we'll draw towards is 
And the point that industry can't do this on its own, particularly not, no single corporate can, can, can realize all of the necessary changes in the system that are needed to deploy these technologies at scale um, with, 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 with the appropriate business case and, and, in, and investable criteria around them. So what we're going to start to see, we think, is probably some new bold forms of collaboration and some of the uh, uh, members of the panel will be able to speak quite fully about that. Um, but, I, but in terms of the it, it, how this all needs to pull together, we obviously have some view from the view from industry, but there's the view from the buyers, there's the view from the energy sector, there's the view from governments, and crucially, there's the view from financiers who typically will need to make substantially uh, increased investments in these technologies. So that draws back to the panel, which to kind of for three starting questions is well, what are the critical challenges you face within your respective uh, industries to, to, to actually uh, progress towards FIDs? What are the types of value chain collaboration that are most needed within the industries to overcome these challenges? Um, and what is the importance of policy uh, and enable it to create the appropriate enabling conditions? Where is policy action most urgent needed uh, in each industry? and indeed across them. So I'll pause there and pass back to Rob. Um, I'm very much looking forward to a very interesting debate with an excellent panel. Thank you. And thank you, Alistair, uh, for setting the scene and almost half doing my job by posing three questions at the end of your presentation, uh, which is a great way for us to start our panel. But let me introduce the panel. I'd like to give a warm welcome to them, please. Uh, we have uh, Martin Pei, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of SSAB. <laughs> Lars Stienkvist, Chief Technology Officer of Volvo Group. Winston Beck, Head of Government Affairs at Heidelberg Materials. And Lola Vallejo, who is Director of the Climate Programme at IDRI. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you. And why don't we just kick off with, with, with the first question? I mean, hearing um, Alistair talk about the urgency of uh, the transition and the scale that, that is required, I mean, he's talking about you know, 70 uh, near zero emission steel plants, something tens at least of, of um, very low emission cement production uh, facilities as well. So I'll start with you, Martin. What do we need to do to accelerate and make sure we meet this challenge of urgency and scale? Uh, we have uh, now shown that uh, the technology for producing fossil free steel works at pallet scale. We are now uh, working very hard to uh, proceed with our investment program. The first uh, commercial facility is aimed at uh, getting started up in 2026. And SSAB has taken decision to build two more mini mills uh, in Sweden, Finland before 2030. So we are doing really whatever we can do from our perspective. But to do that, uh, uh, to realize this uh, very high ambition, we need some support from the society uh, regarding permits, regarding access, uh, grid connection, and so on and so on. Uh, so I think jointly we can push this uh, move faster uh, than what we see uh, on the Alistair's uh, uh, slides. That's great. So you have an, a, a note of optimism. Lars, I'll come to you. Seven million electrified trucks, I think, was the number that Alistair was talking about for 2030. How are you going to get there? What do you need? I'm representing then the Volvo Group, and you know, Volvo Group is everything but passenger cars then. So it's trucks, buses, construction machines, and uh, we are dedicated to becoming then 100% fossil free 2040. We are very early out. We are, as a matter of fact, in the lead then in Europe and North America. But as you say, it goes rather slow, still rather low volumes. So if I talk downstream towards my customers, mm -hmm. tailpipe emissions, we see that it's moving in those countries where you have incentives that it's clearly moving Sweden, Norway, Netherlands, France, Germany, Switzerland, other countries, it's moving far too slow. So that's something really where our politicians can play a role in the early days to grease up the system. Mm. For us then, it's also important to talk upstream because um, decarbonization is not only tailpipe, it's our manufacturing footprint. Then we're working together with Martin and SSAB and others then in order to 
get those value chains going. And uh, we are extremely happy with our partnership on fossil-free steel. We will announce today a partnership together with Norsk Hydro around aluminium in the same direction. And I think that these industry verticals are extremely important, that you have commitments down in the value chain in order to show that there is a market. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, let me turn to you now, Winston, if I may. I, I wonder whether you want to reflect on any specific, sexually specific issues that will help the cement and concrete sector accelerate away. Yes, thank you very much. So I represent Heidelberg uh, Materials, and we are one of the largest uh, construction material companies in the world, and we are actually the biggest cement producer in, in, in Europe, and with big operations in, in Sweden as well. Um, and similar to, to the other companies present on the stage, I think we see ourselves as a front runner in, in the sector. We actually have the most ambitious uh, CO2 reduction uh, um, targets in our industry. We want to reduce our global CO2 footprint in scope one and two by almost 50% by 2030 compared to 1990. And of course, we also want to become net zero by 2050. And it's true that uh, some of the challenges we have heard before are similar. Others are different uh, to our sector. So in our sector, I think uh, what is absolutely key is, of course, that we uh, replace the fossil fuels and defossilize. But actually, the, both emissions are only 30% of our footprint because 60 to 65 percent of our emissions are actually coming from the calcination of the limestone, so our main raw material. So we really need to reduce these unavoidable process emissions. So besides tackling the energy side, I think we need to have a circular mindset. We need to uh, recycle. We, we do uh, major investments in Europe, in the US, and also in Australia in, in that direction. But we also need to capture and store those emissions. Um, so we really need to uh, scale and deploy uh, CCUS on a, on a very wide scale. And I'm quite happy to announce that we have already published nine large-scale CCS projects. We actually will put in operation the first CCS facility in the cement world in Norway in 2024. And we just announced on Tuesday, right on time for COP28, the first carbon-captured net-zero cement will be put on the market in 2025 with the brand name Evo Zero. And of course, we also have a, a massive uh, CCS project in, in Slite in, in Sweden, where we aim to capture 1.8 million tons of CO2 by 2030. But I agree with the other speakers, in order to make that work, we need to have the framework conditions in place, and we really also need to work on the business case. And I think we may have a chance to elaborate a bit more on this. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Winston. Let me turn now to you, Loli, if I may. Um, we haven't We've heard a lot from different sectors and companies who are leading in this. They've talked a little bit about how they're doing that and what some of the challenges might be. But we're here at a COP. Perhaps you can place all of this discussion about industrial decarbonisation in, in the context of, of, of COP28, the UNFCCC, please. Thanks a lot. Um, I mean, indeed, what these four interventions show is that clearly the... You know, the Nordic countries are really well positioned to be global leaders of industrial decarbonization, and it's a really good news for the planet. Um, but of course, we need to reach our goals together, and there's a lot of interest in many other places of the world in accelerating and having an industrial, um, green industrialization pathway. So, of course, you know, Sweden and India partnering together shows that India is very committed. Um, Saudi Arabia, um, sorry, <laughs> UAE um, announced today that they are going to have a, a specific industrialization strategy. There's a lot of parts of the world that would like to do that, and I think What's important to keep in mind is if we want to meet our goals globally, we're going to need leaders on low carbon steel, cement, um, and you know, long transport, uh, long distance transport in every part of the world. So you would need each continent to have their own, you know, CCS plant. And I think that's a discussion on which um, COP can really help. 
because I think another thing that I took away from the Mission Possible report is that signals are important, and this COP is very much about sending signals. The global stock take is trying to send signals about energy transition that could kind of reinforce this business case that you're trying to make and justify the premium that some industries are making the strategic business decision to, to invest today. Uh, and hopefully it could have um, you know, a role of encouraging others to follow, but bearing in mind that some countries will obviously need support and there's a, a conversation to broker between businesses and governments to try and find where are going to be the, the champions, where, you know, where are the Nordic countries in every continent of the world. Thank you so much, Lola. And you, you, you talked there and you've pointed to the important role of policy and Alistair echoed that. Enabling conditions really matter. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit more and ask what you need, Martin. What is, what is it that is where policy action is most urgently needed so within the steel sector in order to get this scale? Uh, in our case, I mean, we are now moving ahead with our uh, decided uh, plan. Uh, we need, uh, uh, say, local uh, policy support in terms of uh, shortening the lead time for permits and so on. But on the larger global perspective, uh, uh, carbon pricing is uh, one important uh, aspect because uh, today uh, with uh, the uh, emission uh, cost not uh, evenly distributed around the globe, then this case it looks different. We, from our side, we are uh, very open. We have developed a hybrid technology that we have uh, protected with patent applications, and we will share this uh, to others who want to use this. Everybody can uh, make a, a, a license agreement with us, and we will support the uh, rollout of such technology uh, anywhere if there is uh, a need for that. And uh, we believe that such technology needs to be shared uh, in order for us to make a, a larger uh, impact. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, let me come to you, if I may, uh, and, and just ask you a little bit about, um, you, you mentioned incentives, and it was incentives that really helped the take up, take, if you like, of, of some of these first uh, vehicles that you were able to put on the market. Are there other policies that you feel are absolutely critical to go from the, the small uptake so far and really expand that by 2030 to be somewhere in the region of whatever your share of the 7 million trucks is? No, well, towards 2030, if, if we take a European perspective with new European legislation coming up, we can foresee that at least one third of the trucks in Europe by 2030 will be electric. Uh, and to be honest, and this is not a pure automotive transformation. This is a transformation of the logistical system. Uh, we have 15,000 engineers. We are busy with working on the vehicles. I can tell you all, the vehicles will not be the bottleneck. It will be about the infrastructure around the electrical uh, transport logistical system. So what our politicians need to focus on is, of course, to make sure that there is enough green electricity available and that you have a distribution system that, so that you can charge your vehicle where you want to charge it. I've said it before, I think it's ridiculous if I have 15,000 engineers developing electric vehicles that will be fueled by electricity produced by coal. That's a big failure. Or? Very clear message there. Get the infrastructure right, both in terms of producing the electricity and distributing it, charging infrastructure, I'm sure, I'm, I assume is part of that. Winston, I'd like to pick up, you, you, you talked a little bit about the business model, and I, I'm actually very curious to understand a little bit more about the business model. Lars talked about how you know, incentives helped his customers. What, what is your relationship with, if you like, downstream that means that a business model for near zero emission cement could be possible. Yes. So uh, absolutely. So I think I, I agree with uh, with the speakers before. You know, I think on the on the on the technical side and on the operational side, I think we feel quite confident that we can make net zero happen. It's just really the the, the business case of how to make it financially and economically viable, and also that our investors really buy into it. 
And for here, it, it is very important, first of all, to, to work on the Queen Premium and to discuss with our investors. I think it's absolutely key that we are transparent about the environmental benefit about our, our new products. So we really need to have solid monitoring and verification schemes. And we also need to go out there and to present these advantages. You know, so, so far, it's really a, a niche market, and we need to broaden up this market to, to a large uh, scale. And we need to advocate um, for the environmental, men, uh, environmental benefits that this will also give a benefit to our customers. You know, they can create net zero buildings, they can market net zero buildings, and they can get further uh, value creation out of that. So I think the green premium is absolutely justified. But I think what is also important to understand that for the next 10 to 15 years, these are all first mover projects, right? There is no uh, blueprint uh, for, for any of these projects. And it is very clear that they are also very CAPEX and, uh, and OPEX intensive. So we do need some uh, support uh, in the early stages. We need, do need uh, funding uh, programs available. Um, I think in, in, we, we do see some positive developments. In the US, we have the IRA. In, in Europe, uh, we have the Green Deal and the, the ETS, with, which gives us some long-term predictability about the CO2 price. But I also have to say that, for example, taking the innovation fund in, in Europe, it's not enough. I mean, it's uh, uh, focused on innovation only and on a few projects, while we are now in, in the stage of scaling up. So we really need to have a fund which supports first mover in scaling up these types of technologies and projects. Fantastic, thank you. Can, can I ask a quick follow-up, actually, Winston? If you had the construction industry here today, because they must be, you know, one of your your key clients. What do you think they would say about, in terms of the policies that they think they would need, the regulations that might make them or even force them to pay that green premium? Yeah. So, first of all, of course, it's absolutely important that each part in the value chain internalizes uh, the CO2 costs. You know, I think that's, that's what, in the end, the net zero economy is about, right? It's an economy. And, and the other one is, I think it's, it's also critical that when we are talking about buildings, that we are also um, embedding the, this concept of low carbon products into the standards and into the building codes. Because right now, we are actually hampered in certain regions uh, by, by very like old, non-updated standards. For example, uh, CCUS is, is not included in the environmental product declarations, so we cannot get the environmental uh, benefit out of that declared into, these, uh, into this declaration. And the same is true for uh, the standards when we use alternative raw materials or supplementary cementitious materials. Some of the standards, which are mostly national, not even regional, they s limit uh, the, the extent to 20%. Even though already now, with the technology we have, we can go easily to 50, 60, uh, or even 70%. So we need to have an update of these standards and building codes. Brilliant. I love it when we get into things like standards, the, the real weeds of all of this stuff. It means that things are probably going to actually happen. Um, before I come back to you, Lola, I just want to stick on the sort of the, the business model thing and then come back to you, if I may, Lars. I mean, I just wonder, whether, are there any advantages for your clients, your customers, the haulage firms, in shifting to these new electric uh, trucks and vehicles? Well, definitely, and um, I think that one driver that we sometimes are underestimating is science-based targets. Uh, I'm really glad to meet so many companies during COP that has uh, committed to the science-based targets. Still too few have really gone the full, full way to take this uh, scope 3 into account. But when you take scope 3 into account, and when you start to do your homework, then all of a sudden, if you don't fix logistics, then you're smoked you will not deliver on your promises. Uh, transport is so vital for all, let's say, industrial companies with any kind of transport and physical products. And uh, so, so definitely then, coming to us and get support when it comes to decarbonization of the logistical system will help them a lot. And that, that's great to hear. How about, are there any things in the sort of the total cost of ownership that are advantageous when shifting to, to a, a electric vehicle. Yeah, clearly. So we will all see that the cost of carbon will just go up. And uh, I mean, from a fuel perspective, it is definitely an advantage uh, to run on electricity in most countries. But we need to get there where we have a situation where green energy is, of course, completely outperforming the brown one. 
and by that you will have your business case. No, no doubt about it. Brilliant. Um, can I come back to you, Lola, please? Um, you spoke about the uh, the need to make sure that this is a transition that's happening, not just in the Nordics, where there are some advantage advantages, um, but in other parts of the world. I've heard finance being talked about as being a key barrier at the moment. Is it the only one? And if it is, or and even if it is a key barrier, what, what do we need to do to, to overcome it? I mean, I mentioned, um, so for instance, Sultan al Jaber and uh, President Ruto from Kenya published a, an op-ed today that was saying that developing countries wanted to uh, industrialize in a low carbon manner, but that they needed the private sector support and they needed private finance flows. And so that's going to require support from public money to make these investments less risky. There's still a lot of questions about how that's going to play out and how that's going to compete with other climate priorities and development priorities of multilateral development banks or bilateral development banks. But clearly it's, it's, a, it's a very important issue. Um, also because, you know, continents like Africa don't want to be stuck at the end of the supply chain in an extractive role and providing the critical materials for the transition for the rest of the world. They do want to move up the supply chain and it's, it's only fair that they do and, and meet their development goals. Um, I would say that to meet some of the building blocks, um, I, I would like to again <laughs> make the promotion of this process because I think this year is, is so important to send those signals. Clearly there's a lot of debate about whether we should send a signal to phase out fossil fuels globally. Clearly it's a message that's aligned with some of the investments that your companies are making. Women Business has put out a statement you know, of companies calling out support for this uh, goal and I think it's it's important that, in particular, the industrial sector supports um, the deployment of CCS that is also oriented to fit the hard to abate sector. Because I think that's another issue that's going to be heavily discussed at COP, is we know we're going to have to deploy carbon capture and storage, but to what usage? And I think industry needs to be also loud and clear. Mm. We're barely starting on this issue and we need to have a priority to reserve it to, you know, we, we need to, uh, cement with CCS and um, it's fantastic that we have the first plant. We need to go faster. So we need to focus our efforts to the sectors that actually need it. Um, and I think that's really important. I'll just do a little bit of a promotion here. I'm also the co chair of something called the Mitigation Work Program. The full name is um, the Work Program for Mitigation, Ambition and Implementation this critical decade. And it's a new process that's supposed to bridge basically the high level global policy signals with the practitioner's community. And there's one thing that's hardened me in this uh, this first year of activity is how every country across the globe was keen to have more sectoral experts and more private sector participation. So I think you know you want to convey your your policy needs, and the other side is really keen to hear from you. And the mitigation work program is one of the places where we could structure those discussions. Thank you so much, Laura. Great invitation uh, to, to all of you here. Winston, I, I, heard, I saw you waving your hand as soon as CCS came up. So do come in, please. Yeah, no, I just want to... So, so we have, as Heidelberg Materials, uh, we are operating in more than 50 countries uh, globally. We have uh, over 200 cement plants. So I fully agree. And our, our targets are, are global, right? So I fully agree that we need to advance not only in Europe and, and in Northern America, but we also need to find solutions for the other parts of the world. I think for... for what is very key for us, first of all, that we have a global roadmap, and our roadmap is built bottom up. So we really looked at each plant worldwide and looked what what can we do to get to net zero by by 2050. Um, and I also uh, think what made a huge difference that we actually have linked our CO2 reduction to the uh, compensation scheme of all managers worldwide. So if they don't achieve our annual uh, CO2 reduction targets, they will also not get their full bonus. And you can tell that that actually made a huge difference. Huh? Um, but then again, we also need uh, the frameworks and, and the regulations. I think. Uh, Carbon pricing is absolutely key. Uh, I think it's important uh, that we advocate for it also here at COP to be rolled out. Uh, if it's regional, we need to um, uh, combine it with some sort of a, 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 a car carbon leakage uh, protection system. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we would also like to achieve a global system, but that I guess is still far in, in the future. And then 
it, we also need to, to, uh, to find the different technology pathways for the different regions, right? So CCUS, we will roll out uh, until 2030 in Europe and in North America. And then we aim to also look into the projects in the other regions. But it's also clear that in Africa, for example, we do have other levers right now, which are the more low hanging fruits, for example, um, replacing the fossil fuels with alternative fuels and with waste. We can burn waste and incinerate it and use actually also the, the, the ashes at the end as a replacement um, of our raw material. So it's called co-processing, which is a very efficient process. But for that, we actually need to roll out waste management schemes in these countries because at the moment, what they do is landfilling. So we also need to really to work on banning or at least taxing landfilling globally. Thank you so much, Winston. I'd like to come back to you, Martin. Um, and you've given us quite a, 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 an amazing picture about how quickly the transition has been taking place at SSAB. You've talked about perhaps what some of those policy obstacles are. You know, it's, it's the access to enough uh, re reliable, uh, clean energy. It's the infrastructure and the permitting. Uh, but you've also talked about the, the ways in which you are developing these value chain uh, collaborations with Volvo. But I believe also you you can be a supplier to the cement industry as well. Um, but how are we going to export this sort of value chain model that's, that's appeared in the Nordics, that's helped create demand for these projects? How are we going to export that to other parts of the world? Yes, I think uh, uh, a good thing is that uh, when we stand together, uh, show that uh, there is a technology developed. This force average steel is sitting in uh, large uh, trucks and uh, uh, vehicles, uh, and now we have uh, the need created to the market of this, uh, and uh, your customers uh, ask for uh, fossil free transport uh, services, and we can really be part of that journey. Uh, and working together, uh, upstream we have mining companies, energy companies uh, that support us, uh, and these are extremely important uh, examples that we share how we, even we are a small country, but we can accomplish this uh, extremely challenging task in such a short time. I think that is uh, really very important. I want to add one thing, I think we touched about the, the standards. There is uh, now, uh, yesterday I participated in the panel with the World Trade Organization who launched these uh, sustainable steel principles, which is an important initiative as we believe. We have been supporting those uh, preparation work from SSAB. Because now when uh, um, every continent, every company start to move in this direction, we really need to create a transparent, trustable, credible uh, way to measure, to report, so that uh, your customer knows in your track what actually material, uh, how much uh, CO2 footprint is in that. And we need to do this all the way up to taking out the mines, uh, iron ore mines from the mining companies. Thank you so much, Martin. All of that alignment along the supply chains and the value chains is, is absolutely critical. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of our session now. Um, you have about 15 seconds each to say one thing about your hopes within the context of the negotiations. What are your hopes that might come out of COP28 that you think could help in this transition? Yes, I can start and then I pass. Uh, uh, Increase the ambitions, we need to move faster. We have the solutions, now we need to move faster. For me, it's very, very tangible that we are clear on addressing this, that it's about stopping burning fossil fuel. I think for us, it's really a regulatory certainty and political commitment. We have now the targets, now we need to focus on the implementation, and I very much agree that we also very much support tripling the renewable energy capacity by 2030. Thank you. Um, I hope for clear signals in the context of the global stock take um, and also to generate increasing trust that the mitigation work program can be a place um, to discuss this implementation issue that everyone is so concerned about. Thank you so much, everybody. A warm hand to our panel, please. <laughs> And thank you so much uh, for listening and your engagement today. As we've heard, this is a transition that is possible. It's happening. Thank you.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session focusing on the Swedish leadership in cutting emissions while simultaneously driving sustainable growth and economic empowerment on the global market. These concrete measures, of course, requires collaboration, cross actors, cross sectors, cross geographies. We just heard our Swedish Prime Minister emphasizing the role of collaboration also with the, role, uh, with the global south. We know that concrete measures are so heavily needed. According to the Global Stocktake Report, we know that we are not on track to the net zero 2050. So this means, of course, that we need to increase speed and collaboration. But what is good is that we also know, once again, according to the Global Stocktake Report, that increased international cooperation is part of solving this problem. And we we also know that the business community is really driving. So for this reason, I'm very happy to moderate this session that will be divided into two different panels. The first panel, we have representatives from different sectors with the business community, government and also development corporation. And the second panel will be represented by three Swedish companies within the energy sector. So by this, let's get started. And now I'd like to welcome up on stage Mr. Jan Olof Jacke, CEO of the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. Welcome. Also, Mr. Stefano Signore, Head of Unit Climate Change and Sustainable Energy at the EU Commission DG International Partnership. So, welcome. <laughs> and then, Mrs. Beatrice Gisa, Director General, Environment and Climate Change, the Ministry of Environment, Rwanda. Welcome. Now, welcome Mr. Jakob Granit, Director General of the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. So welcome. So I introduced this panel by speaking about the Swedish leadership. And Jan Olof, how can Swedish companies push the implementation of both the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda and really commit to lead global sustainable development? Well, thank you. It's a very small question. Yes. Uh, try to be relatively concrete. I mean, there, there should be no doubt that we have, uh, as a country and uh, the companies within the country, very high ambitions for the climate change. Uh, for me, there is absolutely no doubt that the most important thing we can help to demonstrate to the world is that it's entirely possible to lead through the green transition at the same time as we improve our competitiveness and, uh, and, and can sustain economic growth. That is the only way we can be a role model. So I think that that's critical. Um, we have a very good starting point. We have uh, high degrees of innovation, technologies that we can export, but we also start from a good position in terms of of uh, fossil free energy, which is uh, paramount to uh, take us through the, uh, to the green transition. And I think one of the things we can really contribute with is exporting both technologies and products. It's uh, already so that uh, we, uh, we, we push out 25 million tons of CO2 emissions by cleaner manufacturing in, in Sweden than it would have been uh, elsewhere. The the possibility to double that or triple that or quadruple that is absolutely there, but we absolutely have to get the right conditions uh, in place. And just finally, beyond that, I think uh, if we can improve on our ways of working with more difficult, challenging markets, untapped markets, uh, I think we can not only contribute to, to green transition, but also, uh, in fact, to better economic empowerment and to better economic growth. And I'm convinced that there's so much more we can do to improve our ways of working with a broader number of, of markets. 
Thank you very much for that, Jan Olof. And you mentioned also the importance of fossil free energy. And I'm now looking into you, Stefano, here. The EU Global Gateway is a huge initiative from the EU Commission, so focusing on infrastructure and energy also in, in developing economies. Could you please elaborate a bit of what is it, the EU Global Gateway, and what are the challenges and opportunities? Sure. So another small question, I would yes, say. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, the challenge we faced uh, in the previous uh, multiannual financial framework was a certain fragmentation of the EU offer, but also the fact that we uh, saw that both in member states at the European level, there was a bit of a silos approach. So with Global Gateway, if you want, we uh, wanted to aggregate all the capacities, all the technical and financial means of the European institution and member state in order to be, let's say, more visible, more credible, uh, more impactful with our uh, partner countries. Therefore, we have uh, proposed a, an offer which focused on uh, hard infrastructure, However, doesn't neglect, let's say, what we call soft component, regulatory environment, policy making, uh, let's say, all what has to do business environment, etc. The area of uh, attention are climate and energy, digital, transport, health, education and research. So these are, let's say, big uh, uh, areas of intervention where we are going to focus. And let's say the novelties of this are the following. First of all, Team Europe. We were already working with member states in the past, so this is not new. But now really everything we do, we do together with member states from A to Z. So in our partner countries, we organize ourselves in order to have a coherent and synergetic approach. The second element is to use ODA as a official development assistance as catalytic resources, but in fact we want to go well beyond development uh, institution, financial institution, um, uh, banks like EIB, EBRD, and the bilateral one that we have in member states, export credit agencies. So to aggregate the capacities of all this uh, organization in order to, let's say, contribute to the achievement of our goals. But last and not least, the private sector. Because we know that we will not achieve SDGs uh, without the private sector. And we want to improve the way we connect the European private sector to what we do through our partnership. So that is, there are the key component. We have announced, uh, let's say, uh, 300 billion of resources that we will mobilize all together with member state between now and 2027. So there, are, there is no box where we find these 300 billions. This 300 billion is the combination of what we mobilize under our, uh, let's say, EU financial means, 18 billion in grants. We have some 54, 56 billion euro of guarantee capacity that we are mobilizing through the different financial institution in order to the risk investment. And then, as I said, all the leverage that these financial means will make available. For us, what is important is that, of course, uh, we need to organize this in the capital, so in our member state and in the partner countries where we work. So it's a learning process. I mean, it's not, you know, uh, that we can do this with the silver bullets. But for us, it is important that we aggregate this ecosystem of partners in order to be, as I said, more impactful in the countries. And of course, having sustainability at the core. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stefano. And I think it's very clear now with the not only ambition, but the concrete will from a Swedish perspective and European perspective to increase the international partnerships. So turning over to you, Beatrice, Rwanda has an ambitious climate agenda also in terms of circular economy. And could you just tell us a little bit about the progress and the situation that you are having in these areas? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think before I even touch into the progress we're making, uh, as we are talking about uh, sustainability and economic development, I think uh, for Rwanda, it has never been like environment and sustainability in this way and economic development in other ways. So it's interlinked. And this is something that we really uh, take to heart as Rwanda and we work hard on it. So we have developed different uh, strategies, different policies, and coming back to the circularity, the circular economy, we've even gone further to establish the circular economy uh, action plan so that we can really set and pave the way for businesses to thrive, actually, and to help businesses also develop, but not only developing as businesses for economic development, as I said, but also contributing to the sustainability. And with that, we are now trying to see how we can do the taxonomy roadmap for Rwanda so that we can help businesses to know what is green when it comes about the business. You can find people in energy saying their business is green, but what are the benchmark? What do you have as criteria to see that your business is green? So that is what we are doing. We are working with them. We are now trying to develop so that once we get uh, the taxonomy on board, we really know what we mean by a green business. So those are the policies that we are setting, the regulatory frameworks, the tools to really help us um, being as a hub and to position Rwanda as um, really a soft landing land where uh, a proof of concepts can work. So that is what we are doing in terms of policies. But again, something important is um, finance. However much you have good policies and regulatory frameworks, if you don't have finance to implement them, then yeah, you will not reach your objective. So we are also working on the finance, and um, you may all know that we have the Rwanda Green Fund, which was set since 20, since 10 years back. And it's really helping us to mobilize resources and to help the country also not really um, depending on sovereign debt. So we, we are trying to see how we can work to have green financing and also helping the country cut the debt. So, that's um, more or less what we have. It's never a linear way, but at least those are fundamentals to keep the bar uh, pushing. Thank you very much. Truly interesting. And Jacob, as the Director General for CEDA, you are a true enabler of this discussion. So what, what are your views on the business community in this sense and also towards both the Paris Agreement and the, the 2030 Agenda from what you heard here also? Thank you so much. Yes, um, I think for, for us, uh, a starting point is like our colleague from Rwanda. In Sweden, we are also implementing the taxonomy. We are doing the whole green transition in our country, which is a starting point. And as we heard from our uh, colleagues from the Federation of, of Industries, we have some knowledge about this and we are struggling also with it. We are working on it together with, within the EU and, and in Sweden. So that is an important uh, starting point. And uh, the agency I represent has for over 60 years done sort of traditional development aid to a large extent. That means grant financing to different uh, perspectives of development in terms of creating an enabling environment for subsequent investments and also doing direct investments in health or trade or other aspects. Now, over the past uh, 10, 10, 15 years, this has changed quite a lot. So there's been much more focus on how to leverage more financing for investment, because the realization is, of course, we do not have enough grant financing to try to support uh, countries abroad, beyond Europe and Sweden, to, to reach this target of a, of a, of a green transition. Uh, a just green transition. So this is a stepwise approach. And just yesterday, uh, our government actually launched a new strategy, which is called the Swedish Foreign Trade Investment and Global Competitiveness Strategy, with three objectives, competitiveness and trade, increased export, and also that Sweden should be the priority partner in this green transition. 
and this is signal because traditionally that had been only directed to our export credit agencies, but now it's actually directed also to our agency. So we are uh, working very much in a Team Sweden approach to see how can we create also an offer, which is a Swedish offer in terms of enabling environment, capacity building, and then creating uh, opportunities for transactions higher up in the value chain. Uh, not breaking ODA uh, DAC rules, but using development where it fits best. And as our colleague explained, the Global Gateway, this is more or less a Swedish gateway. It is the same type of logic, because most countries actually are, are looking at this now. How can we leverage more? And an example of that, so I just uh, I was very proud. I just came from a meeting with the Inter-American Development Bank, where we have provided Sweden our largest guarantee ever, 250 million US dollars that will be doubled in terms of investment in the Amazon basin. All projects for health, uh, for sustainable forest management, for uh, biomass, also the whole uh, economic green transition. So that's an example how one can utilize aid today and leverage more, double, triple the balance sheet of these uh, development banks, which is one way of dealing with it. So there, there's been a step by approach, and, and, and just, just to finish off, uh, we had also back in 2016, I think this sort of logic started, and, and, and the agency worked very closely together with the industries, private sector, and developed something called the Sustainable Leaders Network for, for, for development. And uh, that's been ongoing, and I think the whole idea was to see how can we work, how can we learn more of the needs of the industry, and private sector, and what can we provide in terms of you know, creating the groundwork for that. And uh, I'm very happy to, to, to know now and, and hear that, that actually the Confederation of Enterprises will, will, will move and take over the torch of this uh, leadership, and we will contribute to that, obviously, more and more as a team Sweden, and then also hopefully uh, you know, within the broader global gateway thinking and logic. So I am there, thanks. Thank you very much, Jacob. And it's really exciting news that this platform, the Swedish Leadership for Sustainable Development, will now be driven by the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. So, uh, Jan Olof, from what you heard, what are your views now? Well, um, well, I think it's a perfect fit, actually, with the announcement of the new uh, trade strategy uh, as, as well. And uh, so thank you, Jacob, for handing over uh, the, uh, the, the coordination and, and, and the ownership to us. I mean, we will continue to do it closely uh, together. Clearly, we have um, a long tradition of sustainable development and sustainable uh, business. I think, though, with the new strategy and working even closer together, we definitely see uh, a clear potential to strengthen the, the opportunities from, uh, from the combination of, of sort of aid and, and trade. Um, when we push this forward, we will make sure that uh, we involve all sectors, all businesses in our, uh, in, in our future work of the Swedish Leadership for Sustainable Development. It will basically mirror the organization we already have with all sizes of companies, uh, all sectors included. But we will try to do even more because we had sessions this morning with a very exciting uh, climate uh, tech companies of all sorts. Uh, and, and, and those are typically not our members, uh, but it's equally important that we involve them in this piece of work. But we want to be a platform and a network to understand what is it that companies really need and how can we really maximize the opportunities for the companies to the better for the companies and for the, uh, the countries they operate in. So look forward to this quite a lot. A good first example could be Global Gateway to sit down with a, a selected number of companies across all sizes and types of businesses to figure out how can we actually get our act together to be an active part of the Global Gateway. So I, I very much look forward and thank you for handing it over. And I think that's a perfect segue to you. So what would you say about that, actually working towards an even closer collaboration with the Swedish business community, the European, and then with the strategic partnership countries? So please, Stefano. So uh, let me perhaps stress the fact that um, while we have this uh, global gateway as a framework, 
uh, we work uh, primarily through uh, program at country level. So, of course, for us it's very important the coordination on the ground, as I said, in a team of spirit, but also with all the different uh, partners, in order to have, as I said, a, a coherent and impactful approach in the countries. But we also have a number of initiatives which can have, let's say, a regional or continental uh, approach. Whenever, of course, this brings uh, an added value and, uh, and increase the impact we can have. So let me perhaps mention a couple of those where uh, Sweden is involved. For instance, the first one I would mention is on energy, because we have uh, been working with our member state and with the African Union institution on an Africa-Europe Green Energy Initiative. By the way, this afternoon there will be, um, let's say, an event uh, that uh, is hosted in the Africa Pavilion. And uh, Sweden is part of the 12 member state that is participating in this uh, green energy initiative. So, of course, we are collecting all the data from member state about the projects, about the intervention that uh, they are conducting, and of course, SIDA obviously has, has a big role in that. Um, and second one is Young Business in Africa. This is also an initiative that basically aims at spurring and supporting, let's say, uh, young entrepreneurs uh, in the continent. And also on that, there are a lot of links with what Sweden is doing. So, of course, for the benefit of time, I will not mention too many. But let's perhaps uh, conclude on the fact that uh, as I said, in the end, what matters is really sustainable investment in the countries. And of course, sustainable investment comes from the development world, from the finance world, uh, from the point of view of trade facilitation and support. And the challenge we all have is to connect all these worlds, huh? the different instruments, the different communities, uh, in order to maximize the impact. Knowing that the countries face challenges in terms of, you know, uh, macroeconomic balance, debt issues in a geopolitical context, which is not easy. But of course, we need to, at the same time, increase uh, the mobilization of finance in support of those objectives, but also have sustainability at the core. So we need to do, at the same time, more, but also different. And for that, we need to mobilize everybody around the same objective. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stefano. And Beatrice, from what you heard, are, are you already familiar with some kind of collaboration ongoing with the Swedish business community, or at least the European? And what do you foresee? What, which way could we go? Well, um, coming from the Africa and from Rwanda, I think what we have is the young generation. And this is an asset. This is an asset for us. And one of the collaboration we have for, with the Sweden, actually, is, um, you, you know, the Norskan House, which was in Stockholm, and the second hub is in Rwanda, in Kigali, the Norskan House. Okay. So it's a hub where we have the young generation coming to turn their innovative minds into real actions, into real businesses. And those businesses are sustainable businesses going from the circular economy to finance to innovative tools in the green economy, in uh, green and clean energy. So I, I think those are the kind of collaboration we are looking forward to see with uh, the EU kit and with the uh, Sweden and with many other European maybe um, private sectors so that they can come train those young ones and then also sharing the technology sharing the technology although we have the green taxonomy which we are developing we need to tell them what is green what is not green what are the um, the criteria for their green businesses we still need technology to use into their businesses so I think this is one of the major and one of the more um, collaboration areas where we can really start so uh, starting with the young generation, bringing technology, I think those are the two things that I can say where we need really uh, collaboration with the countries. Thank you, Beatrice. And we had opportunity to be part of the inauguration in Kigali of the Norwegian House. And this vibrant energy and also what we've been speaking about here, the opportunity, that's what was everything was all about, I would say. And then, Jacob, hearing all this and with your views, what, what are your comments now? 
Yes, thank you. I mean, as we clearly hear from our colleague in Rwanda and from, from the Enter Confederation of Enterprises, there's a very big appetite for doing more in terms of these investments in the sustainable development field to create opportunities, better livelihoods, and also, in a sense, uh, rescue our planet where we can do that. But there are a lot of risks involved. There are financial risks, there are political risks, there are other types of security risks these days. So I think what we need to do collectively is to ensure that we mitigate those risks. And that's, that's part of the job uh, globally for, for us as, as government agencies. So that's, that's the first point. And, 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 and we are, as I said, we are exploring what type of financial instruments would make sense in this case. We don't have all of them yet in place. We are working with them. The gov our government is also providing new uh, tools for us uh, that we can develop more. And the EU is, is, is doing that as well. And finally, a third step, but I think we, 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 we also need to do, and which we are doing now, is to share information. Because we are, uh, as a small country, we are also providing a lot of opportunities financing through our multilateral development banks, where we are shareholders. And sometimes it's very difficult to understand how procurement works and so forth for Swedish interest in that space. And for others as well. So we will, as, as we are present in, in, in these banks as governments, we are working with the EU, we will also make sure we can put that information up and make it uh, uh, available for, for colleagues with Business Sweden, with the Swedish Institute and others. So that's the third step that I think we, we can do to support this and reduce the risks for more investments. Thanks. I hear a lot of concrete measures being mentioned here. And Janola, would you like to comment, please? Uh, just to sh a brief reflection from, from uh, sorry, from uh, listening. Um, one is the very strong similarities of uh, logic and reasoning in terms of sustainability, in terms of how to drive development, you know, regardless of it being uh, European countries or in this case uh, Rwanda. It's, it's striking how, how similar the, the mindset that really is. And, and the second uh, uh, sort of remark or reflection is how we think about developing cooperation and how we think about the climate challenge. There are a lot of similarities uh, between the two. They have a lot of common, in common. And, and what strikes me is that in both cases, it's entirely possible to do good and to make business. That's a very important statement. And since we have a few more minutes, I also give the floor to you, Stefano, related to this, your insights, that you, reflections now. Well, I think that we have already said, of course, that we need to do more and to do better. I think that from our side, what we want to do is to focus on areas which are, let's say, uh, good for climate, environment, uh, social aspect, but also that it creates jobs uh, and growth. So, for instance, you know, uh, today is a day where um, important pledges are going to be made on renewable energy and energy efficiency. This is an area where we are convinced that that uh, not only this is good for, for the planet and for the ecosystem, but also it can create jobs uh, for the countries to create expertise, to create a domestic supply chain. Perhaps let me just focus on this last aspect, because I think that uh, this uh, green revolution can work only if it creates a domestic supply chain. It cannot fly if it is exclusively relying on imports from other countries. So whenever there are opportunities to develop domestic supply chains, we are always happy to support and to identify those opportunities, of course, in full cooperation with the countries. Thanks. Thank you. And from you, Beatrice, a short reflection? The short one is, um, as Stefano said, we are in a green revolution. And it's no longer about policy makers, it's no longer about the public, but it's more on the private sector now. We want to bring in the private sector to help us really implement the policies, but also doing good by doing business when they're doing green as well. So I, I think that would be the takeaway for me. Thank you very much. And then, actually, just one very quick, yes, from you, Jacob. We need to, to stop. Uh, very quick, I think we, we are see, seeing innovation in partnerships. That's what we are doing. Private sector, development sector, partnering with you, between you and other countries. And I think that's the real in, fantastic change that we are experiencing right now for one common cause. Thanks.
Thank you very much. And I think that was a perfect ending of this session. So thank you to this distinguished panel. So with all these new insights, we are now ready also to hear from three Swedish companies with concrete solutions. So may I please welcome now uh, Johan Söderström from Hitachi Energy and Anna Selsing from Alfa Laval and Jonas Gustafsson from Afri. So please join me on stage. We heard a lot about all the opportunities, and I know that the, all three of you are actually already engaged in great collaborations. So if I start with you, Johan, could you please mention some concrete examples? Uh, of collaboration between um, Alfa Laval, Leifri, and, and Hitachi Energy, or? Oh, if you want, but more no. specifically in the local context. In, in the local context yeah. of developing countries. Yeah, exactly. No, we do a lot in, in Africa, as an example. Um, we do the upgrade of high voltage direct current links. We have one particular one in, in Congo, re, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we installed the first HVDC link to connect the hydropower and the mining 40 years ago. Now we upgrade that one in a, in a very good way. Uh, we do a connection to the grid of solar power in Angola, uh, very successfully, also supported by Team Sweden, uh, with the Export Credit Agency making finance. Uh, we also are in the making or collaborate more with Linda Poulson, Head of Energy in AFRI, because we see that Jonas and, and, and Linda and the team, they do a lot in Africa. We also do a lot in Africa, but combined we can do more because the planning phase is super important. With Alfa Laval, we also do a lot, uh, and we do a lot with, with, with a number of, 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 of um, companies. But I'll come back to that in the second question. So you actually answered both, what you do together and what you do in the local context. We were behind perfect. schedule, that was why we speeded up. Thank you. <laughs> but you are perfect. Thank you. So Anna and Alfa Laval, please. Yes. Uh, I, uh, then I could take the global context, uh, maybe, as technology leaders of heat transfer, fluid handling, and separation. Uh, we both have, I think, a role to be leaders, front runners, when it comes to creating a demand, uh, being first movers, for example, for fossil free steel. And that's very important as green premium. There's often a green premium to the new technologies that we need to see happen. And we need to be the first ones driving that demand. Then secondly, I would say that it's very important also that we can share the awareness and knowledge that we have. Uh, for example, on energy efficiency, like International Energy Agency says, we need to triple renewables, we need to also double energy efficiency, and we need to f uh, f uh, phase out fossil free or fossils. So then energy efficiency and all that we know, we can share, uh, and we do together with ABB and others in first mover, or in the energy efficiency movement, uh, having also open source Resources for tools, how you can uh, visualize your energy savings, etc. So it's also a very important aspect. Thank you very much. Such a great example. And then Jonas, please, from yes. your side. <laughs> yes, Afri. Uh, then, you know, energy sector, as uh, Johan said, with Linda now leading the energy division at Afri, we have 20,000 engineers. And we have been active in Europe, Africa, Middle East, Latin America, Asia for many, many years. And of course, with the Nordic know-how in uh, energy transition, that's where we really play an important role globally. And to pick one, one technology that we believe in is ways to energy. And we have been implementing 135 plans all over the world. And uh, currently we have like 10 ongoing in, 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 uh, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia. And we have one, for example, just to highlight one example in Malaysia. So what we do is that replacing, so instead of using waste for, for landfill, you actually put them into the system and you burn them instead then. And like in the Nordic, we use them for district heating, but here you can actually then replace fossil fuel and uh, this is really something we believe in and this one 52 megawatt i believe it is will actually then have like 90,000 households so waste to energy is one technology and again 135 products all over the world and we will continue to to accelerate that so that's one example of nordic technology that have an impact globally 
Thank you very much. And the big theme for this pavilion is urgency and opportunity. And we know that we need to increase the speed. And then I also need to ask the three of you about the prerequisites, if we could do even more. So, John, uh, Johan, coming, coming to you, what would you say, how could we scale this even faster and in, in even a better way? We, we, we have the predictability. And working for Itachi Energy, I feel very blessed with um, a fantastic super cycle. But I also feel that many other companies have a different situation because of the economic downturn here and there, and the interest rates being high and inflation, etc. But uh, uh, the electricity is needed four times. It will grow uh, until 2050 minimum. So generation of power, clean energy, like nuclear, like uh, wind, like solar, uh, like uh, offshore wind, onshore wind, um, wave energy, etc. is needed. But then the power grid starts to be super important, and we are in the making of that uh, to make sure that that's happening. And uh, we see um, a fantastic growth. So we need to collaborate with the best partner on the customer side. We need to collaborate with the best partner on the supply side and collaborate also within the industry in order to save the planet. So competition will be different than it used to be. To compete about single products, it will be more long-term, and we see that happening now, with many customers allowing us to have longer-term perspective, frame agreements, not only in the private sector, also in the public sector. So we are scaling up as we speak, and um, we go for it. Younger generation, Beatrice, you made a very important point. The younger generation has sustainability and digital in the DNA. We also see a big uptick in what we do in Africa, for instance, where we have a fantastic young generation coming into play. I can make an example. We have an energy trade risk management software, and we are the best in the world out of South Africa and the Southern Africa of a global company like Itachi Energy. So Africa is not behind. Africa can also lead, and I think that is important as a global company to understand. Thank you very much. And Anna? Please. Yes, I think uh, it's very important for us to also speed up things, to help to show the business case, uh, to show that it's, for example, a business case to make things more operationally effective, uh, like, again, energy efficiency, because then you can go and get the funding. Otherwise, you won't. You have to show the numbers and the data behind your words to be able to get the funding for all the investments that are needed. So that's a very important. On top of, I think, the strong partnerships between us here on stage and others. That's uh, very important. Thank you very much. And Jonas, please. Oh, um, just to echo what you said, and so partnership, and we, we made a new one, you one partnership. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, to, for, for us then, to, to be local present, but also being able to scale, scale our global expertise. And of course now, with using all the digital models we can do, we can actually do that in a more efficient way. To actually use, to have the technology that we, we have in the Nordics and scale that also in developing countries. And for us also, it also means that you may need to make a long-term commitment in the country. Uh, and normally when we do these projects, we are present in the country maybe 30 years. So to really understand the, the culture, the financial framework, uh, that is for us crucial to make these projects successful. So long-term commitment in the country. So that means that we need to maneuver in a complex world. So how do you move into not only ways to energy, like hydropower, which is a very important source of energy, but also could be very complicated. So how do you maneuver in a complex segment like hydropower in many, many countries? And do that in a responsible way is also very, very important for us. But we believe a lot in scaling globally in energy, and we will continue to do that. Thank you very much. And we heard from Jacob Grunit earlier on about de-risking, and you've been mentioning it a lot, that the will and the energy is there to really drive this. But do you have any more recommendations in terms of de-risking now when we are really trying to collaborate even better between the business community and different sectors? So in terms of de-risking. I, I say, can say two words, um, building on what Jonas just said, um, when we select um, uh, to play in different countries. We don't want to put two persons in a country, we rather put 20. And we rather think long term and we rather build from there with local partners and also global partners. And that's been a good recipe and then we really can be a social contributor and, and we have the, the local people then taking the lead of the companies, etc. And, and then, uh, then, then we have a very good history, history on, on, on track record of that. And then we become local everywhere and we get the global, global scale as well. 
So perfect. And Anna? Yeah, I think um, almost echoing you say, Johan, that we need to have an ecosystem of reliable, long-term committed partners. That's the most important thing for us. And that's also a lot in our own hands, I would say, uh, to create that, like here at COP, for example. Thank you very much. And, and just, oh, just to echo, and I think uh, put opportunity, probably because we have probably all been acting globally for many years, but maybe act globally together more is an opportunity uh, more now that we have this ecosystem of technology that we could actually combine and go together globally would be good potential. And I think that we should actually conclude, but at least I am so convinced now that we have the collaboration from different actors, different sectors, and different geographies. That's what we heard from, and that we have definitely been discussing concrete measures and solutions. So thank you very much. Welcome to today's uh, session, The Future of Reducing Scope 3 Emissions. Uh, I'm Cassandra Julin, I'm heading PR and Communications at Normative, and I will guide you through this panel conversation today. But before we get started, let's take a look at the current situation. One of the biggest issues today is that you cannot see carbon. I was at an event on Thursday where there was this man from the mangroves who was saying, I have a couple of sacks, why don't we pick up the carbon? If it was that easy, we would have solved the problem already. Because it's only when you see carbon that you can actually do something about it and reduce it. So, talking to this group about the planetary imperative is probably pointless because we all are here because we know why we need to do this. And we have the regulatory imperative. Legislation is coming, not only in Europe and UK who has been leading the way for a long time, but also the US, also African countries are adopting to carbon legislation. And then of course there's the business imperative. Those that stay ahead of the curve will size the business opportunity associated with net zero. And what we're seeing today is that carbon accounting isn't just a tick-to-box compliance exercise anymore. It's actually a reductions race for businesses. And this quote makes it crystal clear. Companies that use climate data to build real reduction initiatives outperform those that don't by a factor of 2.4%. So with that, now you know the situation, let's have our experts up with us to start the panel discussion. So welcome, we have uh, Christian Run, CEO and co-founder of Normative. We have Bridget hoyer gusling Director AI and Sustainability at Google, and Kaya Axelsson, Head of Policy and Partnerships at Oxford Net Zero. Let's give them a round of applause. And I will switch the microphone to make myself a little bit more movable. Um, so today we're going to tackle how enabling how enabling technology will provide seamless exchange of carbon data. We will talk about how businesses can adjust for data exchange and decarbonize the economy, and how standardization and policy are key, uh, has a key role in the net zero transition. Let's start with you, Christian. Uh, are we on track to reach net zero? Um. I mean, the simple answer is no, we're not track, on track to reach net zero. I think we, we all know about it. Uh, I mean, we are far behind, um, but I think we all know about sort of the gap in terms of the NDCs and where they take us. Uh, it looks like they will take us towards 2.7 degrees, which is way too much. Uh, but at Normative, we ask this, ourselves the question, where does corporate commitments bring us? Uh, so we looked at, uh, uh, 970 companies approximately.
ultimately with the net zero commitments to look at uh, what percentage of global emissions do those commitments uh, amount to. And turns out that if all of these companies succeed with their net zero targets, it would reduce approximately 78% uh, of global emissions. Uh, so there's a strong ethical imperative, but also a business imperative, as Cassandra talked about earlier, uh, to help these companies go towards uh, net zero emissions. Uh. That sounds uh, surprisingly positive, Christian. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But before that, Bridget, what role does technology play in terms of solving the climate crisis? A big one. Um, I'm probably not surprising to hear that from someone at Google, but I think we are starting to see just now not just what the potential of technology is, but real impacts from new solutions. Um, recently, we were uh, we published a report with BCG that shows that AI, in particular, could potentially help to mitigate five to ten uh, percent of greenhouse gas emissions through better measurement and monitoring, through uh, solutions that actually help to optimize and and maybe better monitor monitor the grid, uh, and then even in new scientific breakthroughs, right? I get excited about new materials that are being developed as well as uh, uh, trials that are happening in terms of optimizing potential fusion pathways. Might be, might be possible, might be not, but certainly something that we need to try. We also know that data is critical to this conversation and thinking about what we, as you said, Cassandra, do and don't know about where emissions are coming from and how we can actually importantly monitor the change that's happening in emissions. I think we've gotten a little bit better at seeing, okay, we, we maybe have a picture of what's there today, but we don't necessarily always have a picture of what that change will look like or the ability to do scenario planning and really understand what our actions could could result in downstream. And I think you know, we have the scientific models you talked about, sort of the temperature models, uh, but also just really helping to make those things real so that people have the tools that they need, corporate actors, government actors, to be able to see uh, what, their, what their actions could actually drive. And I think, you know, obviously, one of the things that Normative does so well is really help put those tools in the hands of small businesses who, as you said, are such an important part of the value chain, such an important part of the emissions calculation, but also you know, extremely distributed. So we at Google, we have a commitment to be 24-7 carbon free by 2030. We also have a massive team of folks working on that. We have energy experts. We have folks kind of all around here who are able to engage in that. And we have corporate buying power that really helps us to do that work well. That's not true for the, the you know, millions of actors really around the world who are critical to getting us to that path. And so equipping them with tools, data and information is absolutely critical to getting us there. I love that, and especially like you're talking about the purchasing power, because you create those business incentives and business opportunities for your supply chain to decarbonize themselves. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the data for you, Bridget, as well. Uh, you talk, touched upon data. What about the data exchange? What role does that play, being able to transfer data and exchange it between different uh, uh, parties? Yeah, such a good question, because I think that, you know, one of the things that you, know, you can go to any pavilion probably here right now and someone's talking about some new data portal or platform or a new map, or maybe that's just the sessions that I go to, but that seems to be the case. And it's critical that we're doing that work in on these specific topics, right? We need specific data for scope three emissions. That's very different than the data that we need, you know, maybe at a macro level to help NDC commitments and the tracking there. But these things should ideally speak to each other and give us a chance to, to build that global picture, to connect the global to the local, to connect to the big corporate to the small business, and that requires more interoperability, it requires more openness, right, and ability to actually put that data out there, obviously in a way that works for folks, and I think we need more efforts that are going to continue to, to do that. Um, one of those uh, projects that we've built at Google is uh, called Data Commons. It's a new platform um, that we brought that essentially allows for that relatively seamless work of creating d data pools that can interoperate really on the back end. So it's not something that requires then a lot of work. We actually host kind of a lot of the infrastructure. And then um, one of the things I'm really excited about is with new AI tools, we've actually created a natural language front end to that. So you can simply query that data using the question that you would want to ask without needing to have data science expertise. And I think that's the other barrier, right? When we think about data exchange, right now you might need to have, you know, a lot of time either, right, to comb through pages and pages of often static reports. I mean, we've all seen the climate reports coming out from UNFCCC and the like, and it's a lot to digest for anyone, much less someone who isn't an expert. 
And then you also either have, to have perhaps data science expertise, right, an ability to actually manipulate that. And so I think I'm also excited about not just what AI can do in terms of modeling and data, but also actually increasing the accessibility of that data because data on its own is not in and of itself useful unless it's accessible as well. Thank you. I have to jump back to Christian on a follow-up question on that, specifically on the data exchange, because there's also something that normative works with. What are you seeing are the major challenges with the data exchange and the major benefits, uh, and why do we need this on a kind of high-scale level from, from your opinion? I think we need that data exchange to have integrity in the entire system. So, I mean, if you look at the system of carbon accounting that you have today, I mean, funds are signed up to net zero targets, but in order for them to track and monitor the progress on those net zero targets, it requires companies within those portfolios to report on their carbon emissions. But companies, most of that emission will be estimated, but those companies that actually report on emission, uh, they will need to know the emission of all of the purchased goods and services and, and other categories of scope three that they're buying. So in other words, like we don't have the product data, which means that we don't have the corporate data, which means that we don't have the integrity of the investment portfolio data. So fundamentally what we need is sort of the process level data and that data to be exchanged because scope three, which usually amounts to 90% of any corporate's emissions, it's, it's not really rocket science. If you look at the data and zoom in on it, like 25% of scope three emissions will be from different electricity processes in the value chain. And we know how to solve for that. I mean, we we not just need to invest in, in renewable electricity, 12% uh, or so will be road transportation. We need to invest in uh, electrification of those transportations. So we need that core data exchange to happen across global value chains to actually know where to invest and take the right level actions. And then we can buy, build a harmonized system where uh, the products of a company adds up to the total corporate footprint that then adds up to the investor uh, corporate footprints, but, but now it's a little bit of a mess. Um. Yes, I mean, we often talk about that sustainability managers, they want to get the most bang for the buck in terms of their sustainability activities. And in order to do that, you need that data in place and you need that, uh, we often talk about the ac actionable insights from businesses. Um, Kaya, moving to you, what about standardization? What's the playing field out there for companies uh, operating on a global scale? I mean, I, I think that one thing I have to say as someone who works on standardization is that it's a mess. You know, companies are really struggling with hundreds of different reporting frameworks in the voluntary landscape. And that is because we haven't yet gotten to the regulatory aims that we need to. We need to move from a voluntary system to a regulated system. And I think it's one of the really exciting places where you see businesses calling for more government action. They're saying, can we please cut through the maze of reporting frameworks, whether that be qualitative or quantitative. Um, and it's not just reporting. I think we, ought, we have to remember, we're at COP28 and we're still talking about reporting, but reporting is the first step. Um, really, we need to be fully embracing transition plans, and we need to have transition plans that are using common templates between companies, but that can't just be a plan. It's how do you assess that? So where's the money? Where's the capital expenditure? How do you know that the plan is in action? And I think that we need to go even one step beyond a net zero transition plan and think beyond inventories. This is something I've been looking at a lot. Scope 3 is, of course, critical to look at. But Scope 3 was invented because it was actually an environmentalist who wrote the Greenhouse Gas Protocol and realized we need to do this together. We're not going to be able to do this alone in kind of individual corporations. And so that's why you see all of these categories where you know companies are like, well, is that my responsibility or is that your responsibility? That was intentional, right? The point is that we're supposed to work together. But we're not doing a good job now, I think, in the standards landscape of incentivizing companies to use the levers at their disposal, which is often their products, their political leverage, their voice in society, because we have no standard currently for capturing climate solutions or what a company could offer to the world. And that's because 
it's often the case that companies try to stick stuff like avoided emissions or investment in credits into their inventories where it doesn't really belong because that's accounting. And so it's my feeling that the standards landscape is very well developed in terms of the kind of inventory that we need to have, but it needs to be more creative in terms of how we incentivize businesses to use their power. You can keep the mic for another second because I'd love to know what stakeholders, I'm not going to say are responsible for this, but what stakeholders do, do we need in order to succeed with this in your opinion, Kaya? I think we need companies really sticking their head above the pulpit to call on governments for interoperable, cross-jurisdictional, cross-domain coordination on regulation. And I think that it's a pivot point that we're seeing where companies are already starting to do that. There's already, I think, a dozen companies that have put videos out at this COP calling for that. There may be a task force on policy and regulation that's announced sometime around this COP. There's, we're in the process, we're in the turn. But we're also, if we're being honest, seeing a very ugly backlash against anything that looks like it's squeezing companies. And that is ideological. Because if you actually are working with the companies, which, you know, at this point, over 50% of the Forbes 2000 list has a net zero target. And they want these interoperable standards. So they want that regulation. And then there's this tiny minority, mostly from my country and from the US, of anti-ESG folks who are saying, we never want to be regulated. Regulation squeezes business, business is good for people. And I just don't think that that's a very nuanced perspective on what regulation can offer. Regulation can create certainty, drive investment, improve our understanding of where we're all going in a common direction. And that's the message that I'd like us to all kind of take away from this COP and connecting it back to the NDCs. You're right that 2.7 is where we would go if we were to meet our NDCs, but those NDCs are not backed by sufficient policy and regulation. So that's what we're tracking. Thank you, Kaya. And again, I'm just reverting back to the business opportunity that we spoke to that I, I love the way you see the positive side of regulation and the kind of benefits in terms of certainty, but it also creates this new business playing field that, uh, you know, new businesses can thrive. Uh, Christian, we touched upon, you know, that there is a very positive situation going on right now with all of these commitments in place, but we also talk about a business execution gap. Can you elaborate on that and what that means and, and what the issue is right now for businesses in the transition? So I mentioned earlier that if uh, enterprises that are actually committed to net zero uh, achieve their net zero targets, it would cut a significant part of global emissions. Uh, and it sounds too good to be true because it basically is. I mean, right now, when you look at the data, a lot, a very few businesses are actually tracking their value chain emissions in scope three properly. Uh, only 30% uh, of companies, according to our, our recent research, is, is actually doing that properly. Uh, so that presents the type of execution gap. And to build on what Kaya was saying, uh, I mean, we need measuring carbon emissions is sort of the first step. I mean, that's what we're trying to do at Normative with the carbon network and like and businesses so they can see like where what are the main sort of levers in terms of using their purchasing power or investment power uh, in, in order to reduce emissions across these global value chains uh, but you can't do so unless there is sort of an incentive environment and regulatory environment where, where, where that happens uh, so I think the business execution gap uh, we need these net zero transition plans it needs to be based on scope 3 data that is accurate and most uh, importantly actionable, uh, and we need uh, regulation for, for a lot of that to, to actually happen. Yes, and there's a lot of numbers being thrown around today, but you know, if 88% of a business emissions are located in the value chain, and in a recent study that we did, 200 uh, sustainability leaders from enterprises in EU and the UK showed that 70 plus percent aren't reporting on their scope three emissions. If you add these numbers up, 88% of your emissions are in the value chain and 70 plus aren't measuring that. We do have a problem in terms of reaching our climate targets. So, I mean, it's, it's positive with legislation, standardization, everything coming, but I do think we need to see the challenges that businesses are facing and help them on the way to get this right because it is extremely complex. Uh, Christian, I'm going to follow up with another question for you. Uh, what's the issue with carbon accounting overall today and how do you see it evolving in the future if you look into your little crystal bowl? So I did, uh, yeah, very, very easy question. No, so I did talk about that earlier, right? We need uh, harmonization. I mean, right now, uh, 
if you take the carbon emissions accounting of one uh, entity and try to compare it to another entity, it's not really comparable. It's not really correlated. They might have had different scoping in terms of what emissions and what business activities are included. They might have diff different definitions of like core entities. Uh, I mean, right now you don't sort of report on a legal entity identifier basis. Uh, but I think the core sort of thing and the core problem is, is to uh, really have that exchange of data across global value chains. If 90% of all my emissions are in my scope three uh, and I'm only doing spend-based estimates, uh, the only way to reduce my emissions is to spend less. And in most situations, you can't do that. It's not like you want to disassemble your business. The only way is to really work with your suppliers or if you're a bank or financial institution, work with your investment portfolios and loans portfolios. Uh, and you need to collaborate around this because if they succeed, uh, you succeed as well. And then tying it back to that question around the business execution gap. I mean, if we don't have that uh, sort of accuracy of, of, of data where you know what to focus on, it, it's very hard to, to execute and to take action. Yes, fully agree. Thank you for that, Christian. Um, Bridget, uh, how is AI and emerging technologies being used to address emissions data? I know you touched upon it a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, can you give any critical examples of such? Deep dive a little bit into the topic. Yeah, we, so I've touched on it a bit. I mean, we've, we start seeing progress, I think, on this across the board, right? So everything from global monitoring, there's a, a project, a coalition of, of researchers and nonprofits from around the world have come together to build called Climate Trace, which provides now real-time emissions monitoring globally. This is something that we were able to help them uh, get started now five plus years ago and has grown tremendously. It's they're now tracking every source of anthropo uh, anthropo uh, <laughs> Human, human, there we go, I'll use the real words, uh, of human emissions uh, globally. They're now able to do it at an asset level, so at a point source level, and tomorrow, uh, preview for them, they'll be announcing kind of the next layer of data, and they're just continuing to add to that. You know, this is replacing, you have to remember where we've been in this, right? We've been in a state where we were looking at old data from years ago, trying to understand the emissions while we're trying to urgently address this problem. We, wouldn't, we don't do that in business, right? We don't look at, we don't, act, we don't want to have data from four years ago to inform our actions today. And we certainly shouldn't be doing that on something so pressing here. So I'm, I'm tremendously excited about what that team's been able to do, and it's What's been really great about it is it's a combination of obviously satellite imagery, on the ground sensor data, you know, tons of data coming from many different sources. They've been very open in the process, so the methodology is public, you know, to this point on also trust and transparency. How do we sort of build a common understanding of what we're trying to do here with all the different factors uh, that we're all kind of uh, coming into this to make possible? And they're doing it in this coalition approach, which I think is critical, that we're actually building just one view of emissions globally across all sources, not a power plant source, a cement source, a source for you know, transport, and that means that we can continue to iterate and improve as we get better about understanding those pieces. So it's the kind of thing that I think AI uniquely unlocks, right? We have this new ability to actually take in that kind of planetary scale data, process it, and provide that kind of real-time point information. That's not something that we could literally have done without it. And now we've got an ability to act on that too. So I think that's you know that's sort of that big global example. I think there are lots of smaller examples happening. And you know, we just funded a project also in Sweden um, that, that Christian's been advising on. You know the work that you all are doing using AI kind of in tools and normative. But I think the more we 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 need to be bringing our most powerful tools to this problem, right? And so AI, as we continue to see the advancements here. One of the things that I hope people will continue to lean into is just what do we need to enable in the broader sector to make those tools really valuable? How do we harness this, um, this energy? And I think we're, we're here for the ride, so excited to, to see where it will go. Yes, and I can really echo on the timeliness as something we speak to a lot to at Normative. Uh, I had a conversation with a CSO at the large enterprise uh, quite recently, and she was saying, I don't want to sit and do my annual reporting and say, shoot, I missed my target again uh, for my net zero goals. You need that data and you need it actionable at the real point in time so that you can actually do something about it and meet your targets, work with these tweaks and adjustments, work with your value chain on a continuous basis. Um, Kaya, moving back to you, uh, and again, reporting is coming, like we're saying, all over the places, especially in Europe. What would you like to say to policymakers right now? What would you like to see happening in the future? I think we would like to see every jurisdiction 
work on passing legislation, or you can sometimes do this through an executive branch on procurement. So not just, I think Christian talked about how the power of companies and their procurement, think about the power of governments. I mean, I think that's like, 20% of GDP, if governments all made procurement policies that were in line with rigorous climate ambition and that they actually followed up on those standards, um, that would be a really powerful and I think under-discussed tool that governments have, but it's something that there are coalitions developing around. So the Net Zero Governments Initiative is about how governments themselves can go net zero, but it also has a procurement element. Um, and so I'm really excited to see them announce their plans. They passed some, uh, they kind of put the coalition together last COP, and they're going to announce how some of their procurement plans for governments are going. But of course, those approaches are different because every government has its own way of doing things. So I think we'd like to see them exchanging best practice and making sure that when you get kind of a procurement uh, questionnaire from a government over here, that you're getting the same one from, or, or and that that's all converging towards a high standard rather than the lowest common denominator. And we have to think about the climate justice perspective as with border carbon adjustment mechanisms, as with anything where you're making a cross-border recommendation or requirement, you need to be bringing in the voices of the international community, their capacity, their unique challenges, their perspective that, hey, you know, the continent of Africa is representing 4% of global historical emissions and you want us to be going first on this, you know, you need to be factoring in common but differentiated responsibility into our standards and policy, and that's not something we've done well historically, but I do think the international standardization system has a system for at least starting the consultation process. I think inclusivity could be improved in those processes, as it almost always can, because it has to be also about capacity building, make sure, making sure that those people are staffed to be a part of that process, but I know that there's folks in this room who work in those systems, and I really think that the international standardization system is a quiet inclusivity tool that we're not using enough in our regulation and policy. Thank you. And uh, we're getting a lot of smart insights here, and there's been a lot of stuff happening in, in the recent years when it comes to the carbon accounting space and reducing scope three emissions. We talked about AI and the acceleration. We talked about how the carbon accounting market is changing, moving from spend base to more activity and, and uh, primary data approaches. We talked about standardization. If you're looking into like two years back, where you were right then, what advice would you have given yourself in terms of what you need to do to reduce your scope three emissions? And I'll let you jump on it, whoever's hungry for the first answer. I can remind you that two years ago, we were at, in Glasgow at COP26, right? I, that, that is a very, very hard question. And I actually don't know quite what to answer, but I, I mean, this is a collaboration effort. And I think as you mentioned, Kaya, like the whole point with scope three is that realization. It's not about everyone asks about double counting when, when they ask about scope three accounting. And that is completely missing the point. There is a ton of double counting, but it's built into the system to highlight our shared responsibility. And I think, Bridget, when you mentioned your work together with Climate Trace, I mean, we have mapped out all of the assets across the world that releases carbon emissions. And we all indirectly, through our procurement or through our investments, have a relationship to those places. But if you see those assets on a map and you see their names, like, most of us have no clue who they even are or the fact that they exist. So we need that traceability throughout uh, our value chains. That's what we're trying to do with the carbon network. And we all need the collaboration to happen on top of that digital infrastructure because it's only by working together that we can solve this problem. And what's the advice related to that? Work together. Good. And would you give the same advice today, Christian? Yes. <laughs> well, that is quite reassuring Then we're heading in the right direction. Uh, does either of you have a different angle to this? Kaya, please go ahead. I'm going to disagree with Christian slightly. Yeah, he likes it. Um, so, so I agree that we need to work together, but we need to be smarter about how we do that. We've been playing this ridiculous game of telephone with our supply chains where we say, hey, Sarah, can I have some data? And then Sarah asks 12 down the chain if she can have some data. And then the data maybe comes back to us 12 years later or, you know, I'm being facetious, but it is actually 
a much bigger system problem and we need to a attack it the way we would, like system engineers. And we need to think, I think, actually I will be agreeing with Christian ultimately, that Trace and all these other projects have found nodes of significant emissions for us and we need to go to them first. But right now, our kind of holistic reporting and, and supply chain engagement strategy is basically to say, could you do everything at once right now? Instead of saying, hey, you're like a steel company. Could you decarbonize steel? That would help the whole cement and steel industry, right? Like that would help like the whole construction industry. And that would like be like our major scope three emissions for this industry could be like dealt with. So like maybe we could like advanced purchase some of your green steel. So I'm really excited about um, tools like advanced market commitments, right? These are like tools that have been used for things that we need in the world, like vaccines or like NASA uses them a lot for really like future casting technology, stuff that we need to like accelerate faster. If we could get coalitions of companies working together to be like, you know what, let's all work together to prioritize this bit of emissions right now, instead of just scattershot being like, everybody fill out this 20 page reporting form. Not that we shouldn't be filling out our reporting forms, we should, but they should also be standardized and regulated so there's just one. Um, yeah, that's, that's my take on supply chain management and how we should be doing it differently. I totally hear you. Do you want to... Yeah. I was going to comment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, so I mean, but basically what you're saying is we need both the exchange of data in a harmonized and standardized way, but we also need to standardize action. Like, here are the specific things that we are asking you to do, and here is how we're all doing that together. Uh. Yeah, I just this, couldn't agree more that I think that, you know, we're asking people to do a lot of things in isolation, or they feel that. That is a felt experience of of everyone is sort of, we have to run and decarbonize, even though this is a system that's obviously operating all the time. Um, and this is an area too where, this is not happening yet, but if anyone wants to work on this, uh, you know, we have actually the history, we know what people have been doing. We actually know a lot about the actions that people are taking. People at, in the last five years, since these commitments started to get made, are progressively working towards these different, um, these different pathways to, to decarbonize in their work. And we actually haven't done a lot, I think, to analyze what people are doing and share that across. You know, what is the entire sector of you know, X industry doing and how might they learn from each other? Not in a sharing of best practices way, but in an actual, like, can we analyze those disclosure reports? What is, what is sitting in the database of reporting that, you know, as you said, is so diffuse right now that we're also not learning from and could learn from? I think it's another place where, frankly, especially with the new language models that we have, could be done pretty easily. I mean, nothing's that easy, but relatively easily to then to fixing the problems we need to fix on climate, that's for sure. Loving the positivity here. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. Um, the last question that I'd like to ask you all is what recommendation would you give to businesses out there now that is ready to get started? You know, a lot of them have to do it because regulation dictates them to do so. But then there's also the business opportunity to get started now. And I know we're preaching a little bit to the choir here, everyone being at COP28 being committed to the cause. But still, what would you say to them, Bridget? I guess just get started. I don't, I don't know. I don't have a very specific thing, but I do think that, um, I mean, I guess I'll pick up on you said, Kai, is I think actually like not all actions are created equal. And so I think, and I think sometimes, you know, you get in this act mode and, and we're human, right? We want to get the A on the test. We want to get the hundred percent, right? Like we're going to go there and we're going to go tick off every box when actually all those boxes, you know, one small box could be worth all of the points. Um, and so I think thinking about it in that kind of more data-driven way, understanding what emissions are coming from different aspects, prioritizing that action is critical. It's why we at Google have spent so much time over the past two decades now almost really working on energy because we know that as, as a company for ourselves, but also in general, that's obviously critical, decarbonizing the grid, investing in that type of clean energy purchasing so that we could decarbonize our own work, but also, of course, in turn, that, that helps everyone. Those are the types of big levers we need, and I think every business has action actions that they can take that are probably more useful than others and really thinking about that feels important. Kaya. Yeah, I 
I'm going to say another controversial thing, which is that I think um, in line with what everyone has said, thinking not as an individual who's like purchasing credits in a market, but thinking as like an actor that can build partnerships to create like a powerful purchasing coalition or a political coalition. I think that's the way, like we, we need to move faster and we can't do it through sort of piecemeal market signals anymore. And I think that's something that like a lot of the economists that I, I work with and a lot of the folks who really dig into like the voluntary carbon market, for example, are starting to come to terms with that um, we need a more outcomes, if the market was better, if it was a more outcomes based organized and regulated market, then we could be doing it that, it that way. But um, I think a lot of companies are still doing a lot of work where they're like trying to do bring down their scope one and scope two and they're doing their, their efficiency stuff and the low hanging fruit and the light bulbs and everything and then they're like and now we'll invest in some carbon credits and I have to say that is like not bad but it is not going to get us to net zero it is absolutely not going to get us to net zero so thinking as a systemic player and seeing yourself as part of the solution and knowing that your business model is going to evolve with the greatest economic transition of our time i mean it's, it's a small ask thank you christian um so my recommendation would be be like Netflix, don't be like Blockbuster. And what I mean by that more specifically is that emissions reduction and net zero is no longer just a compliance tick exercise. It is a reduction race. You need to get the job done. Uh, and as Joan Rockstrom usually says, you can't negotiate with nature. We need to do something about it and we will do something about it. So this is, as you said, Kaya, like one of the biggest transformations in history. So what side do you want to be on with that transformation? Do you want to be like a blockbuster that didn't follow on with the transformation of, of digitization of, of digital media? Or do you want to be like Netflix? Uh, and you can make that decision right now, uh, depending on how you prioritize and the strategi strategic direction that you set. So I would say build a clear theory of change, how you can make a huge difference on the problem of climate change, and then you will win as a business in the long run. Thank you, Christian. And just echoing that, you know, working with so many customers across sectors, giving an example of one of our Danish uh, customers, you know, for them, it's not a sustainability strategy, it's a business strategy because they are part of the supply chain of other businesses. And unless they have their carbon emissions in order, they're not winning their tenders. So, you know, talking about again, how the market is changing, it's such a real example of how this is tangible outside in the business community. The last trend that I want to leave you with as well is that you know the market is evolving, the market is changing, ecosystems are built to handle these transitions. You know, we have expert partners, but we're working together and we're working towards the same goal. So it, it's so delightful to see also within Normative with our latest product release value chain engagement and the carbon network, we're doing exactly that rather than you having to run to a bunch of different partners to get the work done. Again, we talked about it, it gets confusing, it's a lot of hard work. You can't as a supplier receive 200 forms to fill in to report on your emissions when the day comes. You need that kind of centralized system. And at Normative, we're building that network out and helping businesses to have that kind of one stop to deal with their emissions and the data exchange that comes with it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion today. Thank you so much to our panel, Kaya, Bridget and Christian. Thank you to the audience for listening in and I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. Welcome everyone to the Swedish Pavilion here at COP28 in Dubai. So COP28, as you know, brings together world leaders, business leaders, civil society and academia to
together at this pivotal moment to shape the collective action and commitment in order for us to meet the globally agreed global warming tar target below 1.5 degrees. This year's COP is not only the largest of its kind, it's also marking the halfway to 2030. There's no doubt that it's urgent for us to curve and bend the emission curves and reach the Paris Agreement within these years. And this is exactly the moment in times of crisis and difficulties around the world where we need to present positive examples and concrete solutions on how we can bend these curves. And this is exactly why we are here at COP. And this is exactly what we're talking about in the Swedish Pavilion and all the stakeholders who were brought to here together will all discuss concrete solutions, existing solutions and how we together can bend the curves. And this is also exactly what this session will be all about. How we can collaborate cross sectors, cross industries, and also cross borders to find new solutions, to team up and find another way on being more innovative and more fast in finding new ways forward. The companies represented here today, they are all first movers. They are at the very global front line in terms of climate strategy, innovations, and they're all driving real climate action. They're here to collaborate, they're here to partner up, they're here to share their ideas, and they're here to make sure that we are moving even faster. And it is my absolute pleasure to invite our first speaker here today, and that is no one else than Anna Selsing, which is um, the sustainability officer at Alfa Laval, the world leader uh, provider of sustainable solutions within energy, food, water, and marine industries. I cannot wait to hear what you have to tell us here today. Welcome. Thank you, Emma. Uh, great to be here. As Emma said, the latest IPCC reports uh, show that I mean, immediate action to reduce greenhouse gas emission is a must. And the challenge we are in the middle of is massive. And we work together across companies to try our best to solve this challenge. Massive Plus is a partnership between large Swedish corporations and Microsoft to sort or get the greenhouse gas data across value chains to drive for our net zero, reaching our net zero targets. And together we represent over 600,000 employees, all with a common goal to drive down emissions. Our collective annual revenue is almost $300 billion that with a great global impact. And our jointly carbon equivalent emissions are close to 0.2 gigatons, 0.5% of the total global uh, emissions from energy and process industry. And what is it then specifically that we try to solve together? Well, the reality of the value chain is like a universe. We are somehow connected, but yet so far apart, especially when it comes to sharing that data that we need to drive for net zero. And together, we have hundreds of thousands of suppliers. To reach net zero, we need all our suppliers to reach net zero. To show that we reach net zero, we need the data to prove it. We also need to support our suppliers to collect site-level actionable data and to reduce emissions. We need data to comply to our new EU directive on reporting, sustainability reporting, CSRD. We need data to fund the huge investments needed across our society, infrastructure, renewable energy sources, carbon capture, etc. And no investor is going to put billions of dollars into an investment without having all the facts on the table, the data. And here and now, 
our collective headache filling out, or at least trying to fill out, all these endless of questionnaires that we send each other, trying to assess this universe of the value chains. And, and we, we really need to standardize and find a way, because we all ask and make up our own questions, sending them across value chains. And I mean, we came together uh, because we share the same problem. To, to share the same value chain, we are also a part of the same value chain, the stainless steel value chain, where we are front runners in the sense that we have rather defined data on scope one and two level, on site level. And we can support to get a standard in place. And we really, again, need this standard because we send these questionnaires. It could be like 70 pages of questionnaires asking for an LCA. That is not even relevant to my business. Or it could be a questionnaire asking uh, for data from different parts of the organization, creating double or triple work. Or it could be that we ask uh, for information, uh, the same information, but sending different questionnaires. So how do we get to a standardized way of asking ourselves uh, or asking across the value chain? What we do is that we focus on the basics. Again, we focus on the scope one and two data, the actionable data on site level. And we add up that scope one and two data to get to the scope three upstream data. And we do, do that, as you see in the picture on the slide, in each step of the supply chain, trying to make it easy to comply. And we want to use as much as the IT tools as possible to automate this, to make it uh, as seamless as possible, using AI tools, blockchains, for example. And we aim for an industry standard to be in place. And uh, we are, as a first step, developing a questionnaire aligned with the ESRS to make it easy to comply to also the CSRD, the EU standards that are coming. And we are agreeing in each step of the supply chain on what questions to ask uh, our suppliers and automating as much as possible. And just understanding the barriers of why it's so difficult to sharing the data is important to get the granularity, high quality data that we need across value chains, that universe. And when you sit down, around the same table, you realize such simple things as when asking a question in one way, the supplier can't answer. But when you rephrase it, the problem is all gone. So this partnership is unique in many ways, but maybe most importantly, because we work together, hands on. We don't just talk. And that's why we today want to show a prototype of what we have accomplished together so far. And we have uh, our team in Stockholm, sorry, a team in Stockholm uh, to help us walk through the, the prototype. Cecilia Hansried, you will help us doing that as a first step. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Anna. Yes, we will. We would like to share a few highlights of the prototype that we have developed jointly together during eight intense weeks during this autumn. Main objective of the prototype has been to simplify scope one and scope two reporting and make it easy to share that data in a network with others relying on the same data for their scope three. Let's look at the first scenario for data input and recording. There are multiple ways of sharing data. Key point is that we share activity data on site level to ensure that we have standardized calculations. We can define different sources of emissions. We record the data 
Here we see an example of fuel consumption, heating, purchase electricity. We may also have processing emissions that are already recorded in a standardized way, and then we support sharing that data pre-calculated. When data has been recorded, we want to review and make sure that it's validated. If we had used a custom emission factor, it has to, be, has to be proven and validated against a certificate. We define the transparency level, what level of detail that we want to share data with in our network. We review and confirm the data, and we can see the calculated emissions for my company, seeing the different uh, carbon emissions, and see how we perform towards industry benchmarks. Let's look at another scenario where we want to analyze within a value chain. Let's look at our tier one supplier, Alpha Laval, who has been open to share data, where we can see the different sites that have been reporting, and we can see the different scope one and scope two down on site level. In the final step, we would like to analyze the carbon emissions across a full value chain. We have illustrative data in the prototype today, but this is a true use case. <laughs> Volvo Cars, Alfa Laval, SSAB, El Quab, and Sandvik are all connected in a value chain focused on the steel product. And we can see the carbon emissions across this value chain. To summarize this prototype, it's not yet a ready product. There are still a few questions to be solved. The features are straightforward, does not require complex technology as it base. However, we believe that this kind of platform, focusing on scope one and scope two data and sharing that data in a network is essential in order to solve the challenge of reducing scope three emissions. It's a massive challenge. We can take it on together. And we believe that this kind of platform is one piece of that solution. Thanks a lot. Back to you in, in Dubai. Thank you, Cecilia. And I would say that it, uh, it really is important that we try to leverage on our collective competences than working each one separately on the same problem. I think that's the key, and we need to do that a lot more when it comes to sustainability challenges. Indeed, and I think it's impressive to really see that you've been able to find mutual um, challenges, but also collective actions in between the different stakeholders and the different industries that you all represent. Yeah. And, um, and also, I think it's very much in line as well as with the um, COP statement to unite, to act, and to deliver. Like you said earlier, Anna, you don't sit and wait. You see your problem, you identify it, and you get to work and it's very hands-on and it's very yes. concrete. Yes, it's it fascinating. Is. <laughs> and um, we will actually be um, have the honor to be uh, having two other guests on stage, also a part of this fantastic collaboration. Uh, there, um, I would like to present Jonas Otterheim. You are the head of climate at Volvo Cars, uh, as well as Jesper Kansfo. Um, you are head of governmental relations at SSAB, the steel producer. Well, very welcome. And um, as, uh, as mentioned, you are uh, having a similar value chain, similar challenges, but your value chains are also interconnected. You're also part of the same value chain. And uh, you at Volvo Cars, you have set an ambitious target to have uh, all electric cars by 2030, to also reduce your emissions of the cars um, by, is it 75% by uh, 2030, as well as being net zero by 2040? That's impressive, and um, considering the importance of reaching those targets, it's no doubt that data also is important. Could you just elaborate a little bit on the, the massive project here, like the importance of it, but also the potential pain points that you see? 
Yeah, let me try to do that. And I think the why here is rather interesting because, well, all of us companies here and, uh, well, back in Stockholm and likely many others, we see a joint problem and therefore we set out on a journey to try to solve this. So, to me, the Massive is a very good example of collaboration, as you just into. Um, this problem, we don't yet see a good solution to it. Uh, it's therefore us trying to start to explore what is it and how can we jointly find a way out of it and therefore reach higher quality of the data we all are so desperately in need of. The intent is to continue to drive the development because in the end of the day, if we jointly can share our learnings in how to collect and uh, report on accurate scope one and two data, hopefully we can have others do it. And if they do it, therefore that will become likely our scope three data, which will help us. So to me, that's the why. We need this to happen and we don't yet see the solution out there. So we set out to try to solve it ourselves. Let's see if we can do it or someone else do it instead. I love the, the action and the, the motivation. And uh, I assume also it's a, it's a wet dream as well, not only for the uh, reporting teams, sustainability managers, but also the, um, the procurement managers, and not least also for uh, financial institutes to know how to take decisions in, term of their, in terms of their investments. Is that also something that you're collectively are working towards? I, I think, well, all our stakeholders are expecting accurate data. Yeah. I think our customers ex expect that us to be very precise when we do a claim, our, uh, the financial sector do it as well, and of course our suppliers or customers want it. So it's regardless of all these actors, all of them expect us to well act very precise. And uh, Jesper, representing SSCB, the, the founder of the Fossil Free Steel, what are, what are your view on this? Why is this important for you as a steel company and a huge supplier, of course, for, for these industries, but also what potential pinpoints would you, do you see in this uh, pro collab collaborative approach and prototype phase? No, but thank you. No, but I think uh, being a steel producer, being in the beginning of the value chain, so to say, and we already today work together in the value chain, together with Alfa Laval and Volvo Cars and others. So, I mean, what we can do in our scope one and two is a solution for our customers' scope three. So, I think, I mean, the idea behind the massive is purely brilliant, simplistic. You need to also work in a value chain approach uh, and set this kind of the goal of a standardized data-driven approach uh, for emission as well. So, we support this. We think this is good. And also, I mean, talking for SSAB, we are a big emitter today. We are on a pathway to have a strategy to eliminate our emissions by 2030. We have our goals uh, approved by the S, um, SPTI. And now we are also in the, in the process of uh, uh, updating these goals to include uh, scope three. So also this project will be important for us since we are all tied in this value chain together. So, yeah. And I can just add that since uh, I think we're all front runners in the aspect of having rather refined data on scope one and two, uh, that makes it easier for us to showcase also for others what we need uh, and that's very important to be able to put a standard in place. And Anna, you earlier also referred this to a universe. Yes, <laughs> yeah. It and, is. Um, and also considering that you are front runners, you're all really representing front running first movers companies. Yeah. And would you say that, I mean, considering that it requires so much data, do you feel like the industry already at this level to share this, uh, this data and the transparency needed? I think we are very much in the beginning because we see also just getting together and starting to getting to know each other. That's really the importance of this, I would say, the difficult thing, to be very honest, to, to be able to get to know each other, be able to share the data, feel confident and have the trust between us to do that. And that's not something you just do easily. Uh, so I think we're a few front runners in this case who have uh, the trust between us. And the more we get IT tools in place that can also help us be sure that our data is secured when I send it to Jonas or Jesper, that it, nobody tampers that and it's there and you can't use it against me, then that's also <laughs> very important. Uh, and that's getting there, and that's why uh, IT tools are so important, and AI solutions, blockchains, etc. 
but considering the trust you have developed uh, yeah. between the companies, what would you say were the biggest learnings or insights so far in terms of uh, the difficulties? And yeah, please. I th you were into it, Anna, but I think one important learning here is that, well, even though we are three or uh, three on stage, but several Swedish uh, progressive companies with a rather similar ambition and sort of plan to reduce emissions as fast as possible, we at the same time have challenges in sort of agreeing on the details. How are we to report diff the details of emissions? And to me, that's rather important learning that despite being as so similar as we are, we're still rather far away from each other. So just agreeing on those details is a big learning in itself. And of course, other companies have other views and the details that we are talking about here. So we're not done yet, but just trying to solve them one by one is an important step here. Indeed, and Jesper, do you agree, as I said, and also regarding the, the readiness for, for transparency, what, what are your take on that within the, the industry? No, but I think we are uh, uh, extremely ready for the transparency. Uh, as a company today, when we uh, sell a product to a customer, we, uh, with that product comes an environment product declaration, an EPD, which clearly you know, defines exactly the footprint, footprint from a life cycle assessment. So I think that we have a lot of the information. Now it's a question, as Anna said, you know, how can we make sure that we talk about the same things, that we compare apple with apples and not apple with oranges. So a standardized way to look at this, I think, is, it will be crucial. Um, we were actually going to come back to the studio in Stockholm and get connected to, again to um, Johannes, uh, who's a professor at the Chalmers University of uh, Technology. Um, you, uh, from a scientific point of view, um, what, are, what are your view uh, on this and the development phase? Um, I'd like to broaden the scope a little bit to, to focus again on the net zero that we've been talking about uh, in, in the keynote in the beginning, that like to reach net zero, the, the time is really running out. So we need to look at all the potentials for emission reductions that we have. And in the value chains, there are a lot of opportunities that we should really capitalize on. Um, and I think that um, that kind of brings us to the question of readiness, that like maybe it's not so much a question of, of being ready, but rather to find a solution where we can make these companies ready to, to share their data in a way that they feel comfortable with and where we can actually really capitalize on, on these emission reduction potentials. And do you also, I mean, considering there's probably a lot of different similar maybe initiatives, maybe, maybe not as, uh, I mean, developed maybe as this, but do, how would you, you know, describe this partnership and how will this partnership stand out and make a difference? And can you perhaps see any other partnerships happening? Have you identified them throughout the process? And what do you see is the most unique regarding Massive? Well, um, I have followed the project for the last couple of months when developing this prototype, and I have identified at least a, a, a three areas, I would say, where the, this in initiative really stands out. And I think the first one is to really focus on the real data. Uh, but why, like when you actually collect the data from the suppliers, from the, the scope one and two emissions from each supplier, you get the actual data rather than using uh, generic emission factors. And that really makes it possible to identify these opportunities that I was talking about before uh, to find new ways of, of reducing emissions. Um, the second would be that like also with the contact with these different suppliers, uh, you also can create incentives to reduce these emissions. Uh, and those incentives would also hopefully go beyond maybe what certain some countries have put in place as, as policy instruments, um, so that you can really contribute like one step uh, above what's already on the table from the policy side, so to say. Um, and thirdly, um, this IT tool that, that we have saw the prototype for, uh, I'm very excited about because of the fact that it kind of answers to the need of having trustworthy and secure transfer and, and um, sharing of data because we need to get all the companies on board to actually do this. 
and without having those kind of systems in place, and I think also the fact that this is a company-driven initiative can really help uh, to create something that everybody is comfortable with, um, and then also hopefully push regulation and standardization in a direction where we can get access to more data, identify more ways of reducing emissions, and take these steps that are needed to reach that zero in the end. Thank you, Johannes Morfeldt, a researcher in climate and energy systems at Chalmers University. Um, I, I wonder then, Jesper, at uh, SSCB, um, would you do you agree with this, and do you do you see any any other similarities, or have you identified any other uh, projects similar to this? And also, what do you hope to to achieve with this project? No, but I think. It's all about trust and credibility. I think that we need to build trust and credibility for what we do as a company and also what we do in the value chain. And I mean, a little bit apart from, from this, when we talk about steel, fossil free steel or green steel or low carbon steel or near zero emission steel, nobody really knows what it is. We still lack a common agreed definition or standard. So I think this work that we do here to get the credible data that you work in a value chain, you know what the scope one, two, and three is, will also help that work. And, and that is something that we are following really close uh, from SSAB, so also, you know, involving ourselves in this uh, uh, initiative will be super important. Considering the importance of trust, how do you think you're going to come around that? How do you create trust and bring other others with you? Sure. I think we should do it sort of like you usually solve problems. We start from the smallest part and just build from there because, of course, this is an enormous or massive challenge. It's a, well, the value chain is a universe, as we call it. I think if we would be naive and talk about solving everything at once, no one would believe in it. But if we start from the smallest piece and build from there, we can step by step build trust in it. And to me, that's key. Mm. Anna, do you agree? No, yeah, I just want to say showing that what good looks like, it's very important. And show that we do secure data across. That's very important. Also help our suppliers do the right thing and that it pays off and show that it pays off to do the right thing, that you get a green premium, for example, for what SSAB is doing, us buying, for example, fossil free steel for our heat exchangers. That is very important. Uh, yeah. And, and what kind of impact do you think this uh, this will generate on the, in the long run? Uh, I f I hope that this is the starting point of uh, a more specific discussion on what we actually need, more granularity, high quality data, because we are very much on the high level when, and that's the natural thing, that we start sharing on the high level, but now we need and hope this starts the discussion on how do we specifically share the data, even on a product level, yeah. because I need to get paid for my product that I really drive for net zero. Uh, Otherwise, we won't get the momentum of things happening. And we need to also be able to, again, show all these financial institutes and investors what they're putting their money into and show the data. I think that's one of the main uh, drivers for things accelerating the transformation of society that we need to see happen. So this is a, an ignition of that, I hope. I, I just want to add as well, because you mentioned it in the beginning, I think there's something relating to the reporting. All of us are spending too much time yeah. when it comes to reporting. So in the end of the day, I hope to spend less time on systems like this, because it can simplify it for everyone. So I don't have to say or ask the same question to every company, and you ask the same question, but just di slightly different. And I th that's a hope for myself as yeah, well. We do want to spend time driving down emissions instead of reporting, <laughs> that's for sure. And you also mentioned the importance of also having a similar language. And that's also something we see here at COP when we have the different policymakers speaking their language and then the businesses their language and civil society and so forth. But also considering the amount of different stakeholders within the value chain, how are you going to then create this, you know, standard and, and uh, or push for a standard, but also the lang a mutual language so everyone understands it and also to make the whole reporting more efficient? Uh, 
I, I think coming back to what we said before, we need to be humble in terms of this is an enormous challenge in itself, but we are not trying to create a new standard of how to define it. We're just trying to simplify it and ensure we agree on the details of it. So we're not trying to create something else, but do something that can help us do what we already want to do and trying to do, but we're a bit confused of. And also considering where we are uh, at COP28, how are you going to, you know, share the word, call out for collaboration? How are you going to best spend the time here? Yes. <laughs> uh, we talk uh, to many in this room uh, for as a start and then also to other key stakeholders. Uh, many big companies are very interested uh, because they face the same problem and they don't either want to just separately work on it, but rather use the collective intelligence that we do have. Uh, and uh, we've said, and uh, Jonas, we talked about the round table or something, getting everybody together talking about this. Uh, it's very important and that might, yeah, you can fill out yeah, in on that. Yeah, I, I can do that. And sort of I just don't want to sort of skip to the end already, no, but I'm no. happy to summarize because I think there is a key thing in terms of we see a joint problem here and we are trying to set out to solve it. It's not necessarily that we have the perfect solution right now, but we're eager to try and we're eager to act on it. And to me, that's rather unique. And I think I really appreciate that in this collaboration. But what we're trying to do is more, well, why we have this event even is to start collecting feedback with, because we know no, we are not perfect already. We're not even, well, uh, close to perfect, but we need someone to tell us how we can improve it. Hopefully even there's someone that have already solved this problem that we just don't know of, because then we can spend time on reducing emissions instead of doing this one. But we believe this is missing in the whole landscape and therefore we set out on the journey. So we're planning right now to do round tables to call others to give feedback, both other companies, uh, do policy makers, investors, what is good and bad with this idea and can this play an important role in, well, the whole uh, landscape of systems and how we all want to reduce emissions? Or what are the downsides of it? And then we are, of course, continuing to develop what we started off. Uh, so the idea is to develop this proof of concept to get further and have something more concrete to work on and share that with others. But in the end of the day, well, just trying to act to solve something and then hopefully we all can sort of Mm. Uh, have something that we believe in and that can help us reduce emissions. And just adding that uh, onboarding uh, companies step by step, but very carefully, because as I said previously, this is unique because we work hands on together. Uh, we don't just talk. So it really is that onboarding those that really want to put in energy resources and time into this because it doesn't solve itself uh, and you need to be in committed. Do you agree, Jesper? <laughs> no, I agree. And I think, I mean, what we show here, I, I think the key is the strength is in the partnership. Yeah. And I think that's the story that we are trying to tell all of us here at COP, you know, that we work in value chains, we work in partnerships to try to accelerate the transition and drive the emissions down. That's what's, what it's all about. That's all it's all about. And also, Jonas, you were already touching a little bit re regarding the next steps and how you're going to best use the time here. But could you also elaborate a little bit? I mean, we're here now, of course, but after COP, there's, there's a time after that as well. What, can you elaborate a little bit more about the next steps, but also the key messages to the stakeholders that you want to reach out to? Uh, so let, let me repeat what I said in terms of what we're doing. We are seeing a problem when it comes to, well, uh, scope one to three emission data. Of course, there are some solutions out there, but the transparency and the ability to go deep in the value chain, we do, just don't see it yet. So our hope here is that we, by focusing on the scope one, two data, can try to create a bigger transparency when it comes to scope three data. Uh, so the steps right now is to, well, start collecting feedback on what we have set out to do and what others believe uh, or what others have view, uh, to, of others' views on this to see if we're doing something uh, that others also uh, experience or if someone have better ideas we should also implement in this or uh, that they are doing instead. Uh, so we're planning for these roundtables. We are actively calling for companies, organizations to reach out if they want to give us feedback or be part of spending time and effort and resources into this because that's what we are setting out to do. Uh, so please do that.
uh, I think that's perhaps the final word from me. That's fantastic. And I see that you also have a, a QR code here uh, at the screen uh, for people who are interested in uh, learning more about this, but also uh, maybe encourage everyone, of course, to reach out to, to all of you, but also to visit the pavilion uh, here throughout these days. And um, I would just uh, like to ask if you have any last final uh, words before we need to wrap up regarding the, the vision of this project, Anna. Uh, it's important just to, as you said, Jonas, if there's anyone out there who knows anything that's already yeah. in place, let us know. I think that's the one. And uh, really collectively understand that we have to work together because we're all part of this universe. And as I also said, if we are going to reach net zero, as we are all setting, aiming for, well, then everybody has to. And then we have to help, have to help each other uh, do that. We have to try to work together much, much more. And I'm in sustainability, you always work too much, <laughs> I would say. Uh, so we rather have to think differently and work together, uh, leveraging on each other's competences and resources, than trying to, each one of us sitting separately and working and trying to solve the same problem. Thank you so much. It's truly inspiring to see this uh, ongoing project and that you're already at this stage want to share this and really open up for collaboration. Several times we're also talking about collaboration as the new leadership and I think this is an excellent example of it. So thank you so much for, for participating and sharing this and also inviting other stakeholders per, to participate and continue co-create to develop. And uh, I would like to, to just say that, and a final word regarding the importance of really be transparent, you know, be also humble about the process because we can't sit and wait for everything to be perfect. It's urgent enough and it's m speed is more important than, than perfection sometimes. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Anna Alsersing, uh, Chief um, Sustainability Officer at Alfa Laval, Jesper Kanspo, Head of, uh, of Governmental Relations at SSAB, Jonas Otterheim, Head of Climate Action at Volvo Cars, as well as uh, Johannes Morfeldt, who was visiting us through the, from the Stockholm studio, is a researcher in a climate and energy system at uh, Chalmers University, as well as several others from the team uh, in Stockholm. So please join this journey, take part of it, and the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost, because the cost of inaction is way higher than the cost of action. The time is now and the race is on. Together, let's pioneer the possible. Together, let's unite, let's act, and let's deliver. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. This is a really exciting session to be having here on day two of COP28. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Swedish Pavilion and welcome all of our viewers online as well who are tuning in. I'm Diane Holdorf, Executive Vice President of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and so excited to be able to support and moderate the discussion that we're going to have today about reimagining how we feed the world. This is so so timely. The COP28 presidency has taken an absolute leadership position, putting food systems in the heart of the climate discussions. And this is really unprecedented momentum. Yesterday, there was an incredibly historic moment. 134 heads of state, for the first time ever, signed a food declaration, the COP28 UAE's Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems, and climate action. That is momentous. It puts those countries committing 
to embedding food and agriculture into their actions, their NDCs, and the work that they will take forward. And equally unprecedented were the more than 150 non-state actors signing the declaration right behind them in full support of this actions. And it's organizations like WBCSD and companies like Tetra Pak who really help to support and enable the innovation and the solutions that the world frankly depends on to support that kind of ambitious country action. I would like very much to welcome our first speaker today, His Excellency Mohammed Sayed al Nuami, who is the Undersecretary of the Climate Change and Environment Ministry here in the UAE. You and your team have led such momentum on this really important initiative, and we really look forward, Your Excellency, to hearing from you to help us kick off this conversation. Please welcome. Um, thanks, Diane. <clears throat> Actually, you said what I was planning to say. <laughs> well, good evening to everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today, and it's good to talk about a very sensitive subject where everybody was hiding behind the scenes for several years. Nobody would like to have it and talk about it, even though all of the countries, everybody was suffering about the food security issues, hangers, and whatever all the countries they are facing. So yesterday was a lovely moment where all those 134 countries, they agreed, and more than 2.5 billion US dollar was agreed to be put in this subject. This is a big change, and as we keep saying, we are proud in UAE to walk the talk when we agreed that this scope will be totally different. And I think we take the box in the first two days. Now, there are no excuse for anybody to say, well, I'll be back, or I am not interested to join, or I can't do whatever needed from myself as a company or as a country. So I think with this initiative, was launched yesterday and today. And thank you, the Swedish, for hosting me and letting give me the chance to talk about a little bit from what we are, if I may say, suffering of. Um, worldwide, we don't read the same map. Food security issues cannot say it's not a commercial, it's not about clothing, it's not about money laying here and there, it's about people facing death due to the hunger. So this is very critical issue. Everybody should read the same map. Food security has to be um, in a good collaborative hands where everybody believes that all of us should come together to help each other. There is nobody saying, well, it's not my interest to have a country suffering and I'll be away from them. So thanks again for hosting me. I'm willing to hear a lot about the initiative with Twitter back and I'm sure there will be a lot and positive vibe to be said today. So all the best for all of us. And thank you again for hosting me. Thank you. So let's see. Uh, good. Thank you very much all for being here. My name is Charles Brand. I'm EVP for Processing Solutions and Equipment at Tetra Pak. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about reimagining how we feed the world um, and to introduce our white paper on, on how we intend to transform uh, the, the food systems. Um, Sam, I am the third speaker <laughs> on the same, the same topic, and in fact, um, uh, you know, this data that is behind me here, um, I have heard now I don't know how many times in so many different uh, speeches, and in fact, that coalescence around uh, all of the facts that are there uh, and the coalescence around the fact that we have got to take action on those is quite remarkable uh, and, and really, in, in a way, quite moving. Um, 
As a company like Tetra Pak, uh, it's been about, well, what do we do? Um, and so we have partnered with EY Parthenon uh, to take a look at uh, the outside world. Uh, and so we've gone a through a process to look at, uh, so uh, what are the key trends? What's happening out there? Um, we've taken a look at what's the current baseline and where are things going? Uh, we've then taken a look at what are the different scenarios that we could imagine could happen uh, and then looked at, well, what does good look like? And it's been in three different areas, uh, in the area of healthy diets, in the area of regenerative and circular value chains, and in the area of decarbonizing uh, to support the, the whole climate change adaption. And this is kind of somehow for the food systems, there's, you've got climate working against the ability to manufacture food and food being one third, as we saw, of all greenhouse uh, gases. Um, so in in that we've oh dear, sorry in that um, there are a number of different areas that we've looked at in terms of achieving zero hunger, uh, empowering consumers to make the right choices for health because. Is it really acceptable that one third of all consumers are actually obese when we've got 800 million consumers that are malnourished? Um, what does the biodiversity situation look like and, and the ecological health of farmlands? How do we reduce food loss? One third of all food is lost uh, and, and given that one third of all greenhouse gases comes from food, there's a huge opportunity there. And then, of course, we've got to half that one-third of uh, greenhouse gases by 2030 to be able to uh, deliver on the food systems agenda. So with all of that background, we had to decide what is it that Tetra Pak needs to do to address those challenges. Uh, so we came up with four pathways. Um, the first one is enabling a transition to a more sustainable dairy. Uh, dairy is a huge provider of nutrition, a provider of food security. And in actual fact, there are 600 million dairy farmers around the world, so there are a lot of livelihoods that depend on dairy. But it is a big emitter of greenhouse gas emissions, and we've seen our role as supporting the reduction of greenhouse gases in the area of dairy processing. Um, Plant-based and new proteins uh, manufactured uh, through fermentation is another area of opportunity to be able to have a more sustainable food, uh, food system. And there we see a big role because a lot of the equipment that is needed for manufacture of those types of products is already sits in our portfolio. The third area is in reducing food loss and waste. I mean, it can't be acceptable to have one third of all food uh, wasted. And so we take a look at what can we do in the area of food processing and are there ways that we can upcycle side streams of uh, the byproducts out of food processing into other types of new food. And then finally, um, on our packaging side, it's how do we scale the access to safe nutrition through sustainable packaging. And if you look at the value proposition of an aseptic carton, it is you can take a nutritious food product from a producer to a consumer with no refrigeration, no need for preservatives, and with virtually no waste. And that value proposition we see is an ability to help to scale food nutrition out to uh, the population as it grows. So we're a database company, we, a database uh, company. Um, we like uh, targets um, because targets drive action and action drives results. So we have uh, in those four different areas set a number of targets uh, that we have as our ambition through to 2030. Uh, and I won't go through them here, but uh, you can see them in our, in our report. So with that, I'd like to say a very big thank you. Uh, our white paper is available to download. Uh, there is lots of good information in the white paper. Uh, it takes a very external view, so it's not about Tetra Pak, it's about what the world looks like. Uh, and I hope you can draw some use of that. Uh, so Diane, please.
Charles, thank you so much. Let us just really acknowledge this kind of leadership coming from a company like Tetra Pak to dig in deep on what is needed. And clearly, through looking at those pathways, you've got a very good understanding. I would so, go so far as to say a deep understanding of what the actions, therefore, are that Tetra Pak <laughs> needs to take to fulfill the role that you have in helping to drive the food system transformations. So we're gonna have some of this conversation now a little bit further. We've got two additional really amazing leaders in this space who are going to join us. We're so fortunate to have Maximo Torero with us, Chief Economist at the FAO. Please, Maximo, come on up and join us. And Dr. Johan Rockström as well. Thank you. And Dr. Johan Rockström is the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and I'd go so far as to say the preeminent climate scientist, and this is a topic you've been working on for a very long time. Johan, I'm gonna to turn to you first because the work that Tetra Pak has done here tries to place the food systems into the context of the planetary boundaries and the actions that we need to take. Help perhaps this group and everyone online as well understand what is the role of the food systems in helping to ensure we stay within the planetary boundaries? Yeah, th thanks, Diane, and um, great to have this, this opportunity. So. I mean, let me just start in the end, which is that we have overwhelming scientific evidence that if we do not transform the food system along the lines that, that the Charles and His Excellency pointed out here, we will not be able to deliver on the Paris target of holding 1.5 degrees Celsius. But it's even broader than that. We have today, unfortunately, uh, concluded that six of the nine planetary boundaries are outside of the safe operating space. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are at risk of destabilizing the whole planet. It means also that we're losing resilience, that uh, the capacity of, uh, of the biosphere, the living nature, water, biodiversity, land, uh, all ocean systems are losing their capacity to buffer the stress caused by the climate challenge, but also in, in providing services to us as stable food systems or clean air or clean water. And when we do the analysis, we find that agriculture is the single largest cause for transgressing the boundaries. So the food system consumes 70% of the fresh water that we withdraw from rivers and groundwater. It's the biggest cause for changing land and deforestation. It's the, by far the number one cause for overloading land and water with reactive nitrogen and phosphorus, fertilizer overloading. It's the number one cause in, in, in many cases for um, air pollutants and chemical pollution because of pesticide overuse and overuse of antibiotics in the agricultural system. And of course, finally, it's 25% of the climate debt that we pose through nitrous oxide, methane, and, and carbon dioxide. So to put it simple, we fix the food system and we are very, very positively back on, on our way back into safe operating space of planetary boundaries. So you could actually conclude quite clearly that we have two big challenges in the world. And number one is the energy transition, phasing out fossil fuels. And the number two is transitioning, as Charles pointed out, into a sustainable food system. That would bring us quite nicely towards a safe space. So that is why the food system is so important. But let me just close this by also linking it to COP28, that what, what we see is that um, the food system is today equivalent to, on average, and, and the report will be released in two days' time, the Global Carbon Project, the 2023 update on all the carbon emissions. The food system is equivalent to four billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions per year, but it adds up to 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents if you include methane and nitrous oxide. But let's just concentrate on, on carbon dioxide for the moment. Four billion tons of carbon dioxide. That's compared to 40 when we burn oil, coal, and gas. So it's like it's 10% uh, it's of the overall carbon dioxide. It's 25% of all the greenhouse gases. Now, the science gives us a remaining carbon budget for a safe landing to a net zero world economy by 2050. This is, this is the phase out pace of oil, coal, and gas. When you look at those analyses, you find that the only reason why the scientist gives us a remaining carbon budget is very optimistic assumptions on the food system transition. Actually, the assumptions is that we will go from plus four, the single largest emitter, 
to minus five, to be basically the largest single biological part of the solution. I call that an agricultural revolution over the next 30 years. So this is the charge we have. That's why it's so positive that there's been a decision today to really take a big step forward on the food system transition. So to close and hand it back to you, Dan, there is no success on Paris without success on food, but you cannot cheat ourselves. We cannot act on food as a compensation for not acting on fossil fuels. We have to do both simultaneously. That's how we can win this journey. Johan, you put it so clearly. Let me just restate this so that everybody gets it. We are at risk of tipping points on six of the nine planetary boundaries. The food and agriculture system is the single largest contributor. And yet, if we take the action embedded in the 1.5 science, we can turn agriculture into one of the single largest net positive solutions and contributors. That is what leadership looks like. And again, hat tip to the UAE COP28 presidency for seeing that so clearly and placing it at the center of what you are leading in what we need to accomplish here going forward. Maximo. Chief Economist, FAO, you are dealing in the numbers of this food system and the transformation needed every day. You've taken a look, I'm sure, at the white paper that Tetra Pak has put forward, building on all of this science for the role and the actions. You know, Charles spoke to the 10 big shifts and the four significant pathways. Where do you see, based on all the analysis you do, is the current guidance for the critical actions that we need to take? Thank you. And let me go back to what you were saying. Uh, one of the things I, I think that you missed is that the agri-food system provides foods to the world and they feed people in the world, uh, and that's the right to food. The challenge, of course, is that we are not even providing the food that we need. We have 735 million people chronically undernourished, 3.1 billion people without access to healthy diets. And sure, the agricultural system, to be able to achieve that, is creating a lot of problems, and the reason is because we are not doing it in an efficient way, and that's exactly the point. But for me, the point is more positive. No, is clearly we have to achieve SDG2. We have to achieve the access to healthy diets. We have to assure the right to food. But we can do it being more efficient. And that's the just transition process. And the being more efficient means that we increase efficiency in the way we produce. And you raise a lot of the topics where efficiencies can be increased, and you, of course, but also rebalancing. And rebalancing means that there are some areas where there is a need for certain level of foods that are not existent, and that's why we have so much undernourished people, and there are areas or regions where there is too much consumption of food, uh, or certain types of foods, which other areas need. So, so we need to figure out ways in which we can do this rebalancing and this increasing efficiencies. So clearly, food loss and waste is something that is unacceptable. It's kind of ridiculous, but it's not so easy to resolve. Waste uh, is simpler, I think, because its behavior is policy of the North and the South, because the South cannot wait for that. Losses is a little bit more complicated because we have a lot of producers in the world, a lot of atomization on production, but we can improve. And putting targets to that is important, and bringing the science and innovation to that is important. But then you have the use of the natural resources, the soils. No? Today, we are overusing pesticides because and fertilizers, because we don't need, we don't know the soil characteristics and what the soil needs. And that's missing information on soils. Soil health and soil maps that we need to have in place around the world. Water usage, a lot of problems because of bad governance of water and misuse of water, wrong pricing of water. We just finished the SOFA report looking at the true cost accounting. And there are three critical areas, environment, socioeconomic, and of course health. And that helps us to understand where we have problems. Most of the, of the developed countries have a huge problem on health externalities because of overconsumption. Most of the poorest countries have problems in environment and problems in socioeconomic issues. So we need to look at all those informations and to find the ways in which we can get the pathway that you are referring. But what it brings at the end is that we need to attract the climate financing to agriculture. And you are saying is exactly, we need to work on both the energy and the agri-food systems, both at the same time, not one or the other. If you look at the roadmap of the energy transition, it's assuming things in the agri-food systems that won't happen. And we need to assume that that will happen. And for that, we need to attract climate financing. Today, climate financing is 4% for the agri-food system. That doesn't make any sense. 
if we believe everything we are saying here, this needs to change. So I'm very happy that UAE is trying to do that and the report is trying to do that. So there is no one solution because the problem is that the 10 points that you are referring to will change depending on the countries where you are and the regions where you are. And the intensities are important. And that's what we need to figure out. And that's why we are building this roadmap to SDG 2 to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But what is also important is that there are two elements which are enablers, data, which includes, of course, modeling. And if we are violating six of the nine planetary boundaries, a lot of our models not necessarily are able to cope with that because things are going to get exponential. But we need to keep improving on that and policies. Those are enablers that will affect all the different actions that we do, and we need to work intensively on those, I think, and keep accelerating and reducing all the asymmetries of information that we have in the world. You say something today, and the media will put something completely different tomorrow. And we need to come immediately with responses, technical responses that we can clarify so that financing goes to where it needs to go, and we can accelerate this transformation. Maximo, you started with putting this with people absolutely at the center. Food is a necessary a core need, and very personal at that. But then, being the chief economist, you quickly move into what it means for the health economic externalities. In fact, some of the security economic externalities you even referred to a bit. It really is at the heart of the economic systems as well. And then you brought us into some of these big areas of both challenge and opportunity, data, we need right and better data at many levels. We need policy that will open and unlock, and I'm restating these because we're gonna go a little deeper, and finance, only 4% of climate finance going into the biggest opportunity space to drive net positive outcomes is wildly insufficient. So let's dig into that just a little bit more. In these areas of, bound, of, of challenge, where are the opportunities? And, you know, Charles, let me invite you in on those opportunities, then we'll come back to Maximo and Johan again as well. So, so let, me, let me start with the finance uh, side, which we see as a, as a challenge to the cost of capital and the willingness and ability to invest in new, more efficient, more sustainable technologies is clearly not there, uh, at least not to the extent it needs to be. Uh, we're investing heavily in improving all of our equipment. Uh, we've got targets through to 2030 to reduce the impact of energy, water, waste, and chemicals in our equipment by 2050 through to 20, sorry, by 50% through to 20, 2030. But it's the, the deployment of those technologies that are going to provide the effect. And, and that's where I think your, your topic on financing is, is very important. I mean, we've got res, uh, results like minus 40% in our UHT, which is how you process milk, uh, energy consumption uh, for th those types of technologies. So there's lots of things that can be done. Um, there is an interesting certain convergence of sustainability and return on investment as energy costs and water costs and perhaps some effects of carbon taxes come through. Mm. So we really hope that that is going to incentivize investment in new technologies because that's how we're going to make an impact. On the opportunity side, I mean, clearly companies that can combine sustainability with business are the ones that are going to uh, thrive in this new environment of huge investment. In fact, I saw numbers of $4 trillion through to 2030 uh, to uh, deal with all of the investments that are needed out there. In our, in our white paper, we talk about new proteins, uh, new ways of um, uh, delivering food to, uh, to the consumers, both plant-based and, and uh, proteins manufactured uh, through fermentation. And that we see as a big opportunity and as a, as a combination together with all the conventional foods that are out there. Yeah, Charles, I think, you know, the role of business to lead on technology and innovation is key because we have to have scaling. I've heard many people say, you know, we have the solutions, we need the scale, and we need to make them place-appropriate and time appropriate. To do that, of course, we need finance. Maximo, I'm gonna come back to you in a moment on that, but first I'm gonna to come to Johan, because some would argue that in order to really know where the scaling of innovation and technology needs to go so that finance can flow, is we need better data. What's the role of data and some of the stakeholder ecosystem that surrounds that? What do we need to do differently or faster to help move that? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are many challenges here, and, and um, 
let me just give you a few data points, which I think complements very much to, to, to Maximo's point. And then, of course, I fully agree with you that this has to be a, a people-centered focus. We know that as one data point, two different studies have shown that on average 10 million people die prematurely just because of unhealthy food, unnecessarily. And um, that this is uh, actually, in, in just in rate, a higher number than people losing their lives prematurely during COVID-19. So, so we're talking of something which is a, a permanent social cost of huge magnitude. And that we have so much evidence on data points that if you move towards more healthy diets, you can actually not only have a trajectory of, of uh, eliminating that number, you can also have enormous synergies with the sustainability of the planet. Those data points are not there yet in terms of really scaling them from the planet to the local level. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't even have a monitoring system on soil carbon, for example, to make it possible to get the financial incentives in place of how to uh, incentivize farmers, not even in the developed north, to really become stewards of organic carbon in soils. We, we, we know how to do it. We have increasingly satellite uh, remote sensing capabilities to do it, but we haven't really been able to operationalize it and scale it. So I think we, we, are, we are, thanks to the policy advancements, we hopefully see continuing as, as the decision here uh, yesterday, uh, but to also trigger more investments in this kind of monitoring scheme. But, but we have many challenges still remaining. But, but the final one I just want to say is that, that in my view, the, the, the biggest synergy, in, in the, the, the lowest hanging fruit and the biggest synergy we have is to stop expansion of agriculture into natural ecosystems. That we can do tomorrow. I mean, we, we have the monitoring schemes for that. We have the Global Forest Watch. We have all the data we need to, to monitor that very carefully and to help farmers and communities to successfully provide the good quality food and the volumes required on existing farmland not to encroach on ecosystems. Johan, it's so important to bring farmers into the conversation always when we're talking about food systems transformation and producers, thinking of the dairy priority focus that Tetra Pak is bringing as well. Because the, the enabling business environment for farmers to successfully continue not just their livelihoods, but the transition that's needed is key. And the data that you're talking about that they need to also help provision, we've got to simplify and streamline and agree on. And then the funding can flow more. So investing for farmers and practices and transitions as much as investing for innovation is key. Maximo, maybe talk a little bit about what those numbers, where the opportunity lies in the numbers and where you see us needing to lean in most? So, so first, let me uh, debrief you a little bit on, on what are the, the indicators that we are looking that matters for here. So we have, of course, the chronic undernourishment, which the goal is 2030. The 1.5 is 2050. Uh, we have uh, the affordability of healthy diets, the 3.1 billion people. But then we have how many people don't have access to healthy diets. It's not related to affordability, it's also to choice. And the number is a lot bigger. And the tra trajectory of those two can approach to what we want to have for the 1.5 degrees. Because by default, by achieving that, as you said, we are going to improve uh, and reduce externalities over our environment. So that's the, the trajectories we want to be able to go and to achieve both goals at the same time. Now, the issue is uh, how, how, how this will work out and how we need to, to move forward on this. So for me, there are several things which are related to finance. The first thing that we know already, and that's the studies that we have been doing on how governments use the resources to support agriculture, is that they are creating distortions and wrong incentives towards activities that are not the ones that you want to achieve those goals. And that's the whole agenda of how we can repurpose support agriculture. And that's using the little money that, especially in the South, the governments use to be able to align to the correct incentives. So that's the first bucket that we can do. Of course, the governments have to increase how much they invest in the agricultural sector, because at the end of the line, what you want is to produce more with less. You don't want to expand and destroy biodiversity. You want to produce more with less. The second bucket is, OK, how we bring the private sector. Because the private sector plays a crucial role, not only at the corporate level, but also all the farmers are private sector at the end of the line. Uh, but at the corporate level, they play a crucial sector. So we need to align those incentives also so that the private sector realize of the true cost of food and the true cost and accountability of what you are really producing. Because I can transport water by exports. 
through fruits and so on. And that's a, a very valuable asset, which is in a lot of stress. So those through cost accounting for the private sector, I think is extremely important. And that's where we need to work with them because we also need to realign their incentives towards this because we are missing, uh, we are not paying externalities, which are creating profits at the same time. So we need to look at that very carefully. The third bucket is the IFIs, the International Financial Organizations. And that we have a lot of money, but a lot of misalignment. No? And that's why we are trying, and we hope we get the collaboration from everybody through the roadmap to align those in 10 domains of action so that we can coordinate all the IFI's resources going into this sector so that it's properly used and align at least, align them a little bit so that we can create convergence. And we need to go from the global to the country level. It's very important because the heterogeneity in the country level is extremely important. And here comes a lot of the, the confusion that we have that climate is a public good. It's not a private good, it's not a country specific. I can reduce my emissions, but if not everybody does the same, I will never achieve my goal. And that is linked to trade, no? And trade will be central in this play, and trade of emissions and so on and so forth. We need to find solutions for that. And the last bucket is the, the philanthropic agencies, no? Which can help a lot to create catalytic resources. So if we align those four buckets, I think we can do uh, some changes. But we need to understand that we don't have time, and we need to accelerate this process. We need to find alignment, and we need to capture heterogeneity across the board, with the goal, of course, to assure right to food, but also to assure what we say is good food for today and tomorrow. Because that's what brings the link, no? Yeah. It's not just produce more today at any cost. Because if I do that, tomorrow I won't be able to do it. Because if there is a sector that will be affected by climate and by deterioration of natural resources, is the agri-food system. So we need to assure both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a really important role for governments to play in ensuring that the right finance is going to the right incentives. And you brought up the incentive mechanisms that really need to change, but not just how we're doing it today, how we need to do it with urgency differently. And I would say the deforestation, the opportunity to halt that now fits in with that incentive package. Trade is key, trickier, but another really important role that can send the right signals through regulatory. Business responds to those. Those two levers are huge for a private sector response. And we hear more and more a call for coherence and ambition in policy and trade and regulation that will enable the kind of level playing field that provides better data exchange, better investment flow, and better perform when better at the per, better performance can be recognized. And this is where I want to come back to you, Charles, because when we think about what it means to spur the right kind of performance and accountability, embed it into business strategy and therefore operations. What are some of the things that you expect to see out of this work that you've done? So, I mean, today every business has got to assess its direct and collateral impact on, on the economy, on sustainability, on society. And in fact, that's what we've tried to do with, uh, with the white paper is really to look at the outside world and see where do we fit and then pick the actions that we think that we should take, set targets and targets are usually good for actions and actions are usually good for, for results. Uh, so that's how we've decided to go at it. Uh, I mentioned food loss and waste and we've had a, a lot of uh, discussion here already about uh, food loss and waste because obviously it's totally unacceptable and, it, and that, that kind of conflicting conflicting situation between food production and climate clearly needs to be needs to be solved so we've got two kind of areas that we're working on one is in the actual production at our customer sites uh, and there we have a target to reduce food waste out of our equipment uh, by 50 percent through to 2030 using a 2019 base and so there's a lot of work that we can do with our customers to to support them to optimize the production but there are also byproducts out of production, which is also equally unacceptable. Is it acceptable to have any kind of waste in a food production system? Uh, and a good example there is in brewer spent grains. So after you brew beer, there are spent grains left after, left after that. And that would, I would have, in the old days, uh, gone to landfill perhaps. At best, it would have gone to cattle feed. But it can be upcycled into high value ingredients for the food industry or into protein beverages, as an example. So there's lots that can be done to really eradicate food waste out of the system that is there. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you came back to that food waste issue. It's so easy to gloss over it, but the fact that 30% of all food produced is not consumed is, is crazy. And we say it all, and yet the actions, it's actually quite complex to get after these actions. And so more focus in that arena, and perhaps some of the funding on the innovations that enable us to really reduce those, which comes down to infrastructure investment, cooling infrastructure investment, and operational efficiencies, and farmer support. So lots to be done there. Maybe I, we only have a few moments left, but... Johan and Maximo, when we recognize the type of leadership that a company like Tetra Pak is bringing forward, setting out a vision for what needs to change and recognizing their role within it, where, where would you suggest they go? I mean, how do you prioritize that and how might they be contributing in that space? And then Charles, I'll bring it to you to close with again, what, what you hope to deliver. Yeah, so I mean, it's um, that, that's a big question, um, and and it can be answered in, in in many ways. But I would suggest that one of the most important roles that companies like Tetra Pak can provide today is to just as you presented, actually, Charles, to take a a broad, full value chain approach. Um, look all the way, you know, so you're a packaging, fundamentally a packaging and service and processing company, but you're also engaging in sustainable dairy. You also sustain it, is securing that the input into your packaging comes in as sustainable, providing healthy food downstream and food safety to avoid or minimize the loss and waste. I think companies... Um, across sectors, but the food industry in particular, needs to be engaging along that whole upstream downstream value chain and, and take responsibility for it and, and really show that this is not something we do just for, um, you know, the moral responsibility, but we do it for, for as business strategy. We do it to be successful as a company. And I think uh, showing the proof of that uh, is, is, gives a lot of confidence and, and competition out there in the market. I think that those are a few pieces that, that I would um, recommend. But also, to, to close, I, I think uh, given not least COP28 here, I think it's important that a company in the food sector today truly connects to the biodiversity and the climate science and policy and, and sees that, you know, where, wherever you are in, in the food agenda, you're right at the center of these two big, big, I would even argue the biggest challenges humanity is facing in terms of rapid transitions over the next uh, 10 to 30 years. So, so to be a very active player there out in the public sphere, um, hold hands with science sometimes and, and really engage in the dialogue with policymakers, with leaders, because I, I, we see companies um, too seldom out there to really engage in, the, in, in societal dialogues. Yeah, thank you. So know that you're not operating alone, but do everything you can in your own operations. Yeah, thank you. Maximo. I think leadership will be central. I, I think what you are doing has to be great spillovers, and, and that's really important. As you said, the metrics of measuring the impacts of what you do, like reduction of these hidden costs, for example, of how you produce will be essential. Improvement in the way we look at topics like the problem of, of food loss and waste. So food loss goes up to wholesale included, retail to consumer is waste. So we need to have a common definition so that we talk the same thing. Um, and there are areas where, for example, we, we used to believe, and if you look at the literature on the topic, everybody thinks that it's post-harvest. I'm sorry to say it's pre-harvest. Most of the losses are pre-harvest, and that is linked to technology, to innovation, and so on and so forth. So that's what you can bring up, and you can teach the world what can be done. If somebody needs to have precision farming, it's the smallholders, because they are the most budget constraint. But they don't have the money to do it. That's why our role, and I take the responsibility of FAO, is to try to bring all the information they need to do precision farming. That, that's what we want. Uh, but, but, but that is the type of leadership that, that is needed and recognition of how you are trying to minimize those hidden costs and, and those externalities to the world. But leadership is central today because what we see today is a lot of different push in different directions. Uh, and one, one important thing is that if it is not safe, it is not food. Also true. Okay. Uh, uh, and many of the alternatives that are being created today as alternatives to other products not necessarily are the, the ones that have been validated their safety 
with carefully analysis of what will be the consequences in the future. And we need to be very careful about science, and that's the linkage with science. And we need to keep neutrality of science too, because science has to be a certifier of what is being done. So, so we need to assess the situation and try to find the acceleration, but being safe on how we do it. But especially, and I think the most important message here is, open your eyes, financing has to come to the agri-food system because that's where the change needs to happen. And this is where leading companies like Tetra Pak can bring in finance solutions, scaling solutions, innovation solutions done safely also. So Charles, in the last few seconds here, anything you want to leave? Yeah, just, uh, you know, this is the second COP that I've been to. Uh, last year, food systems came on the agenda. This year, it's front and center. And I'm absolutely amazed at the, the amount of convergence of opinion. The facts are there. Everybody's talking about them. Everybody's talking about action and wanting to make it happen. Um, but somehow, inside these four walls, or inside these many walls that there are in this site, everybody has got the same kind of drive and opinion. It's, it's, a, it's a convergence of similar like-minded opinions. But outside the four walls, there are many competing opinions, and it's outside of the four walls that action actually happens. And so if there was one thing that I actually asked for, it would be that the focus is on action and that there is proper policy support to taking the actions, consistency in the policy, and that we really start to scale all of the solutions that we actually have already today in hand. So that call to action is one we need to all take away, no matter what our role is. Let's give a huge thank you to Johan Maximo and Charles for a great discussion here today. Welcome to this session, Your Excellencies, colleagues, distinguished guests. Also welcome to the Swedish Pavilion, where we are incredibly excited to be launching the Blue Mediterranean Partnership Fund. My name is Maria Selin. Uh, I'm a colleague uh, from SIDA. I work uh, at the embassy in Amman, where I'm responsible for a regional development program. Uh, and we have uh, uh, now decided to partner up with all of you to make this uh, happen, the Blue Mediterranean Partnership Fund. So uh, I've been uh, assigned to be the master of ceremonies. Uh, so I think this is going to be a little bit of a difficult task. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, we need to be short, we need to be brief, and we need to say super important things. So um, we'll, we'll do our best uh, jointly. And uh, I want to start off by welcoming um, a reasonably new Director General from SIDA, Jakob Granit. It's a pleasure to have you here, to actually be here to launch the program. And I should also be saying to you that uh, uh, Mr. Granit was previously the Director General for the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management, um, responsible for the blue economy uh, and fisheries in the Baltic and in the North Seas. So he knows what he's talking about. Um, so uh, over to you, DG. The floor is yours. Thank you, Maria, Excellencies, honored guests and dear colleagues. It's a real pleasure to be here. And as you heard from, as my colleagues just said, I really care for the topic we are talking about. So let me welcome you to this launch and the signing ceremony of the Blue Mediterranean Partnership here in the beautiful Swedish pavilion. We meet here in Dubai in very troubled times. We recognize the hardships and the sufferings of civilians in the region, and we acknowledge that at this, times like this, it's difficult to see beyond what happens on a daily basis. We trust that there will be an end to the violence and that we collectively, with collective efforts and a road to a brighter future, can be found. 
The Blue Part Mediterranean Partnership has just like this pavilion its roots in Scandinavia as it has been modeled on the Northern Environmental Partnership that has been successfully managed by the EBRD for over 20 years and enables significant investments in and around the Baltic Sea. The impact that these strategic and coordinated investments has had on the marine environment is well documented, but it's really the spirit of partnership that I would like to highlight. Long-standing and strong partnerships that stand the test of time is essential if you want to achieve sustainable development. And with the BNP, we trust that we will jointly be able to provide lasting benefits for the Mediterranean Sea, for the countries around it, but and more importantly, for the people depending on this amazing resource for subsistence, income and recreation. And partnerships are needed. No single actor can address the transboundary impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss alone. Complex challenges require comprehensive approaches, and a regional platform like the Blue Mediterranean Partnership can provide strategic guidance, policy development, and agenda setting, in addition to mobilizing financial resources and technical assistance at the product investment level. In line with this, the role of the Union for the Mediterranean will be crucial. A regional organization with its member states from both the southern and northern shores of the Mediterranean with in-depth understanding of issues related to environment, climate change and the blue economy. Development banks and international finance institutions are essential for scaling up projects and, and initiatives to meet the very large challenges that the Mediterranean region is facing in terms of climate change and to unlock the blue investments. In this sense, and I'm happy that CEDA, the Swedish government, is able to provide catalytic grant funding to mobilize public and private finances needed for the blue economy in the MENA region. And I can announce today that we will be supporting the partnership with 75 million Swedish kroner, which is about 6.5 million euros. The grant funding we provide might seem small in comparison to the overall investment needs in the region, but its flexibility and timing can be instrumental for getting large-scale projects off the ground if allocated strategically. Blended finance and innovative financial instruments will play key roles in development cooperation moving forward, and it's exciting to see that this, this partnership is already considering how a broader set of financial instruments can be offered to partners in order to facilitate investments and projects. And this is really what we learned in the, in the Baltic Sea region, the scaling up of financing, critical. And at CEDA, we can also make use of our guarantee instrument to really uh, meet uh, scaling at, at scale, scaling, <laughs> financing at scale. In summary, the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs will strengthen the health of the ocean ecosystems in the MENA region. Sectors such as fisheries, marine transport, offshore renewable energy and tourism will provide jobs and livelihoods to millions of people. This event marks the beginning of an important partnership that will deepen relations between Sweden and countries in the southern Mediterranean, something that I very much look forward to. We hope that this partnership will benefit all countries in the broader Mediterranean region, including around the Red Sea. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Director General. And now we will see a short recorded message from uh, the European Commissioner for the Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, DG Mare, Mr. Virginius Sinkiewicz. So please. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to COP28 and the Blue Mediterranean Partnership Pledging Conference. Tonight, we will have the opportunity to witness the beginning of what is bound to become a fruitful partnership. I would also like to thank the banks, financial institutions, donor and recipient countries for joining this effort and making today possible. Because tonight, we are putting the sustainable blue economy at the top of the agenda in the broader Mediterranean region. And we are doing this together. Our joint efforts began in 2021. 
when the 42 member countries of the Union for the Mediterranean adopted the second ministerial declaration on sustainable blue economy. Later that same year, we added the EU approach to a sustainable blue economy and the new agenda for the Mediterranean. These documents completed our political commitment towards the green and blue economies of the Mediterranean region. The Union for the Mediterranean Declaration lists sustainable investment as one of its 10 priorities. And this is key because after political commitment, financial commitment comes and takes things to another level. Because we need investments to develop the economy, especially if we want to make sure that all sectors and activities develop sustainably, so that the seas and oceans can keep providing for future generations. I believe that by supporting and funding smart blue economy projects and initiatives, the Blue Mediterranean Partnership will help us implement not just this priority, but the other nine as well. And this is why today the European Commission pledges 1 million euro to the Blue Mediterranean Partnership. We believe in this partnership. We believe it can contribute to making the prosperous future of the Mediterranean countries. And that means sustainable, resilient prosperity. I also hope that this will inspire others to get involved, be it as a donors or as potential beneficiaries. Ladies and gentlemen, these are challenging times. So it is even more important that we come together and strengthen our support for blue activities, which so many depend on. I leave you with my best wishes for the evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we now move on with some um, uh, short speeches from the beneficiary countries, from the development partners, and from the implementing partners. And in order for us to do this in a, in a rather smooth fashion, I'm going to ask uh, a couple of you to come up on the stage at the same time, and then uh, present um, uh, your, your input, and then uh, we'll take the next uh, group. So I hope that's uh, agreeable to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a, a, a hard negotiated process, this, I can tell you that. So um, I would like, first and foremost, to, um, uh, to invite Her Excellency, the Minister of International Cooperation from Egypt, uh, Her Excellency Alma Shat. Thank you. Uh, and from, from Jordan, I believe um, we have the Chief uh, Commissioner, Nayef Al-Fayez, Al from, no? See, this is where it went wrong. From the outset. His Excellency, Dr. His Excellency, Dr. Alman Soleimain. Sorry for that. Thank you. And of course, uh, His Excellency, the Secretary General for the Union for the Mediterranean, His Excellency Nasser Kamel, please come up. Um, and we have the Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll try and be as fast as possible, but uh, let me first, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's very, I'm very happy to be here with uh, partners who have been engaging uh, with Egypt uh, in many ways uh, on climate action, uh, green transition. So I'm very happy that today it's uh, more on the blue economy. And I want to particularly uh, thank Ambassador Nasser Kamil, who has been uh, working with all of you uh, for a couple of years to bring this uh, to light. Um, um, again, uh, uh, the Mediterranean region is recognized uh, with the marine biodiversity. Uh, it's a hot spot for that. But climate change, of course, accelerates the exposure to environmental risks. Uh, and therefore, this initiative uh, comes uh, very closely with the international concern, uh, as we heard in, uh, in the video. Uh, I'm very pleased that I'll be signing this uh, with uh, colleagues and uh, partners today. Uh, and uh, this COP, uh, COP27 in Egypt was uh, from pledges to implementation and this COP is moving forward uh, also with respect uh, to action. Uh, and therefore, in this context, uh, the Blue Mediterranean Partnership, uh, which seeks more cooperation and coordination among the different uh, stakeholders uh, to actually um, have impact with respect to the blue economy through three objectives, which we find uh, very much uh, in line with our own national goals and also uh, with the efforts that we want to do, uh, supporting the sustainable blue economy, enhancing capacity, uh, on sustainable and innovative uh, practices uh, and also creating and reinforcing enabling environments. We saw tourism on, in, 
the video. Tourism for us is extremely important and we see uh, a lot of opportunity uh, to push this uh, agenda forward. In conclusion, I want to thank uh, all the partners, uh, EBRD, the EU, uh, EIB, AFD, KFW, uh, of course, CEDA, uh, the, the, the Swedish government, and UFM uh, for all the effort that has uh, been taking uh, and I see from Spain, apologies uh, uh, for missing, but again, the, the, the list of partners just shows uh, the importance of uh, when stakeholders come together, uh, there is complementarity, there's plenty that we can do uh, together. Uh, we have witnessed this uh, uh, in Egypt uh, through the different projects that we do together, uh, and uh, also our Nexus of Water, Food and Energy, which is a platform uh, that uh, provides financing on water, food and energy today uh, with the blue economy, biodiversity is a in addition uh, that we look forward to partnering with all of you on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, Excellencies, uh, colleagues and friends. Allow me to thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. Uh, today we are witnessing another partnership with the Mediterranean. This is, a new, this is not a new. We are building on our previous experience in the Mediterranean region and we are coming from the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, we have a long-term partnership with the European Union. Currently, we are working with the European Union as a part of the Green Deal on the establishment of uh, a strategic project, which is the uh, Aqaba Marine Park, which has three main components, uh, Aqaba Marine Reserve, Aqaba Aquarium, and Aqaba 